This is a statement which we shall have occasion to repeat in each of the chapters which follow. 4. But if this contagiousness of sacredness helps to explain the system of interdicts, how is it to be explained itself? Some have tried to explain it with the well-known laws of the association of ideas. The sentiments inspired in us by a person or a thing spread contagiously from the idea of this thing or person to the representations associated with it, and thence to the objects which these representations express. So the respect which we have for a sacred being is communicated to everything touching this being, or resembling it, or recalling it. Of course a cultivated man is not deceived by these associations. He knows that these derived emotions are due to mere plays of the images and to entirely mental combinations, so he does not give way to the superstitions which these illusions tend to bring about. But they say that the primitive naively objectifies his impressions, without criticizing them. Does something inspire a reverential fear in him? He concludes that an august and redoubtable force really resides in it. So he keeps at a distance from this thing and treats it as though it were sacred, even though it has no right to this title. Page 322. But whoever says this forgets that the most primitive religions are not the only ones which have attributed this power of propagation to the sacred character. Even in the most recent cults, there is a group of rites which repose upon this principle. Does not every consecration by means of anointing or washing consist in transferring into a profane object the sanctifying virtues of a sacred one? Yet it is difficult to regard an enlightened Catholic of today as a sort of retarded savage who continues to be deceived by his associations of ideas, while nothing in the nature of things explains or justifies these ways of thinking. Moreover, it is quite arbitrarily that they attribute to the primitive this tendency to objectify blindly all his emotions. In his ordinary life, and in the details of his lay occupations, he does not impute the properties of one thing to its neighbors, or vice versa. If he is less careful than we are about clarity and distinction, still it is far from true that he has some vague, deplorable aptitude for jumbling and confusing everything. Religious thought alone has a marked leaning towards these sorts of confusions. So it is in something special to the nature of religious things, and not in the general laws of the human intelligence, that the origin of these predispositions is to be sought. When a force or property seems to be an integral part or constituent element of the subject in which it resides, we cannot easily imagine its detaching itself and going elsewhere. A body is defined by its mass and its atomic composition. So we do not think that it could communicate any of these distinctive characteristics by means of contact. But, on the other hand, if we are dealing with a force which has penetrated the body from without, since nothing attaches it there and since it is foreign to the body, there is nothing inconceivable in its escaping again. Thus the heat or electricity which a body has received from some external source may be transmitted to the surrounding medium, and the mind readily accepts the possibility of this transmission. So the extreme facility with which religious forces spread out and diffuse themselves has nothing surprising about it, if they are generally thought of as outside of the beings in which they reside. Now this is just what the theory we have proposed implies. In fact, they are only collective forces hypostatized, that is to say, moral forces. They are made up of the ideas and sentiments awakened in us by the spectacle of society, and not of sensations coming from the physical world. So they are not homogeneous with the visible things among which we place them. They may well take from these things the outward and material forms in which they are represented, but they owe none of their efficacy, page 323, to them. They are not united by external bonds to the different supports upon which they alight. They have no roots there, according to an expression we have already used and which serves best for characterizing them, they are added to them. So there are no objects which are predestined to receive them, to the exclusion of all others. Even the most insignificant and vulgar may do so, accidental circumstances decide which are the chosen ones. The terms in which Codrington speaks of the manna should be borne in mind, it is a force, he says, which is not fixed in anything and can be conveyed in almost anything. Likewise, the Dakota of Miss Fletcher represented the Wacken as a sort of surrounding force which is always coming and going through the world, alighting here and there, but definitely fixing itself nowhere. 
Even the religious character inherent in men does not have a different character. There is certainly no other being in the world of experience which is closer to the very source of all religious life. None participates in it more directly, for it is in human consciousnesses that it is elaborated. Yet we know that the religious principle animating men, to wit, the soul, is partially external. But if religious forces have a place of their own nowhere, their mobility is easily explained. Since nothing attaches them to the things in which we localize them, it is natural that they should escape on the slightest contact, in spite of themselves, so to speak, and that they should spread afar. Their intensity incites them to this spreading, which everything favors. This is why the soul itself, though holding to the body by very personal bonds, is constantly threatening to leave it, all the apertures and pores of the body are just so many ways by which it tends to spread and diffuse itself into the outside. But we shall account for this phenomenon which we are trying to understand, still better if, instead of considering the notion of religious forces as it is when completely formulated, we go back to the mental process from which it results. We have seen, in fact, that the sacred character of a being does not rest in any of its intrinsic attributes. It is not because the totemic animal has a certain aspect or property that it inspires religious sentiments. These result from causes wholly foreign to the nature of the object upon which they fix themselves. What constitutes them are the impressions of comfort and dependence which the action of the society provokes in the mind. Of themselves, these emotions are not attached to the idea of any, page 324, particular object, but as these emotions exist and are especially intense, they are also eminently contagious. So they make a stain of oil. They extend to all the other mental states which occupy the mind. They penetrate and contaminate those representations especially in which are expressed the various objects which the man had in his hands or before his eyes at the moment, the totemic designs covering his body. The bull roarers which he was making roar, the rocks surrounding him, the ground under his feet, etc. It is thus that the objects themselves get a religious value which is really not inherent in them but is conferred from without. So the contagion is not a sort of secondary process by which sacredness is propagated, after it has once been acquired. It is the very process by which it is acquired. It is by contagion that it establishes itself, we should not be surprised, therefore, if it transmits itself contagiously. What makes its reality is a special emotion. If it attaches itself to some object, it is because this emotion has found this object in its way. So it is natural that from this one it should spread to all those which it finds in its neighborhood, that is to say, to all those which any reason whatsoever, either material contiguity or mere similarity, has mentally connected with the first. Thus, the contagiousness of sacredness finds its explanation in the theory which we have proposed of religious forces, and by this very fact, it serves to confirm our theory. And, at the same time, it aids us in understanding a trait of primitive mentality to which we have already called the attention. We have seen the facility with which the primitive confuses kingdoms and identifies the most heterogeneous things, men, animals, plants, stars, etc. Now we see one of the causes which has contributed the most to facilitating these confusions. Since religious forces are eminently contagious, it is constantly happening that the same principle animates very different objects equally. It passes from some into others as the result of either a simple material proximity or of even a superficial similarity. It is thus that men, animals, plants and rocks come to have the same totem, the men because they bear the name of the animal, the animals because they bring the totemic emblem to mind, the plants because they nourish these animals. The rocks because they mark the place where the ceremonies are celebrated. Now religious forces are therefore considered the source of all efficacy. Page 325, so beings having one single religious principle ought to pass as having the same essence, and as differing from one another only in secondary characteristics. This is why it seemed quite natural to arrange them in a single category and to regard them as mere varieties of the same class, transmutable into one another. When this relation has been established, it makes the phenomena of contagion appear under a new aspect. Taken by themselves, they seem to be quite foreign to the logical life. Is their effect not to mix and confuse beings, 
in spite of their natural differences? But we have seen that these confusions and participation have played a role of the highest utility in logic. They have served to bind together things which sensation leaves apart from one another. So it is far from true that contagion, the source of these connections and confusions, is marked with that fundamental irrationality that one is inclined to attribute it at first. It has opened the way for the scientific explanations of the future. Page 326. Chapter 2. The Positive Cult. I. Dot, the Elements of the Sacrifice. Whatever the importance of the negative cult may be, and though it may indirectly have positive effects, it does not contain its reason for existence in itself. It introduces one to the religious life, but it supposes this more than it constitutes it. If it orders the worshipper to flee from the profane world, it is to bring him nearer to the sacred world. Men have never thought that their duties towards religious forces might be reduced to a simple abstinence from all commerce. They have always believed that they upheld positive and bilateral relations with them, whose regulation and organization is the function of a group of ritual practices. To this special system of rites we give the name of positive cult. For some time we almost completely ignored the positive cult of the totemic religion and what it consists in. We knew almost nothing more than the initiation rites, and we do not know those sufficiently well even now. But the observations of Spencer and Gillen, prepared for by those of Scholes and confirmed by those of Strello, on the tribes of Central Australia, have partially filled this gap in our information. There is one ceremony especially which these explorers have taken particular pains to describe to us and which, moreover, seems to dominate the whole totemic cult, this is the one that the Arunta, according to Spencer and Gillen, call the Antikyuma. It is true that Strello contests the meaning of this word. According to him, Intikiyoma, or, as he writes it, Intigioma, means, to instruct and designates the ceremonies performed before the young man to teach him the traditions of the tribe. The feast which we are going to describe bears, he says, the name Batjalkatuma, which means, to fecundate or, to put into a good condition. But we shall not try to settle this question of vocabulary, which touches the real problem but slightly, as the rites in question are all, page 327, celebrated in the course of the initiation. On the other hand, as the word Antikyuma now belongs to the current language of ethnography, and has almost become a common noun, it seems useless to replace it with another. The date on which the Antikyuma takes place depends largely upon the season. There are two sharply separated seasons in Australia, one is dry and lasts for a long time. The other is rainy and is, on the contrary, very short and frequently irregular. As soon as the rains arrive, vegetation springs up from the ground as though by enchantment and animals multiply, so that the country which had recently been only a sterile desert is rapidly filled with a luxurious flora and fauna. It is just at the moment when the good season seems to be close at hand that the Antikyuma is celebrated. But as the rainy season is extremely variable, the date of the ceremonies cannot be fixed once for all. It varies with the climatic circumstances, which only the chief of the totemic group, the Alatunja, is qualified to judge, on a day which he considers suitable, he informs his companions that the moment has arrived. Each totemic group has its own intikiuma. Even if this rite is general in the societies of the center, it is not the same everywhere, among the Waramunga, it is not what it is among the Arunta. It varies, not only among the tribes, but also within the tribe, among the clans. But it is obvious that the different mechanisms in use are too closely related to each other to be dissociated completely. There is no ceremony, perhaps, which is not made up of several, though these are very unequally developed, what exists only as a germ in one, occupies the most important place in another, and inversely. Yet they must be carefully distinguished, for they constitute just so many different ritual types to be described and explained separately, but afterwards we must seek some common source from which they were derived. Let us commence with those observed among the Arunta. I. The celebration includes two successive phases. The object of the rites which take place in the first is to assure the prosperity of the animal or vegetable species serving the clan as totem. The means employed for this end may be reduced to two principal types, 
page 328. It will be remembered that the fabulous ancestors from whom each clan is supposed to be descended, formerly lived on earth and left traces of their passage there. These traces consist especially in stones and rocks which they deposited at certain places, or which were formed at the spots where they entered into the ground. These rocks and stones are considered the bodies or parts of the bodies of the ancestors, whose memory they keep alive, they represent them. Consequently, they also represent the animals and plants which serve these same ancestors as totems, for an individual and his totem are only one. The same reality and the same properties are attributed to them as to the actually living plants or animals of the same species. But they have this advantage over these latter, that they are imperishable, knowing neither sickness nor death. So they are like a permanent immutable and ever-available reserve of animal and vegetable life. Also, in a certain number of cases, it is this reserve that they annually draw upon to assure the reproduction of the species. Here, for example, is how the Wichity Grub Clan, at Alice Springs, proceeds at its Intikioma. On the day fixed by the chief, all the members of the totemic group assemble in the principal camp. The men of the other totems retire to a distance. For among the Arunta, they are not allowed to be present at the celebration of the rite, which has all the characteristics of a secret ceremony. An individual of a different totem, but of the same fratry, may be invited to be present, as a favor. But this is only as a witness. In no case can he take an active part. After the men of the totem have assembled, they leave the camp, leaving only two or three of their number behind. They advance in a profound silence, one behind another, all naked, without arms and without any of their habitual ornaments. Their attitude and their pace are marked with a religious gravity, this is because the act in which they are taking part has an exceptional importance in their eyes. Also, until the end of the ceremony they are required to observe a rigorous fast. The country which they traverse is all filled with souvenirs left by the glorious ancestors. Thus they arrive at a spot where a huge block of quartz is found, with small round stones all around it. This block represents the witchetty grub as an adult. The Alatunja strikes it with a sort of wooden tray called Apmara, page 329, and at the same time he intones a chant, whose object is to invite the animal to lay eggs. He proceeds in the same fashion with the stones which are regarded as the eggs of the animal and with one of which he rubs the stomach of each assistant. This done, they all descend a little lower, to the foot of a cliff also celebrated in the myths of the Alcharinga, at the base of which is another stone, also representing the witchetty grub. The Alatunja strikes it with his apmara. The men accompanying him do so as well, with branches of a gum tree which they have gathered on the way, all of which goes on in the midst of chants renewing the invitation previously addressed to the animal. About ten different spots are visited in turn, some of which are a mile or more from the others. At each of them there is a stone at the bottom of a cave or hole, which is believed to represent the witchetty grub in one of his aspects or at one of the phases of his existence, and upon each of these stones, the same ceremonies are repeated. The meaning of the rite is evident. When the Alatunja strikes the sacred stones, it is to detach some dust. The grains of this very holy dust are regarded as so many germs of life. Each of them contains a spiritual principle which will give birth to a new being, when introduced into an organism of the same species. The branches with which the assistants are provided serve to scatter this precious dust in all directions. It is scattered everywhere, to accomplish its fecundating work. By this means, they assure, in their own minds, an abundant reproduction of the animal species over which the clans guard, so to speak, and upon which it depends. The natives themselves give the right this interpretation. Thus, in the clan of the Operla, a kind of mana, they proceed in the following manner. When the day of the Intikioma arrives, the group assembles near a huge rock, about fifty feet high, on top of this rock is another, very similar to the first in aspect and surrounded by other smaller ones. Both represent masses of mana. The Alatunja digs up the ground at the foot of this rock and uncovers a Churinga which is believed to have been buried there in Alcharinga times, and which is, as it were, the quintessence of the mana. Then he climbs up to the summit of the higher rock and rubs it, 
first with the chiringa and then with the smaller stones which surround it. Finally, he brushes away the dust which has thus been collected on the surface of the rock, with the branches of a tree, each of the assistants does the same in his turn. Now Spencer and Gillen say that the idea of the natives is that the dust thus scattered will settle upon the mulga trees and so produce, page 330, manna. In fact, these operations are accompanied by a hymn sung by those present, in which this idea is expressed. With variations, this same rite is found in other societies. Among the Yorubana, there is a rock representing an ancestor of the lizard clan. Bits are detached from it which they throw in every direction, in order to secure an abundant production of lizards. In this same tribe, there is a sandbank which mythological souvenirs closely associate with the Laos totem. At the same spot are two trees, one of which is called the ordinary Laos tree, the other, the crab Laos tree. They take some of this sand, rub it on these trees, throw it about on every side and become convinced that, as a result of this, lice will be born in large numbers. The Mara perform the antikyoma of the bees by scattering dust detached from sacred rocks. For the kangaroo of the plains, a slightly different method is used. They take some kangaroo dung and wrap it up in a certain herb of which the animal is very fond, and which belongs to the kangaroo totem for this reason. Then they put the dung, thus enveloped, on the ground between two bunches of this herb and set the whole thing on fire. With the flame thus made, they light the branches of trees and then whirl them about in such a way that sparks fly in every direction. These sparks play the same role as the dust in the preceding cases. In a certain number of clans, men mix something of their own substance with that of the stone, in order to make the rite more efficacious. Young men open their veins and let streams of blood flow onto the rock. This is the case, for example, in the Antikyoma of the Hakea flower among the Arunta. The ceremony takes place in a sacred place around an equally sacred rock which, in the eyes of the natives, represents Hakea flowers. After certain preliminary operations, the old leader asks one of the young men to open a vein in his arm, which he does, and allows the blood to sprinkle freely, while the other men continue the singing. The blood flows until the stone is completely covered. The object of this practice is to revivify the virtues of the stone, after a fashion, and to reinforce its efficacy. It should not be forgotten that the men of the clan are relatives of the plant or animal whose name they bear, the same principle of life is in them, and especially in their blood. So it is only natural that one should use this blood and the mystic germs which it carries to assure the regular reproduction of the, page 331, totemic species. It frequently happens among the Arunta that when a man is sick or tired, one of his young companions opens his veins and sprinkles him with his blood in order to reanimate him. If blood is able to reawaken life in a man in this way, it is not surprising that it should also be able to awaken it in the animal or vegetable species with which the men of the clan are confounded. The same process is employed in the Antikyoma of the Undiara kangaroo among the Arunta. The theater of the ceremony is a waterhole vaulted over by a peaked rock. This rock represents an animal kangaroo of the Alcharinga which was killed and deposited there by a man kangaroo of the same epoch. Many kangaroo spirits are also believed to reside there. After a certain number of sacred stones have been rubbed against each other in the way we have described, several of the assistants climb up on the rock upon which they let their blood flow. The purpose of the ceremony at the present day, so say the natives, is by means of pouring out the blood of kangaroo men upon the rock. To drive out in all directions the spirits of the kangaroo animals and so to increase the number of the animals. There is even one case among the Arunta where the blood seems to be the active principle in the rite. In the emu group, they do not use sacred stones or anything resembling them. The Alatunja and some of his assistants sprinkle the ground with their blood, on the ground thus soaked, they trace lines in various colors, representing the different parts of the body of an emu. They kneel down around this design and chant a monotonous hymn. From the fictitious emu to which this chant is addressed, and, consequently, from the blood which has served to make it, they believe that vivifying principles go forth, which animate the embryos of the new generation. And thus prevent the species from disappearing. Among the Wonkongru, 
there is one clan whose totem is a certain kind of fish, in the Antikyoma of this totem also, it is the blood that plays the principal part. The chief of the, page 332, group, after being ceremoniously painted, goes into a pool of water and sits down there. Then he pierces his scrotum and the skin around his navel with small pointed bones. The blood from the wounds goes into the water and gives rise to fish. By a wholly similar process, the diary think that they assure the reproduction of two of their totems, the carpet snake and the woma snake, the ordinary snake. A muramura named Minkani is thought to live under a dune. His body is represented by some fossil bones of animals or reptiles, such as the deltas of the rivers flowing into Lake Eyre contain, according to Howitt. When the day of the ceremony arrives, the men assemble and go to the home of the Minkani. There they dig until they come to a layer of damp earth which they call, the excrement of Minkani. From now on, they continue to turn up the soil with great care until they uncover, the elbow of Minkani. Then two young men open their veins and let their blood flow onto the sacred rock. They chant the hymn of Minkani while the assistants, carried away in a veritable frenzy, beat each other with their arms. The battle continues until they get back to the camp, which is about a mile away. Here, the women intervene and put an end to the combat. They collect the blood which has flown from the wounds, mix it with the excrement of Minkani, and scatter the resulting mixture over the dune. When this rite has been accomplished, they are convinced that carpet snakes will be born in abundance. In certain cases, they use the very substance which they wish to produce as the vivifying principle. Thus among the Kadesh, in the course of a ceremony whose object is to create rain, they sprinkle water over a sacred rock which represents the mythical heroes of the water clan. It is evident that they believe that by this means they augment the productive virtues of the rock just as well as with blood, and for the same reasons. Among the Mara, the actor takes water from a sacred hole, puts it in his mouth and spits it out in every direction. Among the Wurgia, when the yams begin to sprout, the chief of the yam clan sends men of the fray tree of which he is not a member himself to gather some of these plants. These bring some to him, and ask him to intervene, in order that the species may develop well. He takes one, chews it, and throws the bits in every direction. Among the Kadesh when, after various rites which we shall not describe, the grain of a certain grass called Erlapina has reached its full, page 333, development, the chief of the totem brings a little of it to camp and grinds it between two stones. The dust thus obtained is piously gathered up, and a few grains are placed on the lips of the chief, who scatters them by blowing. This contact with the mouth of the chief, which has a very special sacramental virtue, undoubtedly has the object of stimulating the vitality of the germs which these grains contain and which, being blown to all the quarters of the horizon, go to communicate these fecundating virtues which they possess to the plants. The efficacy of these rites is never doubted by the native, he is convinced that they must produce the results he expects, with a sort of necessity. If events deceive his hopes, he merely concludes that they were counteracted by the sorcery of some hostile group. In any case, it never enters his mind that a favorable result could be obtained by any other means. If by chance the vegetation grows or the animals produce before he has performed his intikiyoma, he supposes that another intikiyoma has been celebrated under the ground by the ancestors and that the living reap the benefits of this subterranean ceremony. 2. This is the first act of the celebration. During the period immediately following, there are no regular, page 334, ceremonies. However, the religious life remains intense, this is manifested especially by an aggravation of the system of interdicts. It is as though the sacred character of the totem were reinforced, they do not even dare to touch it. In ordinary times, the Arunta may eat the animal or plant which serves as totem, provided they do so with moderation, but on the morrow of the Antikyoma this rite is suspended, the alimentary interdiction is strict and without exceptions. They believe that any violation of this interdict would result in neutralizing the good effects of the rite and in preventing the increase of the species. It is true that the men of other totems who happen to be in the same locality are not submitted to the same prohibition. However, their liberty is less than ordinary at this time. 
They may not consume the totemic animal wherever they place, in the brush, for example, they must bring it to camp, and it is there only that it may be cooked. A final ceremony terminates this period of extraordinary interdictions and definitely closes this long series of rites. It varies somewhat in different clans, but the essential elements are the same everywhere. Here are the two principal forms which it takes among the Arunta. One of these is in connection with the witchetty grub, the other with the kangaroo. When the grubs have attained full maturity and appear in abundance, the men of the totem, as well as others, collect as many of them as possible. Then they all bring those they have found back to camp and cook them until they become hard and brittle. They are then preserved in wooden vessels called pitchi. The harvest of grubs is possible only during a very short time, for they appear only after the rain. When they begin to be less numerous, the Alatunja summons everybody to the camp, on his invitation, each one brings his supply. The others place theirs before the men of that totem. The Alatunja takes one of these pitchi and, with the aid of his companions, he grinds its contents between two stones. After this, he eats a little of the powder thus obtained, his assistants do the same, and what remains is given to the men of the other clans, who may now dispose of it freely. They proceed in exactly the same manner with the supply provided by the Alatunja. From now on, the men and women of the totem may eat it, but only a little at a time. If they went beyond the limits allowed, they would lose the powers necessary to celebrate the Antikyoma and the species would not reproduce. Yet, if they did not eat any at all, and especially if the Alatunja ate none in the circumstances we have just described, they would be overtaken by the same incapacity. Page 335 In the totemic group of the kangaroo, which has its center at Undiara, certain characteristics of the ceremony are more clearly marked. After the rites which we have described have been accomplished on the sacred rock, the young men go and hunt the kangaroo, bringing their game back to the camp. Here, the old men, with the alatunja in their midst, eat a little of the flesh of the animal, and anoint the bodies of those who took part in the antikyoma with its fat. The rest is divided up among the men assembled. Next, the men of the totem decorate themselves with totemic designs and the night is passed in songs commemorating the exploits accomplished by men and animal kangaroos in the times of the Alcharinga. The next day, the young men go hunting again in the forest and bring back a larger number of kangaroos than the first time, and the ceremonies of the day before recommence. With variations of detail, the same rite is found in other Arunta clans, among the Yurubunna, the Kadish, the Unmatura, and in the Encounter Bay tribe. Everywhere, it is made up of the same essential elements. A few specimens of the totemic animal or plant are presented to the chief of the clan, who solemnly eats them and who must eat them. If he did not fulfill this duty, he would lose the power of celebrating the Antikyoma efficaciously, that is to say, so as to recreate the species annually. Sometimes the ritual consumption is followed by an unction made with the fat of the animal or certain parts of the plant. This rite is generally repeated by the men of the totem, or at least by the old men, and after it has been accomplished, the exceptional interdictions are raised. In the tribes located farther north, among the Waramunga and neighboring societies, this ceremony is no longer found. However, traces are found which seem to indicate that there was a time when it was known. It is true that the chief of the clan never eats the totem ritually and obligatorily. But in certain cases, men who are not of the totem whose antikyoma has just been celebrated, must bring the animal or plant to camp and offer it to the chief, asking him if he wants to eat it. He refuses and adds, I have made this for you. You may eat it freely. So the custom of the presentation remains and the question asked, page 336, of the chief seems to date back to an epoch when the ritual consumption was practiced. 3. The interest of the system of rites which has just been described lies in the fact that in them we find, in the most elementary form that is actually known. All the essential principles of a great religious institution which was destined to become one of the foundation stones of the positive cult in the superior religions, this is the institution of sacrifice. We know what a revolution the work of Robertson Smith brought about in the traditional theory of sacrifice. 
Before him, sacrifice was regarded as a sort of tribute or homage, either obligatory or optional, analogous to that which subjects owe to their princes. Robertson Smith was the first to remark that this classic explanation did not account for two essential characteristics of the rite. In the first place, it is a repast, its substance is food. Secondly, it is a repast in which the worshippers who offer it take part, along with the god to whom it is offered. Certain parts of the victim are reserved for the divinity, others are, page 337, attributed to the sacrificers, who consume them. This is why the Bible often speaks of the sacrifice as a repast in the presence of Yahweh. Now in a multitude of societies, meals taken in common are believed to create a bond of artificial kinship between those who assist at them, in fact, relatives are people who are naturally made of the same flesh and blood. But food is constantly remaking the substance of the organism. So a common food may produce the same effects as a common origin. According to Smith, Sacrificial banquets have the object of making the worshipper and his god communicate in the same flesh, in order to form a bond of kinship between them. From this point of view, sacrifice takes on a wholly new aspect. Its essential element is no longer the act of renouncement which the word sacrifice ordinarily expresses, before all, it is an act of elementary communion. Of course there are some reservations to be made in the details of this way of explaining the efficacy of sacrificial banquets. This does not result exclusively from the act of eating together. A man does not sanctify himself merely by sitting down, in some way, at the same table with a god, but especially by eating food at this ritual repast which has a sacred character. It has been shown how a whole series of preliminary operations, lustrations, unctions, prayers, etc., transform the animal to be immolated into a sacred thing, whose sacredness is subsequently transferred to the worshipper who eats it. But it is true, nonetheless, that the alimentary communion is one of the essential elements of the sacrifice. Now when we turn to the rite which terminates the ceremonies of the Antikyoma, we find that it, too, consists in an act of this sort. After the totemic animal has been killed, the Alatunja and the old men solemnly eat it. So they communicate with the sacred principle residing in it and they assimilate it. The only difference we find here is that the animal is naturally sacred while it ordinarily acquires this character artificially in the course of the sacrifice. Moreover, the object of this communion is manifest. Every member of a totemic clan contains a mystic substance within him which is the preeminent part of his being, for his soul is made out of it. From it come whatever powers he has in his social position, for it is this which makes him a person. So he has a vital interest in maintaining it intact and in keeping it, as far as is possible, in a state of perpetual youth. Unfortunately all forces, even the most spiritual, are used up in the course of time if nothing comes to return to them the energy they lose, page 338, through the normal working of things. There is a necessity of the first importance here which, as we shall see, is the real reason for the positive cult. Therefore the men of a totem cannot retain their position unless they periodically revivify the totemic principle which is in them. And as they represent this principle in the form of a vegetable or animal, it is to the corresponding animal or vegetable species that they go to demand the supplementary forces needed to renew this and to rejuvenate it. A man of the kangaroo clan believes himself and feels himself a kangaroo, it is by this quality that he defines himself, it is this which marks his place in the society. In order to keep it, he takes a little of the flesh of this same animal into his own body from time to time. A small bit is enough, owing to the rule, the part is equal to the whole. If this operation is to produce all the desired effects, it may not take place at no matter what moment. The most opportune time is when the new generation has just reached its complete development, for this is also the moment when the forces animating the totemic species attain their maximum intensity. They have just been drawn with great difficulty from those rich reservoirs of life, the sacred trees and rocks. Moreover, all sorts of means have been employed to increase their intensity still more. This is the use of the rites performed during the first part of the Antikyoma. Also, by their very aspect, the first fruits of the harvest manifest the energy which they contain, here the totemic god acclaims himself in all the glory of his youth. 
This is why the first fruits have always been regarded as a very sacred fruit, reserved for very holy beings. So it is natural that the Australian uses it to regenerate himself spiritually. Thus both the date and the circumstances of the ceremonies are explained. Perhaps some will be surprised that so sacred a food may be eaten by ordinary profane persons. But in the first place, there is no positive cult which does not face this contradiction. Every sacred being is removed from profane touch by this very character with which it is endowed. But, on the other hand, they would serve for nothing and have no reason whatsoever for their existence if they could not come in contact with these same worshippers who, on another ground, must remain respectfully distant from them. At bottom, there is no positive right which does not constitute a veritable sacrilege, for a man cannot hold commerce with the sacred beings without crossing the barrier which should ordinarily keep them separate. But the important thing is that the sacrilege should be accompanied, page 339, with precautions which attenuate it. Among those employed, the most usual one consists in arranging the transition so as to introduce the worshipper slowly and gradually into the circle of sacred things. When it has been broken and diluted in this fashion, the sacrilege does not offend the religious conscience so violently, it is not regarded as a sacrilege and so vanishes. This is what happens in the case now before us. The effect of the whole series of rites which has preceded the moment when the totem is solemnly eaten has been to sanctify those who took an active part in them. They constitute an essentially religious period, through which no one could go without a transformation of his religious state. The fasts, the contact with sacred rocks, the chiringa, the totemic decorations, etc. have gradually conferred upon him a character which he did not have before and which enables him to approach, without a shocking and dangerous profanation, this desirable and redoubtable food which is forbidden him in ordinary times. If the act by which a sacred being is first immolated and then eaten by those who adore it may be called a sacrifice, the right of which we have just been speaking has a right to this same name. Moreover, its significance is well shown by the striking analogies it presents with so many practices met with in a large number of agrarian cults. It is a very general rule that even among peoples who have attained a high degree of civilization, the first fruits of the harvest are used in the ritual repasts, of which the Pascal feast is the best known example. On the other hand, as the agrarian rites are at the very basis of the most advanced forms of the cult, we see that the antikioma of the Australian societies is closer to us than one might imagine from its apparent crudeness. By an intuition of genius, Smith had an intuition of all this, though he was not acquainted with the facts. By a series of ingenious deductions, which need not be reproduced here. For their interest is now only historical, he thought that he could establish the fact that at the beginning the animal immolated in the sacrifice must have been regarded as quasi-divine and as a close relative of those who immolated it, now these characteristics are just the ones with which the totemic species is defined. Smith even went so far as to suppose that totemism must have known and practiced a rite wholly similar to the one we have been studying. He was even inclined to see the original source, page 340, of the whole sacrificial institution in a sacrifice of this sort. Sacrifice was not founded to create a bond of artificial kinship between a man and his gods, but to maintain and renew the natural kinship which primitively united them. Here, as elsewhere, the artifice was born only to imitate nature. But in the Book of Smith this hypothesis was presented as scarcely more than a theory which the then known facts supported very imperfectly. The rare cases of totemic sacrifice which he cites in support of his theory do not have the significance he attributed to them, the animals which figure in them are not real totems. But today we are able to state that on at least one point the demonstration is made, in fact, we have just seen that in an important number of societies the totemic sacrifice, such as Smith conceived it, is or has been practiced. Of course, we have no proof that this practice is necessarily inherent to totemism or that it is the germ out of which all the other types of sacrifices have developed. But if the universality of the rite is hypothetical, its existence is no longer to be contested. Hereafter it is to be regarded as established that the most mystical form of the alimentary communion is found even in the most rudimentary cults known today. 4. But on another point the new facts at our disposal invalidate the theories of Smith. 
According to him, the communion was not only an essential element of the sacrifice, but at the beginning, at least, it was the unique element. Not only is one mistaken when he reduces sacrifice to nothing more than a tribute or offering, but the very idea of an offering was originally absent from it, this intervened only at a late period and under the influence of external circumstances. So instead of being able to aid us in understanding it, it has rather masked the real nature of the ritual mechanism. In fact, Smith claimed to find in the very notion of ablation an absurdity so revolting that it could never have been the fundamental reason for so great an institution. One of the most important functions incumbent upon the divinity is to assure to men that food which is necessary for life, so it seems impossible that the sacrifice, in its turn, should consist in a presentation of food to the divinity. It even seems self-contradictory that the gods should expect their food from a man, when it is from them that he gets his. Why should they have need of his aid in order to deduct beforehand their just share of the things which he, page 341, receives from their hands? From these considerations Smith concluded that the idea of a sacrifice offering could have been born only in the great religions, where the gods, removed from the things with which they were primitively confused, were thought of as sorts of kings and the eminent proprietors of the earth and its products. From this moment onwards, the sacrifice was associated with the tribute which subjects paid to their prince, as a price of the rights which were conceded to them. But this new interpretation was really an alteration and even a corruption of the primitive conception. For, the idea of property materializes all that it touches. By introducing itself into the sacrifice, it denatured it and made it into a sort of bargain between the man and the divinity. But the facts which we have described overthrow this argumentation. These rites are certainly among the most primitive that have ever been observed. No determined mythical personality appears in them, there is no question of gods or spirits that are properly so called. It is only vaguely anonymous and impersonal forces which they put into action. Yet the reasoning which they suppose is exactly the one that Smith declared impossible because of its absurdity. Let us return to the first act of the Antikyoma, to the rites destined to assure the fecundity of the animal or vegetable species which serves the clan as totem. This species is the preeminently sacred thing. In it is incarnated that which we have been able to call, by metaphor, the totemic divinity. Yet we have seen that to perpetuate itself it has need of the aid of men. It is they who dispense the life of the new generation each year. Without them, it would never be born. If they stopped celebrating the Antikyoma, the sacred beings would disappear from the face of the earth. So in one sense, it is from men that they get their existence. Yet in another way, it is from them that men get theirs, for after they have once arrived at maturity, it is from them that men acquire the force needed to support and repair their spiritual beings. Thus we are able to say that men make their gods, or, at least, make them live, but at the same time, it is from them that they live themselves. So they are regularly guilty of the circle which, according to Smith, is implied in the very idea of a sacrificial tribute, they give to the sacred beings a little of what they receive from them, and they receive from them all that they give. But there is still more to be said, the oblations which he is thus forced to make every year do not differ in nature from those which are made later in the rites properly called sacrifices. Page 342 if the sacrificer immolates an animal, it is in order that the living principles within it may be disengaged from the organism and go to nourish the divinity. Likewise, the grains of dust which the Australian detaches from the sacred rock are so many sacred principles which he scatters into space, so that they may go to animate the totemic species and assure its renewal. The gesture with which this scattering is made is also that which normally accompanies offerings. In certain cases, the resemblance between the two rites may be followed even to the details of the movements effected. We have seen that in order to have rain the Kadesh pour water over the sacred stone, among certain peoples, the priest pours water over the altar, with the same end in view. The effusions of blood which are usual in a certain number of Antikyoma are veritable oblations. Just as the Arunta or diary sprinkle the sacred rock or the totemic design with blood, so it frequently happens that in the more advanced cults, the blood of the sacrificed victim or of the worshipper himself is spilt before or upon the altar. 
In these cases, it is given to the gods, of whom it is the preferred food, in Australia, it is given to the sacred species. So we have no ground for saying that the idea of ablation is a late product of civilization. A document which we owe to Strello puts this kinship of the Antikyoma and the sacrifice clearly into evidence. This is a hymn which accompanies the Antikyoma of the kangaroo. The ceremony is described at the same time that its expected effects are announced. A morsel of kangaroo fat has been placed by the chief upon a support made of branches. The text says that this fat makes the fat of the kangaroos increase. This time, they do not confine themselves to sprinkling sacred dust or human blood about, the animal itself is immolated, or sacrificed as one might say, placed upon a sort of altar, and offered to the species, whose life it should maintain. Now we see the sense in which we may say that the Antikyoma contains the germs of the sacrificial system. In the form which it takes when fully constituted, a sacrifice is composed of two essential elements, an act of communion and an act of oblation. The worshipper communes with his god by taking in a sacred food, and at the same time he makes an offering to this god. We find these two acts in the Antikyoma, as we have described it. The only difference is that in the ordinary sacrifice they are, page 343, made simultaneously or else follow one another immediately, while in the Australian ceremony they are separated. In the former case, they are parts of one undivided rite. Here, they take place at different times, and may even be separated by a rather long interval. But, at bottom, the mechanism is the same. Taken as a whole, the Antikyoma is a sacrifice, but one whose parts are not yet articulated and organized. The relating of these two ceremonies has the double advantage of enabling us to understand better the nature of the Antikyoma and that of sacrifice. We understand the Antikyoma better. In fact, the conception of Fraser, which made it a simple magic operation with no religious character at all, is now seen to be unsupportable. One cannot dream of excluding from religion a rite which is the forerunner of so great a religious institution. But we also understand what the sacrifice itself is better. In the first place, the equal importance of the two elements entering into it is now established. If the Australian makes offerings to his sacred beings, there is no reason for supposing that the idea of ablation was foreign to the primitive organization of the sacrificial institution and later upset its natural arrangement. The theory of Smith must be revised on this point. Of course the sacrifice is partially a communion, but it is also, and no less essentially, a gift and an act of renouncement. It always presupposes that the worshipper gives some of his substance or his goods to his gods. Every attempt to deduce one of these elements from the other is hopeless. Perhaps the ablation is even more permanent than the communion. In the second place, it ordinarily seems as though the sacrifice, and especially the sacrificial ablation, could only be addressed to personal beings. But the ablations which we have met with in Australia imply no notion of this sort. In other words, the sacrifice is independent of the varying forms in which the religious forces are conceived, it is founded upon more profound reasons, which we shall seek presently. In any case, it is clear that the act of offering naturally arouses in the mind the idea of a moral subject, whom this offering is destined to please. The ritual acts which we have described, page 344, become more intelligible when it is believed that they are addressed to persons. So the practices of the Antikyoma, while actually putting only impersonal forces into play, prepare the way for a different conception. Of course they were not sufficient to form the idea of mythical personalities by themselves, but when this idea had once been formed, the very nature of these rites made it enter into the cult. Thus, taking a more direct interest in action and life, it also acquired a greater reality. So we are even able to believe that the cult favored, in a secondary manner, no doubt, but nevertheless one which is worthy of attention, the personification of the religious forces. V. But we still have to explain the contradiction in which Robertson Smith saw an inadmissible logical scandal. If the sacred beings always manifested their powers in a perfectly equal manner, it would appear inconceivable that men should dream of offering them services, for we cannot see what need they could have of them. But in the first place, in so far as they are confused with things, 
and in so far as they are regarded as principles of the cosmic life, they are themselves submitted to the rhythm of this life. Now this goes in oscillations in contrary directions, which succeed one another according to a determined law. Sometimes it is affirmed in all its glory. Sometimes it weakens to such an extent that one may ask himself whether it is not going to fade away. Vegetation dies every year, will it be reborn? Animal species tend to become extinguished by the effect of natural and violent death. Will they be renewed at such a time and in such a way as is proper? Above all, the rain is capricious. There are long periods during which it seems to have disappeared forever. These periodical variations of nature bear witness to the fact that at the corresponding periods, the sacred beings upon whom the plants, animals, rain, etc., depend are themselves passing through grave crises. So they, too, have their periods of giving way. But men could not regard these spectacles as indifferent spectators. If he is to live, the universal life must continue, and consequently the gods must not die. So he seeks to sustain and aid them. For this, he puts at their service whatever forces he has at his disposition, and mobilizes them for this purpose. The blood flowing in his veins has fecundating virtues, he pours it forth. From the sacred rocks, page 345, possessed by his clan he takes those germs of life which lie dormant there, and scatters them into space. In a word, he makes ablations. The external and physical crises, moreover, duplicate internal and mental crises which tend toward the same result. Sacred beings exist only when they are represented as such in the mind. When we cease to believe in them, it is as though they did not exist. Even those which have a material form and are given by sensible experience, depend upon the thought of the worshippers who adore them. For the sacred character which makes them objects of the cult is not given by their natural constitution, it is added to them by belief. The kangaroo is only an animal like all others. Yet, for the men of the kangaroo, it contains within it a principle which puts it outside the company of others, and this principle exists only in the minds of those who believe in it. If these sacred beings, when once conceived, are to have no need of men to continue, it would be necessary that the representations expressing them always remain the same. But this stability is impossible. In fact, it is in the communal life that they are formed, and this communal life is essentially intermittent. So they necessarily partake of this same intermittency. They attain their greatest intensity at the moment when the men are assembled together and are in immediate relations with one another, when they all partake of the same idea and the same sentiment. But when the assembly has broken up and each man has returned to his own peculiar life, they progressively lose their original energy. Being covered over little by little by the rising flood of daily experiences, they would soon fall into the unconscious, if we did not find some means of calling them back into consciousness and revivifying them. If we think of them less forcefully, they amount to less for us and we count less upon them, they exist to a lesser degree. So here we have another point of view, from which the services of men are necessary to them. This second reason for their existence is even more important than the first, for it exists all the time. The intermittency of the physical life can affect religious beliefs only when religions are not yet detached from their cosmic basis. The intermittency of the social life, on the other hand, is inevitable, even the most idealistic religions cannot escape it. Moreover, it is owing to this state of dependency upon the, page 346, thought of men, in which the gods find themselves, that the former are able to believe in the efficacy of their assistance. The only way of renewing the collective representations which relate to sacred beings is to retemper them in the very source of the religious life, that is to say, in the assembled groups. Now the emotions aroused by these periodical crises through which external things pass induce the men who witness them to assemble, to see what should be done about it. But by the very fact of uniting, they are mutually comforted. They find a remedy because they seek it together. The common faith becomes reanimated quite naturally in the heart of this reconstituted group, if is born again because it again finds those very conditions in which it was born in the first place. After it has been restored, it easily triumphs over all the private doubts which may have arisen in individual minds. 
the image of the sacred things regains power enough to resist the internal or external causes which tended to weaken it. In spite of their apparent failure, men can no longer believe that the gods will die, because they feel them living in their own hearts. The means employed to succor them, howsoever crude these may be, cannot appear vain, for everything goes on as if they were really effective. Men are more confident because they feel themselves stronger. And they really are stronger, because forces which were languishing are now reawakened in the consciousness. So we must be careful not to believe, along with Smith, that the cult was founded solely for the benefit of men and that the gods have nothing to do with it, they have no less need of it than their worshippers. Of course men would be unable to live without gods, but, on the other hand, the gods would die if their cult were not rendered. This does not have the sole object of making profane subjects communicate with sacred beings, but it also keeps these latter alive and is perpetually remaking and regenerating them. Of course it is not the material oblations which bring about this regeneration by their own virtues, it is the mental states which these actions, though vain in themselves, accompany or reawaken. The real reason for the existence of the cults, even of those which are the most materialistic in appearance, is not to be sought in the acts which they prescribe, but in the internal and moral regeneration which these acts aid in bringing about. The things which the worshipper really gives his gods are not the foods which he places upon the altars, nor the blood which he lets flow from his veins, it is his thought. Nevertheless, it is true that there is an exchange of services, which are mutually demanded, between, page 347, the divinity and its worshippers. The rule du utida, by which the principle of sacrifice has sometimes been defined, is not a late invention of utilitarian theorists, it only expresses in an explicit way the very mechanism of the sacrificial system and, more generally, of the whole positive cult. So the circle pointed out by Smith is very real, but it contains nothing humiliating for the reason. It comes from the fact that the sacred beings, though superior to men, can live only in the human consciousness. But this circle will appear still more natural to us, and we shall understand its meaning and the reason for its existence still better if carrying our analysis still farther and substituting for the religious symbols the realities which they represent, we investigate how these behave in the right. If, as we have attempted to establish, the sacred principle is nothing more nor less than society transfigured and personified, it should be possible to interpret the ritual in lay and social terms. And, as a matter of fact, social life, just like the ritual, moves in a circle. On the one hand, the individual gets from society the best part of himself, all that gives him a distinct character and a special place among other beings, his intellectual and moral culture. If we should withdraw from men their language, sciences, arts and moral beliefs, they would drop to the rank of animals. So the characteristic attributes of human nature come from society. But, on the other hand, society exists and lives only in and through individuals. If the idea of society were extinguished in individual minds and the beliefs, traditions and aspirations of the group were no longer felt and shared by the individuals, society would die. We can say of it what we just said of the divinity, it is real only in so far as it has a place in human consciousnesses, and this place is whatever one we may give it. We now see the real reason why the gods cannot do without their worshippers any more than these can do without their gods. It is because society, of which the gods are only a symbolic expression, cannot do without individuals any more than these can do without society. Here we touch the solid rock upon which all the cults are built and which has caused their persistence ever since human societies have existed. When we see what religious rites consist of and towards what they seem to tend, we demand with astonishment how men have been able to imagine them, and especially how they can remain so faithfully attached to them. Whence could the illusion have come that with a few grains of sand thrown to the wind, or a few drops of blood shed upon a rock or the stone of an altar, it is possible to maintain the life of an animal species or of a god? We have undoubtedly made a, page 348, step in advance towards the solution of this problem when we have discovered, behind these outward and apparently unreasonable movements, a mental mechanism which gives them a meaning and a moral significance. But we are in no way assured that this mechanism itself does not consist in a simple play of hallucinatory images. 
We have pointed out the psychological process which leads the believers to imagine that the right causes the spiritual forces of which they have need to be reborn about them. But it does not follow from the fact that this belief is psychologically explicable that it has any objective value. If we are to see in the efficacy attributed to the rites anything more than the product of a chronic delirium with which humanity has abused itself, we must show that the effect of the cult really is to recreate periodically a moral being upon which we depend as it depends upon us. Now this being does exist, it is society. Howsoever little importance the religious ceremonies may have, they put the group into action, the groups assemble to celebrate them. So their first effect is to bring individuals together, to multiply the relations between them and to make them more intimate with one another. By this very fact, the contents of their consciousnesses is changed. On ordinary days, it is utilitarian and individual avocations which take the greater part of the attention. Everyone attends to his own personal business. For most men, this primarily consists in satisfying the exigencies of material life, and the principal incentive to economic activity has always been private interest. Of course social sentiments could never be totally absent. We remain in relations with others, the habits, ideas and tendencies which education has impressed upon us and which ordinarily preside over our relations with others, continue to make their action felt. But they are constantly combated and held in check by the antagonistic tendencies aroused and supported by the necessities of the daily struggle. They resist more or less successfully, according to their intrinsic energy, but this energy is not renewed. They live upon their past, and consequently they would be used up in the course of time, if nothing returned to them a little of the force that they lose through these incessant conflicts and frictions. When the Australians, scattered in little groups, spend their time in hunting and fishing, they lose sight of what concerns their clan or tribe, their only thought is to catch as much game as possible. On feast days, on the contrary, these preoccupations are necessarily eclipsed, being essentially profane, they are excluded from these sacred periods. At this time, their thoughts are centered upon their common beliefs, their common traditions, the memory of their great, page 349, ancestors, the collective ideal of which they are the incarnation, in a word, upon social things. Even the material interests which these great religious ceremonies are designed to satisfy concern the public order and are therefore social. Society as a whole is interested that the harvest be abundant, that the rain fall at the right time and not excessively, that the animals reproduce regularly. So it is society that is in the foreground of every consciousness. It dominates and directs all conduct, this is equivalent to saying that it is more living and active, and consequently more real, than in profane times. So men do not deceive themselves when they feel at this time that there is something outside of them which is born again, that there are forces which are reanimated and a life which reawakens. This renewal is in no way imaginary and the individuals themselves profit from it. For the spark of a social being which each bears within him necessarily participates in this collective renovation. The individual soul is regenerated too, by being dipped again in the source from which its life comes, consequently it feels itself stronger, more fully master of itself, less dependent upon physical necessities. We know that the positive cult naturally tends to take periodic forms, this is one of its distinctive features. Of course there are rites which men celebrate occasionally, in connection with passing situations. But these episodic practices are always merely accessory, and in the religion studied in this book, they are almost exceptional. The essential constituent of the cult is the cycle of feasts which return regularly at determined epochs. We are now able to understand whence this tendency towards periodicity comes, the rhythm which the religious life follows only expresses the rhythm of the social life, and results from it. Society is able to revivify the sentiment it has of itself only by assembling. But it cannot be assembled all the time. The exigencies of life do not allow it to remain in congregation indefinitely. So it scatters, to assemble anew when it again feels the need of this. It is to these necessary alternations that the regular alternations of sacred and profane times correspond. Since the apparent object, at least, of the cult was at first to regularize the course of natural phenomena, 
the rhythm of the cosmic life has put its mark on the rhythm of the ritual life. This is why the feasts have long been associated with the seasons, we have seen this characteristic already in the Antikyoma of Australia. But the seasons have only furnished the outer framework for this organization, and not the principle upon which it rests, for even the cults which aim at exclusively spiritual ends have remained periodical. So this periodicity, page 350, must be due to other causes. Since the seasonal changes are critical periods for nature, they are a natural occasion for assembling, and consequently for religious ceremonies. But other events can and have successfully fulfilled this function of occasional cause. However, it must be recognized that this framework, though purely external, has given proof of a singular resistive force, for traces of it are found even in the religions which are the most fully detached from all physical bases. Many Christian celebrations are founded, with no break of continuity, on the pastoral and agrarian feasts of the ancient Hebrews, although in themselves they are neither pastoral nor agrarian. Moreover, this rhythm is capable of varying in different societies. Where the period of dispersion is long, and the dispersion itself is extreme, the period of congregation, in its turn, is very prolonged, and produces veritable debauches of collective and religion's life. Feasts succeed one another for weeks or even for months, while the ritual life sometimes attains to a sort of frenzy. This is what happens among the Australian tribes and many of the tribes of northwestern America. Elsewhere, on the contrary, these two phases of the social life succeed one another after shorter intervals, and then the contrast between them is less marked. The more societies develop, the less they seem to allow of two great intermittences. Page 351. Chapter 3. The Positive Cult, Continued. 2. Dot, imitative Rites and the Principle of Causality. But the processes which we have just been describing are not the only ones employed to assure the fecundity of the totemic species. There are others which serve for the same end, whether they accompany the preceding ones or replace them. I. In the very ceremonies which we have been describing, in addition to the oblations, whether bloody or otherwise, there are other rites which are frequently celebrated, whose object is to complete the former ones and to consolidate their effects. They consist in movements and cries whose object is to imitate the different attitudes and aspects of the animal whose reproduction is desired, therefore, we shall call them imitative. Thus the Antikyoma of the Wichity Grub among the Arunta includes more than the rites performed upon the sacred rocks, of which we have already spoken. When these are finished, the men set out to return to camp. But when they still are about a mile away, they halt and all decorate themselves ritually, after this, the march is resumed. The decorations with which they thus adorn themselves announce that an important ceremony is going to take place. And, in fact, while the company was absent, one of the old men who had been left to guard the camp had built a shelter out of branches, called Umbana, which represented the chrysalis out of which the insect comes. All of those who had taken part in the previous ceremonies assemble near the spot where this construction has been raised, then they advance slowly, stopping from time to time, until they reach the Umbana, which they enter. At once all the men who do not belong to the freightry of the Wichity Grub Totem, and who assist at the scene, though from a distance, lie down on the ground, with their faces against the earth. They must remain in this position without moving until they are allowed to get up, page 352, again. Meanwhile, a chant arises from the interior of the Umbana, which describes the different phases through which the animal passes in the course of its development, and the myths of which the sacred rocks are the subject. When this hymn ceases, the Alatunja glides out of the Umbana, though remaining in a squatting position, and advances slowly over the ground before him. He is followed by all his companions who reproduce gestures whose evident object is to represent the insect as it leaves the chrysalis. Also, a hymn which is heard at just this moment and which is like an oral commentary on the right, consists in a description of the movements made by the insect at this stage of its development. Another in Tikiyoma, celebrated in connection with another kind of grub, the Unchaka grub, has this character still more clearly. The actors of this rite decorate themselves with designs representing the unchaka bush upon which this grub lives at the beginning of its existence. Then they cover a buckler with concentric circles of down, 
representing another kind of bush upon which the insect lays its eggs when it has become adult. When all these preparations are finished, they all sit down on the ground in a semicircle facing the principal officiant. He alternately bends his body double by leaning towards the ground and then rises on his knees. At the same time, he shakes his stretched out arms, which is a way of representing the wings of the insect. From time to time, he leans over the buckler, imitating the way in which the butterfly flies over the trees where it lays its eggs. When this ceremony is finished, another commences at a different spot, to which they go in silence. This time they use two bucklers. Upon one the tracks of the grub are represented by zigzag lines. Upon the other, concentric circles of uneven dimensions represent the eggs of the insect and the seed of the eremophile bush, upon which it is nourished. As in the former ceremony, they all sit down in silence while the officiant acts, representing the movements of the animal when leaving its chrysalis and taking its first flight. Spencer and Gillen also point out certain analogous facts among the Arunta, though these are of a minor importance, in the Antichioma of the Emu, for example. At a certain moment the actors try to reproduce by their attitude the air and aspect of this bird. In the Antichioma of Water, the men of the totem, page 353, utter the characteristic cry of the plover, a cry which is naturally associated in the mind with the rainy season. But in all, the examples of imitative rites which these two explorers have noted are rather few in number. However, it is certain that their relative silence on this point is due either to their not having observed the Antichioma sufficiently or else to their having neglected this side of the ceremonies. Scholes, on the other hand, has been struck by the essentially imitative nature of the Arunta rites. The sacred Korobori, he says, are generally ceremonies representing animals, he calls them animal churunga and his testimony is now confirmed by the documents collected by Strello. The examples given by this latter author are so numerous that it is impossible to cite them all, there are scarcely any ceremonies in which some imitating gesture is not pointed out. According to the nature of the animals whose feast is celebrated, they jump after the manner of kangaroos, or imitate the movements they make in eating, the flight of winged ants, the characteristic noise of the bat, the cry of the wild turkey, the hissing of the snake, the croaking of the frog, etc. When the totem is a plant, they make the gesture of plucking it, or eating it, etc. Among the Waramunga, the Antichioma generally takes a special form, which we shall describe in the next chapter and which differs from those which we have studied up to the present. However, there is one typical case of a purely imitative Antichioma among this people, it is that of the black cockatoo. The ceremony described by Spencer and Gillen commenced at ten o'clock in the evening. All night long the chief of the clan imitated the cry of the bird with a disheartening monotony. He stopped only when he had come to the end of his force, and then his son replaced him, then he commenced again as soon as he felt a little refreshed. These exhausting exercises continued until morning without interruption. Living beings are not the only ones which they try to imitate. In a large number of tribes, the antichioma of rain consists essentially in imitative rites. One of the most simple of these is that celebrated among the Arabana. The chief of the clan is seated on the ground, all covered with white down and holding a lance in his hands. He shakes himself, undoubtedly in order to detach from his body the down which is fixed there and which represents clouds when scattered about in the air. Thus he imitates the men clouds of the Alcharinga who, according to, page 354, the legend, had the habit of ascending to heaven and forming clouds there, from which the rain then fell. In a word, the object of the whole rite is to represent the formation and ascension of clouds, the bringers of rain. The ceremony is much more complicated among the Kadesh. We have already spoken of one of the means employed, the officiant pours water over the sacred stones and himself. But the action of this sort of ablation is reinforced by other rites. The rainbow is considered to have a close connection with rain, they say that it is its sun and that it is always urged to appear to make the rain stop. To make the rain fall, it is therefore necessary that it should not appear. They believe that this result can be obtained in the following manner. A design representing a rainbow is made upon a buckler. They carry this buckler to camp, 
taking care to keep it hidden from all eyes. They are convinced that by making this image of the rainbow invisible, they keep the rainbow itself from appearing. Meanwhile, the chief of the clan, having beside him a pit chief full of water, throws in all directions flakes of down which represent clouds. Repeated imitations of the cry of the plover complete this ceremony, which seems to have an especial gravity. For as long as it lasts, all those who participate in it, either as actors or assistants, may have no relations whatsoever with their wives, they may not even speak to them. The processes of figuration are different among the diary. Rain is not represented by water, but by blood, which the men cause to flow from their veins on to the assistants. At the same time they throw handfuls of white down about, which represent clouds. A hut has been constructed previously, in which they now place two large stones representing piles of clouds, a sign of rain. After they have been left there for a little while, they are carried a little distance away and placed as high as possible in the loftiest tree to be found, this is a way of making the clouds mount into the sky. Powdered gypsum is then thrown into a water hole, for when he sees this, the rain spirit soon makes the clouds appear. Finally all the men, young and old, assemble around the hut and with heads lowered, they charge upon it. They rush violently through it, repeating the operation several times, until nothing remains of the whole construction except, page 355, the supporting posts. Then they fall upon these and shake and pull at them until the whole thing has tumbled down. The operation consisting in running through the hut is supposed to represent clouds bursting, the tumbling down of the construction, the fall of rain. In the northwestern tribes studied by Clement, which occupy the district included between the Fontescue and Fitzroy rivers, certain ceremonies are celebrated whose object is exactly the same as that of the Antikioma of the Arunta, and which seem to be, for the most part, essentially imitative. These peoples give the name Tarlo to certain piles of stones which are evidently sacred, for, as we shall see, they are the object of important rites. Every animal, every plant, and in fact, every totem or subtotem, is represented by a tarlo which a special clan guards. The analogy between these tarlo and the sacred rocks of the Arunta is easily seen. When kangaroos, for example, become rare, the chief of the clan to which the tarlo of the kangaroo belongs goes to it with a certain number of companions. Here various rites are performed, the chief of which consist in jumping around the tarlo as kangaroos jump, in drinking as they drink and, in a word, in imitating all their most characteristic movements. The weapons used in hunting the animal have an important part in these rites. They brandish them, throw them against the stones, etc. When they are concerned for emus, they go to the tarlo of the emu, and walk and run as these birds do. The skill which the natives show in these imitations is, as it appears, really remarkable. Other tarlo are consecrated to plants, such as the cereals. In this case, they imitate the actions of threshing and grinding the grain. Since in ordinary life it is the women who are normally charged with these tasks, it is also they who perform the rite, in the midst of songs and dances. 2. All these rites belong to the same type. The principle upon which they rest is one of those at the basis of what is commonly and incorrectly called sympathetic magic, page 356. These principles are ordinarily reduced to two. The first may be stated thus, anything touching an object also touches everything which has any relation of proximity or unity whatsoever with this object. Thus, whatever affects the part also affects the whole. Any action exercised over an individual is transmitted to his neighbors, relatives, and all those to whom he is united in any way. All these cases are simple applications of the law of contagion, which we have already studied. A condition or a good or bad quality are communicated contagiously from one subject to another who has some connection with the former. The second principle is ordinarily summed up in the formula, like produces like. The representation of a being or condition produces this being or condition. This is the maxim which brings about the rights which we have just been describing, and it is in them that we can best observe its characteristics. The classical example of the magic charm, which is ordinarily given as the typical application of this same precept, is much less significant. 
the charm is, to a large extent, a simple phenomenon of transfer. The idea of the image is associated in the mind with that of the model, consequently the effects of an action performed upon a statue are transmitted contagiously to the person whose traits it reproduces. The function of the image is for its original what that of a part is for the whole, it is an agent of transmission. Therefore men think that they can obtain the same result by burning the hair of the person whom they wish to injure, the only difference between these two sorts of operations is that in one, the communication is made through similarity, while in the other it is by means of contiguity. It is different with the rights which concern us. They suppose not only the displacement of a given condition or quality, which passes from one object into the other, but also the creation of something entirely new. The mere act of representing the animal gives birth to this animal and creates it, by imitating the sound of wind or falling water, they cause clouds to form, rain to fall, etc. Of course resemblance plays an important part in each case, but not at all the same one. In a charm, it only gives a special direction to the action exercised, it directs in a certain way an action not originating in it. In the rites of which we have just been speaking, it acts by itself and is directly efficacious. So, in contradiction to the usual definitions, the real difference between the two principles of the so-called sympathetic magic and the corresponding practices is not that, page 357, it is contiguity acts in one case and resemblance in the other. But that in the former there is a simple contagious communication, while there is production and creation in the latter. The explanation of imitative rights therefore implies the explanation of the second of these principles, and reciprocally. We shall not tarry long to discuss the explanation proposed by the anthropological school, and especially by Tyler and Fraser. Just as in their attempts to account for the contagiousness of a sacred character, they invoke the association of ideas. Homeopathic magic, says Fraser, who prefers this expression to imitative magic, is founded on the association of ideas by similarity, contagious magic is founded on the association of ideas by contiguity. Homeopathic magic commits the mistake of assuming that things which resemble each other are the same. But this is a misunderstanding of the special nature of the practices under discussion. On the one hand, the formula of Fraser may be applied with some fitness to the case of charms. Here, in fact, two distinct things are associated with each other, owing to their partial resemblance, these are the image and the model which it represents more or less systematically. But in the imitative rites, which we have just been observing, the image alone is given, as for the model, it does not exist, for the new generation of the totemic species is as yet only a hope and even an uncertain hope at that. So there could be no question of association, whether correct or not, there is a real creation, and we cannot see how the association of ideas could possibly lead to a belief in this creation. How could the mere act of representing the movements of an animal bring about the certitude that this animal will be born, and born in abundance? The general properties of human nature cannot explain such special practices. So instead of considering the principle upon which they rest in its general and abstract form, let us replace it in the environment of which it is a part and where we have been observing it. And let us connect it with the system of ideas and sentiments which the above rites put into practice, and then we shall be better able to perceive the causes from which it results. The men who assemble on the occasion of these rites believe that they are really animals or plants of the species whose name, page 358, they bear. They feel within them an animal or vegetable nature, and in their eyes, this is what constitutes whatever is the most essential and the most excellent in them. So when they assemble, their first movement ought to be to show each other this quality which they attribute to themselves and by which they are defined. The totem is their rallying sign. For this reason, as we have seen, they design it upon their bodies, but it is no less natural that they should seek to resemble it in their gestures, their cries, their attitude. Since they are emus or kangaroos, they comport themselves like the animals of the same name. By this means, they mutually show one another that they are all members of the same moral community and they become conscious of the kinship uniting them. The right does not limit itself to expressing this kinship, it makes it or remakes it. For it exists only in so far as it is believed in, and the effect of all these collective demonstrations is to support the beliefs upon which they are founded. 
Therefore, these leaps, these cries and these movements of every sort, though bizarre and grotesque in appearance, really have a profound and human meaning. The Australian seeks to resemble his totem just as the faithful in more advanced religions seek to resemble their god. For the one as for the other, this is a means of communicating with the sacred being, that is to say, with the collective ideal which this latter symbolizes. This is an early form of the Muamicron Omega Sigma Iota Tau Theta Epsilon. However, as this first reason is connected with the most specialized portions of the totemic beliefs, the principle by which like produces like should not have survived totemism, if this had been the only one in operation. Now there is probably no religion in which rights derived from it are not found. So another reason must cooperate with this first one. And, in fact, the ceremonies where we have seen it applied do not merely have the very general object which we have just mentioned, howsoever essential this may be. They also aim at a more immediate and more conscious end, which is the assurance of the reproduction of the totemic species. The idea of this necessary reproduction haunts the minds of the worshippers, upon it the forces of their attention and will are concentrated. Now a single preoccupation cannot possess a group of men to this point without being externalized in a material form. Since all think of the animal or plant to whose destinies the clan is united, it is inevitable that this common thought should not be manifested outwardly by gestures. And those naturally designated for this office are those which represent this animal or plant in one of its most characteristic attitudes. There are no other movements, page 359, so close to the idea filling every mind, for these are an immediate and almost automatic translation of it. So they make themselves imitate the animal, they cry like it, they jump like it. They reproduce the scenes in which they make daily use of the plant. All these ways of representation are just so many means of ostensibly showing the end towards which all minds are directed, of telling the thing which they wish to realize, of calling it up and of evoking it. And this need belongs to no one time, nor does it depend upon the beliefs of any special religion, it is essentially human. This is why, even in religions very far removed from those we have been studying, the worshippers, when assembled to ask their gods for some event which they ardently desire, are forced to figure it. Of course, the word is also a way of expressing it, but the gesture is no less natural, it bursts out from the organism just as spontaneously, it even precedes the word, or, in any case, accompanies it. But if we can thus understand how the gestures acquired a place in the ceremony, we still must explain the efficacy attributed to them. If the Australian repeats them regularly each new season, it is because he believes them essential to the success of the rite. Where could he have gotten the idea that by imitating an animal, one causes it to reproduce? So manifest an error seems hardly intelligible so long as we see in the rite only the material end towards which it seems to aim. But we know that in addition to the effect which it is thought to have on the totemic species, it also exercises a profound influence over the souls of the worshippers who take part in it. They take away with them a feeling of well-being, whose causes they cannot clearly see, but which is well-founded. They feel that the ceremony is good for them, and, as a matter of fact, they reforge their moral nature in it. How could this sort of well-being fail to give them a feeling that the right has succeeded, that it has been what it set out to be, and that it has attained the ends at which it was aimed? As the only end which was consciously sought was the reproduction of the totemic species, this seems to be assured by the means employed, the efficacy of which is thus proven. Thus it comes about that men attribute creative virtues to their gestures, which in themselves are vain. The moral efficacy of the right, which is real, leads to the belief in its physical efficacy, which is imaginary. That of the whole, to the belief in that of each part by itself. The truly useful effects produced by the whole ceremony are like an experimental justification of the elementary practices out of which it is made, though in reality, all these practices are in no way indispensable to its success. A certain proof, moreover, that they do not act, page 360, by themselves is that they may be replaced by others, of a very different nature, without any modification of the final result. It appears that there are intikiuma which include only ablations, with no imitative rites, others are purely imitative, and include no ablations. However, 
both are believed to have the same efficacy. So if a price is attached to these various maneuvers, it is not because of their intrinsic value, but because they are a part of a complex right, whose utility as a whole is realized. We are able to understand this state of mind all the easier because we can still observe it about us. Especially among the most cultivated peoples and environments, we frequently meet with believers who, though having doubts as to the special efficacy attributed by dogma to each rite considered separately, still continue to participate in the cult. They are not sure that the details of the prescribed observances are rationally justifiable, but they feel that it would be impossible to free oneself of them without falling into a moral confusion before which they recoil. The very fact that in them the faith has lost its intellectual foundations throws into eminence the profound reasons upon which they rest. This is why the easy criticisms to which an unduly simple rationalism has sometimes submitted ritual prescriptions generally leave the believer indifferent, it is because the true justification of religious practices does not lie in the apparent ends which they pursue, but rather in the invisible action which they exercise over the mind and in the way in which they affect our mental status. Likewise, when preachers undertake to convince, they devote much less attention to establishing directly and by methodical proofs the truth of any particular proposition or the utility of such and such an observance. Then to awakening or reawakening the sentiment of the moral comfort attained by the regular celebration of the cult. Thus they create a predisposition to belief, which precedes proofs, which leads the mind to overlook the insufficiency of the logical reasons, and which thus prepares it for the proposition whose acceptance is desired. This favorable prejudice, this impulse towards believing, is just what constitutes faith, and it is faith which makes the authority of the rites, according to the believer, whoever he may be, Christian or Australian. The only superiority of the former is that he better accounts for the psychological process from which his faith results, he knows that, it is faith that saves. It is because faith has this origin that it is, in a sense, impermeable to experience. If the intermittent failures of the Antikyuma do not shake the confidence of the Australian in his, page 361, right, it is because he holds with all the strength of his soul to these practices in which he periodically recreates himself. He could not deny their principle without causing an upheaval of his own being, which resists. But howsoever great this force of resistance may be, it cannot radically distinguish religious mentality from the other forms of human mentality, even those which are the most habitually opposed to it. In this connection, that of a scholar differs from the preceding only in degree. When a scientific law has the authority of numerous and varied experiments, it is against all method to renounce it too quickly upon the discovery of a fact which seems to contradict it. It is still necessary to make sure that the fact does not allow of a single interpretation, and that it is impossible to account for it, without abandoning the proposition which it seems to invalidate. Now the Australian does not proceed otherwise when he attributes the failure of the Antikyoma to some sorcery, or the abundance of a premature crop to a mystic Antikyoma celebrated in the beyond. He has all the more reason for not doubting his right on the belief in a contrary fact, since its value is, or seems to be, established by a larger number of harmonizing facts. In the first place, the moral efficacy of the ceremony is real and is felt directly by all who participate in it, there is a constantly renewed experience in it, whose importance no contradictory experience can diminish. Also, the physical efficacy itself is not unable to find an at least apparent confirmation in the data of objective observation. As a matter of fact, the totemic species normally does reproduce regularly. So in the great majority of cases, everything happens just as if the ritual gestures really did produce the effects expected of them. Failures are the exception. As the rites, and especially those which are periodical, demand nothing more of nature than that it follow its ordinary course, it is not surprising that it should generally have the air of obeying them. So if the believer shows himself indocile to certain lessons of experience, he does so because of other experiences which seem more demonstrative. The scholar does not do otherwise, only he introduces more method. So magic is not, as Fraser has held, an original fact, of which religion is only a derived form. Quite on the contrary, it was under the influence of religious ideas that the precepts upon which the art of the magician is based were established, 
and it was only through a secondary extension that they were applied to purely lay relations. Since all the forces of the universe have been conceived on the model of the sacred forces, the, page 362, contagiousness inherent in the second was extended to the first. And men have believed that all the properties of a body could be transmitted contagiously. Likewise, when the principle according to which like produces like had been established, in order to satisfy certain religious needs, it detached itself from its ritual origins to become, through a sort of spontaneous generalization, a law of nature. But in order to understand these fundamental axioms of magic, they must be replaced in the religious atmosphere in which they arose and which alone enables us to account for them. When we regard them as the work of isolated individuals or solitary magicians, we ask how they could ever have occurred to the mind of man, for nothing in experience could either suggest or verify them. And especially we do not explain how so deceiving an art has been able to impose itself for so long a time in the confidence of men. But this problem disappears when we realize that the faith inspired by magic is only a particular case of religious faith in general, and that it is itself the product, at least indirectly, of a collective effervescence. This is as much as to say that the use of the expression sympathetic magic to designate the system of rights which we have just been speaking is not very exact. There are sympathetic rights, but they are not peculiar to magic. Not only are they to be found in religion, but it was from religion that magic received them. So we only risk confusion when, by the name we give them, we have the air of making them something which is specifically magic. The results of our analysis thus attached themselves to and confirmed those attained by M.M. M. Hubert and Moss when they studied magic directly. They have shown that this is nothing more nor less than crude industry based on incomplete science. Behind the mechanisms, purely lycal in appearance, which are used by the magician, they point out a background of religious conceptions and a whole world of forces, the idea of which has been taken by magic from religion. We are now able to understand how it comes that magic is so full of religious elements, it is because it was born of religion. 3. But the principle which has just been set forth does not merely have a function in the ritual. It is of direct interest for the theory, page 363, of knowledge. In fact, it is a concrete statement of the law of causality and, in all probability, one of the most primitive statements of it which has ever existed. A full conception of the causal relation is implied in the power thus attributed to the like to produce the like. And this conception dominates primitive thought, for it is the basis both of the practices of the cult and the technique of the magician. So the origins of the precept upon which the imitative rites depend are able to clarify those of the principle of causality. The genesis of one should aid us in understanding the genesis of the other. Now we have shown how the former is a product of social causes, it was elaborated by groups having collective ends in view, and it translates collective sentiments. So we may assume that the same is true for the second. In fact, an analysis of the principle of causality is sufficient to assure us that the diverse elements of which it is composed really did have this origin. The first thing which is implied in the notion of the causal relation is the idea of efficacy, of productive power, of active force. By cause we ordinarily mean something capable of producing a certain change. The cause is the force before it has shown the power which is in it, the effect is this same power, only actualized. Men have always thought of causality in dynamic terms. Of course certain philosophers have refused all objective value to this conception, they see in it only an arbitrary construction of the imagination, which corresponds to nothing in the things themselves. But, at present, we have no need of asking whether it is founded in reality or not, it is enough for us to state that it exists and that it constitutes and always has constituted an element of ordinary mentality. And this is recognized even by those who criticize it. Our immediate purpose is to seek, not what it may be worth logically, but how it is to be explained. Now it depends upon social causes. Our analysis of facts has already enabled us to see that the prototype of the idea of force was the mana, wakan, orenda, the totemic principle or any of the various names given to collective force objectified and projected into things. The first power which men have thought of as such seems to have been that exercised by humanity over its members. Thus reason confirms the results of observation. 
In fact, it is even possible to show why this notion of power, efficacy or active force could not have come from any other source. In the first place, it is evident and recognized by all that it could not be furnished to us by external experience. Our senses, page 364, only enable us to perceive phenomena which coexist or which follow one another. But nothing perceived by them could give us the idea of this determining and compelling action which is characteristic of what we call a power or force. They can touch only realized and known conditions, each separate from the others, the internal process uniting these conditions escapes them. Nothing that we learn could possibly suggest to us the idea of what an influence or efficaciousness is. It is for this very reason that the philosophers of empiricism have regarded these different conceptions as so many mythological aberrations. But even supposing that they all are hallucinations, it is still necessary to show how they originated. If external experience counts for nothing in the origin of these ideas, and it is equally inadmissible that they were given us ready-made, one might suppose that they come from internal experience. In fact, the notion of force obviously includes many spiritual elements which could only have been taken from our psychic life. Some have believed that the act by which our will brings a deliberation to a close, restrains our impulses and commands our organism, might have served as the model of this construction. In willing, it is said, we perceive ourselves directly as a power in action. So when this idea had once occurred to men, it seems that they only had to extend it to things to establish the conception of force. As long as the animist theory passed as a demonstrated truth, this explanation was able to appear to be confirmed by history. If the forces with which human thought primitively populated the world really had been spirits, that is to say, personal and conscious beings more or less similar to men, it was actually possible to believe that our individual experience was enough to furnish us with the constituent elements of the notion of force. But we know that the first forces which men imagined were, on the contrary, anonymous, vague and diffused powers which resemble cosmic forces in their impersonality, and which are therefore most sharply contrasted with the eminently personal power. The human will. So it is impossible that they should have been conceived in its image. Moreover, there is one essential characteristic of the impersonal forces which would be inexplicable under this hypothesis, this is their communicability. The forces of nature have always been thought of as capable of passing from one object to another, of mixing, combining and transforming themselves into one another. It is even this property which gives them their value as an explanation, for it is through this that effects can be, page 365, connected with their causes without a break of continuity. Now the self has just the opposite characteristic, it is incommunicable. It cannot change its material substratum or spread from one to another, it spreads out in metaphor only. So the way in which it decides and executes its decisions could never have suggested the idea of an energy which communicates itself and which can even confound itself with others and, through these combinations and mixings, give rise to new effects. Therefore, the idea of force, as implied in the conception of the causal relation, must present a double character. In the first place, it can come only from our internal experience. The only forces which we can directly learn about are necessarily moral forces. But, at the same time, they must be impersonal, for the notion of an impersonal power was the first to be constituted. Now the only ones which satisfy these two conditions are those coming from life together, they are collective forces. In fact, these are, on the one hand, entirely psychical, they are made up exclusively of objectified ideas and sentiments. But, on the other hand, they are impersonal by definition, for they are the product of a cooperation. Being the work of all, they are not the possession of anybody in particular. They are so slightly attached to the personalities of the subjects in whom they reside that they are never fixed there. Just as they enter them from without, they are also always ready to leave them. Of themselves, they tend to spread further and further and to invade ever new domains, we know that there are none more contagious, and consequently more communicable. Of course physical forces have the same property, but we cannot know this directly, we cannot even become acquainted with them as such, for they are outside us. When I throw myself against an obstacle, I have a sensation of hindrance and trouble. 
But the force causing this sensation is not in me, but in the obstacle, and is consequently outside the circle of my perception. We perceive its effects, but we cannot reach the cause itself. It is otherwise with social forces, they are a part of our internal life, as we know, more than the products of their action, we see them acting. The force isolating the sacred being and holding profane beings at a distance is not really in this being, it lives in the minds of the believers. So they perceive it at the very moment when it is acting upon their wills, to inhibit certain movements or command others. In a word, this constraining and necessitating action, which escapes us when coming from an external object, is readily perceptible here because everything is inside us. Of course we do not always interpret it in an adequate manner, but at least we cannot fail to be conscious of it, page 366. Moreover, the idea of force bears the mark of its origin in an apparent way. In fact, it implies the idea of power which, in its turn, does not come without those of ascendancy, mastership and domination, and their corollaries, dependence and subordination, now the relations expressed by all these ideas are eminently social. It is society which classifies beings into superiors and inferiors, into commanding masters and obeying servants, it is society which confers upon the former the singular property which makes the command efficacious and which makes power. So everything tends to prove that the first powers of which the human mind had any idea were those which societies have established in organizing themselves, it is in their image that the powers of the physical world have been conceived. Also, men have never succeeded in imagining themselves as forces mistress over the bodies in which they reside, except by introducing concepts taken from social life. In fact, these must be distinguished from their physical doubles and must be attributed a dignity superior to that of these latter, in a word, they must think of themselves as souls. As a matter of fact, men have always given the form of souls to the forces which they believe that they are. But we know that the soul is quite another thing from a name given to the abstract faculty of moving, thinking and feeling. Before all, it is a religious principle, a particular aspect of the collective force. In fine, a man feels that he has a soul, and consequently a force, because he is a social being. Though an animal moves its members just as we do, and though it has the same power as we over its muscles, nothing authorizes us to suppose that it is conscious of itself as an active and efficacious cause. This is because it does not have, or, to speak more exactly, does not attribute to itself a soul. But if it does not attribute a soul to itself, it is because it does not participate in a social life comparable to that of men. Among animals, there is nothing resembling a civilization. But the notion of force is not all of the principle of causality. This consists in a judgment stating that every force develops in a definite manner, and that the state in which it is at each particular moment of its existence predetermines the next state. The former is called cause, the latter, effect, and the causal judgment affirms the existence of a necessary connection between these two moments for every force. The mind posits this connection before having any proofs of it, under the empire of a sort of constraint from which it cannot free itself, it postulates it, as they say, a priori. Page 367. Empiricism has never succeeded in accounting for this a priorism and necessity. Philosophers of this school have never been able to explain how an association of ideas, reinforced by habit, could produce more than an expectation or a stronger or weaker predisposition on the part of ideas to appear in a determined order. But the principle of causality has quite another character. It is not merely an imminent tendency of our thought to take certain forms, it is an external norm, superior to the flow of our representations, which it dominates and rules imperatively. It is invested with an authority which binds the mind and surpasses it, which is as much as to say that the mind is not its artisan. In this connection, it is useless to substitute hereditary habit for individual habit, for habit does not change its nature by lasting longer than one man's life, it is merely stronger. An instinct is not a rule. The rites which we have been studying allow us to catch a glimpse of another source of this authority, which, up to the present, has scarcely been suspected. Let us bear in mind how the law of causality, which the imitative rites put into practice, was born. Being filled with one single preoccupation, the group assembles, 
if the species whose name it bears does not reproduce, it is a matter of concern to the whole clan. The common sentiment thus animating all the members is outwardly expressed by certain gestures, which are always the same in the same circumstances, and after the ceremony has been performed, it happens, for the reason set forth. That the desired result seems obtained. So an association arises between the idea of this result and that of the gestures preceding it, and this association does not vary from one subject to another. It is the same for all the participators in the rite, since it is the product of a collective experience. However, if no other factor intervened, it would produce only a collective expectation. After the imitative gestures had been accomplished, everybody would await the subsequent appearance of the desired event, with more or less confidence, an imperative rule of thought could never be established by this. But since a social interest of the greatest importance is at stake, society cannot allow things to follow their own course at the whim of circumstances, it intervenes actively in such a way as to regulate their march in conformity with its needs. So it demands that this ceremony, which it cannot do without, be repeated every time that it is necessary, and consequently, that the movements, a condition of its success, be executed regularly, it imposes them as an obligation. Now they imply a certain definite state of mind which, in return, participates in this same obligatory character. To prescribe, page 368, that one must imitate an animal or plant to make them reproduce, is equivalent to stating it as an axiom which is above all doubt, that like produces like. Opinion cannot allow men to deny this principle in theory without also allowing them to violate it in their conduct. So society imposes it, along with the practices which are derived from it, and thus the ritual precept is doubled by a logical precept which is only the intellectual aspect of the former. The authority of each is derived from the same source, society. The respect which this inspires is communicated to the ways of thought to which it attaches a value, just as much as to ways of action. So a man cannot set aside either the ones or the others without hurling himself against public opinion. This is why the former require the adherence of the intelligence before examination, just as the latter require the submission of the will. From this example, we can show once more how the sociological theory of the idea of causality, and of the categories in general, sets aside the classical doctrines on the question, while conciliating them. Together with apriorism, it maintains the prejudicial and necessary character of the causal relation, but it does not limit itself to affirming this. It accounts for it, yet without making it vanish under the pretext of explaining it, as empiricism does. On the other hand, there is no question of denying the part due to individual experience. There can be no doubt that by himself, the individual observes the regular succession of phenomena and thus acquires a certain feeling of regularity. But this feeling is not the category of causality. The former is individual, subjective, incommunicable, we make it ourselves, out of our own personal observations. The second is the work of the group, and is given to us ready-made. It is a framework in which our empirical ascertainments arrange themselves and which enables us to think of them, that is to say, to see them from a point of view which makes it possible for us to understand one another in regard to them. Of course, if this frame can be applied to the contents, that shows that it is not out of relation with the matter which it contains, but it is not to be confused with this. It surpasses it and dominates it. This is because it is of a different origin. It is not a mere summary of individual experiences, before all else, it is made to fulfill the exigencies of life in common. In fine, the error of empiricism has been to regard the causal bond as merely an intellectual construction of speculative thought and the product of a more or less methodical generalization. Now, by itself, Pure speculation can give birth only to provisional, hypothetical and more or less plausible views, but ones which, page 369, must always be regarded with suspicion. For we can never be sure that some new observation in the future will not invalidate them. An axiom which the mind accepts and must accept, without control and without reservation, could never come from this source. Only the necessities of action, and especially of collective action, can and must express themselves in categorical formulae, which are peremptory in short and admit of no contradiction. 
for collective movements are possible only on condition of being in concert and, therefore, regulated and definite. They do not allow of any fumbling, the source of anarchy, by themselves, they tend towards an organization which, when once established, imposes itself upon individuals. And as action cannot go beyond intelligence, it frequently happens that the latter is drawn into the same way and accepts without discussion the theoretical postulates demanded by action. The imperatives of thought are probably only another side of the imperatives of action. It is to be borne in mind, moreover, that we have never dreamed of offering the preceding observations as a complete theory of the concept of causality. The question is too complex to be resolved thus. The principle of causality has been understood differently in different times and places, in a single society, it varies with the social environment and the kingdoms of nature to which it is applied. So it would be impossible to determine with sufficient precision the causes and conditions upon which it depends, after a consideration of only one of the forms which it has presented during the course of history. The views which we have set forth should be regarded as mere indications, which must be controlled and completed. However, as the causal law which we have been considering is certainly one of the most primitive which exists, and as it has played a considerable part in the development of human thought and industry, it is a privileged experiment. So we may presume that the remarks of which it has been the occasion may be generalized to a certain degree. Page 370. Chapter 4. The Positive Cult, Continued. 3. Representative or Commemorative Rights. The explanation which we have given of the positive rights of which we have been speaking in the two preceding chapters attributes to them a significance which is, above all, moral and social. The physical efficaciousness assigned to them by the believer is the product of an interpretation which conceals the essential reason for their existence, it is because they serve to remake individuals and groups morally that they are believed to have a power over things. But even if this hypothesis has enabled us to account for the facts, we cannot say that it has been demonstrated directly. At first view, it even seems to conciliate itself rather badly with the nature of the ritual mechanisms which we have analyzed. Whether they consist in ablations or imitative acts, the gestures composing them have purely material ends in view. They have, or seem to have, the sole object of making the totemic species reproduce. Under these circumstances, is it not surprising that their real function should be to serve moral ends? It is true that their physical function may have been exaggerated by Spencer and Gillen, even in the cases where it is the most incontestable. According to these authors, each clan celebrates its intikioma for the purpose of assuring a useful food to the other clans, and the whole cult consists in a sort of economic cooperation of the different totemic groups, each works for the others. But according to Strello, this conception of Australian totemism is wholly foreign to the native mind. If, he says, the members of one totemic group set themselves to multiplying the animals or plants of the consecrated species, and seem to work for their companions of other totems. We must be careful not to regard this collaboration as the fundamental principle of Arunta or Larija totemism. The blacks themselves have never told me that this was the object of their ceremonies. Of course, when I suggested, and, page 371, explained the idea to them, they understood it and acquiesced. But I should not be blamed for having some distrust of replies gained in this fashion. Strello also remarks that this way of interpreting the rite is contradicted by the fact that the totemic animals and plants are not all edible or useful. Some are good for nothing, some are even dangerous. So the ceremonies which concern them could not have any such end in view. When someone asks the natives what the determining reason for these ceremonies is, concludes our author, they are unanimous in replying, it is because our ancestors arranged things thus. This is why we do thus and not differently. But in saying that the right is observed because it comes from the ancestors, it is admitted that its authority is confounded with the authority of tradition, which is a social affair of the first order. Men celebrate it to remain faithful to the past, to keep for the group its normal physiognomy, and not because of the physical effects which it may produce. Thus, the way in which the believers themselves explain them show the profound reasons upon which the rites proceed. But there are cases when this aspect of the ceremonies is immediately apparent. 
I. These may be observed the best among the Waramunga. Among this people, each clan is thought to be descended from a single ancestor who, after having been born in some determined spot, passed his terrestrial existence in traveling over the country in every direction. It is he who, in the course of his voyages, gave to the land the form which it now has, it is he who made the mountains and plains, the waterholes and streams, etc. At the same time, he sowed upon his root living germs which were disengaged from his body and, after many successive reincarnations, became the actual members of the clan. Now the ceremony of the Waramunga which corresponds exactly to the Antikyoma of the Arunta, has the object of commemorating and representing the mythical history, page 372, of this ancestor. There is no question of oblations or, except in one single case, of imitative practices. The rite consists solely in recollecting the past and, in a way, making it present by means of a veritable dramatic representation. This word is the more exact because in this ceremony, the officiant is in no way considered an incarnation of the ancestor, whom he represents, he is an actor playing a role. As an example, let us describe the Antikyoma of the Black Snake, as Spencer and Gillen observed it. An initial ceremony does not seem to refer to the past. At least the description of it which is given us gives no authorization for interpreting it in this sense. It consists in running and leaping on the part of two officiants, who are decorated with designs representing the black snake. When they finally fall exhausted on the ground, the assistants gently pass their hands over the emblematic designs with which the backs of the two actors are covered. They say that this act pleases the black snake. It is only afterwards that the series of commemorative ceremonies commences. They put into action the mythical history of the ancestor Thalawala, from the moment he emerged from the ground up to his definite return thither. They follow him through all his voyages. The myth says that in each of the localities where he sojourned, he celebrated totemic ceremonies, they now repeat them in the same order in which they are supposed to have taken place originally. The movement which is acted the most frequently consists in twisting the entire body about rhythmically and violently, this is because the ancestor did the same thing to make the germs of life which were in him come out. The actors have their bodies covered with down, which is detached and flies away during these movements, this is a way of representing the flight of these mystic germs and their dispersion into space. It will be remembered that among the Arunta, the scene of the ceremony is determined by the ritual, it is the spot where the sacred rocks, trees and waterholes are found, and the worshippers must go there to celebrate the cult. Among the Waramunga, on the contrary, the ceremonial ground is arbitrarily chosen according to convenience. It is a conventional scene. However, the original scene of the events whose reproduction constitutes the theme of the rite is itself represented by, page 373, means of designs. Sometimes these designs are made upon the very bodies of the actors. For example, a small circle colored red, painted on the back and stomach, represents a waterhole. In other cases, the image is traced on the soil. Upon a ground previously soaked and covered with red ochre, they draw curved lines, made up of a series of white points, which symbolize a stream or a mountain. This is a beginning of decoration. In addition to the properly religious ceremonies which the ancestor is believed to have celebrated long ago, they also represent simple episodes of his career, either epic or comic. Thus, at a given moment, while three actors are on the scene, occupied in an important rite, another one hides behind a bunch of trees situated at some distance. A packet of down is attached about his neck which represents a wallaby. As soon as the principal ceremony is finished, an old man traces a line upon the ground which is directed towards the spot where the fourth actor is hidden. The others march behind him, with eyes lowered and fixed upon this line, as though following a trail. When they discover the man, they assume a stupefied air and one of them beats him with a club. This represents an incident in the life of the great black snake. One day, his son went hunting, caught a wallaby and ate it without giving his father any. The latter followed his tracks, surprised him and forced him to disgorge. It is to this that the beating at the end of the representation alludes. We shall not relate here all the mythical events which are represented successively. 
The preceding examples are sufficient to show the character of these ceremonies, they are dramas, but of a particular variety, they act, or at least they are believed to act, upon the course of nature. When the commemoration of Thalawala is terminated, the Waramunga are convinced that black snakes cannot fail to increase and multiply. So these dramas are rites, and even rites which, by the nature of their efficacy, are comparable on every point to those which constitute the Antikyoma of the Arunta. Therefore each is able to clarify the other. It is even more legitimate to compare them than if there were no break of continuity between them. Not only is the end pursued identical in each case, but the most characteristic part of the Waramunga ritual is found in germ in the other. In fact, the Antikyoma, as the Arunta generally perform it, contains within it a sort of implicit commemoration. The places where it is celebrated are necessarily those which the ancestor made illustrious. The roads over which the worshippers pass in the course of their pious, page 374, pilgrimages are those which the heroes of the Alcharinga traversed. The places where they stop to proceed with the rites are those where their fathers sojourned themselves, where they vanished into the ground, etc. So everything brings their memory to the minds of the assistants. Moreover, to the manual rites they frequently add hymns relating the exploits of their ancestors. If, instead of being told, these stories are acted, and if, in this new form, they develop in such a way as to become an essential part of the ceremony, then we have the ceremony of the Waramunga. But even more can be said, for on one side, the Arunta in Tikiyoma is already a sort of representation. The officiant is one with the ancestor from whom he is descended and whom he reincarnates. The gestures he makes are those which this ancestor made in the same circumstances. Speaking exactly, of course he does not play the part of the ancestral personage as an actor might do it, he is this personage himself. But it is true, notwithstanding, that, in one sense, it is the hero who occupies the scene. In order to accentuate the representative character of the rite, it would be sufficient for the duality of the ancestor and the officiant to become more marked, this is just what happens among the Waramunga. Even among the Arunta, at least one in Tikiyoma is mentioned in which certain persons are charged with representing ancestors with whom they have no relationship of mythical descent. And in which there is consequently a proper dramatic representation, this is the Antikyoma of the Emu. It seems that in this case, also, contrarily to the general rule among this people, the theatre of the ceremony is artificially arranged. Page 375. It does not follow from the fact that, in spite of the differences separating them, these two varieties of ceremony thus have an air of kinship, as it were, that there is a definite relation of succession between them. And that one is a transformation of the other. It may very well be that the resemblances pointed out come from the fact that the two sprang from the same source, that is, from the same original ceremony. Of which they are only divergent forms, we shall even see that this hypothesis is the most probable one. But even without taking sides on this question, what has already been said is enough to show that they are rites of the same nature. So we may be allowed to compare them, and to use the one to enable us to understand the other better. Now the peculiar thing in the ceremonies of the Waramunga of which we have been speaking, is that not a gesture is made whose object is to aid or to provoke directly the increase of the totemic species. If we analyze the movements made, as well as the words spoken, we generally find nothing which betrays any intention of this sort. Everything is in representations whose only object can be to render the mythical past of the clan present to the mind. But the mythology of a group is the system of beliefs common to this group. The traditions whose memory it perpetuates express the way in which society represents man and the world, it is a moral system and a cosmology as well as a history. So the right serves and can serve only to sustain the vitality of these beliefs, to keep them from being effaced from memory and, in sum, to revivify the most essential elements of the collective consciousness. Through it, the group periodically renews the sentiment which it has of itself and of its unity, at the same time, individuals are strengthened in their social natures. The glorious souvenirs which are made to live again before their eyes, and with which they feel that they have a kinship. Give them a feeling of strength and confidence, 
a man is surer of his faith when he sees to how distant a past it goes back and what great things it has inspired. This is the characteristic of the ceremony which makes it instructive. Its tendency is to act entirely upon the mind and upon it alone. So if men believe nevertheless that it acts upon things and that it assures the prosperity of the species, this can be only as a reaction to the moral action which it exercises and which is obviously the only one which is real. Thus the hypothesis which we have proposed is verified by a significant experiment, and this, page 376, verification is the more convincing because, as we have shown, there is no difference in nature between the ritual system of the Waramunga and that of the Arunta. The one only makes more evident what we had already conjectured from the other. 2. But there are ceremonies in which this representative and idealistic character is still more accentuated. In those of which we have been speaking, the dramatic representation did not exist for itself, it was only a means having a very material end in view, namely, the reproduction of the totemic species. But there are others which do not differ materially from the preceding ones, but from which, nevertheless, all preoccupations of this sort are absent. The past is here represented for the mere sake of representing it and fixing it more firmly in the mind, while no determined action over nature is expected of the right. At least, the physical effects sometimes imputed to it are wholly secondary and have no relation with the liturgical importance attributed to it. This is the case notably with the ceremonies which the Waramunga celebrate in honor of the snake Wolunkwa. As we have already said, the Wolunkwa is a totem of a very special sort. It is not an animal or vegetable species, but a unique being, there is only one Wolunkwa. Moreover, this being is purely mythical. The natives represent it as a colossal snake whose length is such that when it rises on its tail its head is lost in the clouds. It resides, they believe, in a waterhole called Taporlu, which is hidden in the bottom of a solitary valley. But if it differs in certain ways from the ordinary totems, it has all their distinctive characteristics nevertheless. It serves as the collective name and emblem of a whole group of individuals who regard it as their common ancestor. While the relations which they sustain with this mythical beast are identical with those which the members of other totems believe that they sustain with the founders of their respective clans. In the Alcharinga times, the Wolunkwa traversed the country in every direction. In the different localities where it stopped, it scattered, spirit children, the spiritual principles which, page 377, still serve as the souls of the living of today. The Wolunkwa is even considered as a sort of preeminent totem. The Waramunga are divided into two fratries, called the Luru and Kingili. Nearly all the totems of the former are snakes of different kinds. Now they are all believed to be descended from the Wolunkwa, they say that it was their grandfather. From this, we can catch a glimpse of how the myth of the Wolunkwa probably arose. In order to explain the presence of so many similar totems in the same fratry, they imagined that all were derived from one and the same totem. It was necessary to give it a gigantic form so that in its very appearance it might conform to the considerable role assigned to it in the history of the tribe. Now the Wulunkwa is the object of ceremonies not differing in nature from those which we have already studied, they are representations in which are portrayed the principal events of its fabulous life. They show it coming out of the ground and passing from one locality to another, they represent different episodes in its voyages, etc. Spencer and Gillen assisted at fifteen ceremonies of this sort which took place between the 27th of July and the 23rd of August, all being linked together in a determined order, in such a way as to form a veritable cycle. In the details of the rites constituting it, this long celebration is therefore indistinct from the ordinary antikyoma of the Waramunga, as is recognized by the authors who have described it to us. But, on the other hand, it is an intikioma which could not have the object of assuring the fecundity of an animal or vegetable species, for the Wulunkwa is a species all by itself and does not reproduce. It exists, and the natives do not seem to feel that it has need of a cult to preserve it in its existence. These ceremonies not only seem to lack the efficacy of the classic intikioma, but it even seems as though they have no material efficacy of any sort. The Wulunkwa is not a divinity set over a special order of natural phenomena, 
so they expect no definite service from him in exchange for the cult. Of course they say that if the ritual prescriptions are badly observed, the Wulunkwa becomes angry, leaves his retreat and comes to punish his worshippers for their negligence. And inversely, when everything passes regularly, they are led to, page 378, believe that they will be fortunate and that some happy event will take place, but it is quite evident that these possible sanctions are an afterthought to explain the rite. After the ceremony had been established, it seemed natural that it should serve for something, and that the omission of the prescribed observances should therefore expose one to grave dangers. But it was not established to forestall these mythical dangers or to assure particular advantages. The natives, moreover, have only the very haziest ideas of them. When the whole ceremony is completed, the old men announce that if the Wulunkwa is pleased, he will send rain. But it is not to have rain that they go through with the celebration. They celebrate it because their ancestors did, because they are attached to it as to a highly respected tradition and because they leave it with a feeling of moral well-being. Other considerations have only a complementary part. They may serve to strengthen the worshippers in the attitude prescribed by the rite, but they are not the reason for the existence of this attitude. So we have here a whole group of ceremonies whose sole purpose is to awaken certain ideas and sentiments, to attach the present to the past or the individual to the group. Not only are they unable to serve useful ends, but the worshippers themselves demand none. This is still another proof that the psychical, page 379, state in which the assembled group happens to be constitutes the only solid and stable basis of what we may call the ritual mentality. The beliefs which attribute such or such a physical efficaciousness to the rites are wholly accessory and contingent, for they may be lacking without causing any alteration in the essentials of the rite. Thus the ceremonies of the Wulunkwa show even better than the preceding ones the fundamental function of the positive cult. If we have insisted especially upon these solemnities, it is because of their exceptional importance. But there are others with exactly the same character. Thus, the Waramunga have a totem of the laughing boy. Spencer and Gillen say that the clan bearing this name has the same organization as the other totemic groups. Like them, it has its sacred places, Mungai, where the founder ancestor celebrated ceremonies in the fabulous times, and where he left behind him spirit children who became the men of the clan. The rites connected with this totem are indistinguishable from those relating to the animal or vegetable totems. Yet it is evident that they could not have any physical efficaciousness. They consist in a series of four ceremonies which repeat one another more or less, but which are intended only to amuse and to provoke laughter by laughter, in fine, to maintain the gaiety and good humor which the group has as its speciality. We find more than one totem among the Arunta themselves which has no other in Tikiuma. We have seen that among this people, the irregularities and depressions of the land, which mark the places where some ancestors sojourned, sometimes serve as totems. Ceremonies are attached to these totems which are manifestly incapable of physical effects of any sort. They can consist only in representations whose object is to commemorate the past, and they can aim at no end beyond this commemoration. While they enable us to understand the nature of the cult better, these ritual representations also put into evidence an important element of religion this is the recreative and aesthetic element. We have already had occasion to show that they are closely akin to dramatic representations. This kinship appears with still greater clarity in the latter ceremonies of which we have, page 380, spoken. Not only do they employ the same processes as the real drama, but they also pursue an end of the same sort, being foreign to all utilitarian ends. They make men forget the real world and transport them into another where their imagination is more at ease. They distract. They sometimes even go so far as to have the outward appearance of a recreation, the assistants may be seen laughing and amusing themselves openly. Representative rites and collective recreations are even so close to one another that men pass from one sort to the other without any break of continuity. The characteristic feature of the properly religious ceremonies is that they must be celebrated on a consecrated ground, from which women and non-initiated persons are excluded. But there are others in which this religious character is somewhat effaced, though it has not disappeared completely. They take place outside the ceremonial ground, 
which proves that they are already laicized to a certain degree. But profane persons, women and children, are not yet admitted to them. So they are on the boundary between the two domains. They generally deal with legendary personages, but ones having no regular place in the framework of the totemic religion. They are spirits, more generally malevolent ones, having relations with the magicians rather than the ordinary believers, and sorts of bugbears. In whom men do not believe with the same degree of seriousness and firmness of conviction as in the proper totemic beings and things. As the bonds by which the events and personages represented are attached to the history of the tribe relax, these take on a proportionately more unreal appearance, while the corresponding ceremonies change in nature. Thus men enter into the domain of pure fancy, and pass from the commemorative rite to the ordinary korobori, a simple public merrymaking, which has nothing religious about it and in which all may take part indifferently. Perhaps some of these representations, whose sole object now is to distract, are ancient rites, whose character has been changed. In fact, the distinction between these two sorts of ceremonies is so variable that it is impossible to state with precision to which of the two kinds they belong. Page 381. It is a well-known fact that games and the principal forms of art seem to have been born of religion and that for a long time they retained a religious character. We now see what the reasons for this are. It is because the cult, though aimed primarily at other ends, has also been a sort of recreation for men. Religion has not played this role by hazard or owing to a happy chance, but through a necessity of its nature. Though, as we have established, religious thought is something very different from a system of fictions, still the realities to which it corresponds express themselves religiously only when religion transfigures them. Between society as it is objectively and the sacred things which express it symbolically, the distance is considerable. It has been necessary that the impressions really felt by men, which served as the original matter of this construction, should be interpreted, elaborated and transformed until they became unrecognizable. So the world of religious things is a partially imaginary world, though only in its outward form, and one which therefore lends itself more readily to the free creations of the mind. Also, since the intellectual forces which serve to make it are intense and tumultuous, the unique task of expressing the real with the aid of appropriate symbols is not enough to occupy them. A surplus generally remains available which seeks to employ itself in supplementary and superfluous works of luxury, that is to say, in works of art. There are practices as well as beliefs of this sort. The state of effervescence in which the assembled worshippers find themselves must be translated outwardly by exuberant movements which are not easily subjected to too carefully defined ends. In part, they escape aimlessly, they spread themselves for the mere pleasure of so doing, and they take delight in all sorts of games. Besides, in so far as the beings to whom the cult is addressed are imaginary, they are not able to contain and regulate this exuberance. The pressure of tangible and resisting realities is required to confine activities to exact and economical forms. Therefore one exposes oneself to grave misunderstandings if, in explaining rights, he believes that each gesture has a precise object and a definite reason for its existence. There are some which serve nothing. They merely answer the need felt by worshippers for action, motion, gesticulation. They are to be seen jumping, whirling, dancing, crying and singing, though it may not always be possible to give a meaning to all this agitation. Therefore religion would not be itself if it did not give some place to the free combinations of thought and activity, to play, page 382, to art. To all that recreates the spirit that has been fatigued by the too great slavishness of daily work, the very same causes which called it into existence make it a necessity. Art is not merely an external ornament with which the cult has adorned itself in order to dissimulate certain of its features which may be too austere and too rude, but rather, in itself, the cult is something aesthetic. Owing to the well-known connection which mythology has with poetry, some have wished to exclude the former from religion, the truth is that there is a poetry inherent in all religion. The representative rites which have just been studied make this aspect of the religious life manifest, but there are scarcely any rites which do not present it to some degree. One would certainly commit the gravest error if he saw only this one aspect of religion, or if he even exaggerated its importance. 
When a right serves only to distract, it is no longer a right. The moral forces expressed by religious symbols are real forces with which we must reckon and with which we cannot do what we will. Even when the cult aims at producing no physical effects, but limits itself to acting on the mind, its action is in quite a different way from that of a pure work of art. The representations which it seeks to awaken and maintain in our minds are not vain images which correspond to nothing in reality, and which we call up aimlessly for the mere satisfaction of seeing them appear and combine before our eyes. They are as necessary for the well-working of our moral life as our food is for the maintenance of our physical life, for it is through them that the group affirms and maintains itself. And we know the point to which this is indispensable for the individual. So a right is something different from a game, it is a part of the serious life. But if its unreal and imaginary element is not essential, nevertheless it plays a part which is by no means negligible. It has its share in the feeling of comfort which the worshipper draws from the rite performed, for recreation is one of the forms of the moral remaking which is the principal object of the positive rite. After we have acquitted ourselves of our ritual duties, we enter into the profane life with increased courage and ardor, not only because we come into relations with a superior source of energy, but also because our forces have been reinvigorated by living, for a few moments, in a life that is less strained, and freer and easier. Hence religion acquires a charm which is not among the slightest of its attractions. This is why the very idea of a religious ceremony of some importance awakens the idea of a feast. Inversely, every feast, page 383, even when it has purely lay origins, has certain characteristics of the religious ceremony, for in every case its effect is to bring men together. To put the masses into movement and thus to excite a state of effervescence, and sometimes even of delirium, which is not without a certain kinship with the religious state. A man is carried outside himself and diverted from his ordinary occupation and preoccupations. Thus the same manifestations are to be observed in each case, cries, songs, music, violent movements, dances, the search for excitants which raise the vital level, etc. It has frequently been remarked that popular feasts lead to excesses, and cause men to lose sight of the distinction separating the licit from the illicit. There are also religious ceremonies which make it almost necessary to violate the rules which are ordinarily the most respected. Of course this does not mean that there is no way to distinguish these two forms of public activity. The simple merrymaking, the profane corrobori, has no serious object, while, as a whole, a ritual ceremony always has an important end. Still it is to be remembered that there is perhaps no merrymaking in which the serious life does not have some echo. The difference consists rather in the unequal proportions in which the two elements are combined. 3. A more general fact confirms the views which precede. In their first book, Spencer and Gillen presented the Antikyoma as a perfectly definite ritual entity, they spoke of it as though it were an operation destined exclusively for the assurance of the reproduction of the totemic species. And it seemed as though it ought to lose all meaning, if this unique function were set aside. But in their northern tribes of Central Australia, the same authors use a different language, though perhaps without noticing it. They recognize that these same ceremonies may take place either in the regular Intikioma or in the Initiation, page 384, writes. So they serve equally in the making of animals or plants of the totemic species, or in conferring upon novices the qualities necessary to make them regular members of the men's society. From this point of view, the Antikyoma takes on a new aspect. It is no longer a distinct ritual mechanism, resting upon principles of its own, but a particular application of more general ceremonies which may be utilized for very different ends. For this reason, in their later work, before speaking of the Antikyoma and the initiation they consecrate a special chapter to the totemic ceremonies in general, making abstraction of the diverse forms which they may take. According to the ends for which they are employed. This fundamental indetermination of the totemic ceremonies was only indicated by Spencer and Gillen, and rather indirectly at that, but it has now been confirmed by Strello in more explicit terms. When they lead the young novices through the different feasts of the initiation, he says, they perform before them a series of ceremonies which, though reproducing, 
even in their most characteristic details, the rites of the regular cult, viz. The rites which Spencer and Gillen call the Antikyoma, do not have, nevertheless, the end of multiplying the corresponding totem and causing it to prosper. It is the same ceremony which serves in the two cases, the name alone is not the same. When its special object is the reproduction of the species, they call it Mbatjaukatuma and it is only when it is a part of the process of initiation that they give it the name Intikiyoma. Moreover, these two sorts of ceremonies are distinguished from one another among the Arunta by certain secondary characteristics. Though the structure of the rite is the same in both cases, still we know that the effusions of blood and, more generally, the ablations characteristic of the Arunta and Tikiyoma are not found in the initiation ceremonies. Moreover, among this same people, the Antikyoma takes place at a spot regularly fixed by tradition, to which men must make a pilgrimage, while, page 385, the scene of the initiation ceremonies is purely conventional. But when the Antikyoma consists in a simple dramatic representation, as is the case among the Waramunga, the lack of distinction between the two rites is complete. In the one as in the other, they commemorate the past, they put the myth into action, they play, and one cannot play in two materially different ways. So, according to the circumstances, one and the same ceremony serves two distinct functions. It may even lend itself to other uses. We know that as blood is a sacred thing, women must not see it flow. Yet it happens sometimes that a quarrel breaks out in their presence and ends in the shedding of blood. Thus an infraction of the ritual is committed. Among the Arunta, the man whose blood flowed first must, to atone for this fault, celebrate a ceremony connected with the totem either of his father or of his mother. This ceremony has a special name, Alua Oparilama, which means the washing away of blood. But in itself, it does not differ from those celebrated at the time of the initiation or in the Antikyoma, it represents an event of ancestral history. So it may serve equally to initiate, to act upon the totemic species or to expiate a sacrilege. We shall see that a totemic ceremony may also take the place of a funeral rite. Mm. Hubert and Moss have already pointed out a functional ambiguity of this same sort in the case of sacrifice, and more especially, in that of Hindu sacrifice. They have shown how the sacrifice of communion, that of expiation, that of a vow and that of a contract are only variations of one and the same mechanism. We now see that the fact is much more primitive, page 386, and in no way limited to the institution of sacrifice. Perhaps no rite exists which does not present a similar indetermination. The Mass serves for marriages as for burials. It redeems the faults of the dead and wins the favors of the deity for the living, etc. Fasting is an expiation and a penance, but it is also a preparation for communion, it even confers positive virtues. This ambiguity shows that the real function of a rite does not consist in the particular and definite effects which it seems to aim at and by which it is ordinarily characterized, but rather in a general action which, though always and everywhere the same, is nevertheless capable of taking on different forms according to the circumstances. Now this is just what is demanded by the theory which we have proposed. If the real function of the cult is to awaken within the worshippers a certain state of soul, composed of moral force and confidence. And if the various effects imputed to the rites are due only to a secondary and variable determination of this fundamental state, it is not surprising if a single rite, while keeping the same composition and structure, seems to produce various effects. For the mental dispositions, the excitation of which is its permanent function, remain the same in every case, they depend upon the fact that the group is assembled, and not upon the special reasons for which it is assembled. But, on the other hand, they are interpreted differently according to the circumstances to which they are applied. Is it a physical result which they wish to obtain? The confidence they feel convinces them that the desired result is or will be obtained by the means employed. Has someone committed a fault for which he wishes to atone? The same state of moral assurance will lead him to attribute expiatory virtues to these same ritual gestures. Thus, the apparent efficacy will seem to change while the real efficacy remains invariable, and the right will seem to fulfill various functions though in fact it has only one, which is always the same. Inversely, 
Just as a single right may serve many ends, so many rights may produce the same effect and mutually replace one another. To assure the reproduction of the totemic species, one may have recourse equally to oblations, to imitative practices or to commemorative representations. This aptitude of rights for substituting themselves for one another proves once more both their plasticity and the extreme generality of the useful action which they exercise. The essential thing is that men are assembled, that sentiments are felt in common and expressed in common acts, but the particular nature of these sentiments and acts is something relatively secondary and contingent. Page 387, to become conscious of itself, the group does not need to perform certain acts in preference to all others. The necessary thing is that it partakes of the same thought and the same action. The visible forms in which this communion takes place matter but little. Of course, these external forms do not come by chance, they have their reasons, but these reasons do not touch the essential part of the cult. So everything leads us back to this same idea, before all, rights are means by which the social group reaffirms itself periodically. From this, we may be able to reconstruct hypothetically the way in which the totemic cult should have arisen originally. Men who feel themselves united, partially by bonds of blood, but still more by a community of interest and tradition, assemble and become conscious of their moral unity. For the reasons which we have set forth, they are led to represent this unity in the form of a very special kind of consubstantiality, they think of themselves as all participating in the nature of some determined animal. Under these circumstances, there is only one way for them to affirm their collective existence, this is to affirm that they are like the animals of this species, and to do so not only in the silence of their own thoughts, but also by material acts. These are the acts which make up the cult, and they obviously can consist only in movements by which the man imitates the animal with which he identifies himself. When understood thus, the imitative rites appear as the first form of the cult. It will be thought that this is attributing a very considerable historical importance to practices which, at first view, give the effect of childish games. But, as we have shown, these naive and awkward gestures and these crude processes of representation translate and maintain a sentiment of pride. Confidence and veneration wholly comparable to that expressed by the worshippers in the most idealistic religions when, being assembled, they proclaim themselves the children of the Almighty God. For in the one case as in the other, this sentiment is made up of the same impressions of security and respect which are awakened in individual consciousnesses by this great moral force which dominates them and sustains them. And which is the collective force? The other rites which we have been studying are probably only variations of this essential rite. When the close union of the animal and men has once been admitted, men feel acutely the necessity of assuring the regular reproduction of the principal object of the cult. These imitative practices, which probably had only a moral end at first, thus became subordinated to utilitarian and material ends, and they were thought of as means of producing, page 388, the desired result. But proportionately as, through the development of mythology, the ancestral hero, who was at first confused with the totemic animal, distinguished himself more and more, and became a more personal figure. The imitation of the ancestor was substituted for the imitation of the animal, or took a place beside it, and then representative ceremonies replaced or completed the imitative rites. Finally, to be sure of attaining the end they sought, men felt the need of putting into action all the means at their disposal. Close at hand they had reserves of living forces accumulated in the sacred rocks, so they utilized them. Since the blood of the men was of the same nature as that of the animal, they used it for the same purpose and shed it. Inversely, owing to this same kinship, men used the flesh of the animal to remake their own substance. Hence came the rites of ablation and communion. But, at bottom, all these different practices are only variations of one and the same theme, everywhere their basis is the same state of mind, interpreted differently according to the situations. The Moments of History and the Dispositions of the Worshippers Page 389. Chapter 5. Piacular Rites and the Ambiguity of the Notion. Of Sacredness. Howsoever much they may differ from one another in the nature of the gestures they imply. The positive rites which we have been passing under review have one common characteristic, 
they are all performed in a state of confidence, joy, and even enthusiasm. Though the expectation of a future and contingent event is not without a certain uncertainty, still it is normal that the rain fall when the season for it comes, and that the animal and vegetable species reproduce regularly. Oft-repeated experiences have shown that the rites generally do produce the effects which are expected of them and which are the reason for their existence. Men celebrate them with confidence, joyfully anticipating the happy event which they prepare and announce. Whatever movements men perform participate in this same state of mind, of course, they are marked with the gravity which a religious solemnity always supposes, but this gravity excludes neither animation nor joy. These are all joyful feasts. But there are sad celebrations as well, whose object is either to meet a calamity, or else merely to commemorate and deplore it. These rites have a special aspect, which we are going to attempt to characterize and explain. It is the more necessary to study them by themselves since they are going to reveal a new aspect of the religious life to us. We propose to call the ceremonies of this sort piacular. The term piaculum has the advantage that while it suggests the idea of expiation, it also has a much more extended signification. Every misfortune, everything of evil omen, everything that inspires sentiments of sorrow or fear necessitates a piaculum and is therefore called piacular. So this word seems to be very well adapted for designating the rites which are celebrated by those in a state of uneasiness or sadness. Page 390. I. Mourning offers us a first and important example of piacular rites. However, a distinction is necessary between the different rites which go to make up mourning. Some consist in mere abstentions, it is forbidden to pronounce the name of the dead, or to remain near the place where the death occurred. Relatives, especially the female ones, must abstain from all communication with strangers, the ordinary occupations of life are suspended, just as in feast time, etc. All these practices belong to the negative cult and are explained like the other rites of the same sort, so they do not concern us at present. They are due to the fact that the dead man is a sacred being. Consequently, everything which is or has been connected with him is, by contagion, in a religious state excluding all contact with things from profane life. But mourning is not made up entirely of interdicts which have to be observed. Positive acts are also demanded, in which the relatives are both the actors and those acted upon. Very frequently these rites commence as soon as the death appears imminent. Here is a scene which Spencer and Gillen witnessed among the Waramunga. A totemic ceremony had just been celebrated and the company of actors and spectators was leaving the consecrated ground when a piercing cry suddenly came from the camp, a man was dying there. At once, the whole company commenced to run as fast as they could, while most of them commenced to howl. Between us and the camp, say these observers, lay a deep creek, and on the bank of this, some of the men, scattered about here and there, sat down, bending their heads forwards between their knees, while they wept and moaned. Crossing the creek we found that, as usual, the men's camp had been pulled to pieces. Some of the women, who had come from every direction, were lying prostrate on the body, while others were standing or kneeling around, digging the sharp ends of yam sticks into the crown of their heads. From which the blood streamed down over their faces, while all the time they kept up a loud, continuous wail. Many of the men, rushing up to the spot, threw themselves upon the body, from which the women arose when the men approached, until in a few minutes we could see nothing but a struggling mass of bodies all mixed up together. To one side, three men of the Thapangardi class, who still wore their ceremonial decorations, sat down wailing loudly, with their backs towards the dying man. And in, page 391, a minute or two another man of the same class rushed on to the ground yelling and brandishing a stone knife. Reaching the camp, he suddenly gashed both thighs deeply, cutting right across the muscles, and, unable to stand, fell down into the middle of the group, from which he was dragged out after a time by three or four female relatives, who immediately applied their mouths to the gaping wounds while he lay exhausted on the ground. The man did not actually die until late in the evening. As soon as he had given up his last breath, the same scene was re-enacted, only this time the wailing was still louder, and men and women, seized by a veritable frenzy, 
were rushing about cutting themselves with knives and sharp-pointed sticks. The women battering one another's heads with fighting clubs, no one attempting to ward off either cuts or blows. Finally, after about an hour, a torchlight procession started off across the plain, to a tree in whose branches the body was left. Howsoever great the violence of these manifestations may be, they are strictly regulated by etiquette. The individuals who make bloody incisions in themselves are designated by usage, they must have certain relations of kinship with the dead man. Thus, in the case observed by Spencer and Gillen among the Waramunga, those who slashed their thighs were the maternal grandfather of the deceased, his maternal uncle, and the maternal uncle and brother of his wife. Others must cut their whiskers and hair, and then smear their scalps with pipe clay. Women have particularly severe obligations. They must cut their hair and cover the whole body with pipe clay. In addition to this, a strict silence is imposed upon them during the whole period of mourning, which may last as long as two years. It is not rare among the Waramunga that, as a result of this interdiction, all the women of a camp are condemned to the most absolute silence. This becomes so habitual to them that even after the expiration of the period of mourning, they voluntarily renounce all spoken language and prefer to communicate with gestures, in which, by the way, they acquire a remarkable ability. Spencer and Gillen knew one old woman who had not spoken for over twenty-four years, page 392. The ceremony which we have described opens a long series of rites which succeed one another for weeks and even for months. During the days which follow, they are renewed in various forms. Groups of men and women sit on the ground, weeping and lamenting, and kissing each other at certain moments. These ritual kissings are repeated frequently during the period of mourning. It seems as though men felt a need of coming close together and communicating most closely. They are to be seen holding to each other and wound together so much as to make one single mass, from which loud groans escape. Meanwhile, the women commence to lacerate their heads again, and, in order to intensify the wounds they make, they even go so far as to burn them with the points of fiery sticks. Practices of this sort are general in all Australia. The funeral rites, that is, the ritual cares given to the corpse, the way in which it is buried, etc., change with different tribes, and in a single tribe they vary with the age, sex and social importance of the individual. But the real ceremonies of mourning repeat the same theme everywhere, the variations are only in the details. Everywhere we find this same silence interrupted by groans, the same obligation of cutting the hair and beard, or of covering one's head with pipe clay or cinders, or perhaps even with excrements. Everywhere, finally, we find this same frenzy for beating oneself, lacerating oneself and burning oneself. In central Victoria, when death visits a tribe there is great weeping and lamentation amongst the women, the elder portion of whom lacerate their temples with their nails. The parents of the deceased lacerate themselves fearfully, especially if it be an only son whose loss they deplore. The father beats and cuts his head with a tomahawk until he utters bitter groans, the mother sits by the fire and burns her breasts and abdomen with a small fire stick. Sometimes the burns thus inflicted are so severe as to cause death. Page 393. According to an account of Brof Smith, here is what happens in one of the southern tribes of the same state. As the body is lowered into the grave, the widow begins her sad ceremonies. She cuts off her hair above her forehead, and becoming frantic, seizes fire sticks, and burns her breasts, arms, legs and thighs. She seems to delight in the self-inflicted torture. It would be rash and vain to interrupt her. When exhausted, and when she can hardly walk, she yet endeavors to kick the embers of the fire, and to throw them about. Sitting down, she takes the ashes into her hands, rubs them into her wounds, and then scratches her face, the only part not touched by the fire sticks, until the blood mingles with the ashes, which partly hide her cruel wounds. In this plight, scratching her face continually, she utters howls and lamentations. The description which Howitt gives of the rites of mourning among the Kurnai is remarkably similar to these others. After the body has been wrapped up in opossum skins and put in a shroud of bark, a hut is built in which the relatives assemble. There they lay lamenting their loss, saying, for instance, 
why did you leave us? Now and then their grief would be intensified by some one, for instance, the wife, uttering an ear-piercing wail, my spouse is dead, or another would say, my child is dead. All the others would then join in with the proper term of relationship, and they would gash themselves with sharp stones and tomahawks until their heads and bodies streamed with blood. This bitter wailing and weeping continued all night. Sadness is not the only sentiment expressed during these ceremonies, a sort of anger is generally mixed with it. The relatives feel a need of avenging the death in some way or other. They are to be seen throwing themselves upon one another and trying to wound each other. Sometimes the attack is real, sometimes it is only pretended. There are even cases when these peculiar combats are organized. Among the Kadesh, the heir of the deceased passes by right to his son-in-law. But he, in return, must go, in company with some of his relatives and friends, and provoke a quarrel with one of his tribal brothers, that is. With a man belonging to the same matrimonial class as himself and one who might therefore have married the daughter of the dead man. This provocation cannot be refused and the two combatants inflict serious wounds upon each other's, page 394, shoulders and thighs. When the duel is terminated, the challenger passes on to his adversary the hair which he had temporarily inherited. This latter then provokes and fights with another of his tribal brothers, to whom the precious relic is next transmitted, but only provisionally, thus it passes from hand to hand and circulates from group to group. Also, something of these same sentiments enters into that sort of rage with which each relative beats himself, burns himself or slashes himself, a sorrow which reaches such a paroxysm is not without a certain amount of anger. One cannot fail to be struck by the resemblances which these practices present to those of the vendetta. Both proceed from the same principle that death demands the shedding of blood. The only difference is that in one case the victims are the relatives, while in the other they are strangers. We do not have to treat especially of the vendetta, which belongs rather to the study of juridic institutions. But it should be pointed out, nevertheless, how it is connected with the rites of mourning, whose end it announces. In certain societies, the mourning is terminated by a ceremony whose effervescence reaches or surpasses that produced by the inaugural ceremonies. Among the Arunta, this closing rite is called Erpmilkaima. Spencer and Gillen assisted at two of these rites. One was celebrated in honor of a man, the other of a woman. Here is the description they give of the latter. They commence by making some ornaments of a special sort, called Kimurilia by the men and Aramurilia by the women. With a kind of resin, they fixed small animal bones, which had previously been gathered and set aside, to locks of hair furnished by the relatives of the dead woman. These are then attached to one of the headbands which women ordinarily wear and the feathers of black cockatoos and parrots are added to it. When these preparations are completed, the women assemble in their camp. They paint their bodies different colors, according to their degree of kinship with the deceased. After being embraced by one another for some ten minutes, while uttering uninterrupted groans, they set out for the tomb. At a certain distance, they meet a brother by blood of the dead woman, who is accompanied by some of his tribal brothers. Everybody sits down on the ground, and the lamentations recommence. A pitchi containing the kimurilia is then presented to the elder brother who presses it against his stomach, they say that this is a way of lessening his sorrow. They take out one of the Kimurilia and the dead, page 395, woman's mother puts it on her head for a little while, then it is put back into the pitchi, which each of the other men presses against his breast, in his turn. Finally, the brother puts the Kimurilia on the heads of two elder sisters and they set out again for the tomb. On the way, the mother throws herself on the ground several times, and tries to slash her head with a pointed stick. Every time, the other women pick her up, and seem to take care that she does not hurt herself too much. When they arrive at the tomb, she throws herself on the knoll and endeavors to destroy it with her hands, while the other women literally dance upon her. The tribal mothers and aunts, sisters of the dead woman's father, follow her example. They also throw themselves on the ground, and mutually beat and tear each other, finally their bodies are all streaming with blood. After a while, they are dragged aside. 
The elder sisters then make a hole in the earth of the tomb, in which they place the Kimurilia, which had previously been torn to pieces. Once again the tribal mothers throw themselves on the ground and slash each other's heads. At this moment, the weeping and wailing of the women who were standing round seemed to drive them almost frenzied, and the blood, streaming down their bodies over the white pipe clay, gave them a ghastly appearance. At last only the old mother was left crouching alone, utterly exhausted and moaning weakly on the grave. Then the others raised her up and rubbed off the pipe clay with which she was covered, this was the end of the ceremony and of the mourning. Among the Waramunga, the final rite presents some rather particular characteristics. There seems to be no shedding of blood here, but the collective effervescence is translated in another manner. Among his people, before the body is definitely interred, it is exposed upon a platform placed in the branches of a tree, it is left there to decompose slowly, until nothing remains but the bones. Then these are gathered together and, with the exception of the humerus, they are placed inside an ant hill. The humerus is wrapped up in a bark box, which is decorated in different manners. The box is then brought to camp, amid the cries and groans of the women. During the following days, they celebrate a series of totemic rites, concerning the totem of the deceased and the mythical history of the ancestors from whom the clan is descended. When all these ceremonies have been terminated, they proceed to the closing rite, page 396. A trench one foot deep and fifteen feet long is dug in the field of the ceremony. A design representing the totem of the deceased and certain spots where the ancestor stopped is made on the ground a little distance from it. Near this design, a little ditch is dug in the ground. Ten decorated men then advance, one behind another, and with their hands crossed behind their heads and their legs wide apart they stand astraddle the trench. At a given signal, the women run from the camp in a profound silence. When they are near, they form an Indian file, the last one holding in her hands the box containing the humerus. Then, after throwing themselves on the ground, they advance on their hands and knees, and pass all along the trench, between the legs of the men. The scene shows a state of great sexual excitement. As soon as the last woman has passed, they take the box from her, and take it to the ditch, near which is an old man, he breaks the bone with a sharp blow, and hurriedly buries it in the debris. During this time, the women have remained at a distance, with their backs turned upon the scene, for they must not see it. But when they hear the blow of the axe, they flee, uttering cries and groans. The rite is accomplished. The mourning is terminated. 2. These rites belong to a very different type from those which we have studied hitherto. We do not mean to say that important resemblances cannot be found between the two, which we shall have to note. But the differences are more apparent. Instead of happy dances, songs and dramatic representations which distract and relax the mind, they are tears and groans and, in a word, the most varied manifestations of agonized sorrow and a sort of mutual pity, which occupy the whole scene. Of course the shedding of blood also takes place in the Antikyuma, but this is an ablation made with a movement of pious enthusiasm. Even though the motions may be the same, the sentiments expressed are different and even opposed. Likewise, the ascetic rites certainly imply privations, abstinences and mutilations, but ones which must be borne with an impassive firmness and serenity. Here, on the contrary, dejection, cries and tears are the rule. The ascetic tortures himself in order to prove, in his own eyes and those of his fellows, that he is above suffering. During mourning, men injure themselves to prove that they suffer. By all these signs, the characteristic traits of the piacular rites are to be recognized. But how are they to be explained? Page 397. One initial fact is constant, mourning is not the spontaneous expression of individual emotions. If the relations weep, lament, mutilate themselves, it is not because they feel themselves personally affected by the death of their kinsmen. Of course, it may be that in certain particular cases, the chagrin expressed is really felt. But it is more generally the case that there is no connection between the sentiments felt and the gestures made by the actors in the rite. 
If, at the very moment when the weepers seem the most overcome by their grief, someone speaks to them of some temporal interest, it frequently happens that they change their features and tone at once. Take on a laughing air and converse in the gayest fashion imaginable. Mourning is not a natural movement of private feelings wounded by a cruel loss, it is a duty imposed by the group. One weeps, not simply because he is sad, but because he is forced to weep. It is a ritual attitude which he is forced to adopt out of respect for custom, but which is, in a large measure, independent of his affective state. Moreover, this obligation is sanctioned by mythical or social penalties. They believe, for example, that if a relative does not mourn as is fitting, then the soul of the departed follows upon his steps and kills him. In other cases, society does not leave it to the religious forces to punish the negligent. It intervenes itself, and reprimands the ritual faults. If a son-in-law does not render to his father-in-law the funeral attentions which are due him, and if he does not make the prescribed incisions, then his tribal fathers-in-law take his wife away from him and give him another. Therefore, in order to square himself with usage, a man sometimes forces tears to flow by artificial means. Whence comes this obligation? Ethnographers and sociologists are generally satisfied with the reply which the natives themselves give to this question. They say that the dead wish to be lamented, that by refusing them the tribute of sorrow which is their right, men offend them, and that the only way of preventing their anger is to conform to their will. But this mythological interpretation merely modifies the terms of the problem, without resolving it, it is still necessary to explain why the dead imperatively reclaim the mourning. It, page 398, may be said that it is natural for men to wish to be mourned and regretted. But in making this sentiment explain the complex system of rites which make up mourning, we attribute to the Australian effective exigencies of which the civilized man himself does not always give evidence. Let us admit, as is not evident a priori, that the idea of not being forgotten too readily is pleasing to a man who thinks of the future. It is still to be established that it has ever had enough importance in the minds of the living for one to attribute to the dead a state of mind proceeding almost entirely from this preoccupation. It seems especially improbable that such a sentiment could obsess and impassion men who are seldom accustomed to thinking beyond the present moment. So far is it from being a fact that the desire to survive in the memory of those who are still alive is to be regarded as the origin of mourning, that we may even ask ourselves whether it was not rather mourning itself which, when once established, aroused the idea of and the taste for posthumous regrets. The classic interpretation appears still more unsustainable when we know what the primitive mourning consists in. It is not made up merely of pious regrets accorded to him who no longer is, but also of severe abstinences and cruel sacrifices. The right does not merely demand that one think of the deceased in a melancholy way, but also that he beat himself, bruise himself, lacerate himself and burn himself. We have even seen that persons in mourning sometimes torture themselves to such a degree that they do not survive their wounds. What reason has the dead man for imposing such torments upon them? Such a cruelty on his part denotes something more than a desire not to be forgotten. If he is to find pleasure in seeing his own suffer, it is necessary that he hate them, that he be thirsty for their blood. This ferocity would undoubtedly appear natural to those for whom every spirit is necessarily an evil and redoubt power. But we know that there are spirits of every sort. How does it happen that the soul of the dead man is necessarily an evil spirit? As long as the man is alive, he loves his relatives and exchanges services with them. Is it not strange that as soon as it is freed from his body, his soul should instantly lay aside its former sentiments and become an evil and tormenting genius? It is a general rule that the dead man retains the personality of the living, and that he has the same character, the same hates and the same affections. So this metamorphosis is not easily understandable by itself. It is true that the natives admit it implicitly when they explain the right by the exigencies of the dead man, but the question now before us is to know whence this, page 399, conception came. Far from being capable of being regarded as a truism, it is as obscure as the right itself, and consequently cannot account for it. Finally, even if we had found the reasons for this surprising transformation, 
we would still have to explain why it is only temporary. For it does not last beyond the period of mourning. After the rites have once been accomplished, the dead man becomes what he was when alive, an affectionate and devoted relation. He puts the new powers which he receives from his new condition at the service of his friends. Thenceforth, he is regarded as a good genius, always ready to aid those whom he was recently tormenting. Whence come these successive transfers? If the evil sentiments attributed to the soul come solely from the fact that it is no longer in life, they should remain invariable, and if the mourning is due to this, it should be interminable. These mythical explanations express the idea which the native has of the right, and not the right itself. So we may set them aside and face the reality which they translate, though disfiguring it in doing so. If mourning differs from the other forms of the positive cult, there is one feature in which it resembles them, it, too, is made up out of collective ceremonies which produce a state of effervescence among those who take part in them. The sentiments aroused are different, but the arousal is the same. So it is presumable that the explanation of the joyous rites is capable of being applied to the sad rites, on condition that the terms be transposed. When someone dies, the family group to which he belongs feels itself lessened and, to react against this loss, it assembles. A common misfortune has the same effects as the approach of a happy event, collective sentiments are renewed which then lead men to seek one another and to assemble together. We have even seen this need for concentration affirm itself with a particular energy, they embrace one another, put their arms round one another, and press as close as possible to one another. But the effective state in which the group then happens to be only reflects the circumstances through which it is passing. Not only do the relatives, who are affected the most directly, bring their own personal sorrow to the assembly, but the society exercises a moral pressure over its members, to put their sentiments in harmony with the situation. To allow them to remain indifferent to the blow which has fallen upon it and diminished it, would be equivalent to proclaiming that it does not hold the place in their hearts which is due it, it would be denying itself. A family, page 400, which allows one of its members to die without being wept for shows by that very fact that it lacks moral unity and cohesion, it abdicates, it renounces its existence. An individual in his turn, if he is strongly attached to the society of which he is a member, feels that he is morally held to participating in its sorrows and joys. Not to be interested in them would be equivalent to breaking the bonds uniting him to the group, it would be renouncing all desire for it and contradicting himself. When the Christian, during the ceremonies commemorating the Passion, and the Jew, on the anniversary of the fall of Jerusalem, fast and mortify themselves, it is not in giving way to a sadness which they feel spontaneously. Under these circumstances, the internal state of the believer is out of all proportion to the severe abstinences to which they submit themselves. If he is sad, it is primarily because he consents to being sad, and he consents to it in order to affirm his faith. The attitude of the Australian during mourning is to be explained in the same way. If he weeps and groans, it is not merely to express an individual chagrin, it is to fulfill a duty of which the surrounding society does not fail to remind him. We have seen elsewhere how human sentiments are intensified when affirmed collectively. Sorrow, like joy, becomes exalted and amplified when leaping from mind to mind, and therefore expresses itself outwardly in the form of exuberant and violent movements. But these are no longer expressive of the joyful agitation which we observed before, they are shrieks and cries of pain. Each is carried along by the others, a veritable panic of sorrow results. When pain reaches this degree of intensity, it is mixed with a sort of anger and exasperation. One feels the need of breaking something, of destroying something. He takes this out either upon himself or others. He beats himself, burns himself, wounds himself or else he falls upon others to beat, burn and wound them. Thus it became the custom to give oneself up to the veritable orgies of tortures during mourning. It seems very probable that blood revenge and head hunting have their origin in this. If every death is attributed to some magic charm, and for this reason it is believed that the dead man ought to be avenged, it is because men must find a victim at any price, upon whom the collective pain and anger may be discharged. Naturally this victim is sought outside the group, a stranger is a subject minoris resistentia. 
as he is not protected by the sentiments of sympathy inspired by a relative or neighbor, there is nothing in him which subdues and neutralizes the evil and destructive sentiments aroused by the death. It is undoubtedly for this same reason that women serve more frequently, page 401, than men as the passive objects of the cruelest rites of mourning, since they have a smaller social value, they are more obviously designated as scapegoats. We see that this explanation of mourning completely leaves aside all ideas of souls or spirits. The only forces which are really active are of a wholly impersonal nature, they are the emotions aroused in the group by the death of one of its members. But the primitive does not know the psychical mechanism from which these practices result. So when he tries to account for them, he is obliged to forge a wholly different explanation. All he knows is that he must painfully mortify himself. As every obligation suggests the notion of a will which obliges, he looks about him to see whence this constraint which he feels may come. Now, there is one moral power, of whose reality he is assured and which seems designated for this role, this is the soul which the death has liberated. For what could have a greater interest than it in the effects which its own death has on the living? So they imagine that if these latter inflict an unnatural treatment upon themselves, it is to conform to its exigencies. It was thus that the idea of the soul must have intervened at a later date into the mythology of mourning. But also, since it is thus endowed with inhuman exigencies, it must be supposed that in leaving the body which it animated, the soul lays aside every human sentiment. Hence the metamorphosis which makes a dreaded enemy out of the relative of yesterday. This transformation is not the origin of mourning, it is rather its consequence. It translates a change which has come over the affective state of the group, men do not weep for the dead because they fear them, they fear them because they weep for them. But this change of the affective state can only be a temporary one, for while the ceremonies of mourning result from it, they also put an end to it. Little by little, they neutralize the very causes which have given rise to them. The foundation of mourning is the impression of a loss which the group feels and it loses one of its members. But this very impression results in bringing individuals together, in putting them into closer relations with one another, in associating them all in the same mental state. And therefore in disengaging a sensation of comfort which compensates the original loss. Since they weep together, they hold to one another and the group is not weakened, in spite of the blow which has fallen upon it. Of course they have only sad emotions in common, but communicating in sorrow is still communicating, and every communion of mind, in whatever form it may be made, raises the social vitality. The exceptional violence, page 402, of the manifestations by which the common pain is necessarily and obligatorily expressed even testifies to the fact that at this moment, the society is more alive and active than ever. In fact, whenever the social sentiment is painfully wounded, it reacts with greater force than ordinarily, one never holds so closely to his family as when it has just suffered. This surplus energy effaces the more completely the effects of the interruption which was felt at first, and thus dissipates the feeling of coldness which death always brings with it. The group feels its strength gradually returning to it. It begins to hope and to live again. Presently one stops mourning, and he does so owing to the mourning itself. But as the idea formed of the soul reflects the moral state of the society, this idea should change as this state changes. When one is in the period of dejection and agony, he represents the soul with the traits of an evil being, whose sole occupation is to persecute men. But when he feels himself confident and secure once more, he must admit that it has retaken its former nature and its former sentiments of tenderness and solidarity. Thus we explain the very different ways in which it is conceived at different moments of its existence. Not only do the rites of mourning determine certain of the secondary characteristics attributed to the soul, but perhaps they are not foreign to the idea that it survives the body. If he is to understand the practices to which he submits on the death of a parent, a man is obliged to believe that these are not an indifferent matter for the deceased. The shedding of blood which is practiced so freely during mourning is a veritable sacrifice offered to the dead man. So something of the dead man must survive, and as this is not the body, which is manifestly immobile and decomposed, it can only be the soul. 
Of course it is impossible to say with any exactness what part these considerations have had in the origin of the idea of immortality. But it is probable that here the influence of the cult is the same as it is elsewhere. Rites are more easily explicable when one imagines that they are addressed to personal beings wink with a frown page 403, so men have been induced to extend the influence of the mythical personalities in the religious life. In order to account for mourning, they have prolonged the existence of the soul beyond the tomb. This is one more example of the way in which rites react upon beliefs. 3. But death is not the only event which may disturb a community. Men have many other occasions for being sorry and lamenting, so we might foresee that even the Australians would know and practice other piacular rites besides mourning. However, it is a remarkable fact that only a small number of examples are to be found in the accounts of the observers. One rite of this sort greatly resembles those which have just been studied. It will be remembered that among the Arunta, each local group attributes exceptionally important virtues to its collection of Chiringa, this is this collective palladium, upon whose fate the fate of the community itself is believed to depend. So when enemies or white men succeed in stealing one of these religious treasures, this loss is considered a public calamity. This misfortune is the occasion of a rite having all the characteristics of mourning, men smear their bodies with white pipe clay and remain in camp, weeping and lamenting, during a period of two weeks. This is a new proof that mourning is determined, not by the way in which the soul of the dead is conceived, but by impersonal causes, by the moral state of the group. In fact, we have here a rite which, in its structure, is indistinguishable from the real mourning, but which is, nevertheless, independent of every notion of spirits or evil-working demons. Another circumstance which gives occasion for ceremonies of the same nature is the distress in which the society finds itself after an insufficient harvest. The natives who live in the vicinity of Lake Eyre, says Eilman, also seek to prevent an insufficiency of food by means of secret ceremonies. But many of the ritual practices observed in this region are to be distinguished from those which have been mentioned already, it is not by symbolic dances. By imitative movements nor dazzling decorations that they try to act upon the religious powers or the forces of nature, but by means of the suffering which individuals inflict upon themselves. In the Northern Territories, page 404, it is by means of tortures, such as prolonged fasts, vigils, dances persisted up to the exhaustion of the dancers, and physical pains of every sort. That they attempt to appease the powers which are ill-disposed towards men. The torments to which the natives submit themselves for this purpose sometimes leave them in such a state of exhaustion that they are unable to follow the hunt for some days to come. These practices are employed especially for fighting against drought. This is because a scarcity of water results in a general want. To remedy this evil, they have recourse to violent methods. One which is frequently used is the extraction of a tooth. Among the Kadish, for example, they pull out an incisor from one man, and hang it on a tree. Among the diary, the idea of rain is closely associated with that of bloody incisions made in the skin of the chest and arms. Among this same people, whenever the drought is very great, the great council assembles and summons the whole tribe. It is really a tribal event. Women are sent in every direction to notify men to assemble at a given place and time. After they have assembled, they groan and cry in a piercing voice about the miserable state of the land, and they beg the Muramura, the mythical ancestors, to give them the power of making an abundant rainfall. In the cases, which, by the way, are very rare, when there has been an excessive rainfall, an analogous ceremony takes place to stop it. Old men then enter into a veritable frenzy, while the cries uttered by the crowd are really painful to hear. Spencer and Gillen describe, under the name of Antikyuma, a ceremony which may well have the same object and the same origin as the preceding ones, a physical torture is applied to make an animal species multiply. Among the Yurubuna, there is one clan whose totem is a variety of snake called Wadnungadni. This is how the chief of the clan proceeds, to make sure that these snakes may never be lacking. After having been decorated, he kneels down on the ground, holding his arm straight out. An assistant pinches the skin of his right arm between his fingers, and the officiant forces a pointed bone five inches long through the fold thus formed. 
this self-mutilation is believed to produce the desired result. An analogous rite is used among the diary to make the wild hens lay, the operators pierce their scrotums. Page 405, in certain of the Lake Eyre tribes, men pierce their ears to make yams reproduce. But these partial or total famines are not the only plagues which may fall upon a tribe. Other events happen more or less periodically which menace, or seem to menace, the existence of the group. This is the case, for example, with the Southern Lights. The Kurnai believe that this is a fire lighted in the heavens by the great god Mungan Gawa, therefore, whenever they see it, they are afraid that it may spread to the earth and devour them, so a great effervescence results in the camp. They shake a withered hand, to which the Kurnai attribute various virtues, and utter such cries as, Send it away, do not let us be burned. At the same time, the old men order an exchange of wives, which always indicates a great excitement. The same sexual license is mentioned among the Wimbeo whenever a plague appears imminent, and especially in times of an epidemic. Under the influence of these ideas, mutilations and the shedding of blood are sometimes considered an efficient means of curing maladies. If an accident happens to a child among the diary, his relations beat themselves on the head with clubs or boomerangs until the blood flows down over their faces. They believe that by this process, they relieve the child of the suffering. Elsewhere, they imagine that they can obtain the same end by means of a supplementary totemic ceremony. We may connect with these the example already given of a ceremony celebrated specially to efface the effects of a ritual fault. Of course there are neither wounds nor blows nor physical suffering of any sort in these two latter cases. Yet the right does not differ in nature from the others, the end sought is always the turning aside of an evil or the expiation of a fault by means of an extraordinary ritual prestation. Outside of mourning, such are the only cases of piacular rites which we have succeeded in finding in Australia. To be sure, it is probable that some have escaped us, while we may presume equally well that others have remained unperceived by the observers. But if those discovered up to the present are few in number, it is probably because they do not hold a, page 406, large place in the cult. We see how far primitive religions are from being the daughters of agony and fear from the fact that the rites translating these painful emotions are relatively rare. Of course this is because the Australian, while leading a miserable existence as compared with other more civilized peoples, demands so little of life that he is easily contented. All that he asks is that nature follow its normal course, that the seasons succeed one another regularly, that the rain fall, at the ordinary time, in abundance and without excess. Now great disturbances in the cosmic order are always exceptional. Thus it is noticeable that the majority of the regular piacular rites, examples of which we have given above, have been observed in the tribes of the center, where droughts are frequent and constitute veritable disasters. It is still surprising, it is true, that piacular rites specially destined to expiate sins, seem to be completely lacking. However, the Australian, like every other man, must commit ritual faults, which he has an interest in redeeming. So we may ask if the silence of the texts on this point may not be due to insufficient observation. But howsoever few the facts which we have been able to gather may be, they are, nevertheless, instructive. When we study piacular rites in the more advanced religions, where the religious forces are individualized, they appear to be closely bound up with anthropomorphic conceptions. When the believer imposes privations upon himself and submits himself to austerities, it is in order to disarm the malevolence attributed by him to certain of the sacred beings upon whom he thinks that he is dependent. To appease their hatred or anger, he complies with their exigencies, he beats himself in order that he may not be beaten by them. So it seems as though these practices could not arise until after gods and spirits were conceived as moral persons, capable of passions analogous to those of men. For this reason, Robertson Smith thought it possible to assign a relatively late date to expiatory sacrifices, just as to sacrificial oblations. According to him, the shedding of blood which characterizes these rites was at first a simple process of communion, men poured forth their blood upon the altar in order to strengthen the bonds uniting them to their God. 
the right acquired a piacular and penal character only when its original significance was forgotten and when the new idea which was formed of sacred beings allowed men to attribute another function to it. But as piacular rights are met with even in the Australian societies, it is impossible to assign them so late an origin. Page 407, moreover, all that we have observed, with one single exception, are independent of all anthropomorphic conceptions, there is no question of either spirits or gods. Abstinences and effusions of blood stop famines and cure sicknesses directly and by themselves. No spiritual being introduces his action between the right and the effect it is believed to produce. So mythical personalities intervened only at a late date. After the mechanism of the ritual had once been established, they serve to make it more easily representable in the mind, but they are not conditions of its existence. It is for other reasons that it was founded, it is to another cause that it owes its efficacy. It acts through the collective forces which it puts into play. Does a misfortune which menaces the group appear imminent? Then the group unites, as in the case of mourning, and it is naturally an impression of uneasiness and perplexity which dominates the assembled body. Now, as always, the pooling of these sentiments results in intensifying them. By affirming themselves, they exalt and impassion themselves and attain a degree of violence which is translated by the corresponding violence of the gestures which express them. Just as at the death of a relative, they utter terrible cries, fly into a passion and feel that they must tear and destroy, it is to satisfy this need that they beat themselves, wound themselves, and make their blood flow. When emotions have this vivacity, they may well be painful, but they are not depressing, on the contrary, they denote a state of effervescence which implies a mobilization of all our active forces, and even a supply of external energies. It matters little that this exaltation was provoked by a sad event, for it is real, notwithstanding, and does not differ specifically from what is observed in the happy feasts. Sometimes it is even made manifest by movements of the same nature, there is the same frenzy which seizes the worshippers and the same tendency toward sexual debauches, a sure sign of great nervous overexcitement. Robertson Smith had already noticed this curious influence of sad rites in the Semitic cults, in evil times, he says, when men's thoughts were habitually somber. They betook themselves to the physical excitement of religion as men now take refuge in wine. And so in general when an act of Semitic worship began with sorrow and lamentation, as in the mourning for Adonis, or the great atoning ceremonies which became common in later times, a swift revulsion of feeling followed. And the gloomy part of the service was presently, page 408, succeeded by a burst of hilarious revelry. In a word, even when religious ceremonies have a disquieting or saddening event as their point of departure, they retain their stimulating power over the effective state of the group and individuals. By the mere fact that they are collective, they raise the vital tone. When one feels life within him, whether it be in the form of painful irritation or happy enthusiasm, he does not believe in death. So he becomes reassured and takes courage again, and subjectively, everything goes on as if the right had really driven off the danger which was dreaded. This is how curing or preventive virtues come to be attributed to the movements which one makes, to the cries uttered, to the blood shed and to the wounds inflicted upon one's self or others. And as these different tortures necessarily make one suffer, suffering by itself is finally regarded as a means of conjuring evil or curing sickness. Later, when the majority of the religious forces had taken the form of moral personalities, the efficacy of these practices was explained by imagining that their object was to appease an evil-working or irritated God. But these conceptions only reflect the right and the sentiments it arouses, they are an interpretation of it, not its determining cause. A negligence of the ritual acts in the same way. It, too, is a menace for the group. It touches it in its moral existence for it touches it in its beliefs. But if the anger which it causes is affirmed ostensibly and energetically, it compensates the evil which it has caused. For if it is acutely felt by all, it is because the infraction committed is an exception and the common faith remains entire. So the moral unity of the group is not endangered. Now the penalty inflicted as an expiation is only a manifestation of the public anger, the material proof of its unanimity. So it really does have the healing effect attributed to it. 
At bottom. The sentiment which is at the root of the real expiatory rites does not differ in nature from that which we have found at the basis of the other piacular rites, it is a sort of irritated sorrow which tends to manifest itself by acts of destruction. Sometimes it is assuaged to the detriment of him who feels it, sometimes it is at the expense of some foreign third party. But in either case, the psychic mechanism is essentially the same. Page 409. 4. One of the greatest services which Robertson Smith has rendered to the science of religions is to have pointed out the ambiguity of the notion of sacredness. Religious forces are of two sorts. Some are beneficent, guardians of the physical and moral order, dispensers of life and health and all the qualities which men esteem, this is the case with the totemic principle, spread out in the whole species, the mythical ancestor. The animal protector, the civilizing heroes and the tutelar gods of every kind and degree. It matters little whether they are conceived as distinct personalities or as diffused energies. Under either form they fulfill the same function and affect the minds of the believers in the same way, the respect which they inspire is mixed with love and gratitude. The things and the persons which are normally connected with them participate in the same sentiments and the same character, these are holy things and persons. Such are the spots consecrated to the cult, the objects which serve in the regular rites, the priests, the ascetics, etc. On the other hand, there are evil and impure powers, productive of disorders, causes of death and sickness, instigators of sacrilege. The only sentiments which men have for them are a fear into which horror generally enters. Such are the forces upon which and by which the sorcerer acts, those which arise from corpses or the menstrual blood, those freed by every profanation of sacred things, etc. The spirits of the dead and malign genii of every sort are their personified forms. Between these two categories of forces and beings, the contrast is as complete as possible and even goes into the most radical antagonism. The good and salutary powers repel to a distance these others which deny and contradict them. Therefore the former are forbidden to the latter, any contact between them is considered the worst of profanations. This is the typical form of those interdicts between sacred things of different species, the existence of which we have already pointed out. Women during menstruation, and especially at its beginning, are impure. So at this moment they are rigorously sequestered, men may have no relations with them. Bullroarers and Chiringa never come near a dead man. A sacrilegious, page 410, person is excluded from the society of the faithful. Access to the cult is forbidden him. Thus the whole religious life gravitates about two contrary poles between which there is the same opposition as between the pure and the impure, the saint and the sacrilegious, the divine and the diabolic. But while these two aspects of the religious life oppose one another, there is a close kinship between them. In the first place, both have the same relation towards profane beings, these must abstain from all contact with impure things just as from the most holy things. The former are no less forbidden than the latter, they are withdrawn from circulation alike. This shows that they too are sacred. Of course the sentiments inspired by the two are not identical, respect is one thing, disgust and horror another. Yet, if the gestures are to be the same in both cases, the sentiments expressed must not differ in nature. And, in fact, there is a horror in religious respect, especially when it is very intense, while the fear inspired by malign powers is generally not without a certain reverential character. The shades by which these two attitudes are differentiated are even so slight sometimes that it is not always easy to say which state of mind the believers actually happen to be in. Among certain Semitic peoples, pork was forbidden, but it was not always known exactly whether this was because it was a pure or an impure thing and the same may be said of a very large number of elementary interdictions. But there is more to be said, it very frequently happens that an impure thing or an evil power becomes a holy thing or a guardian power, without changing its nature, through a simple modification of external circumstances. We have seen how the soul of a dead man, which is a dreaded principle at first, is transformed into a protecting genius as soon as the morning is finished. Likewise, the corpse, which begins by inspiring terror and aversion, is later regarded as a venerated relic, funeral anthropophagy, 
which is frequently practiced in the Australian societies, is a proof of this transformation. The totemic animal is the preeminently sacred being, but for him who eats its flesh unduly, it is a cause of death. In a general way, the sacrilegious person is merely a profane one who has been infected with a benevolent religious force. This changes its nature in changing its habitat, it defiles rather than sanctifies. The th page 411, blood issuing from the genital organs of a woman, though it is evidently as impure as that of menstruation, is frequently used as a remedy against sickness. The victim immolated in expiatory sacrifices is charged with impurities, for they have concentrated upon it the sins which were to be expiated. Yet, after it has been slaughtered, its flesh and blood are employed for the most pious uses. On the contrary, though the communion is generally a religious operation whose normal function is to consecrate, it sometimes produces the effects of a sacrilege. In certain cases, the persons who have communicated are forced to flee from one another as from men infected with a plague. One would say that they have become a source of dangerous contamination for one another, the sacred bond which unites them also separates them. Examples of this sort of communion are numerous in Australia. One of the most typical has been observed among the Naranyeri and the neighboring tribes. When an infant arrives in the world, its parents carefully preserve its umbilical cord, which is believed to conceal a part of its soul. Two persons who exchange the cords thus preserved communicate together by the very act of this exchange, for it is as though they exchanged their souls. But, at the same time, they are forbidden to touch or speak to or even to see one another. It is just as though they were each an object of horror for the other. So the pure and the impure are not two separate classes, but two varieties of the same class, which includes all sacred things. There are two sorts of sacredness, the propitious and the unpropitious, and not only is there no break of continuity between these two opposed forms, but also one object may pass from the one to the other without changing its nature. The pure is made out of the impure, and reciprocally. It is in the possibility of these transmutations that the ambiguity of the sacred consists. But even if Robertson Smith did have an active sentiment of this ambiguity, he never gave it an express explanation. He confined himself to remarking that, as all religious forces are indistinctly intense and contagious, it is wise not to approach them except with respectful precautions, no matter what direction their action may be exercised in. It seemed to him that he could thus account for the air of kinship which they all present, in, page 412, spite of the contrasts which opposed them otherwise. But the question was only put off. It still remains to be shown how it comes that the powers of evil have the same intensity and contagiousness as the others. In other words, how does it happen that they, too, are of a religious nature? Also, the energy and force of expansion which they have in common do not enable us to understand how, in spite of the conflict which divides them, they may be transformed into one another or substituted for each other in their respective functions. And how the pure may contaminate while the impure sometimes serves to sanctify. The explanation of piacular rites which we have proposed enables us to reply to this double question. We have seen, in fact, that the evil powers are the product of these rites and symbolize them. When a society is going through circumstances which sadden, perplex or irritate it, it exercises a pressure over its members, to make them bear witness, by significant acts, to their sorrow, perplexity, or anger. It imposes upon them the duty of weeping, groaning or inflicting wounds upon themselves or others, for these collective manifestations, and the moral communion which they show and strengthen. Restore to the group the energy which circumstances threaten to take away from it, and thus they enable it to become settled. This is the experience which men interpret when they imagine that outside them there are evil beings whose hostility, whether constitutional or temporary, can be appeased only by human suffering. These beings are nothing other than collective states objectified, they are society itself seen under one of its aspects. But we also know that the benevolent powers are constituted in the same way. They, too, result from the collective life and express it. They, too, represent the society, but seen from a very different attitude, to wit, at the moment when it confidently affirms itself and ardently presses on towards the realization of the ends which it pursues. 
Since, page 413, these two sorts of forces have a common origin, it is not at all surprising that, though facing in opposite directions, they should have the same nature. That they are equally intense and contagious and consequently forbidden and sacred. From this we are able to understand how they change into one another. Since they reflect the objective state in which the group happens to be, it is enough that this state change for their character to change. After the morning is over, the domestic group is recalmed by the morning itself, it regains confidence, the painful pressure which they felt exercised over them is relieved, they feel more at their ease. So it seems to them as though the spirit of the deceased had laid aside its hostile sentiments and become a benevolent protector. The other transmutations, examples of which we have cited, are to be explained in the same way. As we have already shown, the sanctity of a thing is due to the collective sentiment of which it is the object. If, in violation of the interdicts which isolate it, it comes in contact with a profane person, then this same sentiment will spread contagiously to this latter and imprint a special character upon him. But in spreading, it comes into a very different state from the one it was in at first. Offended and irritated by the profanation implied in this abusive and unnatural extension, it becomes aggressive and inclined to destructive violences, it tends to avenge itself for the offense suffered. Therefore the infected subject seems to be filled with a mighty and harmful force which menaces all that approaches him, it is as though he were marked with a stain or blemish. Yet the cause of this blemish is the same psychic state which, in other circumstances, consecrates and sanctifies. But if the anger thus aroused is satisfied by an expiatory right, it subsides, alleviated. The offended sentiment is appeased and returns to its original state. So it acts once more as it acted in the beginning, instead of contaminating, it sanctifies. As it continues to infect the object to which it is attached, this could never become profane and religiously indifferent again. But the direction of the religious force with which it seems to be filled is inverted, from being impure, it has become pure and an instrument of purification. In resume, the two poles of the religious life correspond to the two opposed states through which all social life passes. Between the propitiously sacred and the unpropitiously sacred there is the same contrast as between the states of collective well-being and ill-being. But since both are equally collective, there is, between the mythological constructions symbolizing them, an intimate kinship of nature. The sentiments held in common vary from extreme dejection to extreme joy, from, page 414, painful irritation to ecstatic enthusiasm but, in any case, there is a communion of minds and a mutual comfort resulting from this communion. The fundamental process is always the same, only circumstances color it differently. So, at bottom, it is the unity and the diversity of social life which make the simultaneous unity and diversity of sacred beings and things. This ambiguity, moreover, is not peculiar to the idea of sacredness alone, Something of this characteristic has been found in all the rites which we have been studying. Of course it was essential to distinguish them. To confuse them would have been to misunderstand the multiple aspects of the religious life. But, on the other hand, howsoever different they may be, there is no break of continuity between them. Quite on the contrary, they overlap one another and may even replace each other mutually. We have already shown how the rites of ablation and communion, the imitative rites and the commemorative rites frequently fulfill the same function. One might imagine that the negative cult, at least, would be more sharply separated from the positive cult, yet we have seen that the former may produce positive effects, identical with those produced by the latter. The same results are obtained by fasts, abstinences and self-mutilations as by communions, oblations and commemorations. Inversely, Offerings and sacrifices imply privations and renunciations of every sort. The continuity between ascetic and piacular rites is even more apparent, both are made up of sufferings, accepted or undergone, to which an analogous efficacy is attributed. Thus the practices, like the beliefs, are not arranged in two separate classes. Howsoever complex the outward manifestations of the religious life may be, at bottom it is one and simple. It responds everywhere to one and the same need, and is everywhere derived from one and the same mental state. In all its forms, 
its object is to raise man above himself and to make him lead a life superior to that which he would lead, if he followed only his own individual whims, beliefs express this life in representations. Rights organize it and regulate its working. Page 415. Conclusion. At the beginning of this work we announced that the religion whose study we were taking up contained within it the most characteristic elements of the religious life. The exactness of this proposition may now be verified. Howsoever simple the system which we have studied may be, we have found within it all the great ideas and the principal ritual attitudes which are at the basis of even the most advanced religions, the division of things into sacred and profane. The notions of the soul, of spirits, of mythical personalities, and of a national and even international divinity, a negative cult with ascetic practices which are its exaggerated form, rites of oblation and communion, imitative rites. Commemorative rites and expiatory rites. Nothing essential is lacking. We are thus in a position to hope that the results at which we have arrived are not peculiar to totemism alone, but can aid us in an understanding of what religion in general is. It may be objected that one single religion, whatever its field of extension may be, is too narrow a base for such an induction. We have not dreamed for a moment of ignoring the fact that an extended verification may add to the authority of a theory, but it is equally true that when a law has been proven by one well-made experiment, this proof is valid universally. If in one single case a scientist succeeded in finding out the secret of the life of even the most protoplasmic creature that can be imagined, the truths thus obtained would be applicable to all living beings, even the most advanced. Then if, in our studies of these very humble societies, we have really succeeded in discovering some of the elements out of which the most fundamental religious notions are made up. There is no reason for not extending the most general results of our researches to other religions. In fact, it is inconceivable that the same effect may be due now to one cause, now to another, according to the circumstances, unless the two causes are at bottom only one. A single idea cannot express one reality here and another one there, unless the duality is only apparent. If among certain peoples the ideas of sacredness, the soul and God are to be, page 416, explained sociologically, it should be presumed scientifically that, in principle, the same explanation is valid for all the peoples among whom these same ideas are found with the same essential characteristics. Therefore, supposing that we have not been deceived, certain at least of our conclusions can be legitimately generalized. The moment has come to disengage these. And an induction of this sort, having at its foundation a clearly defined experiment, is less adventurous than many summary generalizations which, while attempting to reach the essence of religion at once, without resting upon the careful analysis of any religion in particular, greatly risk losing themselves in space. I. The theorists who have undertaken to explain religion in rational terms have generally seen in it before all else a system of ideas, corresponding to some determined object. This object has been conceived in a multitude of ways, nature, the infinite, the unknowable, the ideal, etc., but these differences matter but little. In any case, it was the conceptions and beliefs which were considered as the essential elements of religion. As for the rites, from this point of view they appear to be only an external translation, contingent and material, of these internal states which alone pass as having any intrinsic value. This conception is so commonly held that generally the disputes of which religion is the theme turn about the question whether it can conciliate itself with science or not, that is to say, whether or not there is a place beside our scientific knowledge for another form of thought which would be specifically religious. But the believers, the men who lead the religious life and have a direct sensation of what it really is, object to this way of regarding it, saying that it does not correspond to their daily experience. In fact, they feel that the real function of religion is not to make us think, to enrich our knowledge, nor to add to the conceptions which we owe to science others of another origin and another character but rather, it is to make us act. To aid us to live. The believer who has communicated with his God is not merely a man who sees new truths of which the unbeliever is ignorant, he is a man who is stronger. He feels within him more force either to endure the trials of existence, or to conquer them. It is as though he were raised above the miseries of the world, 
because he is raised above his condition as a mere man, he believes that he is saved from evil, under whatever form he may conceive this evil. The first article in every creed is the belief in salvation by faith. But it is hard to see how a mere, page 417, idea could have this efficacy. An idea is in reality only a part of ourselves. Then how could it confer upon us powers superior to those which we have of our own nature? Howsoever rich it might be in effective virtues, it could add nothing to our natural vitality. For it could only release the motive powers which are within us, neither creating them nor increasing them. From the mere fact that we consider an object worthy of being loved and sought after, it does not follow that we feel ourselves stronger afterwards. It is also necessary that this object set free energy superior to these which we ordinarily have at our command and also that we have some means of making these enter into us and unite themselves to our interior lives. Now for that, it is not enough that we think of them, it is also indispensable that we place ourselves within their sphere of action, and that we set ourselves where we may best feel their influence. In a word, it is necessary that we act and that we repeat the acts thus necessary every time we feel the need of renewing their effects. From this point of view, it is readily seen how that group of regularly repeated acts which form the cult get their importance. In fact, whoever has really practiced a religion knows very well that it is the cult which gives rise to these impressions of joy, of interior peace, of serenity, of enthusiasm which are, for the believer, an experimental proof of his beliefs. The cult is not simply a system of signs by which the faith is outwardly translated, it is a collection of the means by which this is created and recreated periodically. Whether it consists in material acts or mental operations, it is always this which is efficacious. Our entire study rests upon this postulate that the unanimous sentiment of the believers of all times cannot be purely illusory. Together with a recent apologist of the faith we admit that these religious beliefs rest upon a specific experience whose demonstrative value is, in one sense, not one bit inferior to that of scientific experiments, though different from them. We, too, think that, a tree is known by its fruits, and that fertility is the best proof of what the roots are worth. But from the fact that a, religious experience, if we choose to call it this, does exist and that it has a certain foundation, and, by the way, is there any experience which has none? It does not follow that the reality which is its foundation conforms objectively to the idea which believers have of it. The very fact that the fashion in which it has been conceived has varied infinitely in different times is enough to prove that none of these conceptions express it adequately. If a scientist states it as an axiom, page 418, that the sensations of heat and light which we feel correspond to some objective cause, he does not conclude that this is what it appears to the senses to be. Likewise, even if the impressions which the faithful feel are not imaginary, still they are in no way privileged intuitions. There is no reason for believing that they inform us better upon the nature of their object than do ordinary sensations upon the nature of bodies and their properties. In order to discover what this object consists of, we must submit them to an examination and elaboration analogous to that which has substituted for the sensuous idea of the world another which is scientific and conceptual. This is precisely what we have tried to do, and we have seen that this reality, which mythologies have represented under so many different forms, but which is the universal and eternal objective cause of these sensations sway generous out of which religious experience is made, is society. We have shown what moral forces it develops and how it awakens this sentiment of a refuge, of a shield and of a guardian support which attaches the believer to his cult. It is that which raises him outside himself, it is even that which made him. For that which makes a man is the totality of the intellectual property which constitutes civilization, and civilization is the work of society. Thus is explained the preponderating role of the cult in all religions, whichever they may be. This is because society cannot make its influence felt unless it is in action, and it is not in action unless the individuals who compose it are assembled together and act in common. It is by common action that it takes consciousness of itself and realizes its position, it is before all else an active cooperation. The collective ideas and sentiments are even possible only owing to these exterior movements which symbolize them, as we have established. Then it is action which dominates the religious life 
because of the mere fact that it is society which is its source. In addition to all the reasons which have been given to justify this conception, a final one may be added here, which is the result of our whole work. As we have progressed, we have established the fact that the fundamental categories of thought, and consequently of science, are of religious origin. We have seen that the same is true for magic and consequently for the different processes which have issued from it. On the other hand, it has long been known that up until a relatively advanced moment of evolution, moral and legal rules have been indistinguishable from ritual prescriptions. In summing up, then, it may be said that nearly all the great social institutions have, page 419, been born in religion. Now in order that these principal aspects of the collective life may have commenced by being only varied aspects of the religious life, it is obviously necessary that the religious life be the eminent form and, as it were, the concentrated expression of the whole collective life. If religion has given birth to all that is essential in society, it is because the idea of society is the soul of religion. Religious forces are therefore human forces, moral forces. It is true that since collective sentiments can become conscious of themselves only by fixing themselves upon external objects, they have not been able to take form without adopting some of their characteristics from other things, they have thus acquired a sort of physical nature. In this way they have come to mix themselves with the life of the material world, and then have considered themselves capable of explaining what passes there. But when they are considered only from this point of view and in this role, only their most superficial aspect is seen. In reality, the essential elements of which these collective sentiments are made have been borrowed by the understanding. It ordinarily seems that they should have a human character only when they are conceived under human forms, but even the most impersonal and the most anonymous are nothing else than objectified sentiments. It is only by regarding religion from this angle that it is possible to see its real significance. If we stick closely to appearances, Rites often give the effect of purely manual operations, they are anointings, washings, meals. To consecrate something, it is put in contact with a source of religious energy, just as today a body is put in contact with a source of heat or electricity to warm or electrize it, the two processes employed are not essentially different. Thus understood, religious technique seems to be a sort of mystic mechanics. But these material maneuvers are only the external envelope under which the mental operations are hidden. Finally, there is no question of exercising a physical constraint upon blind and, incidentally, imaginary forces, but rather of reaching individual consciousnesses, of giving them a direction and of disciplining them. It is sometimes said, page 420, that inferior religions are materialistic. Such an expression is inexact. All religions, even the crudest, are in a sense spiritualistic, for the powers they put in play are before all spiritual, and also their principal object is to act upon the moral life. Thus it is seen that whatever has been done in the name of religion cannot have been done in vain, for it is necessarily the society that did it, and it is humanity that has reaped the fruits. But, it is said, what society is it that has thus made the basis of religion? Is it the real society? such as it is and acts before our very eyes, with the legal and moral organization which it has laboriously fashioned during the course of history? This is full of defects and imperfections. In it, evil goes beside the good, injustice often reigns supreme, and the truth is often obscured by error. How could anything so crudely organized inspire the sentiments of love, the ardent enthusiasm and the spirit of abnegation which all religions claim of their followers? These perfect beings which are gods could not have taken their traits from so mediocre, and sometimes even so base a reality. But, on the other hand, does someone think of a perfect society, where justice and truth would be sovereign, and from which evil in all its forms would be banished for ever? No one would deny that this is in close relations with the religious sentiment, for, they would say, it is towards the realization of this that all religions strive. But that society is not an empirical fact, definite and observable. It is a fancy, a dream with which men have lightened their sufferings, but in which they have never really lived. It is merely an idea which comes to express our more or less obscure aspirations towards the good, the beautiful, and the ideal. 
now these aspirations have their roots in us, they come from the very depths of our being, then there is nothing outside of us which can account for them. Moreover, they are already religious in themselves. Thus it would seem that the ideal society presupposes religion, far from being able to explain it. But, in the first place, things are arbitrarily simplified when religion is seen only on its idealistic side, in its way, it is realistic. There is no physical or moral ugliness, there are no vices or evils which do not have a special divinity. There are gods of theft and trickery, of lust and war, of sickness and of death. Christianity itself, howsoever high the idea which it has made of the divinity may be, has been obliged to give the spirit of evil a place in its mythology. Satan is an essential piece of the Christian system. Even if he is an impure being, he is not a profane one. The anti-God, is a God, inferior and subordinated, it is true, but, page 421, nevertheless endowed with extended powers, he is even the object of rights, at least of negative ones. Thus religion, far from ignoring the real society and making abstraction of it, is in its image, it reflects all its aspects, even the most vulgar and the most repulsive. All is to be found there, and if in the majority of cases we see the good victorious over evil, life over death, the powers of light over the powers of darkness, it is because reality is not otherwise. If the relation between these two contrary forces were reversed, life would be impossible, but, as a matter of fact, it maintains itself and even tends to develop. But if, in the midst of these mythologies and theologies we see reality clearly appearing, it is none the less true that it is found there only in an enlarged, transformed and idealized form. In this respect, the most primitive religions do not differ from the most recent and the most refined. For example, we have seen how the Arunta place at the beginning of time a mythical society whose organization exactly reproduces that which still exists today. It includes the same clans and fratries, it is under the same matrimonial rules and it practices the same rites. But the personages who compose it are ideal beings, gifted with powers and virtues to which common mortals cannot pretend. Their nature is not only higher, but it is different, since it is at once animal and human. The evil powers there undergo a similar metamorphosis, evil itself is, as it were, made sublime and idealized. The question now raises itself of whence this idealization comes. Some reply that men have a natural faculty for idealizing, that is to say, of substituting for the real world another different one, to which they transport themselves by thought. But that is merely changing the terms of the problem, it is not resolving it or even advancing it. This systematic idealization is an essential characteristic of religions. Explaining them by an innate power of idealization is simply replacing one word by another which is the equivalent of the first, it is as if they said that men have made religions because they have a religious nature. Animals know only one world, the one which they perceive by experience, internal as well as external. Men alone have the faculty of conceiving the ideal, of adding something to the real. Now where does this singular privilege come from? Before making it an initial fact or a mysterious virtue which escapes science, we must be sure that it does not depend upon empirically determinable conditions. The explanation of religion which we have proposed has precisely this advantage, that it gives an answer to this question. Page 422, for our definition of the sacred is that it is something added to and above the real, now the ideal answers to this same definition, we cannot explain one without explaining the other. In fact, we have seen that if collective life awakens religious thought on reaching a certain degree of intensity, it is because it brings about a state of effervescence which changes the conditions of psychic activity. Vital energies are overexcited, passions more active, sensations stronger, there are even some which are produced only at this moment. A man does not recognize himself. He feels himself transformed and consequently he transforms the environment which surrounds him. In order to account for the very particular impressions which he receives, he attributes to the things with which he is in most direct contact properties which they have not. Exceptional powers and virtues which the objects of everyday experience do not possess. In a word, above the real world where his profane life passes he has placed another which, in one sense, 
does not exist except in thought, but to which he attributes a higher sort of dignity than to the first. Thus, from a double point of view it is an ideal world. The formation of the ideal world is therefore not an irreducible fact which escapes science, it depends upon conditions which observation can touch, it is a natural product of social life. For a society to become conscious of itself and maintain at the necessary degree of intensity the sentiments which it thus attains, it must assemble and concentrate itself. Now this concentration brings about an exaltation of the mental life which takes form in a group of ideal conceptions where is portrayed the new life thus awakened. They correspond to this new set of psychical forces which is added to those which we have at our disposition for the daily tasks of existence. A society can neither create itself nor recreate itself without at the same time creating an ideal. This creation is not a sort of work of supererogation for it, by which it would complete itself, being already formed, it is the act by which it is periodically made and remade. Therefore when some oppose the ideal society to the real society, like two antagonists which would lead us in opposite directions, they materialize and oppose abstractions. The ideal society is not outside of the real society, it is a part of it. Far from being divided between them as between two poles which mutually repel each other, we cannot hold to one without holding to the other. For a society is not made up merely of the mass of individuals who compose it, the ground which they occupy, the things which they use and the movements which they perform, but above all is the idea which it forms of itself. It is on, page 423, doubtedly true that it hesitates over the manner in which it ought to conceive itself, it feels itself drawn in divergent directions. But these conflicts which break forth are not between the ideal and reality, but between two different ideals, that of yesterday and that of today, that which has the authority of tradition and that which has the hope of the future. There is surely a place for investigating whence these ideals evolve, but whatever solution may be given to this problem, it still remains that all passes in the world of the ideal. Thus the collective ideal which religion expresses is far from being due to a vague innate power of the individual, but it is rather at the school of collective life that the individual has learned to idealize. It is in assimilating the ideals elaborated by society that he has become capable of conceiving the ideal. It is society which, by leading him within its sphere of action, has made him acquire the need of raising himself above the world of experience and has at the same time furnished him with the means of conceiving another. For society has constructed this new world in constructing itself, since it is society which this expresses. Thus both with the individual and in the group, the faculty of idealizing has nothing mysterious about it. It is not a sort of luxury which a man could get along without, but a condition of his very existence. He could not be a social being, that is to say, he could not be a man, if he had not acquired it. It is true that in incarnating themselves in individuals, collective ideals tend to individualize themselves. Each understands them after his own fashion and marks them with his own stamp, he suppresses certain elements and adds others. Thus the personal ideal disengages itself from the social ideal in proportion as the individual personality develops itself and becomes an autonomous source of action. But if we wish to understand this aptitude, so singular in appearance, of living outside of reality, it is enough to connect it with the social conditions upon which it depends. Therefore it is necessary to avoid seeing in this theory of religion a simple restatement of historical materialism, that would be misunderstanding our thought to an extreme degree. In showing that religion is something essentially social, we do not mean to say that it confines itself to translating into another language the material forms of society and its immediate vital necessities. It is true that we take it as evident that social life depends upon its material foundation and bears its mark, just as the mental life of an individual depends upon his nervous system and in fact his whole organism. But collective consciousness is something more than a mere epiphenomenon of its, page 424, morphological basis, just as individual consciousness is something more than a simple efflorescence of the nervous system. In order that the former may appear, a synthesis sway generous of particular consciousnesses is required. Now this synthesis has the effect of disengaging a whole world of sentiments, ideas and images which, once born, obey laws all their own. They attract each other, 
repel each other, unite, divide themselves, and multiply, though these combinations are not commanded and necessitated by the condition of the underlying reality. The life thus brought into being even enjoys so great an independence that it sometimes indulges in manifestations with no purpose or utility of any sort, for the mere pleasure of affirming itself. We have shown that this is often precisely the case with ritual activity and mythological thought. But if religion is the product of social causes, how can we explain the individual cult and the universalistic character of certain religions? If it is born in foro externo, how has it been able to pass into the inner conscience of the individual and penetrate there ever more and more profoundly? If it is the work of definite and individualized societies, how has it been able to detach itself from them, even to the point of being conceived as something common to all humanity? In the course of our studies, we have met with the germs of individual religion and of religious cosmopolitanism, and we have seen how they were formed. Thus we possess the more general elements of the reply which is to be given to this double question. We have shown how the religious force which animates the clan particularizes itself, by incarnating itself in particular consciousnesses. Thus secondary sacred beings are formed, each individual has his own, made in his own image, associated to his own intimate life, bound up with his own destiny, it is the soul, the individual totem, the protecting ancestor, etc. These beings are the object of rites which the individual can celebrate by himself, outside of any group, this is the first form of the individual cult. To be sure, it is only a very rudimentary cult. But since the personality of the individual is still only slightly marked, and but little value is attributed to it, the cult which expresses it could hardly be expected to be very highly developed as yet. But as individuals have differentiated themselves more and more and the value of an individual, page 425, has increased. The corresponding cult has taken a relatively greater place in the totality of the religious life and at the same time it is more fully closed to outside influences. Thus the existence of individual cults implies nothing which contradicts or embarrasses the sociological interpretation of religion, for the religious forces to which it addresses itself are only the individualized forms of collective forces. Therefore, even when religion seems to be entirely within the individual conscience, it is still in society that it finds the living source from which it is nourished. We are now able to appreciate the value of the radical individualism which would make religion something purely individual, it misunderstands the fundamental conditions of the religious life. If up to the present it has remained in the stage of theoretical aspirations which have never been realized, it is because it is unrealizable. A philosophy may well be elaborated in the silence of the interior imagination, but not so a faith. For before all else, a faith is warmth, life, enthusiasm, the exaltation of the whole mental life, the raising of the individual above himself. Now how could he add to the energies which he possesses without going outside himself? How could he surpass himself merely by his own forces? The only source of life at which we can morally reanimate ourselves is that formed by the society of our fellow beings. The only moral forces with which we can sustain and increase our own are those which we get from others. Let us even admit that there really are beings more or less analogous to those which the mythologies represent. In order that they may exercise over souls the useful direction which is their reason for existence, it is necessary that men believe in them. Now these beliefs are active only when they are partaken by many. A man cannot retain them any length of time by a purely personal effort, it is not thus that they are born or that they are acquired, it is even doubtful if they can be kept under these conditions. In fact, a man who has a veritable faith feels an invincible need of spreading it, Therefore he leaves his isolation, approaches others, and seeks to convince them, and it is the ardor of the convictions which he arouses that strengthens his own. It would quickly weaken if it remained alone. It is the same with religious universalism as with this individualism. Far from being an exclusive attribute of certain very great religions, we have found it, not at the base, it is true, but at the summit of the Australian system. Bunjil, Duramulan, or Bayam are not simple tribal gods. Each of them is recognized by a number of different tribes. In a sense, their cult is international. This conception is therefore very near to that found, page 426, 
in the most recent theologies. So certain writers have felt it their duty to deny its authenticity, howsoever incontestable this may be. And we have been able to show how this has been formed. Neighboring tribes of a similar civilization cannot fail to be in constant relations with each other. All sorts of circumstances give an occasion for it, besides commerce, which is still rudimentary, there are marriages. These international marriages are very common in Australia. In the course of these meetings, men naturally become conscious of the moral relationship which united them. They have the same social organization, the same division into fratries, clans and matrimonial classes, they practice the same rites of initiation, or wholly similar ones. Mutual loans and treaties result in reinforcing these spontaneous resemblances. The gods to which these manifestly identical institutions were attached could hardly have remained distinct in their minds. Everything tended to bring them together and consequently, even supposing that each tribe elaborated the notion independently, they must necessarily have tended to confound themselves with each other. Also, it is probable that it was in intertribal assemblies that they were first conceived. For they are chiefly the gods of initiation, and in the initiation ceremonies, the different tribes are usually represented. So if sacred beings are formed which are connected with no geographically determined society, that is not because they have an extra social origin. It is because there are other groups above these geographically determined ones, whose contours are less clearly marked, they have no fixed frontiers, but include all sorts of more or less neighboring and related tribes. The particular social life thus created tends to spread itself over an area with no definite limits. Naturally the mythological personages who correspond to it have the same character, their sphere of influence is not limited. They go beyond the particular tribes and their territory. They are the great international gods. Now there is nothing in this situation which is peculiar to Australian societies. There is no people and no state which is not a part of another society, more or less unlimited, which embraces all the peoples and all the states with which the first comes in contact, either directly or indirectly. There is no national life which is not dominated by a collective life of an international nature. In proportion as we advance in history, these international groups acquire a greater importance and extent. Thus we see how, in certain cases, this universalistic tendency has been able to develop itself to the point of affecting, page 427, not only the higher ideas of the religious system, but even the principles upon which it rests. 2. Thus there is something eternal in religion which is destined to survive all the particular symbols in which religious thought has successively enveloped itself. There can be no society which does not feel the need of upholding and reaffirming at regular intervals the collective sentiments and the collective ideas which make its unity and its personality. Now this moral remaking cannot be achieved except by the means of reunions, assemblies and meetings where the individuals, being closely united to one another, reaffirm in common their common sentiments. Hence come ceremonies which do not differ from regular religious ceremonies either in their object, the results which they produce, or the processes employed to attain these results. What essential difference is there between an assembly of Christians celebrating the principal dates of the life of Christ, or of Jews remembering the exodus from Egypt or the promulgation of the Decalogue, and a reunion of citizens commemorating the promulgation of a new moral or legal system or some great event in the national life? If we find a little difficulty today in imagining what these feasts and ceremonies of the future could consist in, it is because we are going through a stage of transition and moral mediocrity. The great things of the past which filled our fathers with enthusiasm do not excite the same ardor in us, either because they have come into common usage to such an extent that we are unconscious of them. Or else because they no longer answer to our actual aspirations. But as yet there is nothing to replace them. We can no longer impassionate ourselves for the principles in the name of which Christianity recommended to masters that they treat their slaves humanely, and, on the other hand, the idea which it has formed of human equality and fraternity seems to us today to leave too large a place for unjust inequalities. Its pity for the outcast seems to us too platonic, we desire another which would be more practicable, but as yet we cannot clearly see what it should be nor how it could be realized in facts. In a word, 
The old gods are growing old or already dead, and others are not yet born. This is what rendered vain the attempt of Kant with the old historic souvenirs artificially revived. It is life itself, and not a dead past which can produce a living cult. But this state of incertitude and confused agitation cannot last forever. A day will come when our societies will, page 428, know again those hours of creative effervescence, in the course of which new ideas arise and new formulae are found which serve for a while as a guide to humanity. And when these hours shall have been passed through once, men will spontaneously feel the need of reliving them from time to time in thought, that is to say, of keeping alive their memory by means of celebrations which regularly reproduce their fruits. We have already seen how the French Revolution established a whole cycle of holidays to keep the principles with which it was inspired in a state of perpetual youth. If this institution quickly fell away, it was because the revolutionary faith lasted but a moment, and deceptions and discouragements rapidly succeeded the first moments of enthusiasm. But though the work may have miscarried, it enables us to imagine what might have happened in other conditions, and everything leads us to believe that it will be taken up again sooner or later. There are no gospels which are immortal, but neither is there any reason for believing that humanity is incapable of inventing new ones. As to the question of what symbols this new faith will express itself with, whether they will resemble those of the past or not, and whether or not they will be more adequate for the reality which they seek to translate. That is something which surpasses the human faculty of foresight and which does not appertain to the principal question. But feasts and rites, in a word, the cult, are not the whole religion. This is not merely a system of practices, but also a system of ideas whose object is to explain the world, we have seen that even the humblest have their cosmology. Whatever connection there may be between these two elements of the religious life, they are still quite different. The one is turned towards action, which it demands and regulates. The other is turned towards thought, which it enriches and organizes. Then they do not depend upon the same conditions, and consequently it may be asked if the second answers to necessities as universal and as permanent as the first. When specific characteristics are attributed to religious thought, and when it is believed that its function is to express, by means peculiar to itself, an aspect of reality which evades ordinary knowledge as well as science. One naturally refuses to admit that religion can ever abandon its speculative role. But our analysis of the facts does not seem to have shown this specific quality of religion. The religion which we have just studied is one of those whose symbols are the most disconcerting for the reason. There all appears mysterious. These beings which belong to the most heterogeneous groups at the same time, who multiply, page 429, without ceasing to be one, who divide without diminishing, all seem, at first view, to belong to an entirely different world from the one where we live. Some have even gone so far as to say that the mind which constructed them ignored the laws of logic completely. Perhaps the contrast between reason and faith has never been more thorough. Then if there has ever been a moment in history when their heterogeneousness should have stood out clearly, it is here. But contrary to all appearances, as we have pointed out, the realities to which religious speculation is then applied are the same as those which later serve as the subject of reflection for philosophers, they are nature, man, society. The mystery which appears to surround them is wholly superficial and disappears before a more painstaking observation, it is enough merely to set aside the veil with which mythological imagination has covered them for them to appear such as they really are. Religion sets itself to translate these realities into an intelligible language which does not differ in nature from that employed by science. The attempt is made by both to connect things with each other, to establish internal relations between them, to classify them and to systematize them. We have even seen that the essential ideas of scientific logic are of religious origin. It is true that in order to utilize them, science gives them a new elaboration, it purges them of all accidental elements, in a general way, it brings a spirit of criticism into all its doings, which religion ignores. It surrounds itself with precautions to escape precipitation and bias, and to hold aside the passions, prejudices and all subjective influences. But these perfectionings of method are not enough to differentiate it from religion. 
In this regard, both pursue the same end, scientific thought is only a more perfect form of religious thought. Thus it seems natural that the second should progressively retire before the first, as this becomes better fitted to perform the task. And there is no doubt that this regression has taken place in the course of history. Having left religion, science tends to substitute itself for this latter in all that which concerns the cognitive and intellectual functions. Christianity has already definitely consecrated this substitution in the order of material things. Seeing in matter that which is profane before all else, it readily left the knowledge of this to another discipline, tradit at mundum hominum disputationi, he gave the world over to the disputes of men. It is thus that the natural sciences have been able to establish themselves and make their authority recognized without very great difficulty. But it could not give up the world of souls so easily. For it is before all over souls that the God of, page 430, the Christians aspires to reign. That is why the idea of submitting the psychic life to science produced the effect of a sort of profanation for a long time. Even today it is repugnant to many minds. However, experimental and comparative psychology is founded and today we must reckon with it. But the world of the religious and moral life is still forbidden. The great majority of men continue to believe that here there is an order of things which the mind cannot penetrate except by very special ways. Hence comes the active resistance which is met with every time that someone tries to treat religious and moral phenomena scientifically. But in spite of these oppositions, these attempts are constantly repeated and this persistence even allows us to foresee that this final barrier will finally give way and that science will establish herself as mistress even in this reserved region. That is what the conflict between science and religion really amounts to. It is said that science denies religion in principle. But religion exists, it is a system of given facts, in a word, it is a reality. How could science deny this reality? Also, in so far as religion is action, and in so far as it is a means of making men live, science could not take its place, for even if this expresses life, it does not create it. It may well seek to explain the faith, but by that very act it presupposes it. Thus there is no conflict except upon one limited point. Of the two functions which religion originally fulfilled, there is one, and only one, which tends to escape it more and more, that is its speculative function. That which science refuses to grant to religion is not its right to exist, but its right to dogmatize upon the nature of things and the special competence which it claims for itself for knowing man and the world. As a matter of fact, it does not know itself. It does not even know what it is made of, nor to what need it answers. It is itself a subject for science, so far is it from being able to make the law for science. And from another point of view, since there is no proper subject for religious speculation outside that reality to which scientific reflection is applied. It is evident that this former cannot play the same role in the future as it has played in the past. However, it seems destined to transform itself rather than to disappear. We have said that there is something eternal in religion, it is the cult and the faith. Men cannot celebrate ceremonies for which they see no reason, nor can they accept a faith which they in no way understand. To spread itself or merely to maintain itself, it must be justified, that is to say, a theory must be made of it. A theory of this sort must undoubtedly be founded, page 431, upon the different sciences, from the moment when these exist, first of all, upon the social sciences, for religious faith has its origin in society. Then upon psychology, for society is a synthesis of human consciousnesses, and finally upon the sciences of nature, for man and society are a part of the universe and can be abstracted from it only artificially. But howsoever important these facts taken from the constituted sciences may be, they are not enough, for faith is before all else an impetus to action, while science, no matter how far it may be pushed, always remains at a distance from this. Science is fragmentary and incomplete, it advances but slowly and is never finished, but life cannot wait. The theories which are destined to make men live and act are therefore obliged to pass science and complete it prematurely. 
They are possible only when the practical exigencies and the vital necessities which we feel without distinctly conceiving them push thought in advance, beyond that which science permits us to affirm. Thus religions, even the most rational and laicized, cannot and never will be able to dispense with a particular form of speculation which, though having the same subjects as science itself, cannot be really scientific, the obscure intuitions of sensation and sentiment too often take the place of logical reasons. On one side, this speculation resembles that which we meet within the religions of the past, but on another, it is different. While claiming and exercising the right of going beyond science, it must commence by knowing this and by inspiring itself with it. Ever since the authority of science was established, it must be reckoned with. One can go farther than it under the pressure of necessity, but he must take his direction from it. He can affirm nothing that it denies, deny nothing that it affirms, and establish nothing that is not directly or indirectly founded upon principles taken from it. From now on, the faith no longer exercises the same hegemony as formerly over the system of ideas that we may continue to call religion. A rival power rises up before it which, being born of it, ever after submits it to its criticism and control. And everything makes us foresee that this control will constantly become more extended and efficient, while no limit can be assigned to its future influence. 3. But if the fundamental notions of science are of a religious origin, how has religion been able to bring them forth? At first sight, one does not see what relations there can be between religion and logic. Or, since the reality which religious thought expresses is society, the question can be stated in the following, page 432, terms. Which make the entire difficulty appear even better, what has been able to make social life so important a source for the logical life? It seems as though nothing could have predestined it to this role, for it certainly was not to satisfy their speculative needs that men associated themselves together. Perhaps we shall be found overbold in attempting so complex a question here. To treat it as it should be treated, the sociological conditions of knowledge should be known much better than they actually are, we are only beginning to catch glimpses of some of them. However, the question is so grave, and so directly implied in all that has preceded, that we must make an effort not to leave it without an answer. Perhaps it is not impossible, even at present, to state some general principles which may at least aid in the solution. Logical thought is made up of concepts. Seeking how society can have played a role in the genesis of logical thought thus reduces itself to seeking how it can have taken a part in the formation of concepts. If, as is ordinarily the case, we see in the concept only a general idea, the problem appears insoluble. By his own power, the individual can compare his conceptions and images, disengage that which they have in common, and thus, in a word, generalize. Then it is hard to see why this generalization should be possible only in and through society. But, in the first place, it is inadmissible that logical thought is characterized only by the greater extension of the conceptions of which it is made up. If particular ideas have nothing logical about them, why should it be different with general ones? The general exists only in the particular, it is the particular simplified and impoverished. Then the first could have no virtues or privileges which the second has not. Inversely, if conceptual thought can be applied to the class, species, or variety, howsoever restricted these may be, why can it not be extended to the individual, that is to say, to the limit towards which the conception tends? Proportionately as its extension diminishes? As a matter of fact, there are many concepts which have only individuals as their object. In every sort of religion, gods are individualities distinct from each other, however, they are conceived, not perceived. Each people represents its historic or legendary heroes in fashions which vary with the time. Finally, every one of us forms an idea of the individuals with whom he comes in contact, of their character, of their appearance, their distinctive traits and their moral and physical temperaments, these notions, too, are real concepts. It is true that in general they are formed crudely enough. But even among, page 433, scientific concepts, are there a great many that are perfectly adequate for their object? In this direction, there are only differences of degree between them. Therefore the concept must be defined by other characteristics. 
It is opposed to sensual representations of every order, sensations, perceptions or images, by the following properties. Sensual representations are in a perpetual flux. They come after each other like the waves of a river, and even during the time that they last, they do not remain the same thing. Each of them is an integral part of the precise instant when it takes place. We are never sure of again finding a perception such as we experienced it the first time, for if the thing perceived has not changed, it is we who are no longer the same. On the contrary, the concept is, as it were, outside of time and change. It is in the depths below all this agitation, it might be said that it is in a different portion of the mind, which is serener and calmer. It does not move of itself, by an internal and spontaneous evolution, but, on the contrary, it resists change. It is a manner of thinking that, at every moment of time, is fixed and crystallized. In so far as it is what it ought to be, it is immutable. If it changes, it is not because it is its nature to do so, but because we have discovered some imperfection in it, it is because it had to be rectified. The system of concepts with which we think in everyday life is that expressed by the vocabulary of our mother tongue, for every word translates a concept. Now language is something fixed. It changes but very slowly, and consequently it is the same with the conceptual system which it expresses. The scholar finds himself in the same situation in regard to the special terminology employed by the science to which he has consecrated himself, and hence in regard to the special scheme of concepts to which this terminology corresponds. It is true that he can make innovations, but these are always a sort of violence done to the established ways of thinking. And at the same time that it is relatively immutable, the concept is universal, or at least capable of becoming so. A concept is not my concept, I hold it in common with other men, or, in any case, can communicate it to them. It is impossible for me to make a sensation pass from my consciousness into that of another. It holds closely to my organism and personality and cannot be detached from them. All that I can do is to invite others to place themselves before the same object as myself and to leave themselves to its action. On the other hand, conversation and all intellectual communication between men is an exchange of concepts. The concept is an essentially, page 434, impersonal representation, it is through it that human intelligences communicate. The nature of the concept, thus defined, bespeaks its origin. If it is common to all, it is the work of the community. Since it bears the mark of no particular mind, it is clear that it was elaborated by a unique intelligence, where all others meet each other, and after a fashion, come to nourish themselves. If it has more stability than sensations or images, it is because the collective representations are more stable than the individual ones. For while an individual is conscious even of the slight changes which take place in his environment, only events of a greater gravity can succeed in affecting the mental status of a society. Every time that we are in the presence of a type of thought or action which is imposed uniformly upon particular wills or intelligences, this pressure exercised over the individual betrays the intervention of the group. Also, as we have already said, the concepts with which we ordinarily think are those of our vocabulary. Now it is unquestionable that language, and consequently the system of concepts which it translates, is the product of a collective elaboration. What it expresses is the manner in which society as a whole represents the facts of experience. The ideas which correspond to the diverse elements of language are thus collective representations. Even their contents bear witness to the same fact. In fact, there are scarcely any words among those which we usually employ whose meaning does not pass, to a greater or less extent, the limits of our personal experience. Very frequently a term expresses things which we have never perceived or experiences which we have never had or of which we have never been the witnesses. Even when we know some of the objects which it concerns, it is only as particular examples that they serve to illustrate the idea which they would never have been able to form by themselves. Thus there is a great deal of knowledge, page 435, condensed in the word which I never collected, and which is not individual, it even surpasses me to such an extent that I cannot even completely appropriate all its results. Which of us knows all the words of the language he speaks and the entire signification of each? 
This remark enables us to determine the sense in which we mean to say that concepts are collective representations. If they belong to a whole social group, it is not because they represent the average of the corresponding individual representations. For in that case they would be poorer than the latter in intellectual content, while, as a matter of fact, they contain much that surpasses the knowledge of the average individual. They are not abstractions which have a reality only in particular consciousnesses, but they are as concrete representations as an individual could form of his own personal environment, they correspond to the way in which this very special being. Society, considers the things of its own proper experience. If, as a matter of fact, the concepts are nearly always general ideas, and if they express categories and classes rather than particular objects, it is because the unique and variable characteristics of things interest society but rarely. Because of its very extent, it can scarcely be affected by more than their general and permanent qualities. Therefore it is to this aspect of affairs that it gives its attention, it is a part of its nature to see things in large and under the aspect which they ordinarily have. But this generality is not necessary for them, and, in any case, even when these representations have the generic character which they ordinarily have, they are the work of society and are enriched by its experience. That is what makes conceptual thought so valuable for us. If concepts were only general ideas, they would not enrich knowledge a great deal, for, as we have already pointed out, the general contains nothing more than the particular. But if before all else they are collective representations, they add to that which we can learn by our own personal experience all that wisdom and science which the group has accumulated in the course of centuries. Thinking by concepts, is not merely seeing reality on its most general side, but it is projecting a light upon the sensation which illuminates it, penetrates it and transforms it. Conceiving something is both learning its essential elements better and also locating it in its place, for each civilization has its organized system of concepts which characterizes it. Before this scheme of ideas, the individual is in the same situation as the new Omicron of Plato before the world of ideas. He must assimilate them to himself, for he must have them to hold intercourse with others, but the assimilation is always imperfect. Page 436, each of us sees them after his own fashion. There are some which escape us completely and remain outside of our circle of vision, there are others of which we perceive certain aspects only. There are even a great many which we pervert in holding, for as they are collective by nature, they cannot become individualized without being retouched, modified, and consequently falsified. Hence comes the great trouble we have in understanding each other, and the fact that we even lie to each other without wishing to, it is because we all use the same words without giving them the same meaning. We are now able to see what the part of society in the genesis of logical thought is. This is possible only from the moment when, above the fugitive conceptions which they owe to sensuous experience, men have succeeded in conceiving a whole world of stable ideas, the common ground of all intelligences. In fact, logical thinking is always impersonal thinking, and is also thought subspecies eternitatis, as though for all time. Impersonality and stability are the two characteristics of truth. Now logical life evidently presupposes that men know, at least confusedly, that there is such a thing as truth, distinct from sensuous appearances. But how have they been able to arrive at this conception? We generally talk as though it should have spontaneously presented itself to them from the moment they opened their eyes upon the world. However, there is nothing in immediate experience which could suggest it, everything even contradicts it. Thus the child and the animal have no suspicion of it. History shows that it has taken centuries for it to disengage and establish itself. In our Western world, it was with the great thinkers of Greece that it first became clearly conscious of itself and of the consequences which it implies. When the discovery was made, it caused an amazement which Plato has translated into magnificent language. But if it is only at this epoch that the idea is expressed in philosophic formulae, it was necessarily pre-existent in the stage of an obscure sentiment. Philosophers have sought to elucidate this sentiment, but they have not succeeded. In order that they might reflect upon it and analyze it, it was necessary that it be given them, and that they seek to know whence it came, that is to say, in what experience it was founded. This is in collective experience. 
It is under the form of collective thought that impersonal thought is for the first time revealed to humanity, we cannot see by what other way this revelation could have been made. From the mere fact that society exists, there is also, outside of the individual sensations and images, a whole system of representations which enjoy marvelous properties. By means of them, men understand, page 437, each other and intelligences grasp each other. They have within them a sort of force or moral ascendancy, in virtue of which they impose themselves upon individual minds. Hence the individual at least obscurely takes account of the fact that above his private ideas, there is a world of absolute ideas according to which he must shape his own. He catches a glimpse of a whole intellectual kingdom in which he participates, but which is greater than he. This is the first intuition of the realm of truth. From the moment when he first becomes conscious of these higher ideas, he sets himself to scrutinizing their nature. He asks whence these preeminent representations hold their prerogatives and, in so far as he believes that he has discovered their causes, he undertakes to put these causes into action for himself. In order that he may draw from them by his own force the effects which they produce. That is to say, he attributes to himself the right of making concepts. Thus the faculty of conception has individualized itself. But to understand its origins and function, it must be attached to the social conditions upon which it depends. It may be objected that we show the concept in one of its aspects only, and that its unique role is not the assuring of a harmony among minds, but also, and to a greater extent, their harmony with the nature of things. It seems as though it had a reason for existence only on condition of being true, that is to say, objective, and as though its impersonality were only a consequence of its objectivity. It is in regard to things, thought of as adequately as possible, that minds ought to communicate. Nor do we deny that the evolution of concepts has been partially in this direction. The concept which was first held as true because it was collective tends to be no longer collective except on condition of being held as true, we demand its credentials of it before according it our confidence. But we must not lose sight of the fact that even today the great majority of the concepts which we use are not methodically constituted, we get them from language, that is to say, from common experience, without submitting them to any criticism. The scientifically elaborated and criticized concepts are always in the very slight minority. Also, between them and those which draw all their authority from the fact that they are collective, there are only differences of degree. A collective representation presents guarantees of objectivity by the fact that it is collective, for it is not without sufficient reason that it has been able to generalize and maintain itself with persistence. If it were out of accord with the nature of things, it would never have been able to acquire an extended, page 438, and prolonged empire over intellects. At bottom, the confidence inspired by scientific concepts is due to the fact that they can be methodically controlled. But a collective representation is necessarily submitted to a control that is repeated indefinitely. The men who accept it verify it by their own experience. Therefore, it could not be wholly inadequate for its subject. It is true that it may express this by means of imperfect symbols. But scientific symbols themselves are never more than approximative. It is precisely this principle which is at the basis of the method which we follow in the study of religious phenomena, we take it as an axiom that religious beliefs, howsoever strange their appearance may be at times, contain a truth which must be discovered. On the other hand, it is not at all true that concepts, even when constructed according to the rules of science, get their authority uniquely from their objective value. It is not enough that they be true to be believed. If they are not in harmony with the other beliefs and opinions, or, in a word, with the mass of the other collective representations, they will be denied, minds will be closed to them, consequently it will be as though they did not exist. Today it is generally sufficient that they bear the stamp of science to receive a sort of privileged credit, because we have faith in science. But this faith does not differ essentially from religious faith. In the last resort, the value which we attribute to science depends upon the idea which we collectively form of its nature and role in life, that is as much as to say that it expresses a state of public opinion. In all social life, in fact, science rests upon opinion. 
It is undoubtedly true that this opinion can be taken as the object of a study and a science made of it, this is what sociology principally consists in. But the science of opinion does not make opinions, it can only observe them and make them more conscious of themselves. It is true that by this means it can lead them to change, but science continues to be dependent upon opinion at the very moment when it seems to be making its laws. For, as we have already shown, it is from opinion that it holds the force necessary to act upon opinion. Saying that concepts express the manner in which society represents things is also saying that conceptual thought is coeval with humanity itself. We refuse to see in it the product of a more or less retarded culture. A man who did not think, page 439, with concepts would not be a man, for he would not be a social being. If reduced to having only individual perceptions, he would be indistinguishable from the beasts. If it has been possible to sustain the contrary thesis, it is because concepts have been defined by characteristics which are not essential to them. They have been identified with general ideas and with clearly limited and circumscribed general ideas. In these conditions it has possibly seemed as though the inferior societies had no concepts properly so called. For they have only rudimentary processes of generalization and the ideas which they use are not generally very well defined. But the greater part of our concepts are equally indetermined. We force ourselves to define them only in discussions or when doing careful work. We have also seen that conceiving is not generalizing. Thinking conceptually is not simply isolating and grouping together the common characteristics of a certain number of objects, it is relating the variable to the permanent, the individual to the social. And since logical thought commences with the concept, it follows that it has always existed, there is no period in history when men have lived in a chronic confusion and contradiction. To be sure, we cannot insist too much upon the different characteristics which logic presents at different periods in history, it develops like the societies themselves. But howsoever real these differences may be, they should not cause us to neglect the similarities, which are no less essential. 4. We are now in a position to take up a final question which has already been raised in our introduction and which has been taken as understood in the remainder of this work. We have seen that at least some of the categories are social things. The question is where they got this character. Undoubtedly it will be easily understood that since they are themselves concepts, they are the work of the group. It can even be said that there are no other concepts which present to an equal degree the signs by which a collective representation is recognized. In fact, their stability and impersonality are such that they have often passed as being absolutely universal and immutable. Also, as they express the fundamental conditions for an agreement between minds, it seems evident that they have been elaborated by society. Page 440. But the problem concerning them is more complex, for they are social in another sense and, as it were in the second degree. They not only come from society, but the things which they express are of a social nature. Not only is it society which has founded them, but their contents are the different aspects of the social being the category of class was at first indistinct from the concept of the human group. It is the rhythm of social life which is at the basis of the category of time, the territory occupied by the society furnished the material for the category of space. It is the collective force which was the prototype of the concept of efficient force, an essential element in the category of causality. However, the categories are not made to be applied only to the social realm, they reach out to all reality. Then how is it that they have taken from society the models upon which they have been constructed? It is because they are the preeminent concepts, which have a preponderating part in our knowledge. In fact, the function of the categories is to dominate and envelop all the other concepts, they are permanent molds for the mental life. Now for them to embrace such an object, they must be founded upon a reality of equal amplitude. Undoubtedly the relations which they express exist in an implicit way in individual consciousnesses. The individual lives in time, and, as we have said, he has a certain sense of temporal orientation. He is situated at a determined point in space, and it has even been held, and sustained with good reasons, that all sensations have something special about them. He has a feeling of resemblances. 
similar representations are brought together and the new representation formed by their union has a sort of generic character. We also have the sensation of a certain regularity in the order of the succession of phenomena. Even an animal is not incapable of this. However, all these relations are strictly personal for the individual who recognizes them, and consequently the notion of them which he may have can in no case go beyond his own narrow horizon. The generic images which are formed in my consciousness by the fusion of similar images represent only the objects which I have perceived directly. There is nothing there which could give me the idea of a class, that is to say, of a mold including the whole group of all possible objects which satisfy the same condition. Also, it would be necessary to have the idea of group in the first place, and the mere observations of our interior life could, page 441, never awaken that in us. But, above all, there is no individual experience, howsoever extended and prolonged it may be, which could give a suspicion of the existence of a whole class which would embrace every single being. And to which other classes are only coordinated or subordinated species. This idea of all, which is at the basis of the classifications which we have just cited, could not have come from the individual himself. Who is only a part in relation to the whole and who never attains more than an infinitesimal fraction of reality. And yet there is perhaps no other category of greater importance, for as the role of the categories is to envelop all the other concepts, the category par excellence would seem to be this very concept of totality. The theorists of knowledge ordinarily postulate it as if it came of itself, while it really surpasses the contents of each individual consciousness taken alone to an infinite degree. For the same reasons, the space which I know by my senses, of which I am the center and where everything is disposed in relation to me, could not be space in general. Which contains all extensions and where these are coordinated by personal guidelines which are common to everybody. In the same way, the concrete duration which I feel passing within me and with me could not give me the idea of time in general, the first expresses only the rhythm of my individual life. The second should correspond to the rhythm of a life which is not that of any individual in particular, but in which all participate. In the same way, finally, the regularities which I am able to conceive in the manner in which my sensations succeed one another may well have a value for me. They explain how it comes about that when I am given the first of two phenomena whose concurrence I have observed, I tend to expect the other. But this personal state of expectation could not be confounded with the conception of a universal order of succession which imposes itself upon all minds and all events. Since the world expressed by the entire system of concepts is the one that society regards, society alone can furnish the most general notions with which it should be represented. Such an object can be embraced only by a subject which contains all the individual subjects within it. Since the universe does not exist except in so far as it is thought of, and since it is not, page 442, completely thought of except by society, it takes a place in this latter. It becomes a part of society's interior life, while this is the totality, outside of which nothing exists. The concept of totality is only the abstract form of the concept of society, it is the whole which includes all things, the supreme class which embraces all other classes. Such is the final principle upon which repose all these primitive classifications where beings from every realm are placed and classified in social forms, exactly like men. But if the world is inside of society, the space which this latter occupies becomes confounded with space in general. In fact, we have seen how each thing has its assigned place in social space. And the degree to which this space in general differs from the concrete expanses which we perceive is well shown by the fact that this localization is wholly ideal and in no way resembles what it would have been if it had been dictated to us by sensuous experience alone. For the same reason, the rhythm of collective life dominates and embraces the varied rhythms of all the elementary lives from which it results, consequently the time which it expresses dominates and embraces all particular durations. It is time in general. For a long time the history of the world has been only another aspect of the history of society. The one commences with the other, the periods of the first are determined by the periods of the second. This impersonal and total duration is measured, and the guidelines in relation to which it is divided and organized are fixed by the movements of concentration or dispersion of society. 
or, more generally, the periodical necessities for a collective renewal. If these critical instants are generally attached to some material phenomenon, such as the regular recurrence of such or such a star or the alternation of the seasons. It is because objective signs are necessary to make this essentially social organization intelligible to all. In the same way, finally, the causal relation, from the moment when it is collectively stated by the group, becomes independent of every individual consciousness, it rises above all particular minds and events. It is a law whose value depends upon no person. We have already shown how it is clearly thus that it seems to have originated. Another reason explains why the constituent elements of the category should have been taken from social life, it is because the relations which they express could not have been learned except in and through society. If they are in a sense, page 443, imminent in the life of an individual, he has neither a reason nor the means for learning them, reflecting upon them and forming them into distinct ideas. In order to orient himself personally in space and to know at what moments he should satisfy his various organic needs, he has no need of making, once and for all, a conceptual representation of time and space. Many animals are able to find the road which leads to places with which they are familiar, they come back at a proper moment without knowing any of the categories, sensations are enough to direct them automatically. They would also be enough for men, if their sensations had to satisfy only individual needs. To recognize the fact that one thing resembles another which we have already experienced. It is in no way necessary that we arrange them all in groups and species, the way in which similar images call up each other and unite is enough to give the feeling of resemblance. The impression that a certain thing has already been seen or experienced implies no classification. To recognize the things which we should seek or from which we should flee, it would not be necessary to attach the effects of the two to their causes by a logical bond, if individual conveniences were the only ones in question. Purely empirical sequences and strong connections between the concrete representations would be as sure guides for the will. Not only is it true that the animal has no others, but also our own personal conduct frequently supposes nothing more. The prudent man is the one who has a very clear sensation of what must be done, but which he would ordinarily be quite incapable of stating as a general law. It is a different matter with society. This is possible only when the individuals and things which compose it are divided into certain groups, that is to say, classified, and when these groups are classified in relation to each other. Society supposes a self-conscious organization which is nothing other than a classification. This organization of society naturally extends itself to the place which this occupies. To avoid all collisions, it is necessary that each particular group have a determined portion of space assigned to it, in other terms, it is necessary that space in general be divided, differentiated, arranged. And that these divisions and arrangements be known to everybody. On the other hand, every summons to a celebration, a hunt or a military expedition implies fixed and established dates, and consequently that a common time is agreed upon, which everybody conceives in the same fashion. Finally, the cooperation of many persons with the same end in view is possible only when they are in agreement as to, page 444, the relation which exists between this end and the means of attaining it, that is to say, when the same causal relation is admitted by all the cooperators in the enterprise. It is not surprising, therefore, that social time, social space, social classes and causality should be the basis of the corresponding categories. Since it is under their social forms that these different relations were first grasped with a certain clarity by the human intellect. In summing up, then, we must say that society is not at all the illogical or alogical, incoherent and fantastic being which it has too often been considered. Quite on the contrary, the collective consciousness is the highest form of the psychic life, since it is the consciousness of the consciousnesses. Being placed outside of and above individual and local contingencies, it sees things only in their permanent and essential aspects, which it crystallizes into communicable ideas. At the same time that it sees from above, it sees farther. At every moment of time, it embraces all known reality, that is why it alone can furnish the mind with the molds which are applicable to the totality of things and which make it possible to think of them. It does not create these molds artificially, 
it finds them within itself, it does nothing but become conscious of them. They translate the ways of being which are found in all the stages of reality but which appear in their full clarity only at the summit. Because the extreme complexity of the psychic life which passes there necessitates a greater development of consciousness. Attributing social origins to logical thought is not debasing it or diminishing its value or reducing it to nothing more than a system of artificial combinations, on the contrary, it is relating it to a cause which implies it naturally. But this is not saying that the ideas elaborated in this way are at once adequate for their object. If society is something universal in relation to the individual, it is nonetheless an individuality itself, which has its own personal physiognomy and its idiosyncrasies. It is a particular subject and consequently particularizes whatever it thinks of. Therefore collective representations also contain subjective elements, and these must be progressively rooted out, if we are to approach reality more closely. But howsoever crude these may have been at the beginning, the fact remains that with them the germ of a new mentality was given, to which the individual could never have raised himself by his own efforts, by them the way was open to a stable. Impersonal and organized thought which then had nothing to do except to develop its nature. Page 445. Also, the causes which have determined this development do not seem to be specifically different from those which gave it its initial impulse. If logical thought tends to rid itself more and more of the subjective and personal elements which it still retains from its origin, it is not because extrasocial factors have intervened. It is much rather because a social life of a new sort is developing. It is this international life which has already resulted in universalizing religious beliefs. As it extends, the collective horizon enlarges. The society ceases to appear as the only whole, to become a part of a much vaster one, with indeterminate frontiers, which is susceptible of advancing indefinitely. Consequently things can no longer be contained in the social molds according to which they were primitively classified. They must be organized according to principles which are their own, so logical organization differentiates itself from the social organization and becomes autonomous. Really and truly human thought is not a primitive fact. It is the product of history, it is the ideal limit towards which we are constantly approaching, but which in all probability we shall never succeed in reaching. Thus it is not at all true that between science on the one hand, and morals and religion on the other, there exists that sort of antinomy which has so frequently been admitted. For the two forms of human activity really come from one and the same source. Kant understood this very well, and therefore he made the speculative reason and the practical reason two different aspects of the same faculty. According to him, what makes their unity is the fact that the two are directed towards the universal. Rational thinking is thinking according to the laws which are imposed upon all reasonable beings, acting morally is conducting oneself according to those maxims which can be extended without contradiction to all wills. In other words, science and morals imply that the individual is capable of raising himself above his own peculiar point of view and of living an impersonal life. In fact, it cannot be doubted that this is a trait common to all the higher forms of thought and action. What Kant's system does not explain, however, is the origin of this sort of contradiction which is realized in man. Why is he forced to do violence to himself by leaving his individuality, and, inversely, why is the impersonal law obliged to be dissipated by incarnating itself in individuals? Is it answered that there are two antagonistic worlds in which we participate equally, the world of matter and sense on the one hand, and the world of pure and impersonal reason on the other? That is merely repeating the, page 446, question in slightly different terms, for what we are trying to find out is why we must lead these two existences at the same time. Why do these two worlds, which seem to contradict each other, not remain outside of each other, and why must they mutually penetrate one another in spite of their antagonism? The only explanation which has ever been given of this singular necessity is the hypothesis of the fall, with all the difficulties which it implies, and which need not be repeated here. On the other hand, all mystery disappears the moment that it is recognized that impersonal reason is only another name given to collective thought. For this is possible only through a group of individuals. It supposes them, and in their turn, they suppose it, 
for they can continue to exist only by grouping themselves together. The kingdom of ends and impersonal truths can realize itself only by the cooperation of particular wills, and the reasons for which these participate in it are the same as those for which they cooperate. In a word, there is something impersonal in us because there is something social in all of us, and since social life embraces at once both representations and practices, this impersonality naturally extends to ideas as well as to acts. Perhaps some will be surprised to see us connect the most elevated forms of thought with society, the cause appears quite humble, in consideration of the value which we attribute to the effect. Between the world of the senses and appetites on the one hand, and that of reason and morals on the other, the distance is so considerable that the second would seem to have been able to add itself to the first only by a creative act. But attributing to society this preponderating role in the genesis of our nature is not denying this creation, for society has a creative power which no other observable being can equal. In fact, all creation, if not a mystical operation which escapes science and knowledge, is the product of a synthesis. Now if the synthesis of particular conceptions which take place in each individual consciousness are already and of themselves productive of novelties. How much more efficacious these vast syntheses of complete consciousnesses which make society must be. A society is the most powerful combination of physical and moral forces of which nature offers us an example. Nowhere else is an equal richness of different materials, carried to such a degree of concentration, to be found. Then it is not surprising that a higher life disengages itself which, by reacting upon the elements of which it is the product, raises them to a higher plane of existence and transforms them. Page 447 Thus sociology appears destined to open a new way to the science of man. Up to the present, thinkers were placed before this double alternative, either explain the superior and specific faculties of men by connecting them to the inferior forms of his being, the reason to the senses, or the mind to matter. Which is equivalent to denying their uniqueness. Or else attach them to some super-experimental reality which was postulated, but whose existence could be established by no observation. What put them in this difficulty was the fact that the individual passed as being the finest naturi, the ultimate creation of nature, it seemed that there was nothing beyond him, or at least nothing that science could touch. But from the moment when it is recognized that above the individual there is society, and that this is not a nominal being created by reason, but a system of active forces, a new manner of explaining men becomes possible. To conserve his distinctive traits it is no longer necessary to put them outside experience. At least, before going to this last extremity, it would be well to see if that which surpasses the individual, though it is within him, does not come from this super-individual reality which we experience in society. To be sure, it cannot be said at present to what point these explanations may be able to reach, and whether or not they are of a nature to resolve all the problems. But it is equally impossible to mark in advance a limit beyond which they cannot go. What must be done is to try the hypothesis and submit it as methodically as possible to the control of facts. This is what we have tried to do. Page 448. Page 449. Index. Alatunja. Alcharinga, or mythical period. Ambiguity of sacredness. Explanation of, animal worship, totemism not, animism, as expounded by Tyler and Spencer, how it explains the origin of the idea of the soul, of spirits, their cult, and the nature cult, criticism of these theories. Implies that religions are systems of hallucinations, which is its best refutation. Anthropomorphism, not found among primitives, denied by Spencer, cannot explain totemic view of world, or primitive rites, apriorism, philosophical. Art, why principal forms of, have been born in religion, dramatic, in totemic ceremonies, totemic emblems first form of, and Arunquiltha, or magic force, in Australia, how it enables us to understand totemic principle. Asceticism, nature of, based on negative rights, essential element of religious life, religious function of, sociological import of, implied in the notion of sacredness, its antagonism to the profane, and its contagiousness. Not dependent upon idea of divine personalities, positive effects of. Atonement for faults by rights. 
authority, moral, of society, based on social opinion. Beliefs, how related to rights. Translate social facts, what they seem destined to become, all contain an element of truth. Blood, human, sacredness of, body, essentially profane, explanation of this. Bull roarers, definition of. Categories of the understanding, religious origin of. Social origin of, necessity of, explained, real function of, only social necessity for, modeled on social forms. Causality, law of, first stated in imitative rights. Social origin, imposed by society, sociological theory of, and classical theories, varying statements of, and. Page 450, Charms, Magic, Explanation of. Church, essential to religion, Chiringa, definition of. Eminently sacred character of, due to totemic mark, as religious force, and. Civilizing heroes, common to whole tribe, tribal rights personified, moral role of, connecting link between spirits and gods, clan, characteristics of. Basis of simplest social system known, how recruited, totem as name of, symbolized by totem, implied by totemism, basis for classification of natural things, classes, logical, religious origin of, in higher religions. Based on social classifications, collective life basis of. Communion, alimentary, essential to sacrifice, found in Australia, positive effects of, concept, society's role in the genesis of, not equivalent to general idea. Distinguished from sensations, immutability of, universality of, essentially social nature of, coeval with humanity, objective truth of, contagiousness of sacredness, at basis of ascetic rites. Not due to associations of ideas, but to the externality of religious forces, at basis of logical classifications, contradiction, idea of, religious nature of, social nature of, based on social life. Origin of, contraries, logical, nature of primitive, corrobori. Cosmology of totemism, in all religions, cult, needed by gods, moral reasons for, social interpretation of, real function of, periodical nature of. Imitative rites first form of, aesthetic nature of. Death, insufficiency of, to make a soul into a spirit, or give sacredness. Deity. See gods, spiritual beings. Dreams, as origin of idea of double or soul. Inadequacy of this theory, as suggesting posthumous life. Ecstasy, in religion, explained, efficacy, idea of, social origin of, emblem, totem as, of clan, psychological need for, creates unity of group, and maintains it. Incarnates collective sentiments, why primitives chose theirs in animal or vegetable worlds, empiricism, philosophical. Artnachalunga. Eschatology, Australian. Evil spirits. Expiatory rites, page 451, faith, religious, nature of, family group, based on totemism. Fear, religion not based on. Fetishism. Folklore, how related to religion, related to totemism. Force, religious, ambiguity of. Why outside object in which it resides, as collective force, takes form from society, represents how collective consciousness acts on individuals, idea of, precedes that of scientific force. Collective force as prototype of physical force. See sacred, totemic principle. Formalism, religious, explanation of, first form of legal, free will, doctrine of, how explained, games, born in religion, and gods, religions without. In Australia, immortal, creators, benefactors, connected with initiation rites, international character of, of indigenous origin, developed form of civilizing heroes, closely connected with totemic system. First conceived in tribal assemblies, expressions of tribal unity. Hair, human, sacredness of, hazing, sociological import of. Ideal, the, in religion, formation of, a natural and necessary product of collective life. Idealism, essential, of social and religious worlds. Imitative rites, in Australia, 
based on so-called sympathetic magic, distinguished from charms, reasons for, material efficacy attributed to, explained by moral efficacy of. First expression of law of causality, original form of cult. Immortality of soul, idea of, not established for moral purposes, nor to escape annihilation, influence of dreams, but this not enough to account for doctrine. Doctrine of, invented to explain origin of souls, and expresses the immortality of society, moral value of, an afterthought, doctrine of future judgment in Australia, influence of mourning upon, individual totem. Relations of, to individual, his alter ego, individual, not a species, how related to collective totem, how acquired, how related to genius, origin of. See totemism, individual. Individualism, religious. Importance attributed to, by some, how explained, infinite, conception of, in religion, not equivalent to sacred, the, not characteristic of religion. Page 452, Initiation into tribe by religious ceremonies, no special rites for. Interdictions, or taboos, various sorts of, forms of, in Australia, of touch, of eating, of seeing, of speech, sexual, and, of all temporal activity on certain days, ideas at the basis of, positive effects of. Implied in notion of sacredness. In Tikiuma, description of among the Australians, minus 336, as elementary form of sacrifice, material efficacy expected of, elementary communion in, imitative elements in, commemorative nature of. Used for initiating young men into tribe, and. Knowledge, theory of. See a priorism, empiricism, sociological. Language, importance of, for logical thought, social character of. Logic, related to religion and society. Basis for, furnished by society, magic, based on religious ideas, distinguished from religion, hostility of, towards religion, sympathetic, majesty, essentially religious nature of idea of. Man, sacred character of, explained. Partakes of nature of totemic animal, sacred to varying degrees, double nature of, manna, of the Melanesians, see totemic principle. Matrimonial classes, definition of. Metempsychosis, not found in Australia, mourning. Nature of, determined by etiquette, especially severe for women, anger as well as sorrow expressed in, how related to vendetta, not the expression of individual emotions, but a duty imposed by group. Classic interpretation of, unsustainable, not connected with ideas of souls or spirits, social interpretation of, mystery in religion, idea of, not primitive, absent from many religions. Myths, essential element of religious life. Distinguished from fables, as work of art, interpret rites, as a society's representation of man and the world. Nanji, rock or tree, naturism, as expounded by Max Muller, seeks to establish religion in reality. Teaches that gods are personifications of natural phenomena, distinguishes between religion and mythology, but makes religion a fabric of errors, cannot account for origin of sacredness, page 453, negative rights, nature of, in Australia. See also interdictions, positive effects of, as preparation for positive rights, basis of asceticism, in mourning. Nertunja, as rallying center for group. Ablations, essential to sacrifice, this denied by Smith, found in Australia. Vicious circle implied in, explained, profound reasons for, orenda, of the Iroquois. See totemic principle. Origins, definition of. Pantheism, totemic, part equal to whole, religious principle that, explained, in magic. In sacrificial communions. Personality, idea of, double origin of, impersonal elements in, its alleged autonomy explained, importance of social elements in, represented by individual totem. Fratry, definition of. Predecessor of clan, and, as basis for classifications of natural things. Piacular rites, definition of, distinguished from ascetic rites, based on same needs as positive rites, minus 403, material benefits expected of. As expiation for ritual faults, social function of, 
Pichi. Primitives, definition of, best studied in Australia, why especially important for us, profane, absolute distinction of, from sacred, ratapa, or soul germs. Recreative elements of religion, reincarnation of souls, doctrine of, in Australia. Religion, must have a foundation in reality, none are false, real purpose of, eternal elements of. As source of all civilization, source of science and philosophy, so-called conflict of, with science, speculative functions of, recreative and aesthetic elements of, as preeminent expression of social life. Said to be characterized by supernatural, or by idea of spiritual beings, not based on fear, but happy confidence, characterized by that which is sacred, distinguished from magic, none proceeds on any unique principle. Importance of primitive, totemism most elementary form of, definition of. Representative rights, value of, for showing real reasons for cult, as dramatic representations, moral purpose of, evident. Expect no material benefits, page 454, respect, inspired by society, rights, how related to beliefs, totemic principle attached to, social function of, material efficacy attributed to, due to moral efficacy of. Moral and social significance of, reasons for, as given by Australians, as form of dramatic art, aesthetic nature of, interchangeability of, sacred, that, characteristic of all that is religious. Not characterized by its exalted position, but by its distinction from the profane, superimposed upon its basis, created by society, see totemic principle, double nature of, sacrifice, forms of, in Australia, see in Tikiuma. Theory of Robertson Smith of, elementary communion essential part of, how this strengthens one's religious nature, sacrilege inherent in, explained, oblations essential to, why gods have need of. Social function of, science, so-called conflict of, with religion, religious origin of, supplants religious speculation, but cannot do so completely, authority of. Sexual totems, social life, basis for religious representations, rhythm of, and religion, model for philosophical representations, society, how forms of, determine character of religion, characterized by institutions. Ideal nature of, not an illogical or illogical being, how it recasts animal nature into human nature. How it arouses sensations of divine, of dependence, of respect, of moral authority, of an external moral force, of kindly external forces, of the sacred, stimulating and sustaining action of. How it gives men their most characteristic attributes, how it exists only through its individual members, how this gives men their sacred character, foundation of religious experience. Sociological theory of knowledge, soul, idea of, found in all religions, various representations of, relation of, to body, after death, origin of, according to the Arunta, reincarnation of. As totemic principle incarnate in the individual, or parts of totemic divinity, close relations of, with totemic animal, f, sacred character of, notion of, founded in reality, represents the social part of our nature. Reality of our double nature, coeval with notion of mana, how a secondary formation, idea of immortality of, explained, see immortality, how related to idea of personality, see personality, distinguished from spirit. Form in which human force is represented, social elements of, how employed to explain mourning, origin of idea of, according to animism, space, category of, religious and social origin of, and. Page 455, Spirits, Distinguished from Souls. From ghosts, related to Roman genius, relations of, to things, how derived from idea of soul, objective basis of idea of, spirits of evil, animistic theory of origin of, spiritual beings, as characteristic of religion. Absent from many religions, or strictly religious rites, not sufficient to explain religion. See soul, spirits. Spiritualism, Lang's theory of, as origin of idea of soul. Suffering, religious role of, in inferior societies. Believed to give extra strength, how this idea is well founded. Supernatural, the, as characteristic of religion, conception of, quite modern, not the essential element of religion. Sympathetic magic, 
so-called, at basis of imitative rights, fundamental principles of, why this term is inexact, taboo, derivation of word. See interdictions. Tattooings, totemic. Time, category of, religious and social origin of. Totality, concept of, could never be suggested by individual experience, related to concepts of society in divinity. Totem, derivation of word, as name of clan, nature of things serving as, species, not individuals, how inherited. Of fratries, of matrimonial classes, as emblem or coat of arms of group, religious nature of, relations of, with men and things, subtotems, individual totems, symbol of totemic principle of clan, clan inseparable from. Totemic animals, interdiction against eating by men of that clan, or by those of other clans of the same fratry, and, and against killing, less sacred and powerful than totemic emblems, related to men. Sacredness of, due to resemblance to emblem. Totemic emblem, as collective emblem, sacred character of, conventional nature of, more sacred and powerful than totemic animal, as first form of art. Totemic principle, or mana, cause of the sacredness of things, totem material representation of, as a force, as source of moral life of clan, compared to totemic god, personified in gods of higher religions, as Wacken. As orenda, as mana, ubiquity of, multiformity of, used in magic, attached to rites, words, etc., as representation of clan, first conceived in the midst of great social effervescence. How it comes to be symbolized by totem, totemic system, unity of, work of whole tribe. Totemism, early theoricians of, Australia as classic land of, importance of American, as most elementary religion. Former universality of, unimportant, religious nature of, unquestionable, not animal worship, nor nature cult, contains all the elements of the religious life. Conceptional totemism, inadequacies of, page 456, tribe, totemic system work of whole, unity of, expressed by great gods, universalism, religious, how explained, vendetta, how related to rites of mourning. Wacken, or, great spirit, of Sioux. See totemic principle. Waninga. Footnotes. In the same way, we shall say of these societies that they are primitive, and we shall call the men of these societies primitives. Undoubtedly the expression lacks precision, but that is hardly evitable, and besides, when we have taken pains to fix the meaning, it is not inconvenient. But that is not equivalent to saying that all luxury is lacking to the primitive cults. On the contrary, we shall see that in every religion there are beliefs and practices which do not aim at strictly utilitarian ends, Book 3, CH 4, Section 2. This luxury is indispensable to the religious life, it is at its very heart. But it is much more rudimentary in the inferior religions than in the others, so we are better able to determine its reason for existence here. It is seen that we give a wholly relative sense to this word, origins, just as to the word, primitive. By it we do not mean an absolute beginning, but the most simple social condition that is actually known or that beyond which we cannot go at present. When we speak of the origins or of the commencement of religious history or thought, it is in this sense that our statements should be understood. We say that time and space are categories because there is no difference between the role played by these ideas in the intellectual life and that which falls to the ideas of class or cause, on this point C. Hamelin. Essay sur les elements principaux de la représentation, pp. 63, 76. See the support given this assertion in Hubert and Moss, Melanges d'Histoire de Religions, Travaux de l'Anne Sociologique, Chapter on la Représentation du Temps dans la Religion. Thus we see all the difference which exists between the group of sensations and images which serve to locate us in time, and the category of time. The first are the summary of individual experiences, which are of value only for the person who experienced them. But what the category of time expresses is a time common to the group, a social time, so to speak. In itself it is a veritable social institution. Also, it is peculiar to man, animals have no representations of this sort. 
This distinction between the category of time and the corresponding sensations could be made equally well in regard to space or cause. Perhaps this would aid in clearing up certain confusions which are maintained by the controversies of which these questions are the subject. We shall return to this point in the conclusion of the present work, section 4. Op. Sit, pages 75 ff. Or else it would be necessary to admit that all individuals, in virtue of their organophysical constitution, are spontaneously affected in the same manner by the different parts of space, which is more improbable. Especially as in themselves the different regions are sympathetically indifferent. Also, the divisions of space vary with different societies, which is a proof that they are not founded exclusively upon the congenital nature of man. See Durkheim and Moss, De Calcis Forms Primitives de Classification, in Annie Sociologique, 6, pages 47 ff. See Durkheim and Moss, De Calcis Forms Primitives de Classification, in Annie Sociologique, 6, page 34. Zunai Creation Myths, in 13th Republic of the Bureau of America Ethnol, pages 367 ff. C. Hertz, La Preeminence de la Main Droit. Etude de Polarite Religieuse, in the Revue Philosophique, December, 1909. On this same question of the relations between the representation of space and the form of the group, see the chapter in Ratzel, Politisch Geography, entitled Der Rom in Geist der Volker. We do not mean to say that mythological thought ignores it, but that it contradicts it more frequently and openly than scientific thought does. Inversely, we shall show that science cannot escape violating it, though it holds to it far more scrupulously than religion does. On this subject, as on many others, there are only differences of degree between science and religion. But if these differences should not be exaggerated, they must be noted, for they are significant. This hypothesis has already been set forth by the founders of the Volker psychology. It is especially remarked in a short article by Windelbrand entitled Die Erkenntnislehre unter dem Volker Psychologischen Gesichtspunkt in the Zeitsch. F. Volker Psychology, 8, pages 166 FFCF A note of Steinthal on the same subject, Ibid, pp. 178 FF. Even in the theory of Spencer, it is by individual experience that the categories are made. The only difference which there is in this regard between ordinary empiricism and evolutionary empiricism is that according to this latter, the results of individual experience are accumulated by heredity. But this accumulation adds nothing essential to them, no element enters into their composition which does not have its origin in the experience of the individual. According to this theory, also, the necessity with which the categories actually impose themselves upon us is the product of an illusion and a superstitious prejudice, strongly rooted in the organism, to be sure. But without foundation in the nature of things. Perhaps some will be surprised that we do not define the a priorist theory by the hypothesis of innateness. But this conception really plays a secondary part in the doctrine. It is a simple way of stating the impossibility of reducing rational knowledge to empirical data. Saying that the former is innate is only a positive way of saying that it is not the product of experience, such as it is ordinarily conceived. At least, in so far as there are any representations which are individual and hence wholly empirical. But there are in fact probably none where the two elements are not found closely united. This irreducibility must not be taken in any absolute sense. We do not wish to say that there is nothing in the empirical representations which shows rational ones, nor that there is nothing in the individual which could be taken as a sign of social life. If experience were completely separated from all that is rational, reason could not operate upon it, in the same way, if the psychic nature of the individual were absolutely opposed to the social life, society would be impossible. A complete analysis of the category should seek these germs of rationality even in the individual consciousness. We shall have occasion to come back to this point in our conclusion. All that we wish to establish here is that between these indistinct germs of reason and the reason properly so called. There is a difference comparable to that which separates the properties of the mineral elements out of which a living being is composed from the characteristic attributes of life after this has once been constituted. 
It has frequently been remarked that social disturbances result in multiplying mental disturbances. This is one more proof that logical discipline is a special aspect of social discipline. The first gives way as the second is weakened. There is an analogy between this logical necessity and moral obligation but there is not an actual identity. Today society treats criminals in a different fashion than subjects whose intelligence only is abnormal. That is a proof that the authority attached to logical rules and that inherent in moral rules are not of the same nature, in spite of certain similarities. They are two species of the same class. It would be interesting to make a study on the nature and origin of this difference, which is probably not primitive, for during a long time, the public conscience has poorly distinguished between the deranged and the delinquent. We confine ourselves to signalizing this question. By this example, one may see the number of problems which are raised by the analysis of these notions which generally pass as being elementary and simple, but which are really of an extreme complexity. This question will be treated again in the conclusion of this work. The rationalism which is imminent in the sociological theory of knowledge is thus midway between the classical empiricism and a priorism. For the first, the categories are purely artificial constructions, for the second, on the contrary, they are given by nature. For us, they are in a sense a work of art, but of an art which imitates nature with a perfection capable of increasing unlimitedly. For example, that which is at the foundation of the category of time is the rhythm of social life. But if there is a rhythm in collective life, one may rest assured that there is another in the life of the individual, and more generally, in that of the universe. The first is merely more marked and apparent than the others. In the same way, we shall see that the notion of class is founded on that of the human group. But if men form natural groups, it can be assumed that among things there exists groups which are at once analogous and different. Classes and species are natural groups of things. If it seems to many minds that a social origin cannot be attributed to the categories without depriving them of all speculative value, it is because society is still too frequently regarded as something that is not natural. Hence it is concluded that the representations which express it express nothing in nature. But the conclusion is not worth more than the premise. This is how it is legitimate to compare the categories to tools. For on its side, a tool is material accumulated capital. There is a close relationship between the three ideas of tool, category, and institution. We have already attempted to define religious phenomena in a paper which was published in the Annie Sociologique, Volume 2, pages 1 ff. The definition then given differs, as will be seen, from the one we give today. At the end of this chapter, p. 47, n. 1, we shall explain the reasons which have led us to these modifications, but which imply no essential change in the conception of the facts. See above, page 3. We shall say nothing more upon the necessity of these preliminary definitions nor upon the method to be followed to attain them. That is exposed in our Regles de la Méthode Sociologique, pages 43 FFCF Le Suicide, pages 1 FF, Paris, F. Alkin. First Principles, page 37. Introduction to the Science of Religions, page 18. CF Origin and Development of Religion, page 23. This same frame of mind is also found in the scholastic period, as is witnessed by the formula with which philosophy was defined at this time, Fides Quirins Intellectum. Introduction to the History of Religions, pages 15 ff. Introduction to the History of Religions, page 23. See below, Book 3, ch. 2. Prolegomena to the History of Religions, page 25, tr. by Squire. Primitive Culture, i, page 424. Fourth Edition, 1903. Beginning with the first edition of the Golden Bough, i, pages 30 to 32. Notably Spencer and Gillen and even Proust, who gives the name magic to all non-individualized religious forces. Bernouf, Introduction à l'histoire du Baudism Indien, section edit. Page 464. The last word of the text shows that Buddhism does not even admit the existence of an eternal nature. Barth, The Religions of India, page 110, tr by Wood. Oldenburg, 
Buddha, page 53, TR by Hoey. Oldenburg, Ibid, pages 313 FFCF. Kern, Histoire du Baudism dans l'Inde, I, pages 389 FF. Oldenburg, page 250, Barth, page 110. Oldenburg, page 314. Barth, page 109. In the same way, Bernouf says, I have the profound conviction that if Kakya had not found about him a pantheon already peopled with the gods just named, he would have felt no need of inventing them, Intrad. Ah, Elhist. Du Baudism Indian, page 119. Bernouf, op sit, page 117. Kern, op sit, I, page 289. The belief, universally admitted in India, that great holiness is necessarily accompanied by supernatural faculties, is the only support which he, Kakya, should find in spirits, Bernouf, p. 119. Bernouf, page 120. Ibid, page 107. Ibid, page 302. This is what Kern expresses in the following terms, in certain regards, he is a man, in certain others, he is not a man, in others, he is neither the one nor the other, opposite, I, page 290. The conception, was foreign to Buddhism, that the divine head of the community is not absent from his people, but that he dwells powerfully in their midst as their lord and king. So that all cultus is nothing else but the expression of this continuing living fellowship. Buddha has entered into nirvana, if his believers desired to invoke him, he could not hear them, Oldenburg, page 369. Buddhist doctrine might be in all its essentials what it actually is, even if the idea of Buddha remained completely foreign to it, Oldenburg, page 322. And whatever is said of the historic Buddha can be applied equally well to the mythological Buddhas. For the same idea, see Max Muller, Natural Religion, pages 103 ff and 190. Opsit, page 146. Barth, in Encyclopédie de Sciences Religieuses, 6, p. 548. Oldenburg, Opsit, page 53. 1 Sam, 21, 6. Levitt, 12. Deuteronomy 22, 10 and 11. La Religion Vedique, I, page 122. Ibid, page 133. No text, says Bergain, bears better witness to the consciousness of a magic action by man upon the waters of heaven than verse X, 32, 7, where this belief is expressed in general terms, applicable to an actual man. As well as to his real or mythological ancestors, the ignorant man has questioned the wise. Instructed by the wise, he acts, and here is the profit of his instruction, he obtains the flowing of streams, page 137. Ibid, page 139. Examples will also be found in Hubert, Art. Magia in the Dictionnaire de Antiquites, 6, page 1509. Not to mention the sage and the saint who practice these truths and who for that reason are sacred. This is not saying that these relations cannot take a religious character. But they do not do so necessarily. Schulze, Fetishismus, page 129. Examples of these usages will be found in Fraser, Golden Bow, 2 Edit, I, pages 81 ff. The conception according to which the profane is opposed to the sacred, just as the irrational is to the rational, or the intelligible is to the mysterious, is only one of the forms under which this opposition is expressed. Science being once constituted, it has taken a profane character, especially in the eyes of the Christian religions, from that it appears as though it could not be applied to sacred things. See Fraser, on some ceremonies of the Central Australian Tribes in Australian Association for the Advancement of Science, 1901, pages 313 ff. This conception is also of an extreme generality. In India, the simple participation in the sacrificial act has the same effects, the sacrificer, by the mere act of entering within the circle of sacred things, changes his personality. C. Hubert and Moss, Essay sur le sacrifice in the Annie Sociologique, 2, page 101. See what was said of the initiation above, page 39. We shall point out below how, for example, 
certain species of sacred things exist, between which there is an incompatibility as all-exclusive as that between the sacred and the profane, Book 3, CHV, Section 4. This is the case with certain marriage and funeral rites, for example. See Spencer and Gillen, Native Tribes of Central Australia, pages 534 ff, Northern Tribes of Central Australia, page 463, Howitt, Native Tribes of SE Australia, pages 359 to 361. See Codrington, The Melanesians, ch 12. See Hubert, Art. Magia in Dictionnaire de Antiquites. For example, in Melanesia, the Tindalo is a spirit, now religious, now magic, Codrington, pages 125 ff, 194 ff. See Hubert and Moss, Theorie Générale de la Magie, in Annie Sociologique, Volume 7, pages 83 to 84. For example, the host is profaned in the Black Mass. One turns his back to the altar, or goes around the altar commencing by the left instead of by the right. Locke, Sit, page 19. Undoubtedly it is rare that a ceremony does not have some director at the moment when it is celebrated. Even in the most crudely organized societies, there are generally certain men whom the importance of their social position points out to exercise a directing influence over the religious life, for example. The chiefs of the local groups of certain Australian societies. But this attribution of functions is still very uncertain. At Athens, the gods to whom the domestic cult was addressed were only specialized forms of the gods of the city, Zeta Epsilon Kappa Tau Sigma Iota Omicron, Zeta Epsilon Rho Kappa Epsilon Omicron. In the same way, in the Middle Ages, the patrons of the guilds were saints of the calendar. For the name church is ordinarily applied only to a group whose common beliefs refer to a circle of more special affairs. Hubert and Moss, Locke Sit, page 18. Robertson Smith has already pointed out that magic is opposed to religion, as the individual to the social, the religion of the Semites, 2 edit, pages 264 to 265. Also, in thus distinguishing magic from religion, we do not mean to establish a break of continuity between them. The frontiers between the two domains are frequently uncertain. Codrington, Trans and Proc Roy. Socia Victoria, 16, page 136. Negrioli, De Genii Presso I Romani. This is the conclusion reached by Spencer in his Ecclesiastical Institutions, ch. 16, and by Sabatier in his Outlines of a Philosophy of Religion, based on Psychology and History, tr. by Seed, and by all the school to which he belongs. Notably among numerous Indian tribes of North America. This statement of fact does not touch the question whether exterior and public religion is not merely the development of an interior and personal religion which was the primitive fact, or whether, on the contrary, the second is not the projection of the first into individual consciences. The problem will be directly attacked below, Book 2, CHV, Section 2, CF the same book, CH 6 and 7, Section 1. For the moment, we confine ourselves to remarking that the individual cult is presented to the observer as an element of, and something dependent upon, the collective cult. It is by this that our present definition is connected to the one we have already proposed in the Annie Sociologique. In this other work, we defined religious beliefs exclusively by their obligatory character. But, as we shall show, this obligation evidently comes from the fact that these beliefs are the possession of a group which imposes them upon its members. The two definitions are thus in a large part the same. If we have thought it best to propose a new one, it is because the first was too formal, and neglected the contents of the religious representations too much. It will be seen, in the discussions which follow, how important it is to put this characteristic into evidence at once. Moreover, if their imperative character is really a distinctive trait of religious beliefs, it allows of an infinite number of degrees, consequently there are even cases where it is not easily perceptible. Hence come difficulties and embarrassments which are avoided by substituting for this criterion the one we now employ. We thus leave aside here those theories which, in whole or in part, make use of super-experimental data. 
This is the case with the theory which Andrew Lang exposed in his book, The Making of Religion, and which Father Schmidt has taken up again, with variations of detail, in a series of articles on the origin of the idea of God, Anthropos, 1908-1909. Lang does not set animism definitely aside, but in the last analysis, he admits a sense or intuition of the divine directly. Also, if we do not consider it necessary to expose and discuss this conception in the present chapter, we do not intend to pass it over in silence. We shall come to it again below, when we shall ourselves explain the facts upon which it is founded, Book 2, ch. 9, Section 4. This is the case, for example, of Fustel de Colanges who accepts the two conceptions together, the ancient city, B.K. I in Book 3, ch. 2. This is the case with Jevons, who criticizes the animism taught by Tyler, but accepts his theories on the origin of the idea of the soul and the anthropomorphic instinct of man. Inversely, Usner, in his Gottenamen, rejects certain hypotheses of Max Muller which will be described below, but admits the principal postulates of naturism. Primitive Culture, CHS. 11-18. Principles of Sociology, Parts 1 and 6. This is the word used by Tyler. It has the inconvenience of seeming to imply that men, in the proper sense of the term, existed before there was a civilization. However, there is no proper term for expressing the idea. That of primitive, which we prefer to use, lacking a better, is, as we have said, far from satisfactory. Tyler, Op. Sit, I, pages 455f. C. Spencer, Principles of Sociology. I, pages 143 ff, and Tyler, op sit, I, pages 434 ff, 445 ff. Tyler, 2, pp. 113 ff. Tyler, I, pages 481 ff. Principles of Sociology, I, page 126. Ibid, pages 322 ff. Ibid, Pages 366 to 367. Ibid, page 346. CF, page 384. See below, Book 2, CH8. See Spencer and Gillen, The Native Tribes of Central Australia, pages 123 to 127. Strello, Dioranda, UND Larigistam in Central Australian, 2, pages 52 ff. The Melanesians, pages 249 to 250. Howitt, The Native Tribes of Southeastern Australia, page 358. Ibid, pages 434 to 442. Of the Negroes of Southern Guinea, Tyler says that, their sleeping hours are characterized by almost as much intercourse with the dead as their waking are with the living, primitive culture, I, page 443. In regard to these peoples, the same author cites this remark of an observer, all their dreams are construed into visits from the spirits of their deceased friends, Ibid, page 443. This statement is certainly exaggerated. But it is one more proof of the frequency of mystic dreams among the primitives. The etymology which Strello proposes for the Arunta word al Jurama, which means, to dream, also tends to confirm this theory. This word is composed of Algyra, which Strello translates by, God, and Rama, which means, see. Thus a dream would be the moment when a man is in relations with sacred beings, Dioranda, Uendi Larigistam, I, page 2. Andrew Lang, who also refuses to admit that the idea of the soul was suggested to men by their dream experiences, believes that he can derive it from other empirical data, these are the data of spiritualism, telepathy, distant seeing, etc. We do not consider it necessary to discuss the theory such as it has been exposed in his book The Making of Religion. It reposes upon the hypothesis that spiritualism is a fact of constant observation, and that distant seeing is a real faculty of men, or at least of certain men, but it is well known how much this theory is scientifically contested. What is still more contestable is that the facts of spiritualism are apparent enough and of a sufficient frequency to have been able to serve as the basis for all the religious beliefs and practices which are connected with souls and spirits. The examination of these questions would carry us too far from what is the object of our study. 
It is still less necessary to engage ourselves in this examination, since the theory of Lang remains open to many of the objections which we shall address to that of Tyler in the paragraphs which follow. Jevons has made a similar remark. With Tyler, he admits that the idea of the soul comes from dreams, and that after it was created, men projected it into things. But, he adds, the fact that nature has been conceived as animated like men does not explain how it became the object of a cult. The man who believes the bowing tree or the leaping flame to be a living thing like himself, does not therefore believe it to be a supernatural being, rather, so far as it is like himself, it, like himself, is not supernatural. Introduction to the History of Religions, p. 55. C. Spencer and Gillen, Nor T.R., page 506, and Nat T.R., page 512. This is the ritual and mythical theme which Fraser studies in his Golden Bough. The Melanesians, page 119. Ibid, page 125. There are sometimes, as it seems, even funeral offerings. See Roth, Superstition, Magic and Medicine, in North Queensland Ethnog, Bulletin No. 5, Section 69C, and Burial Customs, in Ibid, No. 10, in Records of the Australian Museum, Volume 6, No. 5, page 395. But these offerings are not periodical. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., pages 538, 553, and Nor T.R., pages 463, 543, 547. See especially, Spencer and Gillen, Northern Tribes, ch. 6, 7, 9. The Religions of Primitive Peoples, pages 47 ff. Myth, Ritual and Religions, page 123. Less Religions de Pupils Non Civilises, 2, Conclusion. The Religion of the Semites, 2 edition, pages 126, 132. This is the reasoning of Westermark, Origins of Human Marriage, page 6. By sexual communism we do not mean a state of promiscuity where man knows no matrimonial rules, we believe that such a state has never existed. But it has frequently happened that groups of men have been regularly united to one or several women. See our suicide, pages 233 ff. Spencer, Principles of Sociology, I, pages 129 f. The Melanesians, page 123. Dorsey, A Study of Suan Cults, in Exith Annual Report of the Bureau of America Ethnology, pages 431 ff, and Passim. La Religion de Pupils Non Civilises, I, page 248. V. W. de Visser, De Grecorum Dies Non Referentibus Specium Humanum. C.F.P., Perdrizet, Bulletin de Correspondence Hellenique, 1899, page 635. However, according to Spencer, there is a germ of truth in the belief in spirits, this is the idea that, the power which manifests itself inside the consciousness is a different form of power from that manifested outside the consciousness, Ecclesiastical Institutions, section 659. Spencer understands by this that the notion of force in general is the sentiment of the force which we have extended to the entire universe, this is what animism admits implicitly when it peoples nature with spirits analogous to our own. But even if this hypothesis in regard to the way in which the idea of force is formed were true, and it requires important reservations which we shall make, Book 3, CH 3, Section 3, it has nothing religious about it, it belongs to no cult. It thus remains that the system of religious symbols and rites, the classification of things into sacred and profane, all that which is really religious in religion, corresponds to nothing in reality. Also, this germ of truth, of which he speaks, is still more a germ of error, for if it be true that the forces of nature and those of the mind are related, they are profoundly distinct. And one exposes himself to grave misconceptions in identifying them. This is undoubtedly what explains the sympathy which folklorists like Manhart have felt for animistic ideas. In popular religions as in inferior religions, these spiritual beings of a second order hold the first place. In the essay entitled Comparative Mythology, pages 47 ff. Harab Kunth de Feuer's Und die Gottertranks, 
Berlin, 1859, a new edition was given by Ernst Kuhn in 1886. C.F. der Schuss de Wilden Jägers auf den Sonnenhirsch, Zeitschrift F. D. Phil. I. 1869, pages 89 to 169. In Twickelung Stufen de Mythos, of Handel. D. Burl. Akkad, 1873. Der Ursprung der Mythology, Berlin, 1860. In his book Hercule T. Cacus. Etude de Mythology Compari. Max Muller's comparative mythology is there signalized as a work which marks a new epoch in the history of mythology, page 12. Die Griechischen Kult und die Mythen, I, page 78. Among others who have adopted this conception may be cited Renal. See his Nouvelles Etudes d'Histoire Religieuse, 1884, page 31. Aside from the comparative mythology, the works where Max Muller has exposed his general theories on religion are, Hibbert Lectures, 1878, under the title The Origin and Development of Religion, Natural Religion, 1889, Physical Religion, 1890. Anthropological Religion, 1892, Theosophy, or Psychological Religion, 1893, Contributions to the Science of Mythology, 1897. Since his mythological theories are closely related to his philosophy of language, these works should be consulted in connection with the ones consecrated to language or logic, especially lectures on the science of language. And the science of thought. Natural Religion, page 114. Physical Religion, pages 119 to 120. Ibid, page 121, cf. page 304. Natural Religion, pages 121 ff, and 149 to 155. The Overwhelming Pressure of the Infinite, Ibid, page 138. Ibid, pages 195 to 196. Max Muller even goes so far as to say that until thought has passed this first stage, it has very few of the characteristics which we now attribute to religion, physic. Rel, page 120. Physic. Rel, page 128. The Science of Thought, page 30. Natural Religion, pages 393 ff. Physic. Rel, page 133. The Science of Thought, page 219, Lectures on the Science of Language, 2, pages 1 ff. The Science of Thought, page 272. The Science of Thought, I, page 327, Physic. Rel, pages 125 ff. Melanges de Mythologie et de Linguistique, page 8. Anthropological Religion, pages 128 to 130. This explanation is not as good as that of Tyler. According to Max Muller, men could not admit that life stopped with death. Therefore they concluded that there were two beings within them, one of which survived the body. But it is hard to see what made them think that life continued after the body was decomposed. For the details, see Anthrop, Rel, pages 351 ff. Anthrop. Rel, page 130. This is what keeps Max Muller from considering Christianity the climax of all this development. The religion of ancestors, he says, supposes that there is something divine in man. Now is that idea not the one at the basis of the teaching of Christ? Ibid, pages 378 ff. It is useless to insist upon the strangeness of the conception which makes Christianity the latest of the cults of the dead. See the discussion of the hypothesis in Grupp, Griechischen Kult und die Mythen, pages 79 to 184. See Milet, Introduction à l'étude comparative de langues in the Europeans, page 119. Oldenburg, Die Religion de Vedas, pages 59 ff. Milet, Ludio Iranian Mithra, in Journal Asiatique, X, No. 1, July August, 1907, pages 143 ff. In this category are a large number of the maxims of popular wisdom. It is true that this argument does not touch those who see in religion a code, especially of hygiene whose provisions, though placed under the sanction of imaginary beings, are nevertheless well-founded. 
but we shall not delay to discuss a conception so insupportable, and which has, in fact, never been sustained in a systematic manner by persons somewhat informed upon the history of religions. It is difficult to see what good the terrible practices of the initiation bring to the health which they threaten, what good the dietetic restrictions, which generally deal with perfectly clean animals, have hygienically. How sacrifices, which take place far from a house, make it more solid, etc. Undoubtedly there are religious precepts which at the same time have a practical utility. But they are lost in the mass of others, and even the services which they render are frequently not without some drawbacks. If there is a religiously enforced cleanliness, there is also a religious filthiness which is derived from these same principles. The rule which orders a corpse to be carried away from the camp because it is the seat of a dreaded spirit is undoubtedly useful. But the same belief requires the relatives to anoint themselves with the liquids which issue from a corpse in putrefaction, because they are supposed to have exceptional virtues. From this point of view, magic has served a great deal more than religion. Contributions to the Science of Mythology, I, pages 68f. Lectures on the Science of Language, 2, page 456ff, Physic. Rel, pages 276ff, also Briel, Melanges, p. 6. To bring the necessary clarity into this question of the origin of mythology, it is necessary to distinguish carefully the gods, which are the immediate product of the human intelligence, from the fables which are its indirect and involuntary product. Max Muller recognized this. See Physic. Rel, page 132, and Comparative Mythology, page 58. The gods are nomina and not noumena, names without being and not beings without name. It is true that Max Muller held that for the Greeks, Zeus was, and remained, in spite of all mythological obscurations, the name of the supreme deity, Science of Language, 2, page 478. We shall not dispute this assertion, though it is historically contestable, but in any case, this conception of Zeus could never have been more than a glimmer in the midst of all the other religious beliefs of the Greeks. Besides this, in a later work, Max Muller went so far as to make even the notion of God in general the product of a wholly verbal process and thus of a mythological elaboration, physic. Rel. Page 138. Undoubtedly outside the real myths there were always fables which were not believed, or at least were not believed in the same way and to the same degree, and hence had no religious character. The line of demarcation between fables and myths is certainly floating and hard to determine. But this is no reason for making all myth stories, any more than we should dream of making all stories myths. There is at least one characteristic which in a number of cases suffices to differentiate the religious myth, that is its relation to the cult. See above, page 28. More than that, in the language of Max Muller, there is a veritable abuse of words. Sensuous experience, he says, implies, at least in certain cases, beyond the known, something unknown, something which I claim the liberty to call infinite, natural rel, page 195, cf page 218. The unknown is not necessarily the infinite, any more than the infinite is necessarily the unknown if it is in all points the same, and consequently like the part which we know. It would be necessary to prove that the part of it which we perceive differs in nature from that which we do not perceive. Max Muller involuntarily recognizes this in certain passages. He confesses that he sees little difference between Agni, the god of fire, and the notion of ether, by which the modern physicist explains light and heat, phys. Rel, pages 126 f. Also, he connects the notion of divinity to that of agency, p. 138, or of a causality which is not natural and profane. The fact that religion represents the causes thus imagined, under the form of personal agents, is not enough to explain how they got a sacred character. A personal agent can be profane, and also, many religious forces are essentially impersonal. We shall see below, in speaking of the efficacy of rites and faith, how these illusions are to be explained, Book 3, CH2. Voyages and Travels of an Indian Interpreter This idea was so common that even M. Reville continued to make America the classic land of totemism, 
Religions de Peuples Non Civilises, I, page 242. Journals of Two Expeditions in Northwest and Western Australia, 2, page 228. The Worship of Animals and Plants. Totems and Totemism, 1869-1870. This idea is found already very clearly expressed in a study by Gallatin entitled Synopsis of the Indian Tribes, Archaeologia Americana, 2, pages 109 ff, and in a notice by Morgan in the Cambrian Journal, 1860, page 149. This work had been prepared for and preceded by two others by the same author, The League of the Iroquois, 1851, and Systems of Consanguinity and Affinity of the Human Family, 1871. Camillaroy and Kernai, 1880. In the very first volumes of the annual report of the Bureau of American Ethnology are found the study of Powell, Wyandotte Government, I, page 59, that of Cushing, Zunai Fetishes, 2, page 9, Smith, Myths of the Iroquois, Ibid, p. 77, and the important work of Dorsey, Omaha Sociology, 3, page 211, which are also contributions to the study of totemism. This first appeared, in an abridged form, in the Encyclopedia Britannica, 9th edition. In his primitive culture, Tyler had already attempted an explanation of totemism, to which we shall return presently, but which we shall not give here. For by making totemism only a particular case of the ancestor cult, he completely misunderstood its importance. In this chapter we mention only those theories which have contributed to the progress of the study of totemism. Published at Cambridge, 1885. First edition, 1889. This is the arrangement of a course given at the University of Aberdeen in 1888. Cf. the article Sacrifice in the Encyclopedia Britannica, 9th edition. London, 1890. A second edition in three volumes has since appeared, 1900, and a third in five volumes is already in course of publication. In this connection must be mentioned the interesting work of Sidney Hartland, The Legend of Perseus, three volumes, 1894 to 1896. We here confine ourselves to giving the names of the authors, their works will be indicated below, when we make use of them. If Spencer and Gillen have been the first to study these tribes in a scientific and thorough manner, they were not the first to talk about them. Howitt had already described the social organization of the Waramongo, Waramonga of Spencer and Gillen, in 1888 in his further notes on the Australian classes in the Journal of the Anthropological Institute, hereafter, J.A.I., pages 44f. The Arunta had already been briefly studied by Scholes, the Aborigines of the Upper and Middle Finca River, in Transactions of the Royal Society of South Australia, Volume 14, FASC. 2. The Organization of the Chingali, the Chingili of Spencer and Gillen, the Wumbia, etc., by Matthews, Wumbia Organization of the Australian Aborigines, in American Anthropologist, New Series, Volume 2, page 494. Divisions of some West Australian tribes, Ibid, page 185, Proceedings America Philos, SOC, XVI, pages 151 to 152, and Journal Roy. SOC of NS Wales, XXXII, page 71 and XXXII, page 111. The first results of the study made of the Arunta had also been published already in the report on the work of the Horn Scientific Expedition to Central Australia, PD4, 1896. The first part of this report is by Sterling, the second by Gillen. The entire publication was placed under the direction of Baldwin Spencer. London, 1899. Hereafter, Native Tribes or Nat T.R. London, 1904. Hereafter, Northern Tribes or Nor T.R. We write the Arunta, the Anula, the Chingili, etc. Without adding the characteristic S of the plural. It does not seem very logical to add to these words, which are not European, a grammatical sign which would have no meaning except in our languages. Exceptions to this rule will be made when the name of the tribe has obviously been Europeanized, the Hurons for example. Strello has been in Australia since 1892, at first he lived among the Diary, and from them he went to the Arunta. Diaranda, Uendi Larigistam in Central Australian. 
Four fascicules have been published up to the present. The last appeared at the moment when the present book was finished, so it could not be used. The two first have to do with the myths and legends, and the third with the cult. It is only just to add to the name of Strello that of Von Leon Hardy, who has had a great deal to do with this publication. Not only has he charged himself with editing the manuscripts of Strello, but by his judicious questions he has led the latter to be more precise on more than one point. It would be useful also to consult an article which Von Leon Hardy gave the Globus. Where numerous extracts from his correspondence with Strello will be found, Uber Einige Religios und Totemistisch Vorstellungen der Randa und Lorigia in Central Australian, in Globus, XCI, p. 285, cf. An article on the same subject by N. W. Thomas in Folklore, 16, pages 428 ff. Spencer and Gillen are not ignorant of it, but they are far from possessing it as thoroughly as Strello. Notably by Klotsch, Schlussberg Duber Mean Rees Nach Australian, in Zeitschrift F. Ethnology, 1907, pages 635 ff. The Book of K. Langlo Parker, The Ualei Tribe, That of Eilman, Die Eingeberinen der Colony Sudaustralien. That of John Matthews, Two Representative Tribes of Queensland, and certain recent articles of Matthews all show the influence of Spencer and Gillen. A list of these publications will be found in the preface to his Nat Tr, pages 8 to 9. London, 1904. Hereafter we shall cite this work by the abbreviation Nat Tr, but always mentioning the name of Howitt, to distinguish it from the first work of Spencer and Gillen, which we abbreviate in the same manner. Totemism and Exogamy, four volumes. London, 1910. The work begins with a re-edition of Totemism, reproduced without any essential changes. It is true that at the end and at the beginning there are some general theories on totemism, which will be described and discussed below. But these theories are relatively independent of the collection of facts which accompanies them, for they had already been published in different articles in reviews long before this work appeared. These articles are reproduced in the first volume, pages 89 to 172. Totemism, page 12. Ibid, page 15. Ibid, page 32. It should be noted that in this connection, the more recent work, Totemism and Exogamy, shows an important progress in the thought as well as the method of Fraser. Every time that he describes the religious or domestic institutions of a tribe, he sets himself to determine the geographic and social conditions in which this tribe is placed. Howsoever summary these analyses may be, they bear witness nevertheless to a rupture with the old methods of the anthropological school. Undoubtedly we also consider that the principal object of the science of religions is to find out what the religious nature of man really consists in. However, as we do not regard it as a part of his constitutional makeup, but rather as the product of social causes, we consider it impossible to find it, if we leave aside his social environment. We cannot repeat too frequently that the importance which we attach to totemism is absolutely independent of whether it was ever universal or not. This is the case with the fratries and matrimonial classes. On this point, see Spencer and Gillen, Northern Tribes, CH3, Howitt, Native Tribes, pages 109 and 137 to 142, Thomas, Kinship and Marriage in Australia, CH6 and 7. Division du Travail Social, 3rd edition, page 150. It is to be understood that this is not always the case. It frequently happens, as we have already said, that the simpler forms aid to a better understanding of the more complex. On this point, there is no rule of method which is applicable to every possible case. Thus the individual totemism of America will aid us in understanding the function and importance of that in Australia. As the latter is very rudimentary, it would probably have passed unobserved. Besides, there is not one unique type of totemism in America, but several different species which must be distinguished. We shall leave this field only very exceptionally, and when a particularly instructive comparison seems to us to impose itself. This is the definition given by Cicero, Gentiles sunt ca interesse et nomini sunt, top. 6. 
those are of the same gens who have the same name among themselves. It may be said in a general way that the clan is a family group, where kinship results solely from a common name, it is in this sense that the gens is a clan. But the totemic clan is a particular sort of the class thus constituted. In a certain sense, these bonds of solidarity extend even beyond the frontiers of the tribe. When individuals of different tribes have the same totem, they have peculiar duties towards each other. This fact is expressly stated for certain tribes of North America, see Fraser, Totemism and Exogamy, 3, pages 57, 81, 299, 356 to 357. The texts relative to Australia are less explicit. However, it is probable that the prohibition of marriage between members of a single totem is international. Morgan, Ancient Society, page 165. In Australia the words employed differ with the tribes. In the regions observed by Gray, they said Kobong, the diary say Merdu, Howitt, Nat Tr, page 91, the Naranyeri, Gaetai, Talpin, in Kerr, 2, page 244, the Waramunga, Mungai or Mungai, nor TR, page 754, etc. Indian Tribes of the United States, 4, page 86. This fortune of the word is the more regrettable since we do not even know exactly how it is written. Some write totem, others tudame, or dodame, or odatum, see Fraser, totemism, page 1. Nor is the meaning of the word determined exactly. According to the report of the first observer of the Ojibwe, J. Long, the word totem designated the protecting genius, the individual totem, of which we shall speak below, Book 2, ch. 4, and not the totem of the clan. But the accounts of other explorers say exactly the contrary, on this point, see Fraser, Totemism and Exogamy, 3, pages 49 to 52. The Wachobaluk, page 121, and the Bwandik, page 123. The same. The Wulgal, p. 102, the Wachobaluk and the Bwandik. The Murabura, p. 117, the Wachobaluk and the Bwandik. The Bwandik and the Kayabra, page 116. It is to be remarked that all the examples come from only five tribes. Thus, out of 204 kinds of totems, collected by Spencer and Gillen out of a large number of tribes, 188 are animals or plants. The inanimate objects are the boomerang, cold weather, darkness, fire, lightning, the moon, red ochre, resin, salt water, the evening star, a stone, the sun, water, the whirlwind, the wind, and hailstones, nor tr, page 773. cf. Fraser, Totemism and Exogamy, I, pages 253 to 254. Fraser, Totemism, pp. 10 and 13, cites a rather large number of cases and puts them in a special group which he calls split totems, but these are taken from tribes where totemism is greatly altered, such as in Samoa or the tribes of Bengal. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 107. See the tables collected by Strello, Op. Sit, 2, pages 61 to 72, CF 3, pages 13 to 17. It is remarkable that these fragmentary totems are taken exclusively from animal totems. Strello, 2, pages 52 and 72. For example, one of these totems is a cave where an ancestor of the wild cat totem rested, another is a subterranean gallery which an ancestor of the mouse clan dug, etc., Ibid, page 72. Nat Tr, pages 561 FF Strello, 2, page 71, note 2. Howitt, Nat Tr, pages 426 FF, on Australian Medicine Men, JAI, 16, page 53. Further notes on the Australian class systems, JAI, 18, pages 63 ff. The Bala means, laughing boy, according to the translation of Spencer and Gillen. The members of the clan which bear this name think they hear him laughing in the rocks which are his residence, nor tr, pages 207, 215, 226 note. According to a myth given on page 422, there was an initial group of mythical Thabala, 
cf. page 208. The clan of the Cady, full-grown men, as Spencer and Gillen say, seems to be of the same sort, nor tr, page 207. Nor tr, pages 226 ff. Strello, 2, pages 71 f. He mentions a totem of the Lorija and Arunta which is very close to the serpent Wulunkwa, it is the totem of a mythical water snake. This is the case with Klotch, in the article already cited, see above, page 92, and 3. As we indicated in the preceding chapter, totemism is at the same time of interest for the question of religion and that of the family, for the clan is a family. In the lower societies, these two problems are very closely connected. But both are so complex that it is indispensable to treat them separately. Also, the primitive family organization cannot be understood before the primitive religious beliefs are known, for the latter serve as the basis of the former. This is why it is necessary to study totemism as a religion before studying the totemic clan as a family group. See Taplin, the Naranyeri tribe, in Kerr, 2, pages 244f, Howitt, Nat Tr, page 131. Nor Tr, pages 163, 169, 170, 172. It is to be noted that in all these tribes, except the Mara and the Annula, the transmission of the totem in the paternal line is only a general rule, which has exceptions. According to Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, pages 123 ff. The soul of the ancestor becomes reincarnate in the body of the mother and becomes the soul of the child, according to Strello, 2, pages 51 ff. The conception, though being the work of the ancestor, does not imply any reincarnation. But in neither interpretation does the totem of the child necessarily depend upon that of the parents. Nat Tr, page 133, Strello, 2, page 53. It is in large part the locality where the mother believes that she conceived which determines the totem of the child. Each totem, as we shall see, has its center and the ancestors preferably frequent the places serving as centers for their respective totems. The totem of the child is therefore that which belongs to the place where the mother believes that she conceived. As this should generally be in the vicinity of the place which serves as totemic center for her husband, the child should generally follow the totem of his father. It is undoubtedly this which explains why the greater part of the inhabitants of a given locality belong to the same totem, Nat Tr, page 9. The Secret of the Totem, pages 159 FFCF Fison and Howitt, Camillaroy in Kurnai, pages 40 F. John Matthews, Eaglehawk and Crow, Thomas, Kinship and Marriage in Australia, pages 52 FF. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 124. Howitt, pages 121, 123, 124, Kerr, 3, page 461. Howitt, page 126. Howitt, pages 98 ff. Kerr, 2, page 165, Brof Smith, I, page 423, Howitt, op. Sit, page 429. Howitt, pages 101, 102. J. Matthews, Two Representative Tribes of Queensland, page 139. Still other reasons could be given in support of this hypothesis, but it would be necessary to bring in considerations relative to the organization of the family, and we wish to keep these two studies separate. Also this question is only of secondary interest to our subject. For example, Makwara, which is the name of a freightry among the Barkinji, the Paruinji and the Mopulko, designates the Eagle Hawk, according to Brof Smith. Now one of the clans of this freightry has the Eagle Hawk as totem. But here the animal is designated by the word Boyara. Many cases of the same thing are cited by Lang, Op Sit, page 162. Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, page 115. According to Howitt, Op. Sit, pages 121 and 454, among the Watjobaluk, the clan of the pelican is found in the two freightries equally. This fact seems doubtful to us. It is very possible that the two clans may have two varieties of pelicans as totems. 
Information given by Matthews on the same tribe seems to point to this, Aboriginal tribes of NS Wales and Victoria, in Journal and Proceedings of the Royal Society of NS Wales, 1904, pages 287f. In connection with this question, see our memoir on Lototmism, in the Annie Sociologique, Volume 5, pages 82ff. On the question of Australian matrimonial classes in general, see our memoir on La Prohibition de l'Inceste, in the Annie Associ. I. P. P. 9ff, and especially for the tribes with eight classes, l'Organisation Matrimonial de Societes Australiennes, in Annie Associ. 8, pages 118 to 147. This principle is not maintained everywhere with an equal strictness. In the central tribes of eight classes notably, beside the class with which marriage is regularly permitted, there is another with which a sort of secondary concubinage is allowed, Spencer and Gillen, nor T.R., page 106. It is the same with certain tribes of four classes. Each class has a choice between the two classes of the other fratry. This is the case with the cabby, C. Matthews, in Kerr, 3, 162. C. Roth, Ethnological Studies Among the Northwest Central Queensland Aborigines, pages 56 ff, Palmer, Notes on Some Australian Tribes, J.A.I., 13, 1884, pages 302 ff. Nevertheless, some tribes are cited where the matrimonial classes bear the names of animals or plants, this is the case with the cabby, Matthew, two representative tribes, page 150, the tribes observed by Mrs. Bates, The Marriage Laws and Customs of the West Australian Aborigines, in Victorian Geographical Journal, 23-24, page 47, and perhaps in two tribes observed by Palmer. But these facts are very rare and their significance badly established. Also, it is not surprising that the classes, as well as the sexual groups, should sometimes adopt the names of animals. This exceptional extension of the totemic denominations in no way modifies our conception of totemism. Perhaps the same explanation is applicable to certain other tribes of the southeast and the east where, if we are to believe the informers of Howitt, totems specially attached to each matrimonial class are to be found. This is the case among the Wiradjuri, the Wakelbura and the Buntamura on the Bula River, Howitt, Nat Tr, pages 210, 221, 226. However, the evidence collected is suspect, according to his own admission. In fact, it appears from the lists which he has drawn up, that many totems are found equally in the two classes of the same fratry. The explanation which we propose, after Fraser, Totemism and Exogamy, pages 531 ff, raises one difficulty. In principle, each clan, and consequently each totem, is represented equally in the two classes of a single fratry, since one of the classes is that of the children and the other that of the parents from whom the former get their totems. So when the clans disappeared, the totemic interdictions which survived should have remained in both matrimonial classes, while in the actual cases cited, each class has its own. Whence comes this differentiation? The example of the Kayabra, a tribe of southern Queensland, allows us to see how it may have come about. In this tribe, the children have the totem of their mother, but it is particularized by some distinctive mark. If the mother has the black eagle hawk as totem, the child has the white eagle hawk, Howitt, Nat Tr, page 229. This appears to be the beginning of a tendency for the totems to differentiate themselves according to the matrimonial classes. A tribe of only a few hundred members frequently has fifty or sixty clans, or even many more. On this point, see Durkheim and Moss, De Calcus Forms Primitives de Classification, in the Annie Sociologique, Volume 6, page 28, n. 1. Except among the Pueblo Indians of the Southwest, where they are more numerous. See Hodge, Pueblo Indian Clans, in American Anthropologist, First Series, Volume 9, pages 345 ff. It may always be asked whether the groups which have these totems are clans or subclans. See the tables arranged by Morgan, Ancient Society, pages 153 to 185. Kraus, Die Klinkatindianer, page 112. Swanton, Social Condition, 
Beliefs and Linguistic Relationship of the Tlingit Indians, in XXV Ith Republic, page 308. Swanton, Contributions to the Ethnology of the Haida, page 62. The distinction between the two clans is absolute in every respect, says Swanton, page 68, he gives the name clan to what we call fratries. The two fratries, he says elsewhere, are like two foreign nations in their relations to each other. Among the Haida at least, the totem of the real clans is altered more than that of the fratries. In fact, usage permits a clan to sell or give away the right of bearing its totem, as a result of which each clan has a number of totems, some of which it has in common with other clans, see Swanton, pages 107 and 268. Since Swanton calls the Fratries clans, he is obliged to give the name of family to the real clans, and of household to the regular families. But the real sense of his terminology is not to be doubted. Journals of Two Expeditions in NW and W. Australia, 2, page 228. Camilaroi in Kurnai, page 165. Indian Tribes, I, page 420, cf. I, page 52. This etymology is very doubtful. CF Handbook of American Indians North of Mexico, Smithsonian INST Burr of Ethnol, PT2, SV, Totem, page 787. Schoolcraft, Indian Tribes, 3, 184, Garrick Mallory, Picture Writing of the American Indians, in Tenth Report, 1893, page 377. Hearn, Journey to the Northern Ocean, page 148, quoted from Fraser, Totemism, page 30. Charlevoix, Histoire et Description de la Nouvelle France, v. page 329. Krauss, Indianer, page 248. Ermini A. Smith, Myths of the Iroquois, in Secretary Republic of the Burr of Ethnol, page 78. Dodge, Our Wild Indians, page 225. Powell, Wyandotte Government, in First Republic of the Burr of Ethnol, 1881, page 64. Dorsey, Omaha Sociology, in Third Republic, pages 229, 240, 248. Krauss, Op. Sit, pages 130f. Krauss, page 308. See a photograph of a Haida village in Swanton, Op. Sit, PL9. C.F. Tyler, Totem Post of the Haida Village of Masset, J.A.I., New Series I, page 133. Hill Tout, Report on the Ethnology of the Statlam of British Columbia, J.A.I., XXXV, page 155. Krauss, Op. Sit, page 230, Swanton, Haida, pages 129, 135 ff. Schoolcraft, Op. Sit, I, pages 52 to 53, 337, 356. In the latter case, the totem is represented upside down in sign of mourning. Similar usages are found among the Creek, C. Swan, in Schoolcraft, v. p. 265, and the Delaware, Heckwelder, an account of the history, manners, and customs of the Indian nations who once inhabited Pennsylvania, pages 246 to 247. Spencer and Gillen, Nor T. R., pages 168, 537, 540. Ibid, page 174. Brough Smith, The Aborigines of Victoria, I, page 99N. Brough Smith, I, page 284. Strello cites a fact of the same sort among the Arunta, 3, page 68. An account of the English colony in N.S. Wales, 2, page 381. Krauss, page 237. Swanton, Social Condition, Beliefs and Linguistic Relationship of the Tlingit Indians, in XXV Ith Republic, pages 435 ff, Boas, The Social Organization and Secret Societies of the Kwakiutl Indians, page 358. Fraser, Totemism, page 26. Burke, The Snake Dance of the Maquis of Arizona, page 229, J. W. Fuchs, The Group of Tusayan Ceremonials Called Katsinas, in XVTH Republic, 1897, pages 151-263. Muller, 
Jeschik der Amerikanischen Erlichenen, page 327. Schoolcraft, op. sit. 3, p. 269. Dorsey, Omaha Social, Third Republic, pages 229, 238, 240, 245. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 451. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 257. The meaning of these relations will be seen below, Book 2, ch. 4. Spencer and Gillen, Nor T.R., page 296. Howitt, Nat T.R., pages 744 to 746, cf. page 129. Camillaroy and Kernai, page 66 n. It is true that other informers contest this fact. Howitt, Nat T.R., page 744. Swanton, Contributions to the Ethnology of the Haida, pages 41 ff, plxx and xxi. Boas, The Social Organization of the Kwaki page 318, Swanton, Plingit, pl 16 ff, in one place, outside the two ethnographic regions which we are specially studying, these tattooings are put on the animals which belong to the clan. The Bechuana of South Africa are divided into a certain number of clans, there are the people of the crocodile, the buffalo, the monkey, etc. Now the crocodile people, for example, make an incision in the ears of their cattle whose form is like the jaws of this animal, Casales, Les Basutos, page 221. According to Robertson Smith, the same custom existed among the ancient Arabs, kinship and marriage in early Arabia, pages 212 to 214. However, according to Spencer and Gillen, there are some which have no religious sense, see Nat Tr, pages 41 f, nor Tr, pages 45, 54 to 56. Among the Arunta, this rule has exceptions which will be explained below. Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, page 162, nor Tr, pages 179, 259, 292, 295 f, Scholes, Locke Sit, page 221. The thing thus represented is not always the totem itself, but one of those things which, being associated to this totem, are regarded as being in the same family of things. This is the case, for example, among the Waramunga, the Walpari, the Wulmala, the Chingili, the Umbaya, and the Unmatura, nor tr. 339-348. Among the Waramunga, at the moment when the design is executed, the performers address the initiated with the following words, that mark belongs to your place, do not look out along another place. This means, say Spencer and Gillen, that the young man must not interfere with ceremonies belonging to other totems than his own, it also indicates the very close association which is supposed to exist between a man and his totem and any spot especially connected with the totem, nor. Tr, page 584 and n. Among the Waramunga, the totem is transmitted from father to child, so each locality has its own. Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, pages 215, 241, 376. It will be remembered, see above, p. 107, that in this tribe, the child may have a different totem than his father, his mother, or his relatives in general. Now the relatives on both sides are the performers designated for the ceremonies of initiation. Consequently, since in principle a man can have the quality of performer or officiant only for the ceremonies of his own totem. It follows that in certain cases the rites by which the young man is initiated must be in connection with a totem that is not his own. That is why the paintings made on the body of the novice do not necessarily represent his own totem. Cases of this sort will be found in Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, page 229. That there is an anomaly here is well shown by the fact that the circumcision falls to the totem which predominates in the local group of the initiate, that is to say, to the one which would be the totem of the initiate himself. If the totemic organization were not disturbed, if among the Arunta it were what it is among the Waramunga, see Spencer and Gillen, Ibid. Page 219, the same disturbance has had another consequence. In a general way, its effect is to extend a little the bonds attaching each totem to a special group, 
since each totem may have members in all the local groups possible, and even in the two fratries. The idea that these ceremonies of a totem might be celebrated by an individual of another totem, an idea which is contrary to the very principles of totemism, as we shall see better after a while, has thus been accepted without too much resistance. It has been admitted that a man to whom a spirit revealed the formula for a ceremony had the right of presiding over it, even when he was not of the totem in question himself, Nat Tr, page 519. But that this is an exception to the rule and the product of a sort of toleration is proved by the fact that the beneficiary of the formula does not have the free disposition of it. If he transmits it, and these transmissions are frequent, it can be only to a member of the totem which the right concerns, Nat Tr, Ibid. Nat Tr, page 140. In this case, the novice keeps the decoration with which he has thus been adorned until it disappears of itself by the effect of time. Boas, General Report on the Indians of British Columbia in British Association for the Advancement of Science, Fifth Republic of the Committee on the N.W. Tribes of the Dominion of Canada, page 41. There are also some among the Waramunga, but in smaller numbers than among the Arunta, they do not figure in the totemic ceremonies, though they do have a place in the myths, nor tr, page 163. Other names are used by other tribes. We give a generic sense to the Arunta term because it is in this tribe that the Chiringa have the most important place and have been studied the best. Strello, 2, page 81. There are a few which have no apparent design, see Spencer and Gillen, Nat. Tr, page 144. Nat Tr, pages 139 and 648, Strello, 2, page 75. Strello, who writes Jurunga, gives a slightly different translation to the word. This word, he says, means that which is secret and personal, der Eigen Gehema. Tju is an old word which means hidden or secret, and Runga means that which is my own. But Kemp, who has more authority than Strello in this matter, translates Tju by great, powerful, sacred, Kemp, vocabulary of the tribes inhabiting McDonnell Ranges, SVTJU, in Transactions of the R, Society of Victoria, Volume 13. At bottom, the translation of Strello is not so different from the other as might appear at first glance, for what is secret is hidden from the knowledge of the profane, that is, it is sacred. As for the meaning given to Runga, it appears to us very doubtful. The ceremonies of the emu belong to all the members of that clan, all may participate in them, therefore they are not personal to any one of them. Nat Tr, pages 130-132. Strello, 2, page 78. A woman who has seen a chiringa or a man who has shown one to her are both put to death. Strello calls this place, defined in exactly the same terms as by Spencer and Gillen, Arknana instead of Ertnachalunga. Strello, 2, p. 78. Nor tr, page 270, nat tr, page 140. Nat tr, page 135. Strello, 2, page 78. However, Strello says that if a murderer takes refuge near an Ertnachalunga, he is unpityingly pursued there and put to death. We find some difficulty in conciliating this fact with the privilege enjoyed by animals. And ask ourselves if the rigor with which a criminal is treated is not something recent and should not be attributed to a weakening of the taboo which originally protected the Nat Tr, page 248. Ibid, pages 545 f, Strello, 2, page 79. For example, the dust detached by rubbing a chiringa with a stone, when dissolved in water, forms a potion which restores health to sick persons. Nat Tr, pages 545 f, Strello, 2, p. 79, contests this fact. For example, the chiringa of the yam totem, if placed in the soil, make the yams grow, nor Tr, page 275. It has the same power over animals, Strello, 2, pages 76, 78, 3, pages 3, 7. Nat Tr, page 135, Strello, 2, page 79. Nor Tr, page 278. Ibid, page 180.
NOR TR, pages 272F. NAT TR, page 135. One group borrows the Chiringa of another with the idea that these latter will communicate some of the virtues which are in them and that their presence will quicken the vitality of the individuals and of the group, NAT TR, pages 158 FF. IBID, P. 136. Each individual is united by a particular bond to a special Chiringa which assures him his life, and also to those which he has received as a heritage from his parents. NAT TR, page 154, NOR TR, page 193. The Chiringa are so thoroughly collective that they take the place of the message sticks with which the messengers of other tribes are provided, when they are sent to summon foreign groups to a ceremony, NAT TR, pages 141 F. IBID, page 326. It should be remarked that the bull roarers are used in the same way, Matthews, Aboriginal tribes of NS Wales and Victoria, in Jure, of Roy. SOC of NS Wales, XXXVII, pages 307F. NAT TR, pages 161, 259FF. IBID, page 138. Strello, I, Borwart. In fine, 2, pages 76, 77 and 82. For the Arunta, it is the body of the ancestor itself, for the Larija, it is only an image. When a child has just been born, the mother shows the father the spot where she believes that the soul of the ancestor entered her. The father, accompanied by a few relatives, goes to this spot and looks for the Chiringa which the ancestor is believed to have left at the moment that he reincarnated himself. If it is found there, some old man of the group undoubtedly put it there, this is the hypothesis of Spencer and Gillen. If they do not find it, a new Chiringa is made in a determined manner, Nat TR, page 132. C.F. Strello, 2, page 80. This is the case among the Waramunga, the Yurubunna, the Wurgia, the Umbaya, the Chingili and the Gwangi, nor TR, pages 258, 275F. Then, say Spencer and Gillen, they were regarded as of a special value because of their association with a totem, Ibid, page 276. There are examples of the same fact among the Arunta, Nat TR, 156. Strello writes Natanja, I, pages 4 to 5. The Kadish, the Ilpira, the Unmatura, but it is rare among the latter. The pole is sometimes replaced by very long Chiringa, placed end to end. Sometimes another smaller one is hung from the top of the Nertunja. In other cases, the Nertunja is in the form of a cross or a T. More rarely, the central support is lacking, Nat TR, pages 298 to 300, 360 to 364, 627. Sometimes there are even three of these crossbars. Nat TR, pages 231 to 234, 306 to 310, 627. In addition to the Nertunja and the Waninga, Spencer and Gillen distinguish a third sort of sacred post or flag, called the Kanana, Nat TR, pages 364, 370, 629, whose functions they admit they have been unable to determine. They merely note that it is regarded as something common to the members of all the totems. According to Strello, 2, page 23, n, 2, the Kanana of which Spencer and Gillen speak, is merely the Nertunja of the wild cat totem. As this animal is the object of a tribal cult, the veneration of which it is the object might easily be common to all the clans. Nor tr, page 342, nat tr, page 309. Nat tr, page 255. Ibid, chx, n11. Ibid, pages 138, 144. C. Dorsey, Suen Cults, Exith Republic, page 413, Omaha Sociology, Third Republic, page 234. It is true that there is only one sacred post for the tribe, while there is an Ertunja for each clan. But the principle is the same. Nat Tr, pp. 232, 308, 313, 334, etc., nor tr. 182, 
186, etc. Nat Tr, page 346. It is true that some say that the Nertunja represents the lance of the ancestor who was at the head of each clan in Alcharinga times. But it is only a symbolic representation of it, it is not a sort of relic, like the Churinga, which is believed to come from the ancestor himself. Here the secondary character of the explanation is very noticeable. Nat Tr, pages 614 ff, ESPP. 617, Nor Tr, page 749. Nat Tr, page 624. Ibid, page 179. Ibid, page 181. See the examples given in Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, figure 131. Here are designs, many of which evidently have the object of representing animals, plants, the heads of men, etc., though of course all are very conventional. Nat Tr, page 617, Nor Tr, page 716 ff. Nat Tr, page 145, Strello, 2, page 80. Nat Tr, p. 151. Ibid, page 346. It cannot be doubted that these designs and paintings also have an aesthetic character, here is the first form of art. Since they are also, and even above all, a written language, it follows that the origins of design and those of writing are one. It even becomes clear that men commence designing, not so much to fix upon wood or stone beautiful forms which charm the senses, as to translate his thought into matter, C.F. Schoolcraft, Indian Tribes, I, page 405, Dorsey, Suen Cults, pages 394 ff. See the cases in Taplin, the Naranieri, page 63, Howitt, Nat Tr, pages 146, 769, Fison and Howitt, Camillaroy and Kurnai, page 169, Roth, Superstition, Magic and Medicine, section 150, Wyatt, Adelaide and Encounter Bay Tribe, in Woods, page 168, Meyer, Ibid. Page 186. This is the case with the Waramunga, nor TR, page 168. For example, among the Waramunga, the Urubana, the Wonghiban, the Yuin, the Watjobaluk, the Bwandik, Njumba, etc. Among the Kadish, if a man of the clan eats too much of his totem, the members of the other fratry have recourse to a magic operation which is expected to kill him, nor TR, page 284. C.F. Nat Tr, page 204, Langlo Parker, the Yulavi tribe, p. 20. Nat Tr, page 202, N. Strello, 2, page 58. Nor Tr, page 173. Nat Tr, pages 207 ff. See above, page 128. It should also be borne in mind that in these myths the ancestors are never represented as nourishing themselves regularly with their totem. Consumption of this sort is, on the contrary, the exception. Their ordinary food, according to Strello, was the same as that of the corresponding animal, see Strello, I, page 4. Also, this whole theory rests upon an entirely arbitrary hypothesis, Spencer and Gillen, as well as Fraser, admit that the tribes of Central Australia, and especially the Arunta, represent the most archaic and consequently the purest form of totemism. We shall presently say why this conjecture seems to us to be contrary to all probability. It is even probable that these authors would not have accepted their thesis so readily if they had not refused to regard totemism as a religion and if they had not consequently misunderstood the sacred character of the totem. Taplin, the Naranieri, page 64, Howitt, Nat Tr, pages 145 and 147, Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, page 202, Gray, Locke Sit, Kerr, 3, page 462. Nor Tr, pages 160, 167. It is not enough that the intermediary be of another totem, as we shall see, Every totem of a fratry is forbidden in a certain measure for the members of the fratry who are of a different totem. Nor Tr, page 167. We can now explain more easily how it happens that when an interdiction is not observed, it is the other fratry which revenges this sacrilege, see above, 
page 129, n. 2. It is because it has an interest in seeing that the rule is observed. In fact, they believe that when the rule is broken, the totemic species may not reproduce abundantly. Now the members of the other fratry consume it regularly, therefore it is they who are affected. That is why they revenge themselves. This is the case among the Lorigia, Strello, 2, pages 60, 61, the Wurgia, the Waramunga, the Walpari, the Mara, the Annula and the Bimbinga, nor TR, pages 166, 167, 171, 173. It may be eaten by a Waramunga or a Walpari, but only when offered by a member of the other fratry. Spencer and Gillen remark, page 167, n, that in this regard the paternal and the maternal totems appear to be under different rules. It is true that in both cases the offer must come from the other fratry. But when it is a question of the paternal totem, or the totem properly so called, this fratry is the one to which the totem does not belong. For the maternal totem, the contrary is the case. Probably the principle was first established for the former, then mechanically extended to the other, though the situation was different. When the rule had once become established that the prohibition protecting the totem could be neglected only on the invitation of the other fratry, it was applied also to the maternal totem. For example, among the Waramunga, nor tr, p. 166, the Watjobaluk, the Bwandik, the Kurnai, Howitt, pages 146 f, and the Naranyeri, Taplin, the Naranyeri, page 63. Even this is not always the case. An Arunta of the mosquito totem must not kill this insect, even when it bothers him, he must confine himself to driving it away, Strello, 2, page 58, C. F. Taplin, page 63. Among the Kadish and the Unmatura, nor T. R., page 160. It even happens that in certain cases an old man gives a young one of a different totem one of his churinga, so that he may kill the donor's totem more easily, Ibid, page 272. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 146, Gray, Op Sit, 2, page 228. Casales, Basudos, page 221. Among these latter, one must be purified after committing such a sacrilege. Strello, 2, Pages 58, 59, 61. Dorsey, Omaha Sociology, IIRD Republic, pages 225, 231. Casales, Ibid. Even among the Omaha, it is not certain that the interdictions of contact, certain examples of which we have just cited, are really of a totemic nature, for many of them have no direct connection with the animal that serves as totem of the clan. Thus in the sub-clan of the eagle, the characteristic interdiction is against touching the head of a buffalo, Dorsey, Op Sit, page 239, in another sub-clan with the same totem, they must not touch vertigris, charcoal, etc., Ibid, page 245. We do not mention other interdictions mentioned by Fraser, such as those of naming or looking at the animal or plant, for it is still less certain that they are of totemic origin. Except perhaps for certain facts observed among the Bechuana, totemism, pp. 12 to 13, Fraser admits too readily, and in this regard, he has imitators, that the prohibitions against eating or touching an animal depend upon totemic beliefs. However, there is one case in Australia, where the sight of the animal seems to be forbidden. According to Strello, 2, p. 59, among the Arunta and the Larija, a man who has the moon as totem must not look at it very long, or he would be likely to die at the hand of an enemy. But we believe that this is a unique case. We must not forget, also, that astronomical totems were probably not primitive in Australia, so this prohibition may be the product of a complex elaboration. This hypothesis is confirmed by the fact that among the Uleai, looking at the moon is forbidden to all mothers and children, no matter what their totems may be. L. Parker, The Uleai, page 53. C. Bank, 3, ch. 2, section 2. Perhaps there is no religion which makes man an exclusively profane being. For the Christian, the soul which each of us has within him and which constitutes the very essence of our being, has something sacred about it. 
we shall see that this conception of the soul is as old as religious thought itself. The place of man in the hierarchy of sacred things is more or less elevated. Nat Tr, page 202. Taplin, the Naranieri, pages 59-61. Among certain clans of the Waramunga, for example, Nor Tr, page 162. Among the Yorubana, Nor Tr, page 147. Even when they tell us that the first beings were men, these are really only semi-human, and have an animal nature at the same time. This is the case with certain Unmatura, Ibid, pages 153 to 154. Here we find ways of thought whose confusion disconcerts us, but which must be accepted as they are. We would denature them if we tried to introduce a clarity that is foreign to them, cf. Nat Tr, page 119. Among the Arunta, Nat Tr, pages 388 ff, and among certain Unmatura, Nor Tr, page 153. Nat Tr, page 389. Cf Strello, I, pages 2-7. Nat Tr, page 389, Strello, I, pages 2 ff. Undoubtedly there is an echo of the initiation rites in this mythical theme. The initiation also has the object of making the young man into a complete man, and on the other hand, it also implies actual surgical operations, circumcision, subincision, the extraction of teeth, etc. The processes which serve to form the first men would naturally be conceived on the same model. This the case with the nine clans of the Makwi, schoolcraft, Indian tribes, for, page 86, the Crane clan among the Ojibwe, Morgan, Ancient Society, p. 180, and the Nootka clans, Boas, Vieth Republic on the NW Tribes of Canada, page 43, etc. It is thus that the Turtle clan of the Iroquois took form. A group of turtles had been forced to leave the lake where they dwelt and seek another home. One of them, which was larger than the others, stood this exercise very badly owing to the heat. It made such violent efforts that it got out of its shell. The process of transformation, being once commenced, went on by itself and the turtle finally became a man who was the ancestor of the clan, Ermenia Smith, The Myths of the Iroquois, Iand Report, page 77. The crab clan of the Choctaw was formed in a similar manner. Some men surprised a certain number of crabs that lived in the neighborhood, took them home with them, taught them to talk and to walk, and finally adopted them into their society, Catlin, North American Indians, 2, page 128. For example, here is a legend of the Tsimshian. In the course of a hunt, an Indian met a black bear which took him to its home, and taught him to catch salmon and build canoes. The man stayed with the bear for two years, and then returned to his native village. But the people were afraid of him, because he was just like a bear. He could not talk or eat anything except raw food. Then he was rubbed with magic herbs and gradually regained his original form. After that, whenever he was in trouble, he called upon his bear friends, who came to aid him. He built a house and painted a bear on the foundation. His sister made a blanket for the dance, upon which a bear was designed. That is why the descendants of this sister had the bear as their emblem, Boas, Kwakiutl, page 323. CFVTH Republic on the NW Tribes of Canada, pages 23, 29 ff. Hill Tout, Report on the Ethnology of the Statlam of British Columbia, in JAI, 1905, XXXV, page 150. Thus we see the inconveniences in making this mystical relationship between the man and the animal the distinctive characteristic of totemism, as M. Van Genet proposes, Totemism et Method Comparative, in Revue de l'Histoire de Religions, Vol. LVA, July, 1908, page 55. This relationship is a mythical representation of otherwise profound facts, but it may be omitted without causing the disappearance of the essential traits of totemism. Undoubtedly there are always close bonds between the people of the clan and the totemic animal, but these are not necessarily bonds of blood relationship, though they are frequently conceived in this form. There are also some Tlingit myths in which the relationship of descent between the man and the animal is still more carefully stated. 
It is said that the clan is descended from a mixed union, if we may so speak, that is to say, one where either the husband or the wife was an animal of the species whose name the clan bears, see Swanton, social condition, beliefs, etc. Of the Tlingit Indians, XXVth Republic, pages 415 to 418. Nat TR, page 284. Ibid, page 179. C Bank, 3, CH2. CF Nat TR, pages 184, 201. Ibid, pages 204, 262, 284. Among the Diary and the Pancala. C. Howitt, Nat TR, pages 658, 661, 668, 669 to 671. Among the Waramunga, the blood from the circumcision is drunk by the mother, nor TR, page 352. Among the Bimbinga, the blood on the knife which was used in the subincision must be licked off by the initiate, Ibid, page 368. In general, the blood coming from the genital organs is regarded as especially sacred, Nat TR, page 464, nor TR, page 598. Nat TR, page 268. Ibid, pages 144, 568. Ibid, pages 442, 464. This myth is quite common in Australia. Nat TR, page 627. Ibid. Page 466. Ibid. It is believed that if all these formalities are not rigorously observed, grave calamities will fall upon the individual. Nat TR, page 538, nor TR, page 604. After the foreskin has been detached by circumcision, it is sometimes hidden, just like the blood, it has special virtues, for example, it assures the fecundity of certain animal and vegetable species, nor tr, pages 353 f. The whiskers are mixed with the hair, and treated as such, ibid, pages 604, 544. They also play a part in the myths, ibid, page 158. As for the fat, its sacred character is shown by the use made of it in certain funeral rites. This is not saying that the woman is absolutely profane. In the myths, at least among the Arunta, she plays a religious role much more important than she does in reality, Nat Tr, pages 195 f. Even now she takes part in certain initiation rites. Finally, her blood has religious virtues, see Nat Tr, page 464, cf la prohibition de l'inceste de ses origins, Annie Social, pages 41 ff. It is upon this complex situation of the woman that the exogamic restrictions depend. We do not speak of them here because they concern the problem of domestic and matrimonial organization more directly than the present one. Nat Tr, page 460. Among the Wakelbara, according to Howitt, page 146. Among the Bechuana, according to Casales, Basudos, page 221. Among the Bwandic and Kurnai, Howitt, Ibid, among the Arunta, Strello, 2, page 58. Howitt, Ibid. In the Tully River district, says Roth, superstition, magic and medicine, in North Queensland ethnography, no. 5, section 74, as an individual goes to sleep or gets up in the morning, he pronounces in a rather low voice the name of the animal after which he is named himself. The purpose of this practice is to make the man clever or lucky in the hunt, or be forewarned of the dangers to which he may be exposed from this animal. For example, a man who has a species of serpent as his totem is protected from bites if this invocation has been made regularly. Taplin, Naranieri, page 64, Howitt, Nat Tr, page 147, Roth, Locke CIT. Strello, 2, page 58. Howitt, page 148. Nor Tr, pp. 159 to 160. Ibid. Ibid, page 225, Nat Tr, pages 202, 203. A. L. P. Cameron, on two Queensland tribes, in Science of Man, Australasian Anthropological Journal, 1904, 
7, 28, Colonel I. Camillaroy and Kernai, page 170. Notes on some Australian tribes, J.I. 13, page 300. In Kerr, Australian Race, 3, page 45, Brof Smith, The Aborigines of Victoria, I, page 91, Fison and Howitt, Camillaroy and Kernai, page 168. Durkheim and Moss, De Calcus Forms Primitives de Classification, in Annie Sociol, 6, pp. 1 ff. Kerr, 3, page 461. Kerr and Fison were both informed by the same person, D. S. Stewart. Matthews, Aboriginal Tribes of N. S. Wales and Victoria, in Journal and Proceedings of the Royal Society of N. S. Wales, XXXVII, pages 287f, Howitt, Nat T. R. Page 121. The feminine form of the names given by Matthews is Gurogurk and Gamadikirk. These are the forms which Howitt reproduces, with a slightly different orthography. The names are also equivalent to those used by the Mount Gamber tribe, Cumite and Croaky. The native name of this clan is Dilup, which Matthews does not translate. This word appears to be identical with Jalup, by which Howitt designates a subclan of the same tribe, and which he translates, Muscle. That is why we think we can hazard this translation. This is the translation of Howitt. Matthews renders the word Wartwort, heat of the midday Sunday. The tables of Matthews and Howitt disagree on many important points. It even seems that clans attributed by Howitt to the Crokey Fratry are given to the Gamuch Fratry by Matthews, and inversely. This proves the great difficulties that these observations present. But these differences are without interest for our present question. Mrs. Langlow Parker, The ULAI Tribe, pages 12 ff. The facts will be found below. Carr, 3, page 27. C. F. Howitt, Nat T. R., page 112. We are merely mentioning the most characteristic facts. For details, one may refer to the memoir already mentioned on less classifications primitives. Ibid, pages 34 ff. Swanton, The Haida, pages 13 to 14, 17, 22. This is especially clear among the Haida. Swanton says that with them every animal has two aspects. First, it is an ordinary animal to be hunted and eaten, but it is also a supernatural being in the animal's form, upon which men depend. The mythical beings corresponding to cosmic phenomena have the same ambiguity, Swanton, Ibid, 16, 14, 25. See above, page 142. This is the case among the Gorndich Mara, Howitt, Nat Tr, p. 124, in the tribe studied by Cameron near the Dead Lake, and among the Watjobaluk, Ibid, pages 125, 250. J. Athews, Two Representative Tribes, page 139, Thomas, Kinship and Marriage, pages 53 f. Among the Osage, for example, C. Dorsey, Suen Sociology, in XVTH Republic, pages 233 ff. At Mabuyag, an island in Torres Strait, Haddon, Head Hunters, p. 132, the same opposition is found between the two fratries of the Arunta, one includes the men of a water totem, the other those of earth, Strello, I, page 6. Among the Iroquois there is a sort of tournament between the two fratries, Morgan, Ancient Society, page 94. Among the Haida, says Swanton, the members of the two fratries of the eagle and the crow, are frequently considered as avowed enemies. Husband and wife, who must be of different fratries, do not hesitate to betray each other, the Haida, page 62. In Australia this hostility is carried into the myths. The two animals serving the fratries as totems are frequently represented as in a perpetual war against each other, C.J. Matthews, Eagle Hawk and Crow, A Study of Australian Aborigines, pages 14 ff. In games, each fratry is the natural rival of the other, Howitt, Nat T.R., page 770. So Thomas has wrongly urged against our theory of the origin of the fratries its inability to explain their opposition, kinship and marriage, page 69. 
We do not believe that it is necessary to connect this opposition to that of the profane and the sacred, C. Hertz, La Preeminence de la Main Droit, in the Revue Philosophique, December, 1909, page 559. The things of one fratry are not profane for the other, both are a part of the same religious system, see below, page 155. For example, the clan of the tea tree includes the grasses, and consequently herbivorous animals, see Camillaroi in Kernai, p. 169, this is undoubtedly the explanation of a particularity of the totemic emblems of North America pointed out by Boas. Among the Tlingit, he says, and all the other tribes of the coast, the emblem of a group includes the animals serving as food to the one whose name the group bears, Fifth Republic of the Committee, etc. British Association for the Advancement of Science, page 25. Thus, among the Arunta, frogs are connected with the totem of the gum tree, because they are frequently found in the cavities of this tree, water is related to the water hen. With the kangaroo is associated a sort of parrot frequently seen flying about this animal, Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., pages 146 to 147, 448. One of the signs of this primitive lack of distinction is that territorial bases are sometimes assigned to the classes just as to the social divisions with which they were at first confounded. Thus, among the Watjobaluk in Australia and the Zunai in America, things are ideally distributed among the different regions of space, just as the clans are. Now this regional distribution of things and that of the clans coincide, see the Calcus forms primitives to classification, pages 34 ff. Classifications keep something of this special character even among relatively advanced peoples, as for example, in China, Ibid, pages 55 ff. Bridgman, in Brough Smith, The Aborigines of Victoria, I, page 91. Fison and Howitt, Camillaroi and Kernai, page 168, Howitt, Further Notes on the Australian Class Systems, J.A.I., 18, page 60. Kerr, 3, page 461. This is about the Mount Gambier tribe. Howitt, On Some Australian Beliefs, J.A.I., 13, page 191. N. 1. Howitt, Notes on Australian Message Sticks, J.A.I., 18, page 326, Further Notes, J.A.I., 18, page 61, N. 3. Kerr, 3, page 28. Matthews, Ethnological Notes on the Aboriginal Tribes of N.S. Wales and Victoria, in Jern. And Proceed. Of the Royal S.O.C. Of N.S. Wales, XXXVII, page 294. C. F. Kerr, 3, page 461, and Howitt, Nat T. R., page 146. The expressions Tuman and Wingo are applied to the one and the other. Howitt, Nat T. R., page 123. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T. R., pages 447 ff, C. F. Strello, 3, pp. 12 ff. Fison and Howitt, Camillaroi and Kernai, page 169. Kerr, 3, page 462. Mrs. Parker, The Ulai Tribe, page 20. Spencer and Gillen, Nor T.R., page 151, Nat T.R., page 447, Strello, 3, page 12. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 449. However, there are certain tribes in Queensland where the things thus attributed to a social group are not forbidden for the members of the group, this is notably the case with the Wakelborough. It is to be remembered that in this society, it is the matrimonial classes that serve as the framework of the classification, see above, page 144. Not only are the men of one class allowed to eat the animals attributed to this class, but they may eat no others. All other food is forbidden them, how it, Nat T.R., page 113, Kerr, 3, page 27. But we must not conclude from this that these animals are considered profane. In fact, it should be noticed that the individual not only has the privilege of eating them, but that he is compelled to do so, for he cannot nourish himself otherwise. Now the imperative nature of this rule is a sure sign that we are in the presence of things having a religious nature, only this has given rise to a positive obligation rather than the negative one known as an interdiction. 
perhaps it is not quite impossible to see how this deviation came about. We have seen above, page 140, that every individual is thought to have a sort of property right over his totem and consequently over the things dependent upon it. Perhaps, under the influence of special circumstances, this aspect of the totemic relation was developed. And they naturally came to believe that only the members of the clan had the right of disposing of their totem and all that is connected with it, and that others, on the contrary, did not have the right of touching it. Under these circumstances, a tribe could nourish itself only on the food attributed to it. Mrs. Parker uses the expression, multiplex totems. As examples, see the Ualei tribe in Mrs. Parker's book, pages 15 ff, and the Wachobaluk, Howitt, Nat. TR, pages 121 ff, cf the above-mentioned article of Matthews. See the examples in Howitt, Nat TR, page 122. C.R. de Kelkis forms primitives to classification, page 28, n. 2. Strello, 2, pages 61 to 72. Nat T.R., page 112. See especially Nat T.R., p. 447, and Nor T.R., page 151. Strello, 3, pages 13 to 18. It sometimes happens that the same secondary totems are attached to two or three principal totems at the same time. This is undoubtedly because Strello has not been able to establish with certainty which is the principal totem. Point two interesting facts which appear from this table confirm certain propositions which we had already formulated. First, the principal totems are nearly all animals, with but rare exceptions. Also, stars are always only secondary or associated totems. This is another proof that these latter were only slowly advanced to the rank of totems and that at first the principal totems were preferably chosen from the animal kingdom. According to the myth, the associate totems served as food to the men of the principal totem in the fabulous times, or, when these are trees, they gave their shade, Strello, 3, page 12, Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, page 403. The fact that the associate totems are believed to have been eaten does not imply that they are considered profane. For in the mythical period, the principal totem itself was consumed by the ancestors, the founders of the clan, according to the belief. Thus in the wild cat clan, the designs carved on the Churinga represent the Hakea tree, which is a distinct totem today, Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, pages 147f. Strello, 3, page 12. N. 4, says that this is frequent. Spencer and Gillen, nor T.R. Page 182, Nat T.R., pages 151 and 297. Nat T.R., pages 151 and 158. Ibid, pages 448 and 449. Thus Spencer and Gillen speak of a pigeon called Interita, sometimes as a principal totem, Nat T.R., page 410, sometimes as an associate totem, Ibid, page 448. Howitt, further notes, pages 63 to 64. Thus it comes about that the clan has frequently been confounded with the tribe. This confusion, which frequently introduces trouble into the writings of ethnologists, has been made especially by Kerr, I, P. P. 61 ff. This is the case especially among the Waramunga, nor TR, page 298. See, for example, Spencer and Gillen, Nat TR, page 380 in Passim. One might even ask if tribal totems do not exist sometimes. Thus, among the Arunta, there is an animal, the wild cat, which serves as totem to a particular clan, but which is forbidden for the whole tribe, even the people of other clans can eat it only very moderately, Nat TR, page 168. But we believe that it would be an abuse to speak of a tribal totem in this case, for it does not follow from the fact that the free consumption of an animal is forbidden that this is a totem. Other causes can also give rise to an interdiction. The religious unity of the tribe is undoubtedly real, but this is affirmed with the aid of other symbols. We shall show what these are below, Book 2, CH 9. The totems belong to the tribe in the sense that this is interested as a body in the cult which each clan owes to its totem. 
Fraser has made a very complete collection of the texts relative to individual totemism in North America, Totemism and Exogamy, 3, pages 370 to 456. For example, among the Hurons, the Iroquois, the Algonquins, Charlevoix, Histoire de la Nouvelle France, 6, pages 67 to 70, Sagard, Le Grand Voyage au Pays de Hurons, p. 160, or among the Thompson Indians, Tite, the Thompson Indians of British Columbia, page 355. This is the case of the Yuin, Howitt, Nat T. R., page 133, the Kurnai, Ibid, p. 135, several tribes of Queensland, Roth, Superstition, Magic and Medicine, North Queensland Ethnography, Bulletin No. 5, page 19, Haddon, Headhunters, page 193, among the Delaware, Heckwelder, an account of the history, of the Indian nations, p. 238, among the Thompson Indians, Tite, Op Sit, page 355, and among the Salish Stadlam, Hill Tout, Republic of the Ethno. Of the Stadlam, J. A., XXXV. Pages 147 ff. Hill Tout, Lock Sit, page 154. Catlin, Manners and Customs, etc., London, 1876, I, p. 36. Lettre Edifiantes et Curiouses, New Edition, 6, pages 172 ff. Charlevoix, Op Sit, 6, page 69. Dorsey, Suen Cults, Exit Republic, page 443. Boas, Quaquiutl, page 323. Hill Tout, Lock Sit, page 154. Boas, Quaquiutl, page 323. Miss Fletcher, The Import of the Totem, A Study from the Omaha Tribe, Smithsonian Republic for 1897, page 583. Dot, similar facts will be found in Tite, Op Sit, pages 354, 356. Peter Jones, History of the Ojibwe Indians, page 87. This is the case, for example, with the dog among the Salish Stadlam, owing to the condition of servitude in which it lives, Hill Tout, Lock Sit, page 153. Langlo Parker, Ulai, page 21. The spirit of a man, says Mrs. Parker, Ibid. Is in his Yuanbai, his individual totem, and his Yuanbai is in him. Langlo Parker, Ulai, page 20. It is the same among certain Salish, Hill Tout, Ethn. Republic on the Stselis and Scalitz tribes, J.A.I., XXXIV, page 324. The fact is quite general among the Indians of Central America, Brinton, Nawalism, a study in Native American folklore and history, in Proceed. Of the A.M. Philos, S.O.C., 33, page 32. Parker, Ibid, Howitt, Nat T.R., page 147. Dorsey, Suen Cults, Exith Republic, page 443. Fraser has made a collection of the American cases and established the generality of the interdiction, totemism and exogamy, 3, page 450. It is true that in America, as we have seen, the individual must kill the animal whose skin serves to make what ethnologists call his medicine sack. But this usage has been observed in five tribes only. It is probably a late and altered form of the institution. Howitt, Nat T.R., pages 135, 147, 387, Australian Medicine Men, J.A., 16, page 34, Tight, The Shoeswap, page 607. Meyer, Manners and Customs of the Aborigines of the Encounter Bay Tribe, in Woods, page 197. Boas, Vieth Republic on the Northwest Tribes of Canada, page 93, Tight, The Thompson Indians, page 336, Boas, Kwakiutl, page 394. Facts will be found in Hill Tout, Rep. Of the Ethnol. Of the Statlam, J.A., XXXV, pages 144, 145. C.F. Langlo Parker, Op Sit, page 29. According to information given by Howitt in a personal letter to Fraser, Totemism and Exogamy, I, page 495, and N, 2. Hill Tout, Ethnol. 
Rep. Honest Silas and Scarlet's Tribes, J.A., XXXIV, page 324. Howitt, Australian Medicine Men, J.A., 16, page 34, Lafito, Moors de Sauvages Ameriquains, I, page 370, Charlevoix, Histoire de la Nouvelle France, 6, page 68. It is the same with the Atai and Tamaniu in Moda, Codrington, the Melanesians, pages 250f. Thus the line of demarcation between the animal protectors and fetishes, which Fraser has attempted to establish, does not exist. According to him, fetishism commences when the protector is an individual object and not a class, totemism, page 56, but it frequently happens in Australia that a determined animal takes this part, see how it, Australian Medicine Men, J.A.I., 16, p. 34. The truth is that the ideas of fetish and fetishism do not correspond to any definite thing. Brinton, Nawalism, in Proceed. America Philos S.O.C., 33, page 32. Charlevoix, 6, page 67. Hill Tout, Republic on the Ethno. Of the Statlum of British Columbia, J.I., XXXV, page 142. Hill Tout, Ethno. Republic on the Stilus and Scarlet's Tribes, J.A.I., XXXIV, pages 311 ff. Howitt, Nat T.R., page 133. Langlow Parker, Op. Sit, page 20. J.W. Powell, An American View of Totemism, in Man, 1902, No. 84, Tyler, Ibid, No. 1, Andrew Lang has expressed analogous ideas in Social Origins, pages 133 to 135. Also Fraser himself, turning from his former opinion, now thinks that until we are better acquainted with the relations existing between collective totems and guardian spirits, it would be better to designate them by different names, totemism and exogamy, 3 p. 456. This is the case in Australia among the Yuan, Howitt, Nat T.R., page 81, and the Naranieri, Meyer, Manners and Customs of the Aborigines of the Encounter Bay Tribe, in Woods, pages 197 ff. The totem resembles the patron of the individual no more than an escutcheon resembles the image of a saint, says Tyler, op. Sit, page 2. Likewise, if Fraser has taken up the theory of Tyler, it is because he refuses all religious character to the totem of the clan, totemism and exogamy, 3, page 452. See below, chapter 9 of this book. Yet according to one passage in Matthews, the individual totem is hereditary among the Wachobaluk. Each individual, he says, claims some animal, plant or inanimate object as his special and personal totem, which he inherits from his mother, Jern. And Proc, of the Roy. SOC of NS Wales, XXXVII, page 291. But it is evident that if all the children in the same family had the personal totem of their mother, neither they nor she would really have personal totems at all. Matthews probably means to say that each individual chooses his individual totem from the list of things attributed to the clan of his mother. In fact, we shall see that each clan has its individual totems which are its exclusive property. The members of the other clans cannot make use of them. In this sense, birth determines the personal totem to a certain extent, but to a certain extent only. Heckwelder, An Account of the History, Manners and Customs of the Indian Nations Who Once Inhabited Pennsylvania, in Transactions of the Historical and Literary Committee of the American Philosophical Society, I, page 238. C. Dorsey, Suen Cults, Exith Republic, page 507, Catlin, Op. Sit, I, page 37, Miss Fletcher, The Import of the Totem, in Smithsonian Republic for 1897, page 580, Tite, The Thompson Indians, pages 317 to 320, Hill Tout, J.A.I., XXXV, page 144. But some examples are found. The Kurnai magicians see their personal totems revealed to them in dreams, Howitt, Nat T.R., page 387, on Australian Medicine Men, in J.A., 16, page 34. The men of Cape Bedford believe that when an old man dreams of something during the night, 
This thing is the personal totem of the first person he meets the next day, W. E. Roth, Superstition, Magic and Medicine, page 19. But it is probable that only supplementary and accessory totems are acquired in this way, for in this same tribe another process is used at the moment of initiation, as we said in the text. In certain tribes of which Roth speaks, Ibid. Also in certain tribes near to Maribra, Howitt, Nat Tr, page 147. Among the Wiradjuri, Howitt, Nat Tr, page 406, on Australian medicine men, in J.A., 16, page 50. Roth, Locke C.I.T. Haddon, Head Hunters, pages 193 ff. Among the Wiradjuri, same references as above, n. 4. In general, it seems as though these transmissions from father to son never take place except when the father is a shaman or a magician. This is also the case among the Thompson Indians, tight, the Thompson Indians, page 320, and the Wiradjuri, of whom we just spoke. Hill Tout, J.I., XXXV, pages 146 f. The essential rite is the blowing upon the skin, if this were not done correctly, the transmission would not take place. As we shall presently see, the breath is the soul. When both breathe upon the skin of the animal, the magician and the recipient each exhale a part of their souls, which are thus fused, while partaking at the same time of the nature of the animal, who also takes part in the ceremony in the form of its symbol. N. W. Thomas, further remarks on Mr. Hill Tout's views on totemism, in Man, 1904, page 85. Langlow Parker, Op. Sit, pages 20, 29. Hill Tout, in J.A.I., XXXV, pages 143 and 146, Ibid, XXXIV, page 324. Parker, Op. Sit, page 30, Tight, The Thompson Indians, p. 320, Hill Tout, in J.A.I., XXXV, page 144. Charlevoix, 6, page 69. Hill Tout, Ibid, page 145. Thus at the birth of a child, a tree is planted which is cared for piously, for it is believed that its fate and the child's are united. Fraser, in his Golden Bough, gives a number of customs and beliefs translating this same idea in different ways. C. F. Hartland, Legend of Perseus, 2, pages 1 to 55. Howitt, Nat T. R., pages 148 ff, Fison and Howitt, Camilaroi and Kernai, pp. 194, 201 ff, Dawson, Australian Aborigines, page 52. Petrie also mentions it in Queensland, Tom Petrie's Reminiscences of Early Queensland, pages 62 and 118. Jern. And Proc, of the Roy. SOC of NS Wales, XXXVI, page 339. Must we see a trace of sexual totemism in the following custom of the Waramunga? When a dead person is buried, a bone of the arm is kept. If it is a woman, the feathers of an emu are added to the bark in which it is wrapped up. If it is a man, the feathers of an owl, nor tr, page 169. Some cases are cited where each sexual group has two sexual totems. Thus the Wurundjeri unite the sexual totems of the Kurnai, the Emuren and the Linnet, to those of the Wachobaluk, the Bat and the Nightjar Owl. See Howitt, Nat Tr, page 150. Totemism, page 51. Camilaroi and Kurnai, page 215. Threlkeld, quoted by Matthews, Locke Sit, page 339. Howitt, Nat Tr, pages 148, 151. Camilaroi and Kurnai, pages 200 to 203, Howitt, Nat Tr, page 149, Petrie, Op. Sit, page 62. Among the Kurnai, these bloody battles frequently terminate in marriages of which they are, as it were, a sort of ritual precursor. Sometimes they are merely plays, Petrie, Locke Sit. On this point, see our study on La Prohibition de l'Inceste et ses origins, in the Annie Sociologique, I, pages 44 ff. However, as we shall presently see, ch 9, 
there is a connection between the sexual totems and the great gods. Primitive culture, I, page 402, 2, page 237, remarks on totemism, with a special reference to some modern theories concerning it, in J.A.I., Atenii, and I, New Series, page 138. Het animism beige den Vulcan van den Indischen Archipel, pages 69 to 75. Tyler, Primitive Culture, 2, page 6. Tyler, Ibid, 2, pages 6 to 18. G. McCall Thiel, Records of Southeastern Africa, 7. We are acquainted with this work only through an article by Fraser, South African Totemism, published in Man, 1901, No. 3. Codrington, The Melanesians, pages 32f, and a personal letter by the same author cited by Tyler in J.A.I., Atenii, page 147. This is practically the solution adopted by Wundt, Mythos und Religion, 2, page 269. It is true that according to Tyler's theory, a clan is only an enlarged family, therefore whatever may be said of one of these groups is, in his theory, applicable to the other, J.A.I., Atenii, page 157. But this conception is exceedingly contestable, only the clan presupposes a totem, which has its whole meaning only in and through the clan. For this same conception, see A. The Lang, Social Origins, page 150. See above, page 63. Primitive Culture, 2, p. 17. Wundt, who has revived the theory of Tyler in its essential lines, has tried to explain this mysterious relationship of the man and the animal in a different way, it was the sight of the corpse in decomposition which suggested the idea. When they saw worms coming out of the body, they thought that the soul was incarnate in them and escaped with them. Worms, and by extension, reptiles, snakes, lizards, etc. were therefore the first animals to serve as receptacles for the souls of the dead, and consequently they were also the first to be venerated and to play the role of totems. It was only subsequently that other animals and plants and even inanimate objects were elevated to the same dignity. But this hypothesis does not have even the shadow of a proof. Wundt affirms, Mythos und Religion, 2, p. 296, that reptiles are much more common totems than other animals, from this, he concludes that they are the most primitive. But we cannot see what justifies this assertion, in the support of which the author cites no facts. The lists of totems gathered either in Australia or in America do not show that any special species of animal has played a preponderating role. Totems vary from one region to another with the flora and fauna. Moreover, if the circle of possible totems was so closely limited at first, we cannot see how totemism was able to satisfy the fundamental principle which says that the two clans or subclans of a tribe must have two different totems. Sometimes men adore certain animals, says Tyler, because they regard them as the reincarnation of the divine souls of the ancestors. This belief is a sort of bridge between the cult rendered to shades and that rendered to animals, primitive culture, 2, page 805, cf 309, in fine. Likewise, Wundt presents totemism as a section of animalism, 2, page 234. See above, page 139. Introduction to the History of Religions, pages 97 ff. See above, page 28. Jevons recognizes this himself, saying, It is to be presumed that in the choice of an ally he would prefer, the kind or species which possessed the greatest power, page 101. Second edition, 3, pages 416 ff, see especially page 419, n, 5. In more recent articles, to be analyzed below, Fraser exposes a different theory, but one which does not, in his opinion, completely exclude the one in the Golden Bough. The origin of the totemism of the Aborigines of British Columbia, in Proc, and Transact. Of the Roy. SOC of Canada, 2nd Series, 7, Section 2, pages 3 ff. Also, Report on the Ethnology of the Statlam, JAI, XXXV, page 141. Hill Tout has replies to various objections made to his theory in Volume 9 of the Transact. Of the Roy. SOC of Canada, 
pages 61 to 99. Alice C. Fletcher, The Import of the Totem, in Smithsonian Report for 1897, pages 577 to 586. The Kwakiutl Indians, pp. 323 ff, 336 to 338, 393. The Development of the Clan System, in America Anthrop, NS6, 1904, pages 477 to 486. J.I., XXXV, page 142. Ibid, page 150. CFVTH Republic on the N.W. Tribes of Canada, B.A.S., page 24. A myth of this sort has been quoted above. J.I., XXXV, page 147. Proc and Transact, etc., 7, section 2, page 12. See the Golden Bow 2-3, pages 351 FF Wilkin had already pointed out similar facts in De Simpsonsage, in De Gids, 1890. De Betrekking Tushin mentioned Deeren and Plantenleven, in Indish Gids, 1884-1888, Uber Das Heropfer, in Review Coloniale Internationale, 1886-1887. For example, Eilman in Die Eingeberinen der Colonie Südaustralien, page 199. Mrs. Parker says in connection with the ULAI, that if the Yunbi does, confer exceptional force, it also exposes one to exceptional dangers, for all that hurts the animal wounds the man, Ulei, page 29. In a later work, The Origin of Totemism, in the Fortnightly Review, May, 1899, pages 844 to 845, Fraser raises this objection himself. If, he says, I deposit my soul in a hare, and my brother John, a member of another clan, shoots that hare, roasts and swallows it, what becomes of my soul? To meet this obvious danger it is necessary that John should know the state of my soul, and that, knowing it, he should, whenever he shoots a hare, take steps to extract and restore to me my soul before he cooks and dines upon the animal. Now Fraser believes that he has found this practice in use in Central Australia. Every year, in the course of a ceremony which we shall describe presently, when the animals of the new generation arrive at maturity, the first game to be killed is presented to men of that totem, who eat a little of it. And it is only after this that the men of the other clans may eat it freely. This, says Fraser, is a way of returning to the former the souls they may have confided to these animals. But, aside from the fact that this interpretation of the fact is wholly arbitrary, it is hard not to find this way of escaping the danger rather peculiar. This ceremony is annual, long days may have elapsed since the animal was killed. During all this time, what has become of the soul which it sheltered and the individual whose life depended on this soul? But it is superfluous to insist upon all the inconceivable things in this explanation. Parker, Op. Sit, page 20. Howitt, Australian Medicine Men, in J.A.A., 16, pages 34, 49F, Hill Tout, J.A.I., XXXV, page 146. According to Hill Tout himself, the gift or transmission, of a personal totem, can only be made or effected by certain persons, such as shamans, or those who possess great mystery power, J.A.I., page 146. C.F. Langlow Parker, Op. Sit, pages 29-30. C.F. Hartland, Totemism and Some Recent Discoveries, in Folklore, 11, pages 59 ff. Except perhaps the Kurnai, but even in this tribe, there are sexual totems in addition to the personal ones. Among the Watjobaluk, the Bwandik, the Wiradjuri, the Yuin and the tribes around Maribra, Queensland. See Howitt, Nat Tr, pages 114-147, Matthews, J, of the R, SOC of NS Wales, XXXV, page 291. C. F. Thomas, Further Notes on Mr. Hill Tout's Views on Totemism, in Man, 1904, page 85. This is the case with the ULAI and the facts of personal totemism cited by Howitt, Australian Medicine Men, in J.A., 16, pages 34, 35, 49-50.
Miss Fletcher, A Study of the Omaha Tribe, in Smithsonian Report for 1897, page 586, Boas, The Kwakiutl, page 322. Likewise, VTH Republic of the Committee, of the NW Tribes of the Dominion of Canada, BAS, page 25, Hill Tout, JAI, XXXV, page 148. The proper names of the gentes, says Boas in regard to the Tlingit, are derived from their respective totems, each gens having its special names. The connection between the name and the collective totem is not very apparent sometimes, but it always exists, VTH Republic of the Committee, etc., page 25. The fact that individual forenames are the property of the clan, and characterize it as surely as the totem, is also found among the Iroquois, Morgan, Ancient Society, page 78, the Wyandotte, Powell, Wyandotte Government, in East Republic, p. 59, the Shawnee, Sock and Fox, Morgan, Ancient Society, pages 72, 76 to 77, and the Omaha, Dorsey, Omaha Sociology, in IIIRD Republic, pages 227 ff. Now the relation between forenames and personal totems is already known, see above, page 157. For example, says Matthews, if you ask a Wartwort man what totem he is, he will first tell his personal totem, and will probably then enumerate those of his clan, sure, of the Roy. SOC of NS Wales, XXXVII, page 291. The Beginnings of Religion and Totemism Among the Australian Aborigines, in Fortnightly Review, July, 1905, pages 162 ff, and September, page 452. CF The Same Author, The Origin of Totemism, Ibid, April, 1899, page 648, and May, page 835. These latter articles, being slightly older, differ from the former on one point, but the foundation of the theory is not essentially different. Both are reproduced in Totemism and Exogamy, I, pages 89 to 172. In the same sense, C. Spencer and Gillen, some remarks on Totemism as applied to Australian tribes, in J.A.I., 1899, pages 275 to 280, and the remarks of Fraser on the same subject, Ibid, pages 281 to 286. Perhaps we may say that it is but one remove from the original pattern, the absolutely original form of totemism, Fortnightly Review, September, 1905, page 455. On this point, the testimony of Strello, 2, page 52, confirms that of Spencer and Gillen. For a contrary opinion, C. A. Lang, The Secret of the Totem, page 190. A very similar idea had already been expressed by Haddon in his address to the Anthropological Section, BAAS, 1902, pages 8 ff. He supposes that at first, each local group had some food which was especially its own. The plant or animal thus serving as the principal item of food became the totem of the group. All these explanations naturally imply that the prohibitions against eating the totemic animal were not primitive, but were even preceded by a contrary prescription. Fortnightly Review, September, 1905, page 458. Fortin. Rev., May, 1899, p. 835, and July, 1905, pages 162 ff. Though considering totemism only a system of magic, Fraser recognizes that the first germs of a real religion are sometimes found in it, Fortin. Rev., July, 1905, page 163. On the way in which he thinks religion developed out of magic, see the Golden Bough, 2i, pages 75-78. Sir Le Totemism, in Annie Associ, v, pages 82-121. C.F., on this same question, Hartland, Presidential Address, in Folklore, 11, page 75, A. Lang, A Theory of Arunta Totemism, in Man, 1904, number 44, Conceptional Totemism and Exogamy, Ibid, 1907, number 55, The Secret of the Totem, C.H. 4, N. W., Thomas, Arunta Totemism, in Man, 1904, number 68, P. W.
Schmidt, die Stellung der Oranda unter der Australischen Stammen, in Zeitschrift für Ethnologie, 1908, pages 866 ff. Die Oranda, 2, pages 57 to 58. Scholz, Locke Sitt, pages 238 to 239. In the Conclusion of Totemism and Exogamy, 4, pp. 58 to 59, Fraser says, it must be admitted, that there is a totemism still more ancient than that of the Arunta, it is the one observed by rivers in the Banks Islands, totemism in Polynesia and Melanesia, in J.A.I., XXXAX, page 172. Among the Arunta it is the spirit of an ancestor who is believed to impregnate the mother, in the Banks Islands, it is the spirit of an animal or vegetable, as the theory supposes. But as the ancestral spirits of the Arunta have an animal or vegetable form, the difference is slight. Therefore we have not mentioned it in our exposition. Social Origins, London, 1903, especially ch. 8, entitled The Origin of Totem Names and Beliefs, and The Secret of the Totem, London, 1905. In his Social Origins especially, Lang attempts to reconstitute by means of conjecture the form which these primitive groups should have. But it seems superfluous to reproduce these hypotheses, which do not affect his theory of totemism. On this point, Lang approaches the theory of Julius Pickler, C. Pickler and Somolo, Der Ursprung de Totemismus. Ein Beitrag zur Materialistischen Gestics Theory, Berlin, 36 pages in 8 VO. The difference between the two hypotheses is that Pickler attributes a higher importance to the pictorial representation of the name than to the name itself. Social Origins, page 166. The Secret of the Totem, page 121, cf. pages 116, 117. The Secret of the Totem, page 136. J.A.I., August, 1888, pages 53-54. CF Nat TR, pages 89, 488, 498. With reverence, as Lang says, The Secret of the Totem, page 111. Lang adds that these taboos are the basis of exogamic practices. Ibid, page 125. However, we have not spoken of the theory of Spencer. But this is because it is only a part of his general theory of the transformation of the ancestor cult into the nature cult. As we have described that already, it is not necessary to repeat it. Except that Lang ascribes another source to the idea of the great gods, as we have already said, he believes that this is due to a sort of primitive revelation. But Lang does not make use of this idea in his explanation of totemism. For example, in a Kwakiutl myth, an ancestral hero pierces the head of an enemy by pointing a finger at him, Boas, VTH Republic on the North. Tribes of Canada, BAS, 1889, page 30. References supporting this assertion will be found on page 128, n. 1, and page 320, n. 1. C. Bank, 3, ch. 2. C. for example, Howitt, Nat T.R., page 482, Sherman, The Aboriginal Tribes of Port Lincoln, in Woods, Nat T.R., of S. Australia, page 231. Fraser has even taken many facts from Samoa which he presents as really totemic, see Totemism, pages 6, 12-15, 24, etc. It is true that we have charged Fraser with not being critical enough in the choice of his examples, but so many examples would obviously have been impossible if there had not really been important survivals of totemism in Samoa. C. Turner, Samoa, page 21 and ch. 4 and v. Alice Fletcher, A Study of the Omaha Tribe, in Smithsonian Republic for 1897, pages 582 f. Dorsey, Suen Sociology, in XVTH Republic, page 238. Ibid, page 221. Riggs and Dorsey, Dakota English Dictionary, in Contribution. N. America Ethnol, 7, page 508. Many observers cited by Dorsey identify the word Wakan with the words Wakanda and Wakanta, which are derived from it, but which really have a more precise signification. Exith Republic, page 372, section 21. Miss Fletcher, 
while recognizing no less clearly the impersonal character of the Wakanda, adds nevertheless that a certain anthropomorphism has attached to this conception. But this anthropomorphism concerns the various manifestations of the Wakanda. Men address the trees or rocks where they think they perceive the Wakanda, as if they were personal beings. But the Wakanda itself is not personified, Smithsonian Rep. 4 1897, page 579. Riggs, Taku Wakan, pages 56-57, quoted from Dorsey, Exith Republic, page 433, section 95. Exith Republic, page 380, section 33. Ibid, page 381, section 35. Ibid, page 376, section 28, page 378, section 30, cf. page 449, section 138. Ibid, page 432, section 95. Ibid, page 431, section 92. Ibid, page 433, section 95. Orenda and a Definition of Religion, in American Anthropologist, 1902, page 33. Ibid, page 36. Tisa, Studi del Thavenet, page 17. Boas, Quakiutl, page 695. Swanton, Social Condition, etc., of the Tlingit Indians, XXVth Republic, 1905, page 451, n. 2. Swanton, Contributions to the Ethnology of the Haida, page 14, CF Social Condition, etc., page 479. In certain Melanesian societies, Banks Islands, North New Hebrides, the two exogamic fratries are found which characterize the Australian organization, Codrington, the Melanesians, pages 23 ff. In Florida, there are regular totems, called butos, Ibid, page 31. An interesting discussion of this point will be found in Lang, Social Origins, pages 176 ff. On the same subject, and in the same sense, C.W. H.R. Rivers, Totemism in Polynesia and Melanesia, in J.A.I., XXXAX, pages 156 ff. The Melanesians, page 118, n. 1. C.F. Parkinson, Dreisig Jar in Der Sudsi, pages 178, 392, 394, etc. An analysis of this idea will be found in Hubert and Moss, Théorie Générale de la Meiji, in Annie Social, 7, page 108. There are not only totems of clans but also of guilds, a. Fletcher, Smithsonian Republic for 1897, pages 581 ff. Fletcher, Op CIT. Pages 578 f. Ibid, page 583. Among the Dakota, the totem is called Wacken. See Riggs and Dorsey, Dakota Grammar, Texts and Ethnol, in Contributions N, America Ethn, 1893, page 219. James's account of Long's expedition in the Rocky Mountains, I, page 268. Quoted by Dorsey, Exith Republic, page 431, section 92. We do not mean to say that in principle every representation of religious forces in an animal form is an index of former totemism. But when we are dealing with societies where totemism is still apparent, as is the case with the Dakota, it is quite natural to think that these conceptions are not foreign to it. See below, same book, ch9, section 4, pages 285 ff. The first spelling is that of Spencer and Gillen, the second, that of Strello. Nat tr, page 548, n. 1. It is true that Spencer and Gillen add, the idea can be best expressed by saying that an Arunkwaltha object is possessed of an evil spirit. But this free translation of Spencer and Gillen is their own unjustified interpretation. The idea of the Arunkwaltha in no way implies the existence of spiritual beings, as is shown by the context and Strello's definition. Dioranda, 2, p. 76, n. Under the name Boilia, C. Gray, Journal of Two Expeditions, 2, pages 337-338. See above, p. 
page 42. Spencer and Gillen recognize this implicitly when they say that the Arunquilfa is a supernatural force. C.F. Hubert and Moss, Theory Générale de la Magie, in Annie Sociale, 7, page 119. Codrington, The Melanesians, pages 191 ff. Hewitt, Locke Sit, page 38. There is even ground for asking whether an analogous notion is completely lacking in Australia. The word Chiringa, or Chirunga as Strello writes, has a very great similarity, with the Arunta. Spencer and Gillen say that it designates all that is secret or sacred. It is applied both to the object and to the quality it possesses, Nat Tr. P. 648, S. V. Chiringa. This is almost a definition of manna. Sometimes Spencer and Gillen even use this word to designate religious power or force in a general way. While describing a ceremony among the Kadesh, they say that the officiant is full of Chiringa, that is to say, they continue, of the magic power emanating from the objects called Chiringa. Yet it does not seem that the notion of Chiringa has the same clarity and precision as that of the manna in Melanesia or of the Wakan among the Sioux. Yet we shall see below, this book, ch. 8 and 9, that totemism is not foreign to all ideas of a mythical personality. But we shall show that these conceptions are the product of secondary formations, far from being the basis of the beliefs we have just analyzed, they are derived from them. Locke, Sit, page 38. Representative Peabody Museum, 3, page 276, n. Quoted by Dorsey, Exit Republic, page 435. See above, page 35. In the expressions such as Zeta Epsilon Epsilon Iota or Ceres Succiditor, it is shown that this conception survived in Greece as well as in Rome. In his Gotternamen, Usner has clearly shown that the primitive gods of Greece and Rome were impersonal forces thought of only in terms of their attributes. Definition du Phenomeni Religio, in Annie Sociale, 2, pages 14 to 16. Preanimistic Religion, in Folklore, 1900, pages 162 to 182. Ibid, page 179. In a more recent work, The Conception of Manna, in Transactions of the Third International Congress for the History of Religions, 2, pages 54 ff. Merritt tends to subordinate still further the animistic conception of manna, but his thought on this point remains hesitating and very reserved. Ibid, page 168. This return of preanimism to naturism is still more marked in Claude, Preanimistic Stages of Religion, Trans Third Inter. Congress for the H. of Rel. I., page 33. Theory Générale de la Magie, in Annie Sociale, 7, pages 108 ff. Der Ursprung der Religion und die Kunst, in Globus, 1904, Volume 86, pages 321, 355, 376, 389, 1905, Volume 87, pages 333. 347, 380, 394, 413. Globus, LXXXV, page 381. He clearly opposes them to all influences of a profane nature, Globus, LXXXVI, p. 379a. It is found even in the recent theories of Fraser. For if this scholar denies to totemism all religious character, in order to make it a sort of magic, it is just because the forces which the totemic cult puts into play are impersonal like those employed by the magician. So Fraser recognizes the fundamental fact which we have just established. But he draws different conclusions because he recognizes religion only where there are mythical personalities. However, we do not take this word in the same sense as Proust and Merit. According to them, there was a time in religious evolution when men knew neither souls nor spirits, a pre-animistic phase. But this hypothesis is very questionable, we shall discuss this point below, Book 2, CH 8 and 9. On this same question, see an article of Alessandro Bruno, Sue Phenomeni Magico Religiosi della Comunita Primitive, in Revista Italiana di Sociologia, 12 year, FASC, 4v, pages 568 ff, 
and an unpublished communication made by W. Bogaris to the 14th Congress of the Americanists, held at Stuttgart in 1904. This communication is analyzed by Proust in the Globus, LXXXVA, page 201. All things, says Miss Fletcher, are filled with a common principle of life, Smith's. Rep. For 1897, page 579. Hewitt, in American Anthropologist, 1902, page 36. The Melanesians, pages 118 to 120. Ibid, page 119. See above, page 103. Pickler, in the little work above mentioned, had already expressed, in a slightly dialectical manner, the sentiment that this is what the totem essentially is. See our division du travail social, third edition, pages 64 ff. Ibid, page 76. This is the case at least with all moral authority recognized as such by the group as a whole. We hope that this analysis and those which follow will put an end to an inexact interpretation of our thought, from which more than one misunderstanding has resulted. Since we have made constraint the outward sign by which social facts can be the most easily recognized and distinguished from the facts of individual psychology, it has been assumed that according to our opinion. Physical constraint is the essential thing for social life. As a matter of fact, we have never considered it more than the material and apparent expression of an interior and profound fact which is wholly ideal, this is moral authority. The problem of sociology, if we can speak of a sociological problem, consists in seeking, among the different forms of external constraint. The different sorts of moral authority corresponding to them and in discovering the causes which have determined these latter. The particular question which we are treating in this present work has as its principal object, the discovery of the form under which that particular variety of moral authority which is inherent in all that is religious has been born. And out of what elements it is made. It will be seen presently that even if we do make social pressure one of the distinctive characteristics of sociological phenomena, we do not mean to say that it is the only one. We shall show another aspect of the collective life, nearly opposite to the preceding one, but none the less real, see page 212. Of course this does not mean to say that the collective consciousness does not have distinctive characteristics of its own, on this point, see representations individuals et representations collectives, in Revue de Metaphysique et de Morale, 1898. pp. 273 ff. This is proved by the length and passionate character of the debates where a legal form was given to the resolutions made in a moment of collective enthusiasm. In the clergy as in the nobility, more than one person called this celebrated night the Duke's Night, or, with Riverall, the Saint Bartholomew of the Estates, C. Stoll, Suggestion und Hypnotismus in der Volker Psychology, 2nd edition, page 618, n. 2. C. Stoll, op. Sit, pages 353 ff. Ibid, pages 619, 635. Ibid, pages 622 ff. The emotions of fear and sorrow are able to develop similarly and to become intensified under these same conditions. As we shall see, they correspond to quite another aspect of the religious life, Book 3, CHV. This is the other aspect of society which, while being imperative, appears at the same time to be good and gracious. It dominates us and assists us. If we have defined the social fact by the first of these characteristics rather than the second, it is because it is more readily observable, for it is translated into outward and visible signs. But we have never thought of denying the second, see our Regles de la méthode sociologique, preface to the second edition, p. xx, n. 1. Codrington, The Melanesians, pages 50, 103, 120. It is also generally thought that in the Polynesian languages, the word mana primitively had the sense of authority, see Tregear, Mari Comparative Dictionary, S.V. See Albert Mathies, Les Origines de Cults Revolutionnaires, 1789-1792. Ibid, p. 24. Ibid, pages 29, 32. Ibid, page 30. Ibid, page 46. 
C. Matthies, La Theophilanthropy et la Cult Decadere, page 36. C. Spencer and Gillen, Nor T.R., page 33. There are even ceremonies, for example, those which take place in connection with the initiation, to which members of foreign tribes are invited. A whole system of messages and messengers is organized for these convocations, without which the great solemnities could not take place, see how it, notes on Australian message sticks and messengers, in J.A.I., 1889, Nat T.R., pages 83, 678-691. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 159, nor T.R., page 551. The Korobori is distinguished from the real religious ceremonies by the fact that it is open to women and uninitiated persons. But if these two sorts of collective manifestations are to be distinguished, they are, nonetheless, closely related. We shall have occasion elsewhere to come back to this relationship and to explain it. Except, of course, in the case of the great bush beating hunts. The peaceful monotony of this part of his life, say Spencer and Gillen, nor T.R., page 33. Howitt, Nat T.R., page 683. He is speaking of the demonstrations which take place when an ambassador sent to a group of foreigners returns to camp with news of a favorable result. C.F. Brof Smith, I., page 138, Scholes, Locke Sit, page 222. C. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., pp. 96f, nor tr, page 137, Brof Smith, 2, page 319. This ritual promiscuity is found especially in the initiation ceremonies, Spencer and Gillen, Nat tr, pages 267, 381, Howitt, Nat tr, page 657, and in the totemic ceremonies, nor tr, pp. 214, 298, 237. In these latter, the ordinary exogamic rules are violated. Sometimes among the Arunta, unions between father and daughter, mother and son, and brothers and sisters, that is in every case, relationship by blood, remain forbidden, Nat. T.R., pages 96f. Howitt, Nat T.R., pages 535, 545. This is extremely common. These women were Kingili themselves, so these unions violated the exogamic rules. Nor TR, page 237. Nor TR, page 391. Other examples of this collective effervescence during the religious ceremonies will be found in Nat TR, pages 244 to 246, 365 to 366, 374, 509 to 510 this latter in connection with a funeral rite. C.F. Nor T.R., pages 213, 351. Thus we see that this fraternity is the logical consequence of totemism, rather than its basis. Men have not imagined their duties towards the animals of the totemic species because they regarded them as kindred, but have imagined the kinship to explain the nature of the beliefs and rights of which they were the object. The animal was considered a relative of the man because it was a sacred being like the man, but it was not treated as a sacred being because it was regarded as a relative. See below, Book 3, CHI, Section 3. At the bottom of this conception there is a well-founded and persistent sentiment. Modern science also tends more and more to admit that the duality of man and nature does not exclude their unity, and that physical and moral forces, though distinct, are closely related. We undoubtedly have a different conception of this unity and relationship than the primitive, but beneath these different symbols, the truth affirmed by the two is the same. We say that this derivation is sometimes indirect on account of the industrial methods which, in a large number of cases, seem to be derived from religion through the intermediacy of magic, see Hubert and Moss, Theorie Générale de la Magie. Annie Sociol. 7, pages 144 ff, 4. As we believe, magic forces are only a special form of religious forces. We shall have occasion to return to this point several times. At least after he is once adult and fully initiated, for the initiation rites, introducing the young man to the social life, are a severe discipline in themselves. 
Upon this particular aspect of primitive societies, see our division du travail social, 3rd edition, pages 123, 149, 173 ff. We provisionally limit ourselves to this general indication, we shall return to this idea and give more explicit proof, when we speak of the rights, book 3. On this point, see Eclis, Die Extase, Berlin, 1902, especially CHI. CF. Moss, Essay sur les variations saisonnières de Societes Eskimos, in Annie Sociol, 9, page 127. Thus we see how erroneous those theories are which, like the geographical materialism of Ratzel, see especially his politish geography, seek to derive all social life from its material foundation either economic or territorial. They commit an error precisely similar to the one committed by Maudsley in individual psychology. Just as this latter reduced all the psychical life of the individual to a mere epiphenomenon of his physiological basis, they seek to reduce the whole psychical life of the group to its physical basis. But they forget that ideas are realities and forces, and that collective representations are forces even more powerful and active than individual representations. On this point, see our representations individuels et representations collectives, in the Revue de Métaphysique et de Morale, May, 1898. See above, pages 188 and 194. Even the excreta have a religious character. See Proust, Der Ursprung der Religion und die Kunst, especially CH2, entitled Der Zauber der Defication, Globus, LXXXVI, pages 325 ff. This principle has passed from religion into magic, it is the totem X part of the alchemists. On this point see Regles de la Method Sociologique, pages 5 ff. Procopius of Gaza, Commentarii in Isaiah, 496. C. Thevenot, Voyage au Levant, Paris, 1689, page 638. The fact was still round in 1862. Le Cossain, Les Tatouages, page 10. Lombroso, Home Criminal, I, page 292. Lombroso, Ibid, I, pages 268, 285, 291 f, Le Cossain, Op Sit, page 97. See above, page 127. For the authority of the chiefs, see Spencer and Gillen, Nat TR, page 10, Nor TR, page 25, Howitt, Nat TR, pages 295 ff. At least in Australia. In America, the population is more generally sedentary, but the American clan represents a relatively advanced form of organization. To make sure of this, it is sufficient to look at the chart arranged by Thomas, Kinship and Marriage in Australia, page 40. To appreciate this chart properly, it should be remembered that the author has extended, for a reason unknown to us, the system of totemic filiation in the paternal line clear to the western coast of Australia. Though we have almost no information about the tribes of this region, which is, moreover, largely a desert. The stars are often regarded, even by the Australians, as the land of souls and mythical personages, as will be established in the next chapter, that means that they pass as being a very different world from that of the living. Op Sit, I, page 4. C. F. Scholes, Lock Sit, page 243. Of course it is to be understood that, as we have already pointed out, see above, p. 155, this choice was not made without a more or less formal agreement between the groups that each should take a different emblem from its neighbors. The mental state studied in this paragraph is identical to the one called by Levi Brol the law of participation, less functions mentals dawn less societes inferiors, pages 76 ff. The following pages were written when this work appeared and we published them without change, we confine ourselves to adding certain explanations showing in what we differ from M. Levy Bro in our understanding of the facts. See above, page 230. Another cause has contributed much to this fusion, this is the extreme contagiousness of religious forces. They seize upon every object within their reach, whatever it may be. Thus a single religious force may animate the most diverse things which, by that very fact, become closely connected and classified within a single group. 
we shall return again to this contagiousness, when we shall show that it comes from the social origins of the idea of sacredness, Book 3, CHI, in fine. Levy Bro, Op Sit, pages 77 ff. Ibid, page 79. See above, page 146. This is the case with the Nanji, C nor TR, pages 170, 546, cf a similar case in Brof Smith, 2, page 269. Australian Aborigines, page 51. There certainly was a time when the Nanji women had souls, for a large number of women's souls still exist today. However, they never reincarnate themselves. Since in this tribe the soul animating a newborn child is an old reincarnated soul, it follows from the fact that women's souls do not reincarnate themselves, that women cannot have a soul. Moreover, it is possible to explain whence this absence of reincarnation comes. Filiation among the Nanji, after having been uterine, is now in the paternal line, a mother no longer transmits her totem to her child. So the woman no longer has any descendants to perpetuate her, she is the finest familiar sui. To explain this situation, there are only two possible hypotheses, either women have no souls, or else they are destroyed after death. The Nanji have adopted the former of these two explanations, certain peoples of Queensland have preferred the latter, see Roth, Superstition, Magic and Medicine, in N. Queensland Ethnog, No. 5, Section 68. The children below four or five years of age have neither soul nor future life, says Dawson. But the fact he thus relates is merely the absence of funeral rites for young children. We shall see the real meaning of this below. Dawson, page 51. Parker, the Ulai, page 35, Eilman, page 188. Nor T.R., page 542, Sherman, the Aboriginal tribes of Port Lincoln, in Woods, page 235. This is the expression used by Dawson, page 50. Strello, I, page 15, N, 1, Scholes, Locke Sid, page 246. This is the theme of the myth of the vampire. Strello, I, page 15, Scholes, page 244, Dawson, page 51. It is true that it is sometimes said that souls have nothing corporeal, according to certain testimony collected by Eilman, p. 188, they are own flesh und blood. But these radical negations leave us skeptical. The fact that offerings are not made to the souls of the dead in no way implies, as Roth thinks, superstition, magic, etc., section 65, that they do not eat. Roth, Ibid, section 65, nor tr, page 530. It sometimes happens that the soul emits odors, Roth, Ibid, section 68. Roth, Ibid, section 67, Dawson, page 51. Roth, Ibid, section 65. Sherman, Aberig. T.R., of Port Lincoln, in Woods, page 235. Parker, the Ulai, pp. 29, 35, Roth, Ibid. Section 65, 67, 68. Roth, Ibid, Section 65, Strello, I, page 15. Strello, I, page 14, N, 1. Fraser, on certain burial customs, as illustrative of the primitive theory of the soul, in J.A.I., 15, page 66. This is the case with the Kadish and the Unmatura, C. nor T.R., page 506 and Nat T.R., page 512. Roth, Ibid, section 65, 66, 67, 68. Roth, Ibid, section 68, this says that when someone faints after a loss of blood, it is because the soul is gone. C.F. Parker, the Ulai, page 38. Parker, the Ulai, pages 29, 35, Roth, Ibid. Section 65. Strello, I, pages 12, 14. In these passages he speaks of evil spirits which kill little children and eat their souls, livers and fat, or else their souls, livers and kidneys. 
The fact that the soul is thus put on the same plane as the different viscera and tissues and is made of food like them shows the close connection it has with them. C.F. Scholes, page 245. For example, among the peoples on the Penafather River, Roth, Ibid, section 68, there is a name for the soul residing in the heart, nigh, another for the one in the placenta, cho I, and a third for the one which is confounded with the breath, wanji. Among the Ulei, there are three or even four souls, Parker, the Ulei, page 35. See the description of the Erpmilkaima rite among the Arunta, Nat Tr, pages 503 ff. Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, pages 497 and 508. Nor Tr, pages 547, 548. Ibid. Pages 506, 527 ff. Meyer, The Encounter Bay Tribe, in Woods, page 198. Nor Tr, pages 551, 463, Nat Tr, page 553. Nor Tr, page 540. Among the Arunta and Larija, for example, Strello, I, page 15, N, 2, 2, page 77. During life, the soul is called Gumna, and Lutana after death. The Lutana of Strello is identical with the Ulthana of Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, pages 514 ff. The same is true of the tribes on the Bloomfield River, Roth, Superstition, etc., section 66. Eilman, page 188. Nat Tr, pages 524, 491, 496. Nor Tr, pages 542, 504. Matthews, Ethnol. Notes on the Aboriginal Tribes of NS Wales and Victoria, in Journal and Proc of the Roy. SOC of NS Wales, XXXVII, page 287. Strello, I, pages 15 ff. Thus, according to Strello, the dead live in an island in the Arunta theory, but according to Spencer and Gillen, in a subterranean place. It is probable that the two myths coexist and are not the only ones. We shall see that even a third has been found. On this conception of an island of the dead, see Howitt, Nat Tr, page 498, Sherman, Aberig. Tr, of Port Lincoln, in Woods, page 235, Eilman, page 189. Schulz, page 244. Dawson, page 51. In these same tribes evident traces of a more ancient myth will be found, according to which the dead live in a subterranean place, Dawson, Ibid. Kaplan, the Naranieri, pages 18f, Howitt, Nat Tr, page 473, Strello, I, page 16. Howitt, Nat Tr, p. 498. Strello, I, page 16, Eilman, page 189, Howitt, Nat Tr, page 473. These are the spirits of the ancestors of a special clan, the clan of a certain poisonous gland, Gift Drusenmanner. Sometimes the work of the missionaries is evident. Dawson speaks of a real hell opposed to paradise, but he too tends to regard this as a European importation. Dorsey, Exith Republic, pages 419 to 420, 422, 485. C.F. Marilier, La Survivance de l'Aime et l'Ide de Justice chez les Peuples non civilises, Rapport de l'École de Hautes Etudes, 1893. They may be doubled temporarily, as we shall see in the next chapter, but these duplications add nothing to the number of the souls capable of reincarnation. Strello, I, page 2. Nat Tr, page 73, n. 1. On this set of conceptions, see Nat Tr, pp. 119, 123 to 127, 387 ff, nor tr, pages 145 to 174. Among the Nanji, it is not necessarily near the Oknanakilla that the conception takes place. But they believe that each couple is accompanied in its wanderings over the continent by a swarm of souls of the husband's totem. 
When the time comes, one of these souls enters the body of the wife and fertilizes it, wherever she may be, nor tr. Page 169. Nat tr. Pages 512 f. Cf. Chx and 11. Nat tr. Page 119. Among the Kadesh, nor tr. Page 154, and the Yurubana, nor tr. Page 146. This is the case among the Waramunga and the related tribes, the Walpari, Wulmala, Wurgia, Chingili, nor tr. Page 161, and also the Umbaya and the Nanji, Ibid, page 170. Strello, I, pages 15 to 16. For the Lorigia, see Strello, page 7. Strello even goes so far as to say that sexual relations are not even thought to be a necessary condition or sort of preparation for conception, 2, page 52, and 7. It is true that he adds a few lines below that the old men know perfectly well the connection which unites sexual intercourse and generation, and that as far as animals are concerned, the children themselves know it. This lessens the value of his first assertion a little. In general, we employ the terminology of Spencer and Gillen rather than that of Strello because it is now consecrated by long usage. Nat T.R., pages 124, 513. I, page 5. Ngara means eternal, according to Strello. Among the Lorigia, only rocks fulfill this function. Strello translates it by kinderkeem, children germs. It is not true that Spencer and Gillen have ignored the myth of the Ratapa and the customs connected with it. They explicitly mention it in Nat Tr, pages 336 ff and 552. They noticed, at different points of the Arunta territory, the existence of rocks called Arathipa from which the spirit children, or the children's souls, disengage themselves, to enter the bodies of women and fertilize them. According to Spencer and Gillen, Arathipa means child, though, as they add, it is rarely used in this sense in ordinary conversation, Ibid, page 338. The Arunta are divided into four or eight matrimonial classes. The class of a child is determined by that of his father, inversely, that of the latter may be deduced from the former, see Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, pages 70 ff, Strello, I, pages 6 ff. It remains to be seen how the Ratapa has a matrimonial class, we shall return to this point again. Strello, 2, page 52. It happens sometimes, though rarely, that disputes arise over the nature of the child's totem. Strello cites such a case, 2, p. 53. This is the same word as the Namatwina found in Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, page 541. Strello, 2, page 53. Strello, 2, page 56. Matthews attributes a similar theory of conception to the Chingili, alias Chingili, Proc, Roy. Geagr. Trans. And SOC Queensland, XXA, 1907, pages 75 to 76. It sometimes happens that the ancestor who is believed to have thrown the Namatuna shows himself to the woman in the form of an animal or a man. This is one more proof of the affinity of the ancestral soul for a material form. Schulz, Locke Sit, page 237. This results from the fact that the Ratapa can incarnate itself only in the body of a woman belonging to the same matrimonial class as the mother of the mythical ancestor. So we cannot understand how Strello could say, I, p. 42, Anmerkung, that, except in one case, the myths do not attribute determined matrimonial classes to the Alcharinga ancestors. His own theory of conception proves the contrary, cf 2, pages 53 ff. Strello, 2, page 58. The difference between the two versions becomes still smaller and is reduced to almost nothing, if we observe that, when Spencer and Gillen tell us that the ancestral soul is incarnated in the woman. The expressions they use are not to be taken literally. It is not the whole soul which comes to fertilize the mother, but only an emanation from this soul. In fact, according to their own statement, a soul equal or even superior in power to the one that is incarnated continues to live in the Nanja tree or rock, see Nat Tr, 
page 514, we shall have occasion to come back to this point again, cf. Below, page 275. 2, pages 76, 81. According to Spencer and Gillen, the Churinga is not the soul of the ancestor, but the object in which his soul resides. At bottom, these two mythological interpretations are identical, and it is easy to see how one has been able to pass into the other, the body is the place where the soul resides. Strello, I, page 4. Strello, I, pages 53 f. In these stories, the ancestor begins by introducing himself into the body of the woman and causing there the troubles characteristic of pregnancy. Then he goes out, and only then does he leave his Namatuna. Strello, 2, page 76. Ibid, page 81. This is the word-for-word -word translation of the terms employed, as Strello gives them, dies du corpor bist, dies du der namlish. In the myth, a civilizing hero, Manga Kunja Kunja, says as he presents to each man the Churinga of his ancestor, you are born of this Churinga, Ibid, page 76. Strello, 2, page 76. Strello, Ibid. At bottom, the only real difference between Strello and Spencer and Gillen is the following one. For these latter, the soul of the individual, after death, returns to the Nanja tree, where it is again confounded with the ancestor's soul, Nat Tr. Page 513, for Strello, it goes to the Isle of the Dead, where it is finally annihilated. In neither myth does it survive individually. We are not going to seek the cause of this divergence. It is possible that there has been an error of observation on the part of Spencer and Gillen, who do not speak of the Isle of the Dead. It is also possible that the myth is not the same among the Eastern Arunta, whom Spencer and Gillen observed particularly, as in the other parts of the tribe. Strello, 2, page 51. Ibid, 2, page 56. Ibid, I, pages 3 to 4. Ibid, 2, page 61. See above, p. 183. Strello, 2, page 57, i, page 2. Strello, 2, page 57. Roth, Superstition, Magic, etc., section 74. In other words, the totemic species is made up of the group of ancestors and the mythological species much more than of the regular animal or vegetable species. See above, page 254. Strello, 2, page 76. Strello, Ibid. Strello, 2, pages 57, 60, 61. Strello calls the list of totems the list of Ratapa. Howitt, Nat Tr., pages 475 ff. The manners and customs of the Diary Tribe of Australian Aborigines, in Kerr, 2, page 47. Howitt, Nat Tr., page 482. Ibid, page 487. Taplin, Folklore, Customs, Manners, etc., of the South Australian Aborig, page 88. The clan of each ancestor has its special camp underground, this camp is the Meyer. Matthews, Injure, of Roy. SOC of NS Wales, XXXVI, page 293. He points out the same belief among other tribes of Victoria, Ibid, page 197. Matthews, Ibid, page 349. J. Bishop, Di Nial Nial, in Anthropos, 3, page 35. Roth, Superstition, etc., Section 68, cf. Section 69a, gives a similar case from among the natives on the Proserpine River. To simplify the description, we have left aside the complications due to differences of sex. The souls of daughters are made out of the choy of their mother, though these share with their brothers the nigh of their father. This peculiarity, coming perhaps from two systems of filiation which have been in use successively, has nothing to do with the principle of the perpetuity of the soul. Ibid, page 16. Die Klinkatindianer, page 282. Swanton, Contributions to the Ethnology of the Haida, pages 117 ff. Boas, Sixth Republic of the Calm on the NW Tribes of Canada, 
page 59. Lafito, Moors de Sauvages Ameriquains, 2, page 434, Petito, Monography de Dean Dingy, page 59. See above, pp. 134 ff. See above, page 137. Howitt, Nat T.R., page 147, C.F. Ibid, page 769. Strello, I, page 15, N, 2, and Scholes, Locke Sit, page 246, speak of the soul, as how it here speaks of the totem, as leaving the body to go to eat another soul. Likewise, as we have seen above, the Algyra or maternal totem shows itself in dreams, just as a soul or spirit does. Fison and Howitt, Kernai and Camillaroy, page 280. Globus, Volume CXI, page 289. In spite of the objections of Lee and Hardy, Strello maintains his affirmations on this point, see Strello, 3, page 11. Lee and Hardy finds a contradiction between this assertion and the theory according to which the Ratapa emanate from trees, rocks, or Chiringa. But the totemic animal incarnates the totem just as much as the nanji tree or rock does, so they may fulfill the same function. The two things are mythological equivalents. Notes on the West Coastal Tribes of the Northern Territory of S. Australia, in Trans of the Roy. SOC of S. Australian, XXXI, 1907, page 4. CF Mann, 1909, number 86. Among the Wakelborough, where, according to Kerr and Howitt, each matrimonial class has its own totems, the animal shows the class, see Kerr, 3, page 28. Among the Bwandic, it reveals the clan, Mrs. James S. Smith, the Bwandic tribes of S. Australian Aborigines, p. 128. C. F. Howitt, on some Australian beliefs, in J.A.I., 13, page 191, 14, page 362. Thomas, An American View of Totemism, in Man, 1902, No. 85, Matthews, Jern. Of the Roy. SOC of N.S. Wales, XXXVII, pages 347-348, Brof Smith, I, page 110, nor T.R., page 513. Roth, Superstition, etc., section 83. This is probably a form of sexual totemism. Prinz zu Weed, Ries in Das in Ihr Nordamerika, 2, page 190. K. von den Steinen, Unter den Nadervolkern Central Brasiliens, 1894, pages 511, 512. C. Fraser, Golden Bow 2, I, pages 250, 253, 256, 257, 258. Third Republic, pages 229, 233. Indian Tribes, 4, page 86. For example, among the Bada of Sumatra, see Golden Bough 2, 3, page 420, in Melanesia, Codrington, the Melanesians, page 178, in the Malay Archipelago, Tyler, Remarks on Totemism, in J.A.I., New Series, I, page 147. It is to be remarked that the cases where the soul clearly presents itself after death in an animal form all come from the societies where totemism is more or less perverted. This is because the idea of the soul is necessarily ambiguous wherever the totemic beliefs are relatively pure, for totemism implies that it participate in the two kingdoms at the same time. So it cannot become either one or the other exclusively, but takes one aspect or the other, according to the circumstances. As totemism develops, this ambiguity becomes less necessary, while at the same time, spirits more actively demand attention. Then the marked affinities of the soul for the animal kingdom are manifested, especially after it is freed from the human body. See above, page 170. On the generality of the doctrine of metempsychosis, see Tyler, 2, pages 8 ff. Even if we believe that religious and moral representations constitute the essential elements of the idea of the soul, still we do not mean to say that they are the only ones. Around this central nucleus are grouped other states of consciousness having this same character, though to a slighter degree. This is the case with all the superior forms of the intellectual life, 
owing to the special price and dignity attributed to them by society. When we devote our lives to science or art, we feel that we are moving in a circle of things that are above bodily sensations, as we shall have occasion to show more precisely in our conclusion. This is why the highest functions of the intelligence have always been considered specific manifestations of the soul. But they would probably not have been enough to establish the idea of it. F. Tregear, The Maori Polynesian Comparative Dictionary, pages 203-205. This is the thesis of Proust in his articles in the Globus which we have cited several times. It seems that M. Levy Brohl also tends towards this conception, see his functions mentals, etc., pages 92-93. On this point, see our suicide, pages 233-ff. It may be objected perhaps that unity is the characteristic of the personality, while the soul has always been conceived as multiple, and as capable of dividing and subdividing itself almost to infinity. But we know today that the unity of the person is also made up of parts and that it, too, is capable of dividing and decomposing. Yet the notion of personality does not vanish because of the fact that we no longer think of it as a metaphysical and indivisible atom. It is the same with the popular conceptions of personality which find their expression in the idea of the soul. These show that men have always felt that the human personality does not have that absolute unity attributed to it by certain metaphysicians. For all this, we do not deny the importance of the individual factor, this is explained from our point of view just as easily as its contrary. If the essential element of the personality is the social part of us, on the other hand there can be no social life unless distinct individuals are associated, and this is richer the more numerous and different from each other they are. So the individual factor is a condition of the impersonal factor. And the contrary is no less true, for society itself is an important source of individual differences, see our division du travail social, 3rd, edition, pages 267 ff. Wrath, superstition, magic, etc., section 65, 68, Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., pages 514, 516. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., pages 521, 515, Dawson, Austral. Aberig, page 58, Roth, Op. Sit, section 67. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 517. Strello, 2, p. 76 and N. 1, Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., pages 514, 516. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 513. On this question, see Negrioli, De Genii Presso I Romani, the articles Daimon and Genius in the Dictionary of Antique, Preller, Romish Mythology, 2, pp. 195 ff. Negrioli, Ibid, page 4. Ibid, page 8. Ibid, page 7. Ibid, page 11. C. F. Santer, Der Ursprung der Lehren Kultus, in Archiv F. Religions Wissenschaft, 1907, pages 368 to 393. Schulz, Locke Sit, page 237. Strello, I, page 5. C. F. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T. R. Page 133, Gason, in Kerr, 2, page 69. See the case of a Muramura who is considered the spirit of certain hot springs, in Howitt, Nat T.R., page 482. Nor T.R., pages 313 F., Matthews, Jern. Of the Roy. SOC of N.S. Wales, XXXVI, page 351. Among the diary there is also a Muramura whose function is to produce rain, Howitt, Nat T.R., pages 798 F. Roth. Superstition, etc., section 67. C. F. Dawson, page 59. Strello, I, pages 2 ff. C. Above, page 249. Nor T. R., C. H. 7. Spencer and Gillen, Nor T. R. Page 277. Strello, I, page 5. 
It is true that some Nanji trees and rocks are not situated around the Earth Nachalunga, they are scattered over different parts of the tribal territory. It is said that these are places where an isolated ancestor disappeared into the ground, lost a member, let some blood flow, or lost a chiringa which was transformed into a tree or rock. But these totemic sites have only a secondary importance. Strello calls them Kleinir Totemplatz, I, pages 4 to 5. So it may be that they have taken this character only by analogy with the principal totemic centers. The trees and rocks which, for some reason or other, remind one of those found in the neighborhood of Inert Nachalunga, inspire analogous sentiments, so the myth which was formed in regard to the latter was extended to the former. Nat T.R., page 139. Parker, the Ulei, page 21. The tree serving for this use is generally one of those figuring among the subtotems of the individual. As a reason for this choice, they say that as it is of the same family as the individual, it should be better disposed to giving him aid, Ibid, page 29. Ibid, page 36. Strello, 2, page 81. Parker, Op Sit, page 21. Codrington, The Melanesians, pp. 249 to 253. Turner, Samoa, page 17. These are the very words used by Codrington, page 251. This close connection between the soul, the guardian genius and the moral conscience of the individual is especially apparent among certain peoples of Indonesia. One of the seven souls of the Tababatak is buried with the placenta, though preferring to live in this place, it may leave it to warn the individual or to manifest its approbation when he does well. So in one sense, it plays the role of a moral conscience. However, its communications are not confined to the domain of moral facts. It is called the younger brother of the soul, as the placenta is called the younger brother of the child. In war, it inspires the man with courage to march against the enemy, Warneck, der Bataksch an und UND Geisterkult, in Aug. Mission Zeitschrift, Berlin, 1904, page 10. C. F. Kruijd, Het Animism in den Indischen Archipel, page 25. It still remains to be investigated how it comes that after a certain moment in evolution, this duplication of the soul was made in the form of an individual totem rather than of a protecting ancestor. Perhaps this question has an ethnological rather than a sociological interest. However, the manner in which this substitution was probably effected may be represented as follows, the individual totem commenced by playing a merely complementary role. Those individuals who wished to acquire power superior to those possessed by everybody, did not and could not content themselves with the mere protection of the ancestor, so they began to look for another assistant of the same sort. Thus it comes about that among the Ulei, the magicians are the only ones who have or who can procure individual totems. As each one has a collective totem in addition, he finds himself having many souls. But there is nothing surprising in this plurality of souls, it is the condition of a superior power. But when collective totemism once begins to lose ground, and when the conception of the protecting ancestor consequently begins to grow dim in the mind, another method must be found for representing the double nature of the soul, which is still felt. The resulting idea was that, outside of the individual soul, there was another, charged with watching over the first one. Since this protecting power was no longer demonstrated by the very fact of birth, men found it natural to employ, for its discovery. Means analogous to those used by magicians to enter into communion with the forces of whose aid they thus assured themselves. For example, see Strello, 2, page 82. Wyatt, Adelaide and Encounter Bay Tribes, in Woods, page 168. Taplin, the Naranieri, pages 62f, Roth, Superstition, etc., section 116, Howitt, Nat T.R., pages 356, 358, Strello, pages 11 to 12. Strello, I., pages 13 to 14. Dawson, page 49. Strello, I., pages 11 to 14, Eilman, pages 182, 185, Spencer and Gillen, nor T.R., page 211, Sherman, the Aberig. T.R., of Port Lincoln, in Woods, 
page 239. Eilman, page 182. Matthews, Jern. Of the Roy. SOC of NS Wales, XXXVAI, page 345. Fison and Howitt, Camilaroy and Kernai, page 467, Strello, I, page 11. Nat TR, pages 390 to 391. Strello calls these evil spirits Arincha, but this word is evidently equivalent to Arincha. Yet there is a difference in the ways the two are presented to us. According to Spencer and Gillen, the Arincha are malicious rather than evil, they even say, page 328, that the Arunta know no necessarily evil spirits. On the contrary, the regular business of Strello's Arincha is to do evil. Judging from certain myths given by Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr. P. 390, they seem to have touched up the figures of the Arunta a little, these were originally ogres, Ibid, page 331. Roth, Superstition, etc., section 115, Eilman, page 190. Nat Tr, pages 390f. Ibid, p. 551. Ibid, pages 326f. Strello, i, page 14. When there are twins, the first one is believed to have been conceived in this manner. Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, page 327. Howitt, Nat Tr, pages 358. 381, 385, Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, page 334, Nor Tr, pages 501, 530. As the magician can either cause or cure sickness, we sometimes find, besides these magical spirits whose function is to do evil, others who forestall or neutralize the evil influence of the former. Cases of this sort will be found in Nor Tr, pp. 501 to 502, the fact that the latter are magic just as much as the former is well shown by the fact that the two have the same name, among the Arunta. So they are different aspects of a single magic power. Strello, I, page 9. Pudiapusha is not the only personage of this sort of whom the Arunta myths speak, certain portions of the tribe give a different name to the hero to whom the same invention is ascribed. We must not forget that the extent of the territory occupied by the Arunta prevents their mythology from being completely homogeneous. Spencer and Gillen, Nor Tr, page 493. Ibid, page 498. Ibid, pages 498f. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 135. Ibid, pp. 476ff. Strello, I. Pages 6 to 8. The work of Manga Kunja Kunja must be taken up again later among other heroes. For, according to a belief that is not confined to the Arunta, a time came when men forgot the teaching of their first initiators and became corrupt. This is the case, for example, of Atnatu, Spencer and Gillen, Nor Tr, p. 153, and the Waterna, Nor Tr, page 498. If Tendun did not establish these rites, it is he who is charged with the direction of their celebration, Howitt, Nat Tr, page 670. Nor Tr, page 499. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 493, Camilaroi in Kurnai, pp. 197 and 247, Spencer and Gillen, Nor Tr, page 492. For example, see Nor Tr, page 499. Nor TR, pages 338, 347, 499. It is true that Spencer and Gillen maintain that these mythical beings play no moral role, nor TR, page 493. But this is because they give too narrow a meaning to the word. Religious duties are duties, so the fact of looking after the manner in which these are observed concerns morals, especially because all morals have a religious character at this period. The fact was observed as early as 1845 by air, journals, etc. 2, page 362, and, before air, by Henderson, observations on the colonies of N.S. Wales and Van Diemen's Land, page 147. Nat T.R., 
pages 488 to 508. Among the Kulin, Wachobaluk and Wowarung, Victoria. Among the Yuin, Garigo and Woolgal, New South Wales. Among the Kamilaroi and Ualei, northern part of New South Wales, and more to the center, in the same province, among the Wonghibbon and the Wiradjuri. Among the Wimbeo and the tribes on the Lower Murray, Ridley, Kamilaroi, page 137, Brough Smith, I, pages 423, N, 431. Among the tribes on the Herbert River, Howitt, Nat Tr, page 498. Among the Kurnai. Taplin, page 55, Eilman, page 182. It is undoubtedly to this supreme Muramura that Gason makes allusion in the passage already cited, Kerr, 2, page 55. Nat Tr, page 246. Between Bai Aim, Bunjil and Duramulan on the one hand, and al Jaira on the other, there is the difference that the latter is completely foreign to all that concerns humanity, he did not make man and does not concern himself with what they do. The Arunta have neither love nor fear for him. But when this conception is carefully observed and analyzed, it is hard to admit that it is primitive. For if the al Jaira plays no role, explains nothing, serves for nothing, what made the Arunta imagine him? Perhaps it is necessary to consider him as a sort of Bayam who has lost his former prestige, as an ancient god whose memory is fading away. Perhaps, also, Strello has badly interpreted the testimony he has gathered. According to Eilman, who, it is to be admitted, is neither a very competent nor a very sure observer, Algira made men, op sit, page 134. Moreover, among the Larija, the corresponding personage, Takura, is believed to celebrate the initiation ceremonies himself. For Bunjil, see Brough Smith, I, page 417, for Bai Aim, see Ridley, Camilaroi, page 136, for Duramulan, see Howitt, Nat Tr, p. 495. On the composition of Bunjil's family, for example, see Howitt, Nat Tr, pages 128, 129, 489, 491, Brough Smith, I, pages 417, 423, for Byams, C. L. Parker, the Ulai, pages 7, 66, 103, Howitt, Nat Tr. Pages 502, 585, 407. For Nurunderis, Taplin, the Naranieri, pages 57 f. Of course, there are all sorts of variations in the ways in which the families of these great gods are conceived. The personage who is a brother here, is a son there. The number and names of the wives vary with the locality. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 128. Brough Smith, I, pages 430, 431. Ibid, I, page 432, N. Howitt, Nat Tr, pages 498, 538, Matthews, Jour, of the Roy. SOC of NS Wales, XXXVII, page 343, Ridley, page 136. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 538, Taplin, the Naranieri, pages 57 to 58. L. Parker, the Ulai, page 8. Brough Smith, I, page 424. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 492. According to certain myths, he made men but not women, this is related of Bunjil. But then, the origin of women is attributed to his son brother, Paul Yen, Brough Smith, I, pages 417 and 423. Howitt, Nat Tr, pages 489, 492, Matthews, Jern. Of the Roy. SOC of NS Wales, XXXVI, page 340. L. Parker, the Ulai, page 7, Howitt, Nat. Tr, page 630. Ridley, Camilaroi, page 136, L. Parker, the Ulai, page 114. L. Parker, Moraustra. Leg. Tales, pages 84 to 89, 90 to 91. Howitt, Nat Tr, p. 
pages 495, 498, 543, 563, 564, Brof Smith, I, page 429, L. Parker, The Ulei, pages 79. Ridley, page 137. L. Parker, The Ulei, pages 90 to 91. Howitt, Nat T. R., page 495, Taplin, The Naranieri, page 58. Howitt, Nat T. R., pages 538, 543, 553, 555, 556, Matthews, Locke Sit, page 318, L. Parker, The Ulei, pages 6, 79, 80. Howitt, Nat T. R., pages 498, 528. Howitt, Ibid, page 493, L. Parker, The Ulei, page 76. L. Parker, The Ulei, page 76, Howitt, Nat T. R., pages 493, 612. Ridley, Camilaroi, page 153, L. Parker, The Ulei, page 67, Howitt, Nat T. R., page 585, Matthews, Locke Sit, page 343. In opposition to by aim, Duramulin is sometimes presented as a necessarily evil spirit, L. Parker, Locke Sit, Ridley, in Brof Smith, 2, page 285. J.A.I., XXI, pages 292 ff. The Making of Religion, pages 187 to 293. Lang, Ibid, page 331. The author confines himself to stating that the hypothesis of St. Paul does not appear to him the most unsatisfactory. The thesis of Lang has been taken up again by Father Schmidt in the Anthropos, 1908-1909. Replying to Sidney Hartland, who had criticized Lang's theory in an article entitled The High Gods of Australia, in Folklore, Volume 9, pages 290 ff, Father Schmidt undertook to show that by aim, Bunjil, etc. Are eternal gods, creators, omnipotent, omniscient and guardians of the moral order. We are not going to enter into this discussion, which seems to have neither interest nor importance. If these different adjectives are given a relative sense, in harmony with the Australian mind, we are quite ready to accept them, and have even used them ourselves. From this point of view, omnipotent means having more power than the other sacred beings, omniscient, seeing things that escape the vulgar and even the greatest magicians. Guardian of the moral order, one causing the rules of Australian morality to be respected, howsoever much these may differ from our own. But if they want to give these words meanings which only a spiritualistic Christian could attach to them, it seems useless to discuss an opinion so contrary to the principles of the historical method. On this question, C. N. W. Thomas, by Aim and Bellbird, a Note on Australian Religion, in Man, 1905, No. 28. C. F. Lang, Magic and Religion, page 25. Waits had already upheld the original character of this conception in his Anthropology D. Naderboker, pages 796-798. Dawson, p. 49, Meyer, Encounter Bay Tribe, in Woods, pages 205-206. Howitt, Nat T. R., pages 481, 491, 492, 494, Ridley, Camillaroi, page 136. Taplin, The Naranieri, pages 55 to 56. L. Parker, More Ostra. Leg. Tales, page 94. Brough Smith, I., pages 425 to 427. Taplin, Ibid, p. 60. Taplin, Ibid, page 61. The world was created by beings called Neurally, these beings, who had already long existed, had the forms of crows or of eagle hawks, Brof Smith, I, pages 423 to 424. By a me, says Mrs. Parker, is for the Ulei what the Alcharinga is for the Arunta, the Ulei, page 6. See above, pages 257 f. In another myth, reported by Spencer and Gillen, 
a wholly analogous role is filled by two personages living in heaven, named Ungambicula, Nat Tr, pages 388 ff. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 493. Parker, the Eulei, pages 62 to 66, 67. This is because the great god is connected with the bull roarer, which is identified with the thunder, for the roaring of this ritual instrument is connected with the rolling of thunder. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 135. The word meaning totem is written thundum by Howitt. Strello, I, pages 1 to 2 and 2, page 59. It will be remembered that, among the Arunta, the maternal totem was quite probably the real totem at first. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 555. Ibid, pages 546, 560. Ridley, Camillaroy, pages 136, 156. He is represented in this form during the initiation rites of the Camillaroy. According to another legend, he is a black swan, L. Parker, more Australian leg. Tales, page 94. Strello, I, page 1. Brough Smith, I, pages 423 to 424. Nat Tr, page 492. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 128. Brough Smith, I, pages 417 to 423. See above, page 108. There are freighters bearing the names Kilpara, Crow, and Maquara. This is the explanation of the myth itself, which is reported by Brough Smith, I, pp. 423 to 424. Brough Smith, I, pages 425 to 427. C. F. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 486. In this case, Carween is identified with the blue heron. Brough Smith, I, page 423. Ridley, Camillaroy, page 136, Howitt, Nat Tr, page 585, Matthews, J, of R, S, of N, S. Wales, 18i, 1894, page 111. See above, page 145. C.F. Father Schmidt, The Origin of the Idea of God, in Anthropos, 1909. Opsit, page 7. Among these same people, the principal wife of Bai Aim is also represented as the mother of all the totems, without belonging to any totem herself, Ibid, pages 7, 79. C. Howitt, Nat Tr, pages 511 f, 513, 602 ff, Matthews, J, of R. S. of N. S. Wales, XXXVI, page 270. They invite to these feasts not only the tribes with whom a regular canubium is established, but also those with whom there are quarrels to be arranged. The vendetta, half ceremonial and half serious, take place on these occasions. See above, page 155. There is one form of ritual especially which we leave completely aside. This is the oral ritual which must be studied in a special volume of the collection de l'Anne Sociologique. See the article Taboo in the Encyclopedia Britannica, written by Fraser. Facts prove the reality of this inconvenience. There is no lack of writers who, putting their trust in the word, have believed that the institution thus designated was peculiar to primitive peoples in general, or even to the Polynesians, see Reville, Religion de Pupils Primitives, 2, page 55. Richard, La Femme Dawn List War, page 435. See above, page 43. This is not saying that there is a radical break of continuity between the religious and the magic interdictions, on the contrary, it is one whose true nature is not decided. There are interdicts of folklore of which it is hard to say whether they are religious or magic. But their distinction is necessary, for we believe that the magic interdicts cannot be understood except as a function of the religious ones. See above, page 149. Many of the interdictions between sacred things can be traced back, we think, to those between the sacred and the profane. This is the case with the interdicts of age or rank. For example, in Australia, there are sacred foods which are reserved for the initiated. 
but these foods are not all sacred to the same degree, there is a hierarchy among them. Nor are the initiated all equal. They do not enjoy all their religious rites from the first, but only enter step by step into the domain of religious things. They must pass through a whole series of ranks which are conferred upon them one after another, after special trials and ceremonies, it requires months and sometimes even years to reach the highest rank. Now special foods are assigned to each of these ranks, the men of the lower ranks may not touch the foods which rightfully belong to the men of the superior ones, see Matthews, Ethnol. Notes, etc., Lock Sit pages 262 ff, Parker, the ULAI, page 23. Spencer and Gillen, Nor TR, pages 611 ff, Nat TR, pages 470 ff. So the more sacred repels the less sacred, but this is because the second is profane in relation to the first. In fine, all the interdictions arrange themselves in two classes, the interdictions between the sacred and the profane and the purely sacred and the impurely sacred. See above, page 137. Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, page 463. Nat Tr, page 538, Nor Tr. Page 640. Nor Tr, page 531. Nor Tr, pages 518 f, Howitt, Nat Tr, page 449. Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, page 498, Scholes, Locke Sit, page 231. Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, page 499. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 451. If the alimentary interdictions which concern the totemic plant or vegetable are the most important, they are far from being the only ones. We have seen that there are foods which are forbidden to the non-initiated because they are sacred. Now very different causes may confer this character. For example, as we shall presently see, the birds which are seen on the tops of trees are reputed to be sacred, because they are neighbors to the great God who lives in heaven. Thus, it is possible that for different reasons the flesh of certain animals has been specially reserved for the old men and that consequently it has seemed to partake of the sacred character recognized in these latter. See Fraser, Totemism, page 7. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 674. There is one interdiction of contact of which we say nothing because it is very hard to determine its exact nature, this is sexual contact. There are religious periods when a man cannot have commerce with a woman, nor tr. Pages 293, 295, Nat tr, page 397. Is this because the woman is profane or because the sexual act is dreaded? This question cannot be decided in passing. We set it aside along with all that concerns conjugal and sexual rights. It is too closely connected with the problems of marriage and the family to be separated from them. Nat Tr, page 134, Howitt, Nat Tr, page 354. Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, page 624. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 572. Ibid, page 661. Nat Tr, page 386. Howitt, Nat Tr, pages 655, 665. Among the Wimbeo, Howitt, Ibid, page 451. Howitt, Ibid, pages 624, 661, 663, 667, Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, pages 221, 382 ff, Nor Tr, pages 335, 344, 353, 369. Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, pp. 221, 262, 288, 303, 378, 380. Ibid, page 302. Howitt, Nat Tr, page 581. Nor Tr, page 227. See above, page 288. Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, page 498, Nor Tr, page 526, Taplin, Naranieri, page 19. Howitt, Nat Tr, 
pages 466, 469 ff. Wyatt, Adelaide and Encounter Bay Tribes, in Woods, page 165. Howitt, Nat T.R., page 470. Ibid, page 657, Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 139, Nor T.R., pages 580 ff. Howitt, Nat T.R., page 537. Howitt, Nat T.R., pages 544, 597, 614, 620. For example, the hair belt which he ordinarily wears, Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 171. Ibid, page 624 ff. Howitt, Nat T.R., page 556. Ibid, page 587. This act takes on a sacred character, it is true, when the elements eaten are sacred. But in itself, the act is so very profane that eating a sacred food always constitutes a profanation. The profanation may be permitted or even ordered, but, as we shall see below, only on condition that rites attenuating or expiating it precede or accompany it. The existence of these rites shows that, by itself, the sacred thing should not be eaten. Nor T.R., page 263. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 171. Howitt, Nat T.R., page 674. Perhaps the rule against talking during the great religious solemnities is due to the same cause. Men speak, and especially in a high voice, during ordinary life. Then, in the religious life they ought to keep still or talk in a low voice. This same consideration is not foreign to the alimentary interdictions, see above, page 128. Nor tr, page 33. Since there is a sacred principle, the soul, within each man, from the very first, the individual is surrounded by interdicts, the original form of the moral interdicts which isolate and protect the human person today. Thus the corpse of his victim is considered dangerous for a murderer, Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 492, and is taboo for him. Now the interdicts having this origin are frequently used by individuals as a means of withdrawing certain things from common use and thus establishing a property right over them. When a man goes away from the camp, leaving his arms and food there, says Roth, speaking of the tribes on the Palmer River, North Queensland, if he urinates near the objects he leaves. They become tammy, equivalent to taboo, and he may be sure of finding them intact on his return, North Queensland Ethnography, in Records of the Australian Museum, Volume 7, Number 2, Page 75. This is because the urine, like the blood, is believed to contain some of the sacred force which is personal to the individual. So it keeps strangers at a distance. For the same reasons, the spoken word may also serve as a vehicle for these same influences, that is how it becomes possible to prevent access to an object by a mere verbal declaration. This power of making interdicts varies with different individuals, it is greater as their character is more sacred. Men have this privilege almost to the exclusion of women, Roth cites one single case of a taboo imposed by women. It is at its maximum with the chiefs and old men, who use it to monopolize whatever things they find it convenient to, Roth, Ibid, page 77. Thus the religious interdict becomes a right of property and an administrative rule. See below, this book, ch2. See above, page 10. See above, page 219. See Hubert and Moss, Essay sur la nature et la fonction du sacrifice, in Melange's Destroyer de Religions, pages 22 ff. Howitt, Nat T.R., pages 560, 657, 659, 661. Even the shadow of a woman must not fall upon him, Ibid, page 633. Whatever he has touched must not be touched by a woman, Ibid, page 621. Ibid, pages 561, 563, 670 f, Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 223, Nor T.R., pages 340, 342. The word Jurail, for example, among the Kurnai, or Kuringal among the Yuin and Wulgal, Howitt, Nat T.R., 
pages 518, 617. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 348. Howitt, page 561. Howitt, pages 633, 538, 560. Ibid, page 674, Parker, Ulai, page 75. Ridley, Camilaroy, page 154. Howitt, page 563. Ibid, page 611. Ibid, pages 549, 674. Howitt, Nat T.R., pages 580, 596, 604, 668, 670, Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., pages 223, 351. Howitt, page 557. Ibid, page 604, Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 351. Howitt, p. 611. Howitt, page 589. One may compare these ascetic practices with those used at the initiation of a magician. Just like the young neophyte, the apprentice magician is submitted to a multitude of interdictions, the observation of which contributes to his acquisition of his specific powers, see L'Origine de Pouvoir's Magiques, in Hubert and Moss. Melange's Destroyer de Religions, pp. 171, 173, 176. The same is true for the husband and wife on the day before and the day after the wedding, taboos of the betrothed and newly married, this is because marriage also implies a grave change of condition. We limit ourselves to mentioning these facts summarily, without stopping over them. For the first concern magic, which is not our subject, and the second have to do with that system of juridical religious rules which relates to the commerce of the sexes. The study of which will be possible only in conjunction with the other precepts of primitive conjugal morality. It is true that Proust interprets these facts by saying that suffering is a way of increasing a man's magic force, die mensch like Zauberkraft, from this expression, one might believe that suffering is a magic rite, not a religious one. But as we have already pointed out, Proust gives the name magic, without great precision, to all anonymous and impersonal forces, whether they belong to magic or religion. Of course, there are tortures which are used to make magicians. But many of those which we have described are a part of the real religious ceremonies, and, consequently, it is the religious state of the individuals which they modify. Proust, der Ursprung der Religion und die Kunst, in Globus, LXXXVII, pages 309-400. Under this same rubric Proust classes a great number of incongruous rites, for example, effusions of blood which act in virtue of the positive qualities attributed to blood and not because of the suffering which they imply. We retain only those in which suffering is an essential element of the rite and the cause of its efficacy. Nor tr, pages 331f. Ibid, page 335. A similar practice will be found among the diary, how it, Nat T.R., pages 658 ff. Spencer and Gillen, Nat. T.R., pages 214 ff. From this example we see that the rites of initiation sometimes have all the characteristics of hazing. In fact, hazing is a real social institution which arises spontaneously every time that two groups, inequal in their moral and social situation, come into intimate contact. In this case, the one considering itself superior to the other resists the intrusion of the newcomers, it reacts against them in such a way as to make them aware of the superiority it feels. This reaction, which is produced automatically and which takes the form of more or less grave cruelties quite naturally, is also destined to shape the individuals for their new existence and assimilate them into their new environment. So it is a sort of initiation. Thus it is explained how the initiation, on its side, takes the form of hazing. It is because the group of old men is superior in religious and moral dignity to that of the young men, and yet the first must assimilate the second. So all the conditions for hazing are given. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 372. Ibid, page 335. Howitt, Nat T.R., page 675. Howitt, Nat T.R., pages 569, 
604. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 251, Nor T.R., 341, 352. Among the Waramonga, the operation must be made by persons favored with beautiful hair. Howitt, Nat T.R., page 675. This concerns the tribes on the Lower Darling. Eilman, Op. Sit, page 212. Ibid. References on this question will be found in our memoir on La Prohibition de l'Incest et ses Origins, Annie Socio, pages 1 ff, and Crawley, The Mystic Rose, pp. 37 ff. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 133. See above, page 121. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., pages 134 f, Strello, I, page 78. Spencer and Gillen, Nor T.R., pages 167, 299. In addition to the ascetic rites of which we have spoken, there are some positive ones whose object is to charge, or, as Howitt says, to saturate the initiate with religiousness, Howitt, Nat T.R., page 535. It is true that instead of religiousness, Howitt speaks of magic powers, but as we know, for the majority of the ethnologists, this word merely signifies religious virtues of an impersonal nature. Howitt, Ibid, pages 674 f. Spencer and Gillen, Nat. T.R., page 454. C.F. Howitt, Nat T.R., page 561. Howitt, Nat T.R., page 557. Ibid, page 560. See above, pages 303, 306. C.F. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 498, Nor T.R., pages 506, 507, 518 F., 526, Howitt, Nat T.R., page 449, 461, 469, Matthews, in J., of R.S. Of N.S. Wales, XXXVII, page 274, Scholes, Locke Sit, page 231, Wyatt, Adelaide and Encounter Bay Tribes, in Woods, pages 165, 198. Australian Aborigines, page 42. Howitt, Nat T.R., pages 470 to 471. On this question, see Robertson Smith, Religion of the Semites, pages 152 ff, 446, 481, Fraser, Art. Taboo in in Sikh, Brit, Jevons, Introduction to the History of Religions, pages 59 f, Crawley, Mystic Rose, ch 2-9. Van Genep, Taboo et Totemism on Madagascar, ch 3. See references above, page 128, n, 1. C.F. Nor T.R., Pages 323, 324, Nat T.R., page 168, Taplin, The Naranieri, page 16, Roth, North Queensland Ethnography. Bull. 10, Records of Austral. Museum, 7, p. 76. It is to be remembered that when it is a religious interdict that has been violated, these sanctions are not the only ones, there is also a real punishment or a stigma of opinion. C. Jevons, Introduction to the History of Religions, pages 67 to 68. We say nothing of the recent, and slightly explicit, theory of Crawley, Mystic Rose, ch 4 to 7, according to which the contagiousness of taboos is due to a false interpretation of the phenomena of contagion. It is arbitrary. As Jevons very truly says in the passage to which we refer, the contagious character of sacredness is affirmed a priori, and not on a faith in badly interpreted experiences. See above, page 229. See above, page 194. See above, page 190. This has been well demonstrated by Proust in his articles in the Globus. It is true that this contagiousness is not peculiar to religious forces those belonging to magic have the same property. Yet it is evident that they do not correspond to objectified social sentiments. It is because magic forces have been conceived on the model of religious forces. 
We shall come back to this point again, see page 361. See above, page 235. Strello, I, P. 4. Of course the word designating these celebrations changes with the tribes. The Yorubana call them Pichinta, nor TR, page 284, the war among the Thalaminta, Ibid, page 297, etc. Scholes, Locke Sid, page 243, Spencer and Gillen, Nat TR, pages 169F. Nat TR, pages 170FF. Of course the women are under the same obligation. The Atmara is the only thing which he brought from the camp. Nat TR, pages 185 to 186. Nor TR, page 288. Ibid. Nor TR, page 312. Ibid. We shall see below that these clans are much more numerous than Spencer and Gillen say. Nat TR, pages 184 to 185. Nat TR, pages 438, 461. 464, nor TR, pages 596 ff. Nat TR, page 201. Ibid, page 206. We use the words of Spencer and Gillen, and with them, we say that, spirits or spirit parts of kangaroo, are disengaged from the rocks. Strello, 3, page 7, contests the exactness of this expression. According to him, the right makes real kangaroos, with living bodies, appear. But this dispute is without interest, just as the one about the notion of the ratapa was, see above, page 252. The kangaroo germs thus escaping from the rock are not visible, so they are not made out of the same substance as the kangaroos which we see. This is all that Spencer and Gillen mean to say. It is quite certain, moreover, that they are not pure spirits such as a Christian might conceive. Like human souls, they have a material form. Nat TR, page 181. A tribe on the east of Lake Eyre. Nor TR, pages 287F. Howitt, Nat TR, page 798. CF. Howitt, Legends of the Diary and Kindred Tribes of Central Australia, in JAI, Ziv. Pages 124 ff how it believes that the ceremony is performed by the men of the totem, but is not prepared to say so definitely. Nor tr, page 295. Ibid, page 314. Ibid, pages 296 f. Nat tr, page 170. Ibid, page 519. The analysis of the rites which have just been studied is based solely on the observations of Spencer and Gillen. Since this chapter was written, Strello has published the third fascicule of his work, which deals with the positive cult and especially the Antikyoma, or, as he says, the rites of the Mbatjalkatuma. But we have found nothing in this publication which obliges us to modify the preceding description or even to complete it with important additions. The most interesting thing taught by Strello on this subject is that the effusions and ablations of blood are much more frequent than one would suspect from the account of Spencer and Gillen, see Strello, 3, pp. 13, 14, 19, 29, 39, 43, 46, 56, 67, 80, 89, moreover, the information given by Strello in regard to the cult must be taken carefully for he was not a witness of the rites he describes. He confined himself to collecting oral testimony, which is generally rather summary, see Fask 3, Preface of Leon Hardy, P. V. It may even be asked if he has not confused the totemic ceremonies of initiation with those which he calls Mbatjalkatuma, to an excessive degree. Of course, he has made a praiseworthy attempt to distinguish them and has made two of their distinctive characteristics very evident. In the first place, the Antikyoma always takes place at a sacred spot to which the souvenir of some ancestor is attached, while the initiation ceremonies may be celebrated anywhere. Secondly, the oblations of blood are special to the Antikyoma, which proves that they are close to the heart of the ritual, 3, page 7. But in the description which he gives us of the rites, we find facts belonging indifferently to each species of ceremony. 
In fact, in what he describes under the name Bhatjalkatuma, the young men generally take an important part, for example, see pages 11, 13, etc., which is characteristic of the initiation. Also, it seems as though the place of the rite is arbitrary, for the actors construct their scene artificially. They dig a hole into which they go, he seldom makes any allusion to sacred trees or rocks and their ritual role. Nat T.R., page 203. C.F. Meyer, The Encounter Bay Tribe, in Woods, page 187. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 204. Nat T.R., pages 205 to 207. Nor T.R., pages 286 F. Ibid, page 294. Ibid, page 296. Meyer, in Woods, page 187. We have already cited one case. Others will be found in Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 208, Nor T.R., page 286. The Walpari, Wulmala, Jingili, Umbaya. Nor T.R., page 318. For the second part of the ceremony as for the first, we have followed Spencer and Gillen. On this subject, the recent fascicule of Strello only confirms the observations of his predecessors, at least on all essential points. He recognizes that after the first ceremony, two months afterwards, he says, p. 13, the chief of the clan eats the totemic animal or plant ritually and that after this he raises the interdicts, he calls this operation die free gave de totems zoom algamine and gabrach, 3, page 7. He even tells us that this operation is important enough to have a special word for it in the Arunta language. He adds, it is true, that this ritual consummation is not the only one, but that the chiefs and old men sometimes eat the sacred plant or animal before the first ceremony and that the performer of the rite does so after the celebration. The fact is not improbable, these consummations are means employed by the officiants or assistants to acquire virtues which they acquire, it is not surprising if they are numerous. It does not invalidate the account of Spencer and Gillen at all, for the rite upon which they insist, and not without reason, is the free gave de totems. On only two points does Strello contest the allegations of Spencer and Gillen. In the first place, he declares that the ritual consumption does not take place in every case. This cannot be doubted, for there are some animals and plants which are not edible. But still, the rite is very frequent. Strello himself cites numerous examples, pages 13, 14, 19, 23, 33, 36, 50, 59, 67, 68, 71, 75, 80, 84, 89, 93. Secondly, we have seen that according to Spencer and Gillen, if the chief does not eat the totemic animal or plant, he will lose his powers. Strello assures us that the testimony of natives does not confirm this assertion. But this question seems to us to be quite secondary. The assured fact is that the ritual consumption is required, so it must be thought useful or necessary. Now, like every communion, it can only serve to confer needed virtues upon the person communicating. It does not follow from the fact that the natives, or some of them, have forgotten this function of the rite, that it is not real. Is it necessary to repeat that worshippers are generally ignorant of the real reasons for their practices? See the religion of the Semites, lectures 6 to 11, and the article Sacrifice in the Encyclopedia Britannica, 9th edition. See Hubert and Moss, Essay sur la nature et la fonction du sacrifice, in Melange's Destroyer de Religions, pages 40 ff. See the explanation of this rule, above, page 229. See Strello, 3, page 3. We must not forget that among the Arunta it is not completely forbidden to eat the totemic animal. See other facts in Fraser, Golden Bough, pages 348 ff. The Religion of the Semites, pages 275 ff. The Religion of the Semites, pages 318 to 319. On this point, see Hubert and Moss, Melange's Destroyer de Religions, Preface, PVFF. The Religion of the Semites, pages 390 ff. 
Smith cites some cases himself in the realm of the Semites, page 231. For example, see Exodus 29. 10-14, Leviticus 9. 8-11, it is their own blood which the priests of Baal pour over the altar, 1 Kings 18. 28. Strello, 3, page 12, verse 7. At least when it is complete, in certain cases, it may be reduced to one of its elements. Strello says that the natives regard these ceremonies as a sort of divine service, just as a Christian regards the exercises of his religion, 3, page 9. It should be asked, for example, whether the effusions of blood and the offerings of hair which Smith regards as acts of communion are not real oblations, see Smith, opposite, pages 320 ff. The expiatory rites, of which we shall speak more fully in the fifth chapter of this same book, are almost exclusively oblations. They are communions only secondarily. This is why we frequently speak of the ceremonies as if they were addressed to living personalities, see, for example, texts by Krichoff and Kemp, in Eilman, page 202. In a philosophical sense, the same is true of everything, for nothing exists except in representation. But as we have shown, p. 227, this proposition is doubly true for religious forces, for there is nothing in the constitution of things which corresponds to sacredness. C. Moss, Essay sur les variations saisonnières de Societes Eskimos, in Annie Social, 9, pages 96 ff. Nat tr, page 176. Nor tr, page 179. It is true that Spencer and Gillen do not say expressly that this is an intikiuma. But the context allow of no doubt on this point. In the index of totem names, Spencer and Gillen write Antjaka, nor tr, p. 772. Nat tr, page 182. Nat tr, page 193. Schulz, Locke Sit, page 221, cf. page 243. Strello, 3, pages 11, 31, 36, 37, 68, 72, 84. Ibid, page 100. Ibid, pages 81, 100, 112, 115. Nor tr, page 310. Nor tr, pages 285 to 286. Perhaps the object of these movements of the lance is to pierce the clouds. Nor tr, pages 294 to 296. It is curious that, on the contrary, the annula regard the rainbow as productive of rain, Ibid, page 314. The same process is employed among the Arunta, Strello, 3, page 132. Of course we may ask if this effusion of blood is not an ablation designed to win the powers which produce rain. However, Gason says distinctly that this is a way of imitating the water which falls. Gason, the diary tribe, in Kerr, 2, pages 66-68. Howitt, Nat Tr, pages 798-800, mentions other rites of the diary for obtaining rain. Ethnological Notes on the Western Australian Aborigines, in Internationals Archive. F. Ethnography, 16, pages 6-7. C. F. Withnell, Marriage Rights and Relationship in Man, 1903, page 42. We presume that subtotems may have tarlo, for, according to Clement, certain clans have several totems. Clement says a tribal family. We shall explain below, page 362, why this is incorrect. On this classification, see Fraser, Lectures on the Early History of Kingship, pages 37 ff, Hubert and Moss, Theorie Générale de la Meiji, pages 61 ff. We say nothing of what has been called the Law of Opposition, for, as M.M. Hubert and Moss have shown, a contrary produces its opposite only through the intermediacy of a similar, Theorie Générale de la Meiji, page 70. Lectures on the History of Kingship, page 39. It is applicable in the sense that there is really an association of the statue and the person in charmed. But it is true that this association is the simple product of an association of ideas by similarity. 
the true determining cause of the phenomenon is the contagiousness peculiar to religious forces, as we have shown. For the causes determining this outward manifestation, see above, pages 230 ff. M. Levy Bro, Les Functions Mentals Dawn Les Societes Inferiors, pages 61 to 68. Golden Bow 2, I, pages 69 to 75. We do not wish to say that there was ever a time when religion existed without magic. Probably as religion took form, certain of its principles were extended to non religious relations, and it was thus supplemented by a more or less developed magic. But if these two systems of ideas and practices do not correspond to distinct historical phases, they have a relation of definite derivation between them. This is all we have sought to establish. Locke, Sit, pages 108 ff. See above, pages 203 f. Of course animal societies do exist. However, the word does not have exactly the same sense when applied to men and to animals. The institution is a characteristic fact of human societies, but animals have no institutions. The conception of cause is not the same for a scholar and for a man with no scientific culture. Also, many of our contemporaries understand the principle of causality differently, as they apply it to social facts and to physico-chemical facts. In the social order, men frequently exhibit a conception of causality singularly like that which was at the basis of magic for a long time. One might even ask if a physicist and a biologist represent the causal relation in the same fashion. Of course these ceremonies are not followed by an alimentary communion. According to Strello, they have another name, at least when they concern non-edible plants, they are called, not Mbatjalkatuma, but Nujalalama, Strello, 3, page 96. Strello, 3, page 8. The Waramunga are not the only ones among whom the Antikyoma takes the form of a dramatic representation. It is also found among the Chingili, the Umbaya, the Wulmula, the Walpari, and even the Kadish, though in certain of its features the ritual of these latter resembles that of the Arunta, nor tr. page 291, 309, 311, 317. If we take the Waramunga as a type, it is because they have been studied the best by Spencer and Gillen. This is the case with the Antikyoma of the Black Cockatoo, see above, page 353. Nor tr. pages 300 ff. One of these two actors does not belong to the Black Snake clan, but to that of the Crow. This is because the Crow is supposed to be an associate of the Black Snake, in other words, it is a subtotem. Nor tr. page 302. Ibid, page 305. C. Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr., page 188, Strello, 3, page 5. Strello himself recognizes this, the totemic ancestor and his descendant, who represents him, Der Darstler, are presented as one in these sacred hymns. 3, page 6. As this incontestable fact contradicts the theory according to which ancestral souls do not reincarnate themselves, Strello adds, it is true, in a note. That, in the course of the ceremony there is no real incarnation of the ancestor in the person who represents him. If Strello wishes to say that the incarnation does not take place on the occasion of the ceremony, then nothing is more certain. But if he means that there is no incarnation at all, we do not understand how the officiant and the ancestor can be confounded. Perhaps this difference is partially due to the fact that among the Waramunga each clan is thought to be descended from one single ancestor about whom the legendary history of the clan centers. This is the ancestor whom the rite commemorates. Now the officiant need not be descended from him. One might even ask if these mythical chiefs, who are sorts of demigods, are submitted to reincarnation. In this Antikyoma, three assistants represent ancestors, of a considerable antiquity. They play a real part, Nat Tr, pages 181 to 182. It is true that Spencer and Gillen add that these are ancestors posterior to the Alcharinga. Nevertheless, mythical personages are represented in the course of the rite. Sacred rocks and waterholes are not mentioned. The center of the ceremony is the image of an emu drawn on the ground, which can be made anywhere. 
we do not mean to say that all the ceremonies of the Waramunga are of this type. The example of the white cockatoo, of which we spoke above, proves that there are exceptions. Nor tr, pages 226 ff. On this same subject, cf certain passages of Eilman which evidently refer to the same mythical being, Die ein Geberinen, etc. p. 185, Strello also mentions a mythical snake among the Arunta, Kalea, water snake, which may not differ greatly from the Wolunkwa, Strello, I, page 78, cf 2, page 71, where the Kalea is found in a list of totems. We use the Arunta words, in order not to complicate our terminology, the Waramunga call this mythical period Wingera. It is not easy to express in words what is in reality rather a vague feeling amongst the natives, but after carefully watching the different series of ceremonies. We were impressed with the feeling that the Wulunkwa represented to the native mind the idea of a dominant totem, nor. Tiar, page 248. One of the most solemn of these ceremonies is the one which we have had occasion to describe above, p. 217, in the course of which an image of the Wulunkwa is designed on a sort of hillock which is then torn to pieces in the midst of a general effervescence. Nor tr, pages 227, 248. Here are the terms of Spencer and Gillen in the only passage in which they speak of a possible connection between the Wulunkwa and rain. A few days after the ride about the hillock, the old men say that they have heard Wulunkwa speak, that he was satisfied with what had passed and that he was going to send rain. The reason for this prophecy was that they, as well as ourselves, had heard thunder rolling at a distance. To such a slight extent is the production of rain the immediate object of the ceremony that they did not attribute it to Wulunkwa until several days later, and then after accidental circumstances. Another fact shows how vague the ideas of the natives are on this point. A few lines below, thunder is spoken of as a sign, not of the Wulunkwa's satisfaction, but of its discontent. In spite of these prognostics, continue our authors, the rain did not fall. But some days later, they heard the thunder rolling in the distance again. The old men said that the Wulunkwa was grumbling because he was not contented with the way in which the rite had been celebrated. Thus a single phenomenon, the noise of thunder, is sometimes interpreted as a sign of a favoring disposition, and sometimes as a mark of evil intentions. However, there is one detail of the ritual which, if we accept the explanation of it proposed by Spencer and Gillen, is directly efficient. According to them, the destruction of the hillock was intended to frighten the Wulunkwa and to prevent it, by magic constraint, from leaving its retreat. But this interpretation seems very doubtful to us. In fact, in the very case of which we were speaking, where it was announced that the Wulunkwa was dissatisfied, this dissatisfaction was attributed to the fact that they had neglected to take away the debris of the hillock. So this removal is demanded by the Wulunkwa itself, and in no way intended to intimidate it and exercise a coercive influence over it. This is probably merely one case of a more general rule which is in force among the Waramunga, the instruments of the cult must be destroyed after each ceremony. Thus the ritual ornamentations with which the officiants are decorated are violently torn off from them when the rite is terminated, nor tr, page 205. Nor tr, pages 207 to 208. Ibid, page 210. See, in the list of totems drawn up by Strello, Nos. 432 to 442, 2, page 72. See Strello, 3, p. 8. Among the Arunta there is also a totem Wura which greatly resembles the Laughing Boy, Totem of Waramunga, Ibid, and 3, page 124. Wura means young men. The object of the ceremony is to make the young men take more pleasure in the game Labera, for this game, see Strello, I, page 55, N, 1. See above, page 373. A case of this sort will be found in Nor TR, page 204. Nat TR, page 118 and N, 2, pp. 618 ff, Nor TR, pages 716 ff. There are some sacred ceremonies from which women are not wholly excluded, see, for example, Nor TR, 
pages 375 ff, but this is exceptional. See Nat TR, pages 329 ff, nor TR, pages 210 ff. This is the case, for example, with the Korobori of the Malanga among the Pitta Pitta of Queensland and the neighboring tribes, see Roth, Ethnog. Studies among the NW Central Queensland Aborigines, pages 120 ff. References for the ordinary Korobori will be found in Sterling, Republic of the Horn Expedition to Central Australia, Part 4, page 72, and in Roth, Op. Sit, pages 117 ff. On this question see the excellent work of Kulin, Games of the North American Indians, XXIVTH Republic of the Bureau of AM. Ethnol. See above, page 81. Especially in sexual matters. In the ordinary Korobori, sexual license is frequent, see Spencer and Gillen, Nat TR, pages 96 to 97, and Nor TR, pages 136 to 137. On sexual license in popular feasts in general, see Hegel Strange, Sedeutsches Bauernalben im Mittelalter, pages 221 ff. Thus the exogamic rules must be violated in the course of certain religious ceremonies, see above, page 216, n, 1. A precise ritual meaning probably could not be found for these excesses. It is merely a mechanical consequence of the state of superexcitation provoked by the ceremony. It is an example of rites having no definite object themselves, but which are mere discharges of energy, see above, page 381. The native does not assign them a definite end either, he merely says that if these licenses are not committed, the rite will not produce its effects, the ceremony will fail. Here are the very words used by Spencer and Gillen, they, the ceremonies connected with the totems, are often, though by no means always, associated with the performance of the ceremonies attendant upon initiation of young men. Or are connected with the Antikyoma, nor. Tiar, page 178. We leave aside the question of what this character consists in. It is a problem which would lead us into a very long and technical development and which must therefore be treated by itself. Moreover, it does not concern the propositions established in this present work. This is Chapter 6, entitled Ceremonies Connected with the Totems. Strello, 3, pages 1-2. This explains the error of which Strello accuses Spencer and Gillen, that they applied to one form of the ceremony the term which is more appropriate for the other. But in these conditions, the error hardly seems to have the gravity attributed to it by Strello. It cannot be otherwise. In fact, as the initiation is a tribal feast, novices of different totems are initiated at the same time. So the ceremonies which thus succeed one another in the same place have to do with several totems, and, therefore, they must take place away from the places with which they are connected by the myth. It will now be understood why we have never studied the initiation rites by themselves, it is because they are not a ritual entity, but are formed by the conglomeration of rites of different sorts. There are interdictions, ascetic rites and representative ceremonies which cannot be distinguished from those celebrated at the time of the Antikyoma. So we had to dismember this composite system and treat each of the different rites composing it separately, classifying them with the similar rites to which they are to be related. We have also seen, pages 285 ff. That the initiation has served as the point of departure for a new religion which tends to surpass totemism. But it has been sufficient for us to show that totemism contained the germs of this religion. We have had no need of following out its development. The object of this book is to study the elementary beliefs and practices, so we must stop at the moment when they give birth to more complex forms. Nat TR Page 463. If the individual may choose between the ceremonies of his paternal and maternal totems, it is because, owing to reasons which we have set forth above, page 183, he participates in both. See below, CHV, page 395. C.S.A. Sir Le Sacrifice, in Melange's Destroyer de Religions, page 83. Piacularia auspicia appellabent quae sacrificantibus tristia portendibent, Paul X. Fest, page 244, edition Muller. The word piaculum is even used as a synonym of misfortune. 
Vitanica herba, says Pliny, tantum glorii habit ut domus in qua sit sit tuta existimeter a piaculus omnibus, xxv, 8, 46. Nor tr, page 526, Eilman, page 239. Cf above, page 305. Brof Smith, I, page 106, Dawson, page 64, Eilman, page 239. Dawson, p. 66, Eilman, page 241. Nat tr, page 502, Dawson, page 67. Nor tr, pages 516 to 517. Ibid, pages 520 to 521. The authors do not say whether these were tribal or blood relatives. The former hypothesis is the more probable one. Nor tr, pages 525 f. This interdiction against speaking, which is peculiar to women, though it consists in a simple abstention, has all the appearance of a piacular rite, it is a way of incommoding oneself. Therefore we mention it here. Also, fasting may be a piacular rite or an ascetic one, according to the circumstances. Everything depends upon the conditions in which it takes place and the end pursued, for the difference between these two sorts of rites, see below, page 396. A very expressive illustration showing this rite will be found in Nor Tr, page 525. Ibid, page 522. For the principal forms of funeral rites, see how it, Nat Tr, pages 446 to 508, for the tribes of the southeast, Spencer and Gillen, Nor Tr, p. 505, and Nat Tr, pages 497 ff, for those of the center, Roth, Nor Queensland Ethnog, Bull. 9, in records of the Australian Museum, 6, number 5, pages 365 ff, burial customs and disposal of the dead. See, for example, Roth, Locke Sit, page 368. Air, Journals of Expt. Into Central Australian, 2, pages 344 f. Spencer and Gillen, Nat Tr, page 500, Nor Tr, pages 507, 508, Eilman, page 241, Parker, Ulai, pages 83 ff, Brof Smith, I, page 118. Dawson, page 66, Howitt, Nat Tr, page 466, Eilman, pp. 239 to 240. Brof Smith, I, page 113. W. E. Stanbridge, Trans Ethnological Society of London, N.S., Volume 1, page 286. Brof Smith, I, page 104. Howitt, Nat T.R., page 459. Similar scenes will be found in Air, Op. Sit, 2, page 255, N., and page 347. Roth, Locke Sit, pages 394, 395, for example, Gray, 2, pages 320 ff. Brof Smith, I, pages 104, 112, Roth, Locke Sit, page 382. Nor Tr, pages 511 to 512. Dawson, page 67, Roth, Locke Sit, pages 366 to 367. Nat Tr, pages 508 to 510. A Little Wooden Vessel, of which we spoke above, page 334. Nat Tr, pages 508 to 510. The other final rite at which Spencer and Gillen assisted is described on pages 503 to 508 of the same work. It does not differ essentially from the one we have analyzed. Nor Tr, pages 531 to 540. Contrarily to what Jevons says, Introduction to the History of Religion, pages 46 ff. This makes Dawson say that the morning is sincere, page 66. But Eilman assures us that he never knew a single case where there was a wound from sorrow really felt, opposite, page 113. Nat Tr, page 510. Eilman, pages 238 to 239. Nor Tr, page 507, Nat Tr, p. 
page 498. Nat TR, page 500, Eilman, page 227. Brof Smith, I, page 114. Nat TR, page 510. Several examples of this belief are to be found in Howitt, Nat TR, page 435. C. F. Strello, I, 15 to 16, 2, page 7. It may be asked why repeated ceremonies are necessary to produce the relief which follows upon mourning. The funeral ceremonies are frequently very long, they include many operations which take place at intervals during many months. Thus they prolong and support the moral disturbance brought about by the death, C.F. Hertz, La Representation Collective de la Mort, in Annie Social, X, pages 48 ff. In a general way, a death marks a grave change of condition which has extended and enduring effects upon the group. It takes a long time to neutralize these effects. In a case reported by Gray from the observations of Bustle, the rite has all the aspects of a sacrifice, the blood is sprinkled over the body itself, Gray, 2, page 330. In other cases, there is something like an offering of the beard, men in mourning cut off a part of their beards, which they throw on to the corpse, Ibid, page 335. Nat TR, pages 135 to 136. Of course each Chiringa is believed to be connected with an ancestor. But it is not to appease the spirits of the ancestors that they mourn for the lost Chiringa. We have shown elsewhere, p. 123, that the idea of the ancestor only entered into the conception of the Chiringa secondarily and late. Op Sit, page 207, cf. page 116. Eilman, page 208. Ibid, page 211. Howitt, The Diary, in J.I., XX, 1891, page 93. Howitt, Nat T.R., page 394. Howitt, Ibid, page 396. Communication of Gason in J.A.I., Ziv, 1895, page 175. Nor T.R., page 286. Gason, The Diary Tribe, in Kerr, 2, page 68. Gason, The Diary Tribe, Eilman, page 208. Howitt, Nat T.R., pages 277 and 430. Ibid, page 195. Gason, The Diary Tribe, in Kerr, 2, page 69. The same process is used to expiate a ridiculous act. Whenever anybody, by his awkwardness or otherwise, has caused the laughter of others, he asks one of them to beat him on the head until blood flows. Then things are all right again, and the one who was laughed at joins in the general gaiety, Ibid, page 70. Eilman, pages 212 and 447. See above, page 385. The Religion of the Semites, Lecture 11. This is the case in which the diary, according to Jason, invoked the Muramura of water during a drought. Op Sit, page 262. It is also possible that the belief in the morally tempering virtues of suffering, see above, p. 312, has added something here. Since sorrow sanctifies and raises the religious level of the worshipper, it may also raise him up again when he falls lower than usual. Cf. What we have said of expiation in our division du travail social 3, pages 64 ff. See above, page 301. Spencer and Gillen, Nat T.R., page 460, Nor T.R., page 601, Roth, North Queensland Ethnography, Bulletin No. 5, page 24. It is useless to multiply references for so well-known a fact. However, Spencer and Gillen cite one case where Chiringa are placed on the head of the dead man, Nat T.R., page 156. But they admit that the fact is unique and abnormal, Ibid, page 157, while Strello energetically denies it, 2, page 79. Smith, Rel. Of Semites, page 153, CF page 446, the additional note, holiness, uncleanness and taboo. Howitt, Nat T.R., pages 448 to 450, Brof Smith, I, pages 118, 120, Dawson, page 67, 
Air, 2, page 251, Roth, North Queensland Athen, Bull. MO9, in wreck, of the Austral. Museum, 6, number 5, page 367. See above, page 320. Nor TR, page 599, Nat TR, page 464. Among the Hebrews, for example, they sprinkled the altar with the blood of the expiatory victim, Leviticus 4, 5 ff. They burned the flesh and used products of this combustion to make water of purification, Num, 19. Taplin, the Naranieri, pages 32-34. When two persons who have thus exchanged their umbilical cords belong to different tribes, they are used as intertribal messengers. In this case, the exchange of cords took place shortly after birth, through the intermediary of their respective parents. It is true that Smith did not admit the reality of these substitutions and transformations. According to him, if the expiatory victim served to purify, it was because it had nothing impure in itself. At first, it was a holy thing. It was destined to re-establish, by means of a communion, the bonds of kinship uniting the worshipper to his God, when a ritual fault had strained or broken them. An exceptionally holy animal was chosen for this operation in order that the communion might be as efficacious as possible, and efface the effects of the fault as completely as possible. It was only when they no longer understood the meaning of the rite that the sacrosanct animal was considered impure, opposite, pages 347 ff. But it is inadmissible that beliefs and practices as universal as these, which we find at the foundation of the expiatory sacrifice, should be the product of a mere error of interpretation. In fact, we cannot doubt that the expiatory victim was charged with the impurity of the sin. We have shown, moreover, that these transformations of the pure into the impure, or the contrary, are to be found in the most inferior societies which we know. William James, The Varieties of Religious Experience Quoted by James, Op. Sit, page 20. See above, pages 230 ff. Only one form of social activity has not yet been expressly attached to religion, that is economic activity. Sometimes processes that are derived from magic have, by that fact alone, an origin that is indirectly religious. Also, economic value is a sort of power or efficacy, and we know the religious origins of the idea of power. Also, richness can confer mana, therefore it has it. Hence it is seen that the ideas of economic value and of religious value are not without connection. But the question of the nature of these connections has not yet been studied. It is for this reason that Fraser and even Proust set impersonal religious forces outside of, or at least on the threshold of religion, to attach them to magic. Bout Rue, Science et Religion, pages 206-207. See above, pages 379 ff. On this same question, see also our article, Representations Individuelles et Representations Collectives, in the Revue de Métaphysique, May, 1898. William James, Principles of Psychology, I, page 464. This universality of the concept should not be confused with its generality, they are very different things. What we mean by universality is the property which the concept has of being communicable to a number of minds, and in principle, to all minds, but this communicability is wholly independent of the degree of its extension. A concept which is applied to only one object, and whose extension is consequently at the minimum, can be the same for everybody, such is the case with the concept of a deity. It may be objected that frequently, as the mere effect of repetition, ways of thinking and acting become fixed and crystallized in the individual, in the form of habits which resist change. But a habit is only a tendency to repeat an act or idea automatically every time that the same circumstances appear it does not at all imply that the idea or act is in the form of an exemplary type, proposed to or imposed upon the mind or will. It is only when a type of this sort is set up, that is to say, when a rule or standard is established, that social action can and should be presumed. Thus we see how far it is from being true that a conception lacks objective value merely because it has a social origin. See also above, page 208. Levi Brough, 
Les Functions Mentals Dawn Les Societes Inferiors, pages 131 to 138. Ibid, page 446. See above, page 18. William James, Principles of Psychology, I, page 134. Men frequently speak of space and time as if they were only concrete extent and duration, such as the individual consciousness can feel, but enfeebled by abstraction. In reality, they are representations of a wholly different sort, made out of other elements, according to a different plan, and with equally different ends in view. At bottom, the concept of totality, that of society and that of divinity are very probably only different aspects of the same notion. See our classifications primitives, Locke Sit, pages 40 ff.